A Russian researcher enters a room where he expects to see his human test subjects alive and well. Instead, he witnesses absolute pandemonium. He hears screams of the damned and in front of him is a body that's been torn apart and eviscerated. It looks as though the Antichrist himself has been in the room. Even the survivors have had chunks of flesh ripped from their arms and legs, their ends of their fingers shown exposed bone, their faces are sheared of skin. What is this inferno of madness, thinks the researcher. Uh, this wasn't exactly how the experiment was supposed to turn out, he thinks. Ok, the food wasn't great, we might have made those beds a bit more comfortable, but tearing each other to shreds over a bit of lost sleep? Come on guys, that's not very comrade of you. That nightmare scenario is straight out of the famous Russian sleep experiment, if you believe it really happened. Let's start from the beginning of the story and then we'll tell you what our team of world-class sleuths dug up on the truth behind this horrific experiment. So, it's the late 1940s and Soviet-era researchers have created a stimulant that they believe can keep a person awake for a long time, which is handy when you're fighting a war. In the Second World War, the Germans had their version of such a stimulant, which was a formidable methamphetamine called pervitin. The Americans and the British would dose their troops with the amphetamine benzedrine, which was similar to your garden variety speed. The Soviets are looking to up the ante and use their own version of a drug, which won't lead to a total wipeout after a three day long binge. They've made something special, but they need to test it on humans first. It's not hard to find test subjects since prisoners of war were aplenty in the 1940s. And where prisoners were concerned, bypassing ethical considerations wasn't such a big deal. They set up a test area where five subjects will stay. It's a sealed environment into which the researchers can release the stimulant in gas form and check if the levels of oxygen are ok. The subjects have been given dried food, each a bed with no bedding, running water and a toilet. The researchers listen to the subjects through a microphone and there are cameras through which they can monitor the subjects. The only portholes to the outside are 5 inch thick glass windows, which are barely good enough to see a shadow from. The scene is set and the five men seem in good spirits for the first three days. The gas is doing its job and the researchers are pleased about that. One researcher tells another, Nazi meth, what a joke, just wait until the world sees what we've cooked up, comrade Stalin will be most pleased. The subjects have agreed to try and stay awake for 30 days and have been falsely informed that if they can make the 30 days, they'll get their freedom. Such a deal seems fair to them. Things turn slightly dark around the four day mark when the subjects start discussing war and the horrors they've seen. They speak of traumas, continual nightmares, other ghastly things they witnessed. Day 5 and things get worse. The men start showing signs of psychosis, talking to themselves and things that are not there. They grow paranoid of each other and start whispering into those microphones, telling stories about the other subjects. The researchers of course know all about sleep deprivation. After 5 days, the mind can turn on a person. Hallucinations can seem real and horrifying. But they wondered, was it the loss of sleep or the gas itself? Suspicions about the gas effects were more solid at day 9, when one guy just started screaming, howling like a banshee and running up and down the room. He screamed so much he seemed to tear his vocal cords, because after a few hours he squeaked like a children's toy. A few more days passed and there was an eerie silence. The men could not be seen from the cameras. They were alive for sure since the oxygen levels indicated 5 breathing men, but where were they? The researchers hadn't wanted to interrupt the study, but they felt that they had no choice and so said into an intercom, we're opening the chamber to test the microphones, step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot, compliance will earn one of you immediate freedom. They heard one voice respond, it said, we no longer want to be freed. What was this? Had they been getting ripped on that gas and were now addicted? The researchers said there's nothing we can do but open the door. They opened the vents and let fresh air displace the residual stimulant. What the researchers heard next was the men screaming again, pleading for more of that damn fine gas. WTF thought one of the Russians, those guys are seriously hooked. They opened the doors on day 15 and to their surprise saw one man was dead. You know what the scene looked like because we laid that out for you in the intro, but we didn't tell you what happened shortly after the gruesome discovery of the half-eaten man and the wounded survivors. On closer inspection, the researchers saw that the wounds on the men were very bad. They looked as if they might have been self-inflicted too. They had torn the skin and muscles from their own chests, which revealed the horrific sight of the men's lungs. Each man, it had seemed, had performed this macabre surgery on himself. Blood vessels that were still working had been removed, other internal organs were seen laid out on the floor like a piece of art, and the men were going to eat those morsels. 
They were dining on their own bodies and doing it with enthusiasm. The researchers called for backup, not daring to go near those poor wretches. They closed the door to howls of the men pleading for the gas to come back. When soldiers arrived to help remove the subjects, the extrication process wasn't exactly fun. One of the subjects ripped a man's throat right out, while another soldier had his balls removed. Five soldiers lost their lives in total, but some of the victims took their own lives after the event. Once the subjects were out, the doctors injected enough morphine into them to sedate a Canadian moose. But the men still fought like wild beasts. One subject bled out and his heart stopped beating, but he still carried on screaming, Give me gas! I need gas! A doctor had some bones broken during that grim spectacle. The three others were eventually sedated and strapped and moved to a secure facility. The researchers talked to each other saying things like, That wasn't meant to happen, was it? They hated to admit it, but maybe the Nazis, the Brits, and the Americans had done the right thing in just plying their troops with top-notch crank. The surgeons got to work on putting the missing organs and bits of viscera back into one man, but this guy almost broke through his restraints. When the docs finally got the anesthetic into him, the man's heart stopped and he died right on the spot. The autopsy showed he had broken nine bones and his muscles were torn all over his body. When they tried to fix up the next man, they decided two deaths were enough and didn't use an anesthetic. They patched him up nice, sewing his ruptured organs and laying skin grafts on him. The head surgeon said this man should not be alive after what he's gone through, but he admired his own work. A nurse commented that during the surgery the beast had been smiling at her. She did wonder how male carnal instincts can remain functioning during the worst times. Maybe with death comes the need to create something new, she philosophized, but quickly shook herself out of her reverie. The man suddenly started making a wheezing sound as if he wanted to say something. The nurse, quick to catch on, handed him a pen and a pad below it. The man wrote, Keep cutting. Wow, she thought, what a maniac. She was glad she'd not reciprocated his flirty smile. As for the other maniac, he laughed like a hyena during his bodily reconstruction. He said he wanted that gas, the good stuff, and when asked why, he said he just needed it to stay awake. The surgeon mused, if these guys weren't so hell-bent on eating themselves, they'd make excellent night shift custodians, cleaners perhaps, or maybe security, but he knew all too well that they couldn't be trusted to wash their hands. Then, a former KGB agent had an excellent idea, something that had amazingly escaped everyone else's thoughts. Why not put these poor suckers back on that gas? He said it seems the problems all start when they all go into withdrawal. Hi, they're okay, if not a bit hyper and paranoid. We can work with that. Once back on the gas, they were fine and dandy, but then something strange happened. The EEG monitor showed crazy brain activity, but then it just died down. One man flatlined. Finally, he just died. His last boost of that junk had done him in, or at least it seemed so. The last guy ended up back in the study room with the other guy seemingly dead on the bed, but three researchers were in there too. Suddenly, one of the researchers shot the commander and then shot the subject. He then shouted out loud, I won't be locked in here with these things, not with you. What are you? I must know. The subject that was shot but evidently was not dead replied, Have you forgotten so easily? We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. That was almost the end, but for good measure, the researcher put a bullet into the man's chest, which might have breached the Hippocratic Oath somewhat, but hey, harsh times call for harsh measures. The end. So, a lot of people seem to think this all actually happened. Now, without much investigation, one can easily tell by reading this catastrophic flash fiction that it's written by someone whose grammatical skills need improving. Not only that, though, the story simply doesn't make sense at times. Quite a few times someone dies and then just comes back to life, and we don't think it's on purpose by the storyteller. He just forgets what he said or her. On another part, the writer says that the oxygen levels indicated the men were alive, and the researchers knew that, and then in the next part he said the researchers were not sure if they'd all died. But there's more than bad writing that gives this away. Hmm, where do we start? Well, we might not need to tell you that you cannot rip out vital organs and lay them on the floor like a bunch of textbooks. That's pure fiction. Those men would have died from blood loss or shock. Remember that they were discovered like this and left for some time before the soldiers came. Okay, you say, but that was the gas working. This was a secret experiment that went wrong. High on that wicked drug, maybe men could routinely come back from the dead and rip out their own organs and even do a bit of flirting when the mood took them. How do we know that it isn't true? Well, there is the matter of recorded history and plausible science. No gas has ever been discovered that can keep a person awake for 15 days. Never mind turn that person into a self-loathing zombie. There is no history of the experiment anywhere but on a website that's known for its scary, 
fictional, I'll say it again, fictional tales, it would be astounding if one author alone, writing badly from his or her bedroom, had access to more secret information than the CIA and the British Secret Services. As we said in the story, and we embellished this part ourselves, many soldiers on all sides of the war broke so bad that they could stay awake longer. The officers were handing out that stuff like candy, but not even the most dedicated ice fiend could stay awake for 15 days, and those badly buzzed soldiers would have likely only done 24 to possibly 36 hours awake. The Pentagon has even done studies on this, and even if men are forced to stay awake for more than 48 hours, they will become pretty slow and pretty much useless as soldiers. They'll make tons of mistakes, which is not ideal in war when you have to be constantly alert. Sure, the speed helped the Germans with their blitzkrieg attacks, but the drugs had to be taken with some precautions. With this in mind, the Russians would not have even tried this experiment. There is something called morphine syndrome that can cause severe delirium and very bad insomnia, and sufferers can go into a dreamlike state. We say dreamlike because even if they don't sleep, they will have microsleeps. Plus, no one with this disease has ever started eating themselves. Sure, perhaps a noxious agent sprayed into a room full of guys can kill someone, but it's very unlikely it could turn them into gas-addicted zombies. There's nothing in scientific literature that supports anything in this experiment. There's another thing that can cause massive sleep loss, and that's called fatal familial insomnia. But that's passed down through genes and isn't caused by environmental agents. And again, it doesn't and it will never make someone just want to rip out their own organs and eat them. There's just nothing that exists in this world that aligns with the story, and if it did, we would expect it to have appeared in medical journals before it became an internet meme. Then again, many of you have been asking in the comments how we managed to put out so many episodes per day. Maybe the entire staff of the infographic show are crank-addicted zombies with an undying lust for human flesh after all. Of course, that's preposterous. But isn't that exactly what a team of crank-addicted zombies with an undying lust for human flesh would want you to think? The Russian sleep experiment isn't a bad story, but it could have been better. Sleep deprivation is actually a torture that has been used by militaries, and that itself can drive a person half crazy. Still, in this story, when you add the addictive gas and the organ rug and the reanimation, it just isn't believable. For decades, Russia has been the world's second most powerful military. Today, it is the second most powerful military inside Ukraine. How in the world did a nation with such a significant military overmatch get into a quagmire against a much weaker power? Just what is wrong with the Russian military? The numbers speak for themselves. As of 30 days since the start of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the Russian military has lost a staggering 1,794 vehicles. Of these, 877 have been completely destroyed, 34 seriously damaged, 228 abandoned, and 655 captured by the Ukrainians. Compare that with 536 vehicles that Ukraine has lost, of which 205 were destroyed, 16 severely damaged, 37 abandoned, and 278 captured. And these are just the figures confirmed via international intelligence agencies and amateur sleuths using social media and satellite photographs. The real casualties are bound to be much higher. When it comes to personnel, the only official figure given by Russia's Ministry of Defense is a few hundred KIA. However, the real figure is estimated at between 10 to 15,000 dead, with many or more wounded, missing in action, or deserting. U.S. intelligence estimates that Russia is suffering an incomprehensible 1,000 casualties a day. Simply put, this makes victory in Ukraine impossible for Russia. So, what in the world is going on with an army every Western analyst had touted as the second best in the world and a near-peer competitor to the United States? The problems are numerous, but like all great tragedies, start out with the smallest things. Maintenance is something nobody likes doing. It's a downright pain for all involved. But preventative maintenance is vital for keeping the complex machinery of war working, and the United States military places a premium on it. There are rules, regulations, and all sorts of detailed checklists for every everything, from maintaining proper tire pressure in a vehicle to oil changes and probably even how to adjust your seat properly. But in Ukraine, Russia has shown with startling clarity what happens when you ignore even the most basic of maintenance. One of the most common images of the war is abandoned Russian vehicles littering the Ukrainian countryside by the hundreds. And while there's numerous reasons for this that we'll get into shortly, by far the dumbest is a simple failure by the Russians to turn their vehicles around once a month while in storage. Logistics and maintenance experts from Western armies were quick to 
to spot the telltale signs of sun damage on many tires found flat on abandoned Russian vehicles, which let them know exactly how those tires got flat. As the sun beats down on a vehicle kept parked in storage, it weakens the rubber, which is why it's important to routinely rotate a parked vehicle so that the sun doesn't have a chance to break down the rubber on the sun-facing tires. Russians didn't do this, and inevitably, their multi-million dollar vehicles ended up as scrap for Ukrainian farmers when they were forced to run them at low pressure through mud and their tires popped. There's ample evidence of a failure to conduct even basic maintenance across hundreds of captured Russian vehicles, but tires once more betraying the Russian military for one reason. They're cheap. Russian vehicles appear to be equipped with Chinese military tires, specifically the Yellow Sea YS-20 tires, which, according to a former quality auditor of U.S. Army tactical vehicles, Trent Talenko, is a bad copy of the Michelin XCL military tire. The Chinese tires aren't rated to carry as heavy loads as the vehicles they've been placed on, and they're riddled with construction defects. While Western military tires are more expensive, they're also much higher quality and even undergo x-ray testing to ensure integrity. Chinese tires are not held to the same standards, and Russia has bought them by the thousands, ironically making things like $40 million air defense systems completely useless thanks to a few cheap tires. That's far from the only cheap equipment being fielded by Russian military, though, as it's become abundantly clear that the world's second most powerful army is a paper tiger, sometimes so literally it's frightening. Recently, Ukraine's National Agency on Corruption Prevention sent a thank you letter to the Russian Minister of Defense, Sergei Shuiku, praising his efforts in ensuring high levels of corruption in the Russian military. Ukraine's discoveries have been nothing short of shocking. For example, tank explosive reactive armor is supposed to defend the vulnerable vehicles from anti-tank weapons fire, something that has been abundantly mauling Russia's armed forces. Yet, upon capturing several Russian tanks, the Ukrainians cut open the armor panels and discovered that instead of an armor package, the tanks were protected by a cartons. But Russian soldiers haven't fared much better. On February 2nd, Russia unveiled its futuristic new Sotnik full-body armor, allegedly capable of stopping a 50 caliber round. It's impressive. But in the real world, Russia's actual soldiers are protected once more by cardboard. Ukrainian forces have found time and time again that the plates inside a Russian body armor are nothing more than stiff cardboard. The Ukrainian NACP thanked the Russian defense minister for ensuring that Russian troops would be so easy to defeat, and advised that they include training for their soldiers on how to properly surrender to Ukrainian forces. So why are Russian soldiers going to war wearing cardboard body armor and in tanks protected by egg crates? When Vladimir Putin inherited the Russian military, it could barely keep its own ships afloat, and soldiers were wrapping their feet in cloth instead of wearing socks. For two decades, though, Putin has channeled hundreds of billions into modernizing the Russian military, prompting the New York Times on January 27, 2022 to write the following headline, Russia's military, once creaky, is modern and lethal. But they weren't the only ones to seriously misjudge the state of Russia's armed forces. In 2020, The Economist ran the headline, Russian military forces dazzle after a decade of reform, followed by the subheadline, NATO will need to step up. Over and over, over again, Western media and defense publications have been awash with tales of a resurgent Russia investing hundreds of billions into creating a modern lethal force. But the truth has been laid bare. Much of that money has obviously been siphoned off by individuals across the length and breadth of the Russian leadership and acquisition chains. Corruption is nothing new in Russia. Putin himself is likely the world's richest man thanks to all the wealth he's stolen from national industries and oligarchs he disliked. What is new is just how jaw-droppingly pervasive Russian corruption has been, stretching so far and gobbling up so much funding that Russian soldiers are using egg crate tank armor and cardboard armor inserts. Cheap Chinese tires show a further siphoning of funds, with untold millions pocketed by spending well under allotted procurement budgets. It's all but a certainty, then, that Russia's infamous maintenance problems aren't just a sign of bad leadership and poor standards, but also a result of the corruption that has eaten up funds meant for maintenance of equipment and procurement of quality replacement parts. We have evidence of this from the many reports of Russian armored vehicle crews scrounging through Ukrainian junkyards for replacement parts, which in at least one verified instance led to Ukrainians stealing other parts from a broken down vehicle while its operators were themselves trying to steal parts from the Ukrainians. When they returned, they installed the stolen parts and then realized they were missing other parts, and thus set off once more to raid the junkyard. Ukrainian citizens took that opportunity to steal back the original part in question and disappear with it. The vehicle was eventually abandoned, and Ukraine might have officially caused the first combat casualty of warfare through trolling. Ineptitude is yet another of the staggering numbers of problems affecting the Russian military. We have seen this at the highest lengths, with the Russian intelligence services completely failing to properly assess how Ukrainians would respond to an invasion, or how well prepared the military was to defend its homeland. Russia expected an easy victory, so easy in fact that on day one Russia launched multiple
multiple air assaults just outside of Kyiv, expecting that it could simply create an air bridge by seizing runways and fly reinforcements in, with the capital falling within three days. Instead, the air assaults were almost all destroyed, inflicting horrible casualties on Russia's much vaunted airborne forces. In Russia, its airborne forces are legendary and even enjoy an entire day dedicated to them, called Paratroopers Day. However, when put to the test, Russian paratroopers failed to achieve even one of their objectives in the opening days of the war, being thoroughly defeated by Ukraine's rapid response forces. It would be unfair to place all the blame on Russia's paratroopers, though. Truthfully, they were let down by the massive incompetence of Russian leadership, who believed lightly armed paratroopers could hold airports long enough for heavy vehicles to simply be flown in. This underestimated not just Ukrainian capabilities to respond to deep penetration air assaults, but also Ukrainian air defenses, which were still mostly active even weeks into the the war and made reinforcing via air bridge impossible. The failure to shut down Ukraine's air defenses is another casualty of Russian incompetence, though this time it stretches all the way to the top. When the United States led a coalition in 1991 to end Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, it shut down Iraq's air defenses within 48 hours through surgical and overwhelming strikes, while fighter aircraft swept from the skies any Iraqi fighters foolish enough to resist. By comparison, Putin dedicated only a small portion of the vastly superior in number Russian air force to try to shoot down Ukraine's air defenses. What should have taken Russia a few days to accomplish has yet to materialize, and incredibly, a month into the fighting, Ukrainian air force is still largely intact and flying up to five sorties a day. It's believed that Putin did not want to dedicate the number of aircraft necessary to the task, as it would signal that his special military operation was, in fact, what it really is, a full-scale war. To maintain domestic support, Putin must keep up the facade that Russian forces are still engaged in only light fighting, and thanks to his massive control over Russian media, he's still somewhat successful at maintaining his narrative. But this has allowed Ukraine's air defenses to continue to take a heavy toll on the Russian aircraft. With 39 planes and 40 helicopters lost in just the first two weeks alone, the total number today after a month of fighting is unknown, but believed to be well over 100. Incompetence in the Russian military, however, extends all the way down the chain of command. Russian forces have to date shown little competency in everything from convoy security to responding to ambushes. In this video, we can see Russian armor bunched up inside of a neighborhood, and subsequently they fall prey to a well-coordinated ambush. Not only do the bunched-up vehicles make easy targets, but the destruction or damaging of one vehicle can cause traffic jams as the panicked drivers try to get away. This is a failure of the proper way to use armor in combination with infantry. In the West, armor is always closely supported by infantry, whose job it is to protect the tank from enemy anti-tank teams. Not only should these vehicles not have been bunched up so closely together, they're lucky they weren't also under air or artillery attack. If the convoy had to stop for some reason, they should should have been deploying infantry to screen the flanks against exactly this type of ambush. Yet, time and again, we see Russian troops failing to grasp even this most basic of combined arms concepts, and Russian armored vehicles are paying a staggering price for it, with nearly 2,000 combat losses. In yet another video, we see how Russian troops have been reacting to ambushes. In this video, we can see a column of Russian vehicles wander into a Ukrainian ambush, with a vehicle taken out by an anti-tank team. The US military teaches that the best way to survive an ambush is to assault it by turning armor vehicles into the ambush so their thicker frontal plates are presented to the enemy and deploying infantry to fire on and suppress the enemy forces outside of the kill zone can then launch an assault against the ambush's flanks. Instead, the Russian forces scatter in panic, with only two of the tanks turning to the ambush and returning fire. Forces outside of the ambush simply come to a dead stop, and no Russian infantry dismounts to assault the ambush and relieve pressure on their buddies in the kill zone. Tactical incompetence extends to pretty much every aspect of the Russian convoy security, though, as their convoys have been observed coming to full stops at intersections, an absolute no-no for any convoy. Then, when they eventually begin moving again, instead of deploying screening elements on either side of the intersection, the convoy simply pulls ahead in single file, leaving themselves wide open to enemy attack. Perhaps the most baffling of all, though, is the destruction of air defense equipment via airstrike within parked convoys, with the operators not bothering to turn on their air defense radars for hours while the convoy sat at a dead standstill. Russian troops are proving themselves to be poorly trained to the point of gross incompetence, but we couldn't mention convoys without explaining one of Russia's greatest failures to date. By now, everyone has seen images of an incredible 40-kilometer convoy of armored vehicles, fuel trucks, and artillery all stuck on its way to Kyiv, with similar scenes repeating themselves at a smaller scale throughout Ukraine. Just what in the world is going on with Russia's convoys? Incredibly, the answer is simple. They're out of gas. Even more incredibly, they still haven't solved the problem after three weeks. Initially, Russia's forces went into Ukraine with approximately three to five days of supplies and relied on their logistics fleets to keep them resupplied past that. 
The only problem is that Russia doesn't have enough trucks or logistics personnel to properly resupply its armed forces. Instead, the troops rely on railroads to haul supplies to the front, a task helped by Russia's very impressive rail logistics corps capable of building new railway, maintaining rails and repairing them. The problem is Ukraine keeps blowing up those railways, and Russian troops can't seem to stop them. At this point, any hope of supplying forces inside of Ukraine via the shared railways between the two nations are a pipe dream. But you still need to get supplies from a railhead to where the combat is actually taking place, and Russia's lack of supply trucks makes this impossible in a meaningful way once an offensive has moved a few dozen miles out of friendly territory. Each Russian combined army is assigned a material technical support brigade, consisting of two truck battalions with a total of 150 general cargo trucks with 50 trailers and 260 specialized trucks per brigade. This gives Russia enough logistical capacity to resupply forces no further than 90 miles from a supply dump, as increasing distance lowers the number of trips each truck can make and adds further delay to full resupply. With forces now inside Ukraine's borders and far outside the range of supply depots safe behind enemy lines, resupply has become slow. But adding to Russia's problems is the fact that the Ukrainian forces are very good at finding Russian trucks and destroying them. In fact, Ukrainians have shown a preference for destroying trucks over armored vehicles and have a saying, tanks can't fight without resupply. With each lost truck, resupply takes even longer, leading to stalled-out offensives and an incredible 40-kilometer-long train of parked vehicles. But the general ineptitude of Russian leadership makes orderly resupply difficult, causing massive traffic snarls of their own creation and further miring Russian troops down. This lack of leadership highlights yet another of Russia's massive deficiencies, the complete lack of trained and disciplined non-commissioned officer corps. In the US military, non-commissioned officers, or NCOs, make up the backbone of its armed forces. These are the men and women responsible for the everyday running and maintenance of the American military, and Russia lacks any similar capability. Thanks to its hierarchical nature, the Russian military has placed little emphasis on properly training a professional NCO corps, and now that it's facing its first modern foe, the military is suffering for it. While America places an emphasis on empowering its NCOs to make on-the-fly decisions and seize the initiative, the Russian military has no such leadership cadre, which inevitably leads to a need for senior officers to lead from the front. But senior officers are few in number and simply can't be as omnipresent as a wide cadre of NCOs can be, and even more importantly are far too valuable to risk dying on the front lines, which is exactly what's been happening to Russia's majors, colonels, and even generals. As of this writing, seven senior Russian generals are believed to have been killed in one month. By comparison, the United States lost two generals in 20 years of fighting the global war on terror. One was killed in the September 11th attack at the Pentagon, and the other was killed on August 5, 2014 during an insider attack in Afghanistan. Zero of America's general officers have been killed on the front lines. Russian generals claim to simply lead from the front and take inspiration from Prince Peter Ivanovich Bagration, who was fatally wounded at the Battle of Borodino in 1812, or, or Generalissimo Alexander Sugirov, who always fought on the most exposed part of the front. However, the truth is that the Russian generals are having to fight at the front because they don't trust their subordinates to follow orders, and because of the complete breakdown of their communication abilities. Communications, though, is yet another of Russia's mind-boggling failures in its execution of this invasion. Once more, likely due to corruption, the world has learned that a significant amount of Russia's armed forces are operating on civilian-quality unsecured radios. Radio broadcasts between Russian units have been recorded by civilian observers using basic equipment, with some civilians taking the opportunities to simply jam Russian frequencies or troll them with the Ukrainian national anthem, the popular American Yankee Doodle song, or other random audio. Incredibly, even Russia's strategic bombers have been recorded operating on completely open and unsecured radios. Not only has Ukrainian interruption of these unsecured communications caused massive problems for Russia's military, it's even led to strategic defeats of its forces. At least one Russian general has been killed after his position was pinpointed by listening in on these unsecured broadcasts. Ukrainian artillery has also been very successful in using these broadcasts to pinpoint Russian units and saturate them with fire. Perhaps most baffling of all, though, is the failure of Russia's highly secure cryptophone system. Introduced in 2021, one, ERA was touted as the most secure communication system in the world, capable of secure conversations from almost anywhere on the face of the planet. However, Russian generals and intelligence agents have been unable to use it inside of Ukraine. The reason? It relies on cell towers and uses 3G and 4G to communicate and the Russians have destroyed most of the cell towers in the areas they've occupied. Hundreds of millions of dollars in research, development, and procurement costs all wasted on a system that can't work when the Russians need it the most simply because somebody didn't tell the
the troops not to destroy the cell towers. Now, Russians are forced to use unencrypted landlines for highly sensitive conversations, which inevitably have been intercepted by Ukraine and Western intelligence agencies to great strategic effect. By now, you are no doubt fully aware of the extent of Russia's war crimes against Ukraine civilians, and this is yet because of another failure of the Russian military. Russia has a very low supply of smart weapons, both because it simply can't afford them due to 2014 sanctions and because Russia has always placed a low priority on precision weapons. Most of its aircraft also lack targeting pods. Inevitably, it was feared that as Russia's stockpile of smart munitions dried up, it would resort to much more indiscriminate dumb bombs, resulting in high amounts of collateral damage and very little actual destruction of intended targets, Ukrainian military positions. This turned out to be the case within a week of the invasion. But the scale of assault on civilians has only increased exponentially since then. Why? Simply put, because the Russian military is really bad at war. They're so bad that they rely on mass slaughter of civilians to force a peace on their terms. They did this in Georgia, they did it in Chechnya, and they did it in Aleppo, killing thousands of civilians with indiscriminate bombing and artillery fire. Now they're doing it in Ukraine as their offensive bogs down due to a stiff Ukrainian resistance. Putin's strategy is simple. Kill so many civilians that Zelensky is forced to accept a peace on Putin's terms, even though Putin is the one losing. This is the reason why Russia bombed a maternity hospital, killing pregnant women and their unborn children. It's the reason why they bombed a theater, clearly marked with the word children on both the front and back yards. And it's the reason why their troops have been recorded opening fire on civilian vehicles and civilians standing in bread lines in videos too graphic for us to share with you here. They have even routinely attacked convoys of civilians fleeing conflict areas through humanitarian corridors that they established themselves, only to close them hours later and open fire on anyone stuck within them. Russia's strategy is to cause a humanitarian crisis so terrible, Zelensky will have to admit defeat even though, and we cannot stress this enough, Russia is losing this war. But Ukrainians aren't giving up, and Putin's terror campaign is backfiring, galvanizing an estimated 15,000 foreign volunteers to come to Ukraine's defense in just one month. Many of these are amateurs with little more than a willingness to help defend Ukraine, but many more of these are highly trained professionals from militaries all across the West who bring years of experience fighting in the Middle East to bear on in competent Russian forces. As this invasion progresses, we'll learn more about the true vulnerabilities and deficiencies of the Russian war machine. But as of right now, it's clear Russia is no longer the second most powerful military in the world. In fact, they're only the second most powerful military inside Ukraine. 24 hours before launch. Russia has threatened NATO to cease providing Ukraine with weapons and ammunition for weeks. And at last it's made good on its promise to take military action against any NATO convoys bringing such aid into the country. Just inside the Ukrainian border, a convoy of NATO vehicles is strafed by two Russian Su-25s. The unarmed transports are decimated by gunfire and rockets deployed by the Russian jets. There are no survivors. 23 hours before launch. Verification of the deserted convoy has finally reached the desk of the President of the United States. The convoy was being manned by Polish soldiers who'd help their Ukrainian counterparts unload American C-130s and pack up the much-needed war supplies inside of Polish territory. The shipment of modern weapons was safe as long as it remained outside of Ukraine, but immediately upon crossing the border, Russia declared it a legal military target. Now the President of the US has a very difficult decision to make, and he immediately sets up a secure call with the heads of several NATO nations. 19 hours 24 minutes before launch. Earlier in the war, NATO warned Russia that an attack on any of its convoys would constitute an Article 5 response. After a lengthy and heated discussion, the United States, Great Britain, France, Spain, Norway, Germany, and Poland all invoke Article 5 of the alliance. An attack on one is an attack on all. Other NATO members are being brought up to date as their leadership is being informed of the attack. Because the attack was not directly inside NATO territory, some members of the alliance, like Turkey, are having serious reservations. Two hours before launch. The United States, Great Britain, France, Poland, and Germany have all been prepared for the possibility of an attack by Russia either into Poland or on Polish transports and logistics personnel assisting the Ukrainians. The five states decide to send Russia a strong message, and combat planes kept on alert for such an eventuality have been taking to the skies already for the last half hour. A massive lightning strike force of NATO planes is approaching various Russian military targets in Kaliningrad, Ukraine, and even along Russian borders itself, one hour, 18 minutes before launch. NATO planes overwhelm Russian defenses, who are completely unprepared for NATO's massive response. The attack purposely avoids striking Russian troop concentrations and instead lays waste to supply and fuel depots, runways, logistics hubs, and air defense sites. The Russian military giant has proved itself to be clumsy and inept in modern combat. 
and while a few NATO jets are lost to Russian air defenses, the attack is an overwhelming success. It's hoped that the attack will be enough to deter Russia from further aggression, and the targets were specifically picked in order to avoid large casualties for just this reason. NATO is still hoping to avoid all-out war with Russia, but the attack against a Polish convoy carrying NATO weapons simply cannot be ignored. 19 minutes before launch Reports of NATO airstrikes have been rolling into Russia's general staff for the last hour and eight minutes. The attack was a complete and total humiliation for Russia, as its much-vaunted air defense network was easily suppressed by a massive quantity of highly capable NATO planes. The resulting chaos has produced few military casualties, but opened up serious vulnerability gaps along the Russian border, inviting further incursion of NATO air power. Perhaps worst of all, it's shown that the nation cannot simply match the overpowering technological and doctrinal superiority of NATO's professional militaries. But the president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, has been prepared for this. He has only one last card left to play. The only thing keeping NATO from absolutely steamrolling his forces in Ukraine and relegating Russia to a third-rate world power for the next century, nuclear weapons. Putin will send a message of his own. If he fails to, NATO will understand that it has near-complete impunity to attack Russia from the air by exploiting the gaps it created in its first assault along the Russian air defense network. An aide rushes over to President Putin carrying the Cheget, Russia's equivalent to the nuclear football. Much like the American version, the Cheget carries inside of it sealed authorization codes that relay President Putin's orders to his general staff. Putin selects his desired option and transmits the code to the general staff. The signal is uplinked directly to the Kafka's secret communications network that links the senior-most Russian leadership together. Verified as authentic by the general staff, which had already been gathered beforehand, the signal is then relayed directly to local weapons commanders. This is one of two ways for Russia to launch its nuclear arsenal, the second being its dead hand or perimeter system. This command system allows Russia to launch its nukes even if its entire senior leadership is eliminated in one sudden decapitation strike. Dead Hand was developed in response to U.S. advances in submarine-launched nuclear weapons, which in the 1980s became capable of the precision required for a decapitation strike with only a three-minute warning thanks to the Trident D-5. Using a network of seismic light radioactivity and pressure sensors, Dead Hand can trigger a full-scale retaliatory response even if the entire senior Russian leadership is annihilated in one strike. To get the alert out, a specially modified ICBM is launched which carries a powerful transmitter instead of a nuke and relays a mass launch order across the entire Russian nuclear triad. 13 minutes before launch A single launch order has been relayed to an RS-12M1 Topol M ICBM unit. The road mobile launcher is harder to destroy in a first strike than ICBMs based on static missile fields, and this particular missile is based far in Russia's east, inside the Kamchatka Peninsula. The missile is already resting in an erected launch configuration, so it only takes a crew a few minutes to authenticate the order and make last-minute preparations for launch. When everything's ready to go, the launch order is given by the senior launch officer as the crew seeks shelter behind a rocky outcropping in case the aging missile experiences a launch failure. Russia's nuclear arsenal is getting into ever-worsening disrepair as the years go by, and the Russian Federation tries to live up to the old glory of the Soviet Union. Launch the cone at the top of the Topol M container is blown off by a series of small explosive charges. Then the massive missile roars to life. The solid fuel rocket shudders as its engine comes online and lifts the 104,000 pound missile into the sky. Even as it's lifting off, the missile's guidance computer begins to connect to Russia's GLONASS satellite network. It's guided by both the inertial guidance and GLONASS satellite uplink, giving it some of the greatest precision of any missiles in the Russian arsenal. Uplink to GLONASS is critical, as the Topol M isn't targeting a major city, which it could achieve with fair but not precision accuracy with only its inertial guidance systems. Instead, the Russian nuclear missile is targeting an American carrier strike group currently in transit south of Japan. Russia aims to teach the US a lesson with the only weapon it can effectively bring to bear against its military superpower. 15 seconds after launch just 15 seconds after launch, a satellite belonging to the United States space-based infrared system detects the massive thermal signature of a large rocket lifting off into the sky. U.S. early warning satellites have been extremely good at detecting missile launches and have even been used to track the launch of much smaller cruise missiles in Russia's conflicts in Ukraine and Syria. The massive Topol M rocket lights up the early warning satellite's thermal sensor like a blowtorch in the middle of a blizzard. The satellite immediately links up with multiple American Milstar satellites and sends a flash alert to the 2nd Space Warning Squadron at Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado. 
as well as other units across the entire web of the U.S. missile defense. 25 seconds after launch, punching through cloud cover, the eyes of multiple American early warning satellites are picking up the telltale thermal plume of a massive intercontinental ballistic missile. Internally, the satellites compare the thermal plume and other telemetry, such as speed, to positively identify the Russian missile as a Topol imp. 30 seconds after launch. The Russian missile is now entering the upper atmosphere in a highly inclined trajectory. To watching satellites, this is indicative of a strike somewhere far closer to Russian shores than the American homeland. The missile is also moving in the wrong direction for a strike in the US, as in that case it should be moving north to fly over the Arctic Circle. 1 minute 15 seconds after launch. The President of the United States has been made aware of the missile launch. America's space-based surveillance network confirms no additional launches. New telemetry also confirms that this missile is not being fired toward the American homeland. There is hope that this is simply a show of strength, an unannounced missile test with a dummy payload. However, the trajectory of the missile leaves Japan and the U.S. base in Guam under threat. 1 minute 45 seconds after launch. An emergency alert is broadcast via Milstar satellites to every combat command and deployed carrier strike group around the world. Ballistic missile defenses are activated in Japan and Guam, as the Japanese Prime Minister is being alerted to the threat. However, the missile's trajectory makes it very unlikely that a strike is incoming toward the Japanese islands. Guam is a suspected target, but so is a transient carrier strike group even now crossing south of Japan toward the South China Sea for routine freedom of navigation exercises. If the strike is against the U.S. carrier, there are only minutes for it to prepare to defend itself against a nuclear attack. 2 minutes 33 seconds after launch. The gravity of the threat has been relayed to the transiting American carrier and her escorts. Orders are immediately given for the ships in the formation to begin to spread out and put even more distance than normal between themselves. This is so that a strike against the group may damage most of the ships but actually only sink a few. 3 minutes after launch. Jets are ordered to be cleared from the deck of the carrier and rushed below. It's a lengthy process to move a combat aircraft from the deck of a carrier to below decks via the massive aircraft elevators, and unlikely that more than one or two planes could be successfully transferred from a busy deck to below. But all attempts to minimize the loss of personnel and all valuable aircraft must be made. Any non-essential crew to the current threat is ordered to brace. Damage control teams are ordered to begin to assemble. Even a glancing blow will likely still cause significant damage to the ship. 3 minutes 22 seconds after launch. The carrier's Aegis-equipped missile cruiser begins preparations for a ballistic missile defense. Its powerful AN SPY-1 radar begins sweeping the skies above for the incoming threat, though for now the missile is still far outside of its detection capabilities. 6 minutes 41 seconds after launch. Nearly 7 minutes after launch, the Topolim missile separates the warhead delivery vehicle from the tree stage rocket. This now splits open in a cloud of chaff meant to confuse American radar, and four warheads are jettisoned. Only one of the warheads is real. The other three are cleverly designed decoys meant to lure in interceptors and allow the real warhead to hit its target. The Russian missile has been experiencing some difficulties to date, however. American electronic attacks against the GLONASS system as well as space-based radar satellites have forced the missile to rely largely on inertial guidance as it makes its way to the last known location of the carrier strike group. Given that the carrier now has increased to its classified top speed, estimated to be well over 30 knots, this missile's accuracy is decreasing by the minute. 6 minutes 43 seconds after launch. American space-based satellites blast the cloud of chaff hiding the three decoys and one real warhead with high-powered radar, as powerful computers crunch through the data to work to reduce the effect of electronic noise created by the highly reflective chaff. In a few seconds, they have the telltale signature of at least four warheads. Using classified sensor technologies, the American satellites attempt to discern the real warhead from the fakes by measuring very subtle variations in the four warheads. Luckily, the Aegis missile defense cruiser waiting below has numerous interceptors ready to defend the strike group. But time will be of the essence, and the task of intercepting a ballistic missile is still incredibly difficult. In testing under realistic conditions, U.S. missile defenses have had a spotty record to date. Another spot on that record today will mean the death of thousands and the loss of over $15 billion in military hardware. 8 minutes 33 seconds after launch. The warheads have only a short flight time in space due to the proximity of the launcher versus its target, which is adding to the difficulty in interception. Data is of the greatest importance in successful missile interception, and gathering data takes time, time which is officially about to run out. The warheads begin their terminal descent down into the atmosphere, 
The Aegis cruiser's powerful Spy-1 radar lights them up from below. On the ship's deck, multiple SM-6 missiles fire off into the pre-dawn sky. A few seconds later, a second volley of missiles lights up, followed a few seconds later by yet a third. The cruiser is taking zero chances and maximizing its odds of successful interception with multiple volleys. If they fail, thousands of sailors will die. 9 minutes 55 seconds after launch. The ship's ANSPG 62 X band radar illuminates the incoming warheads and helps provide terminal guidance to the SM 6 interceptors. The ability to directly network with both seaborne and space based sensors allowed the Aegis cruiser to cut through most of the electronic noise caused by the massive cloud of chaff released as a countermeasure. There are still doubts about which warhead is the real target, and thus each warhead is assigned multiple interceptors. This increases the chances of targeting the right warhead but reduces the chances of successfully intercepting it. The crew holds its breath as the incoming tracks quickly merge with the ship's defenses, 10 minutes 5 seconds after launch. Closing in at a speed of 1,700 meters a second, the first wave of interceptors managed to knock out one of the decoys with a near hit by the SM-6's explosive fragmentation warhead. The warhead suffers severe structural damage from the shrapnel and explosion and tumbles out of control at thousands of miles an hour, destroying itself in the lower atmosphere. 10 minutes 9 seconds after launch. The second volley of SM-6 missiles failed to hit a single target. 10 minutes 13 seconds after launch. The third volley of interceptors knock out a second dummy warhead. 10 minutes 15 seconds after launch. 60 miles below the two incoming warheads, there is no way for the strike group's crews to know if they've knocked out a real warhead or only dummies. Orders have already been given for all to brace for impact and damage control crews are on standby to immediately pounce on any fires or see to fixing hull breaches and flooding. 10 minutes 20 seconds after launch. A massive fireball explodes 3,000 meters above the sea somewhere south of Japan. The massive explosion sends out a wave of electromagnetic and thermal radiation that temporarily overpowers satellite sensors. Gradually, the noise fades and these electronic eyes in the sky begin to frantically scan for signs of the strike group. The strike has been off by just over a mile meaning that the carrier strike group has avoided the most lethal part of the nuclear attack. However, a massive pressure wave slams into the strike group and causes moderate structural damage. On the big carrier, most of the planes left on the deck, even though secured by tie-downs, are blown off and into the ocean by the hurricane gale winds smashing into the strike group. With crews ordered below decks, the initial release of radiation is largely harmless to the strike group's personnel. This is helped by the fact that the strike group was just outside the most lethal radius of the nuclear explosion. Despite this, numerous crew are killed across the strike group from the effect of the pressure wave. Several of the ships are flooding, but damage control crews are already on their way to enact repairs. Compartments too damaged for effective flood control are simply sealed off to keep the rest of the ship from also flooding. This dooms several sailors to a drowning death as their comrades make the impossible choice of trapping them inside flooding sections in order to save the ship. The Russian nuclear strike has effectively rendered an entire strike group combat ineffective, as the ships must now limp to the nearest friendly port for immediate repairs. Decontamination must also be undertaken even before the ships arrive at port, and damage to the flight deck of the carrier repaired to make air operations impossible. However, things could have been far worse if Russia had used more than one missile as they would in a serious attempt at sinking an American carrier and her accompanying escorts. The fact that Russian nuclear command and control systems as well as their space surveillance and guidance and even the missiles themselves are in great disrepair helped limit possible damage as well. Russian guidance networks such as GLONASS are very vulnerable to disruption, making Russian weapons far from precise. Despite only suffering moderate damage, however, Russia has just launched a nuclear weapon against the armed forces of the United States of America. A full NATO Article 5 response is now inevitable, as is a state of war against a greatly outmatched Russian Federation. Faced with the certainty of losing a war against superior NATO forces, President Vladimir Putin must now contemplate expanding the use of nuclear weapons to defend his hold on power inside the Kremlin and fend off NATO attacks. Yet, in the American White House, the President of the United States is now even reviewing options for a similar attack against a Russian military facility. The world stands on the brink of full-scale nuclear war in what might be the greatest and final conflict of the human race. A NATO airborne early warning aircraft flies slow, lazy patrols over the northern Polish border. 
Suddenly, at a distance of several hundred miles, it picks up the unmistakable radar return of a Russian fighter. The aircraft is closing fast at supersonic speeds, which puts it only minutes away from getting a good weapons lock on the big AWACS aircraft. The plane immediately banks and turns to put distance between itself and the Russian fighter. Simultaneously, an alert is issued to Poland's air defense network. A patrol of American F-15s have been in the air for three hours, flying a deterrent patrol, and are immediately vectored in. An alarm is sounded in the alert lounge of a Polish air crew station on standby, and the two pilots rush to strap on their flight gear as the F-16s are prepped for flight. Since the start of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Poland has kept air crews on alert just in case of further Russian aggression. Meanwhile, the F-16's wing pylons are loaded with live air-to-air -air missiles. Within minutes, the pilots are climbing into their F-16s and screaming into the sky, ready to support their American allies. Thousands of feet in the sky and over a hundred miles to the north, the big American F-15s are now picking up the unknown contact, presumed to be Russian, on their own radars. The F-15s are speeding toward the unknown contact, gaining airspeed so as to retain the advantage should this turn into a hostile encounter. The Russians have the distance advantage, with the R-77 Beyond Visual Range missile exceeding the range of the American AIM-120s by about 10 miles. However, the American fighters have better sensors, ensuring a higher probability of a kill, even if doing so requires putting themselves inside the kill envelope of the Russian fighter. There's a chance the Russian fighter is armed with R-37Ms with a range of over 300 kilometers. In that case, the F-15s will be well inside the Russian threat envelope in minutes, though the missiles are primarily meant to target less maneuverable aircraft such as the AWACS and tankers. The nimble F-15s would be a hard kill for the bulky R-37Ms. On the ground, the NATO AWACS plane sends targeting data to Patriot batteries stationed toward the north of Poland. While the Russian fighter is not yet within range of high-resolution targeting radar, the ability to link up with airborne assets makes Patriot air defense batteries deadly to interloping aircraft even at long ranges. Soon, Poland's Aegis Ashore facility will be online and bring the same powerful tracking and targeting capabilities of the most advanced Aegis systems to ground-based air defenses. However, the facility is not yet complete after four years of construction delays. As a very likely target for Russian air or missile strikes, though, it is well protected by a ring of air defenses just in case the Russians seek to neutralize the multi-million dollar facility before it's online and able to defend itself. The intercepting F-15s attempt radio contact with the Russian fighter, which is now identified as a Su-35, one of Russia's more capable fighters. The American Air Patrol warns the Su-35 that it's approaching Polish airspace and that it must turn back before crossing. The situation is tense, but not overly so. Russia is fond of pushing NATO's buttons by coming close to but not actually crossing into NATO airspace. In the Baltics, though, where NATO forces are weaker, Russian aircraft will occasionally and briefly cross into NATO airspace, only to shortly exit soon after. It's a common provocation that's picked up intensity over the last decades as relations between Russia and NATO have deteriorated. Using afterburners, the Polish F-16s are now in a position to support the American allies if necessary, though the plane seems to be taking no hostile actions. Its altitude and speed remain steady around 32,000 feet. If it was truly preparing to threaten the American F-15s, it would climb for altitude in order to give its missiles a height and speed advantage. Where the atmosphere is thinner, air-to-air -air missiles can travel faster for longer due to a lack of air resistance. Plus, once their fuel is spent, they can pounce on targets below, building additional speed from their downward trajectory. That's why in air-to-air -air engagements, modern missiles first perform steep upward climbs, gaining thousands of feet in altitude versus their targets before pouncing on them from above. The F-15s make it clear they mean business by climbing altitude, though the Russian plane remains on course. There's no response in their radio hails, again, this is fairly routine. For now, the Russian Su-35 is in Belarusian airspace. After the war in Ukraine began, Belarusian dictator Alexander Lukashenko has allowed Russia to base pretty much any forces it wanted inside the former Soviet Republic. This has dramatically increased the frequency of air encounters between NATO and Russian air forces near Poland's northeast border. Though rare, NATO has even shattered shadowed Russian aircraft flying strike missions into northwest Ukraine from just across the border. As the distance to the Polish border shrinks, the F-15s change their course, turning their noses toward the Su-35. This lets the Russians know that the Americans are looking straight down the barrel at them in an optimal targeting angle for their electronically scanned array radars, which guide missiles to their target. While the F-15s radars can still guide missiles to target at a variety of angles, the head-on angle is optimal and lets the Russians know that the Americans aren't messing around. Any sign of hostility will be met with immediate and lethal force. Now with the airspeed and height advantage, and well within the threat envelope of the Eagle's AIM-120's AMRAMs, the Russian Su-35 is in dire straits if it decides it wants to pick a fight. 
To make matters worse, ground-based air defenses are now in the game. Patriot air defense batteries use their powerful AN MPQ-65 radars to track and target the Russian fighter. The big phased array radar provides the Patriot system with classified range, believed to be in excess of 100 kilometers. It's a formidable air defense radar that uses a second traveling wave tube to boost the strength of the signal. This makes the AN MPQ-65 difficult to jam or spoof, even at a long range. The attack network to the U.S. military's Link-16 command and control network allows the Patriot battery to share information with a vast array of U.S. assets. Software upgrades throughout the 2000s and 2010s give the Patriot a greater capability to conduct TBM, or theater ballistic missile searches, a necessity spurred on by the growing danger from long-range ballistic missiles fielded by both Russia and China. The system can also engage targets at predetermined altitudes so as to neutralize the effects of chemical weapons or early release submunitions, which would otherwise be released across a wide area. The combination of software and radar is even able to tell if a contact is manned or unmanned, and if incoming ballistic objects re-entering the atmosphere are carrying ordnance or not. This makes the Patriot capable of resisting at least some of the most common countermeasures employed by ballistic missiles, such as releasing dummy warheads to lure in intercepting missiles. What makes the Patriot system work, however, is the Pac-2 and Pac-3 missiles. The Pac-3 missiles are the newest iteration of Patriot air defense missiles, but designed almost solely for the interception of ballistic missiles. The Pac-3 missile is slower and has a smaller range than the Pac-2, as it's intended to destroy ballistic missiles in their terminal phase. They also employ a hit-to-kill kinetic warhead armed with active radar that can be disconnected from ground stations and guide itself to a target, being smart enough to target the warhead portion of the missile. The kinetic kill warhead does employ a small explosive charge called a lethality enhancer, which launches 24 tungsten fragments in a radial direction to enhance kill probability. This makes the Pac-3 a much more sophisticated missile than the Pac-2, but also gives it extremely poor capabilities against a fast-flying and agile enemy fighter like the incoming Su-35. That's why Patriot batteries carry a mix of missiles, and it's the Pac-2's job to destroy incoming aircraft, which might threaten the Patriot battery itself. To do this, the Pac-2 employs a large fragmentation warhead, which is designed to shred enemy aircraft. A direct hit is not required to neutralize a fighter jet or a bomber, as these delicate machines require thousands of precisely engineered parts all working perfectly to stay in the air. Damage to even some of these systems can be lethal to the aircraft and the Pac-2 creates a vast cloud of high-speed shrapnel that shreds even the most armored enemy plane. In a wartime situation, a firing solution would have already been achieved, and the incoming Russian Su-35 would be facing threats from both airborne and ground-based missiles. But NATO and Russia are not at war, yet. Thus, the F-15 pilots are told not to engage unless they themselves are engaged, and instead are directed to intercept the Russian plane within visual range. It's a show of force with the F-15s placing themselves between the Su-35 and any further penetration into Polish territory. As expected, the Su-35 briefly crosses into Polish airspace, is met by the American F-15s, but doesn't push its luck and quickly turns its nose parallel to the F-15s. After a few minutes, the Russian fighter once more turns back for safe airspace, leaving the F-15 to loiter near the border and watch from a distance. It's yet another microaggression by Russia meant to simply show NATO that it's not afraid of it, though it very much should be. Russia's aging air fleet puts it in serious doubt that it could actually threaten NATO airspace in any significant manner, and the current sanctions against Russia has left it unable to procure the more sophisticated electronic components it relied on for producing its air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles. This means that as the war in Ukraine rages on, Russian stockpiles of weapons diminish daily, and it couldn't possibly hope to compete against the vast quantities of missiles NATO still holds in reserve. It's a possibility that NATO is eyeing war as an increasing likelihood given the invasion of Ukraine. What was once thought impossible is now at the forefront of every member of NATO. Could Russia really declare war on the alliance? And could it win? To answer the question, we have to imagine an alternate timeline where Russia forces weren't bogged down in a never-ending fight for Ukraine, and instead opted for a more direct provocation against NATO. February 24, 2022, Russian forces have been involved in a large-scale exercise with their allies in Belarus, but this has been a front to allow Russian forces to stage closer to the NATO countries of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. At 0600 local Moscow time, Russian autocrat Vladimir Putin releases a pre-recorded message relaying his intention to declare a special military operation meant to bring NATO aggression to heel. Right on cue, Russian missile strikes begin to rain down across Lithuania and Latvia. The first targets are military bases and airfields. The attack isn't a complete surprise to NATO, though, and the missile defense systems begin to knock Russian missiles out of the air. 
The Russian volley is overwhelming, and with a hit rate of 60%, missile strikes saturate military targets across the Baltic nations. Dozens of NATO's forward-deployed supply caches are destroyed, along with several key supply depots. Russia's long-range targeting capabilities, however, are deficient due to the 2014 sanctions against it and the banning of dual-use technology that crippled its space surveillance network. While many missiles hit their targets, many don't, often hitting civilian targets instead. After a blistering barrage lasting half an hour, Russia has failed to completely cripple the command and control or air defense networks of the two countries, and over half of the airfields remain operational. In the air, Russian planes piggyback on the missile assault. Thanks to NATO's superior long-range surveillance capability, its air forces are not caught completely off guard, and several combat air patrols have been on constant rotation ever since the military buildup along Russia's western military district and Belarus. But the incoming wave of air power is overwhelming for the few defenders in the sky, and from damaged airfields across the Baltics, NATO fighters are being rushed for combat. Their pilots, however, have to be recalled to base from their home or barracks, adding to the response time. The few fighters NATO manages to get in the air engage Russian targets with standoff attack long-range air-to-air missiles. These missiles allow NATO forces to operate from well outside the envelope of Russian ground-based air defenses, which ring the Baltic states. The first combat casualties of the Russian NATO war are Russian planes, but there are too few defenders and too many attackers to significantly stem the incoming air attack. With long-range missiles expended, NATO fighters are forced to move to positions just outside the threat range of the Russian S-400s and other mobile air defenses. Engaging Russian forces sent to neutralize them until forced to retreat to airfields in Latvia. With the missile onslaught and Russian air defenses in Kaliningrad on Lithuania's southern border, any surviving NATO aircraft can only be guaranteed some measure of safety further north in Latvia. But NATO has plenty of air defenses left operational, even after the opening missile barrage. In our real world, Russia proved unable to neutralize Ukraine's air defenses in its opening wave of attacks, despite having far superior air and long-range striking power. In this scenario, Russia is committing far more forces to the attack, but also facing far more sophisticated and better equipped defenses. As Russian planes are blotted out of the sky by air defenses, the Russian air offensive is briefly halted. Instead, more limited strikes against air defense networks are carried out by long-range standoff weapons. However, However, Russia has a limited availability of smart weapons, and its targeting capabilities are far inferior to NATO. Many air defense sites are destroyed or heavily damaged, with anti-radiation missiles taking out all important air defense radars, but defenses on the more western parts of the Baltics remain intact. Within minutes of hostilities, NATO's very high readiness response force has been activated. Soldiers on leave or at home are being recalled and a 5,000-strong response force of special forces, infantry, armor, and artillery is being assembled for immediate deployment. Within 48 hours, they'll be on the ground in the Baltics, ready to help stem the Russian onslaught. A few days later, they could be joined by NATO's response force, a rapid response force of 40,000 that includes combat air power and air support components. NATO maintains a contingent of around 1,000 strong of forward-deployed forces in the Baltics, and with the military buildup by Russia in recent weeks, this has been strengthened by an additional few thousand, along with several dozen aircraft. However, this is far insufficient to stop a Russian onslaught of 150,000 troops, even with Latvia and Lithuania's approximately 50,000 strong military. Of that number, not all are actual combat troops, with many being support and logistical personnel. So NATO's actual combat power in the ground numbers at barely over 12,000. Of more critical concern is the lack of tanks. Though Latvia and Lithuania both field nearly a thousand armored vehicles with some anti-tank capabilities. As Russian troops cross the border, NATO forces are ordered to retreat rather than engage the invaders. NATO's top general, Supreme Allied Commander General Todd D. Walters, is aware of the massive mismatch of forces across the Baltics. This exact scenario has been wargamed extensively, and the only chance NATO has of holding off the Russian military long enough for its response force to arrive is to force the Russians into fighting in major cities, where the terrain favors the defender and Russia's over overwhelming firepower can be largely neutered. However, it's always been accepted that it was strategically impossible to guarantee the security of the Baltic members of NATO, given that stationing enough troops to do so would have required massive commitments of forward-deployed soldiers from across the alliance, a costly proposition, and a hugely destabilizing move that would have guaranteed a conflict between Russia and NATO much sooner than this. NATO will fight as best it can to hold the Baltics open for as long as possible, but its main response force already has plans to launch a counterattack from Poland, planning for the fall of Latvia and Lithuania within the first few days of fighting. Already Polish troops are digging in for an assault, either from Kaliningrad or Belarus, but such an assault won't be forthcoming. Russia's strategy to break NATO is to target the relatively undefended Baltic states, and then simply dig in. NATO will then have to decide if it wants to invoke Article 5 of the alliance's charter, stating that an attack on one is an attack on all, knowing that they'll be fighting an offensive war against an entrenched enemy in a conflict that could turn nuclear. 
Russia is betting that NATO's resolve is weak and it won't risk escalating the war. The assurance of mutual defense is a bedrock principle of NATO and should it fail, the alliance could be splintered. The United States, Poland, and the United Kingdom are staunchly committed to invoking Article 5 in any case of hostilities, but other member nations might not be as committed to waging war for countries that many of them weren't happy about joining NATO anyway. Some of them, like Germany, have deep financial ties to Russia already, and an end to Russian energy for Germany will be economically catastrophic. Only the coming days will determine if NATO invokes Article 5 in full. But for now, what is sure is that even if Russia is facing just Poland, the UK, and the US, it's still facing a significantly powerful force. The US just has to get its firepower to Europe first, a process that will take weeks to fully mature. In our fictional scenario, though, the US hasn't been blind to Russia's buildup of forces along its western military district and in Belarus. In this scenario, an invasion of Ukraine was possible, but the buildup of forces and supply depots along the borders with the Baltic states tipped Russia's hand weeks ago. Still, the US has delayed in deploying the bulk of its firepower to Europe in hopes of not destabilizing the situation further. But that doesn't mean it hasn't taken steps to move a significant force to its bases in Germany. A large contingent of its air power has also been moved to bases in mainland Europe and the UK and is now preparing for combat with the Russian Air Force. This has been a conflict the US Air Force has been waiting for for a very long time. Its F-15 Fighting Eagle was designed to kill Soviet MiGs, but today it's more than capable of sweeping the skies clear of Russian fighters. The US's F-35 fleet isn't fully operational yet, but dozens of the advanced stealthy planes are ready for combat, and as the Russians will soon find out, are absolutely game-changing. NATO's strategy is simple. Draw the Russians into NATO territory and away from their logistics hubs inside Russia and Belarus. Logistics has always been the Russian military's weakest point, and in our real world, a lack of logistical support has severely affected the Russian military's ability to fight in Ukraine. This is because Russian forces are simply not capable by design of fighting major land offensives far from their own borders. This sounds strange, given that Russia's greatest potential conflict was a major land war in Europe, so it seems like it should be something that the Russian military would be prepared for. Yet, for all the focus on new hypersonic missiles, overwhelming amounts of artillery, thousands of tanks and APCs, etc., etc., the Russian military has failed to learn the lesson it's been forcibly taught over and over again throughout history. A military can't fight without fuel, food, and ammo. Russian logistics focus on rail transportation, with an incredible capability to move troops and equipment within their own borders quickly and efficiently. Russian internal logistics are probably some of the best in the world, and they even have an entire corps dedicated to railway transportation, its building, repairing, and maintenance. But Russian railways stop at the Soviet Union's old borders. That's because Russia uses a wider gauge railroad track than the rest of Europe meaning that their plan to resupply forces via railroads stop at the Baltics in Ukraine. Adjustable carriages do exist, but engines cannot be made adjustable to fit both the Soviet rails and newer European rails. Thus, Russia would have to seize European engines to drive their railroad carriages into Europe proper. But NATO would never allow those engines to fall into the hands of the Russians for this exact reason. But whether delivering supplies to a railhead their trains can actually reach, or deeper into Europe with seized European engines, Russia still has a serious problem with logistics. Mainly, there aren't enough logistics personnel or equipment for the job of supplying all of its forces. Each Russian combined arms army is allotted a single material technical support brigade. Each material technical support brigade has two truck battalions with a total of 150 general cargo trucks with 50 trailers and 260 specialized trucks per brigade. The further an army moves from the railhead, the less trips that its resupply trucks can undertake, increasing the total length of time for resupply. At the current number of trucks available, there are simply not enough trucks for the operation more than a few dozen miles from a railhead, and that's before taking into account losses due to enemy activity and equipment breakdown. Take for instance Russia's heavy use of rocket artillery. Each Russian army has approximately 56 to 90 multiple launch rocket systems, and resupplying a single launcher takes up the entire bed of a truck. So if the entire MLRS force fired just one volley, it would require up to 90 trucks solely for resupplying ammunition. Those trucks then could not be used for anything else, like for example ferrying the fuel the MLRS needs to drive to a new location, or food or water or ammunition for the men manning the systems. Just a Russian army MLRS attachment is already taking up a significant amount of Russia's logistical capabilities, leaving the rest of its forces, tanks, APCs, infantry, tube artillery, with much fewer trucks for their own resupply needs. And again, this is before taking into account the fact that Russian logistics will be under constant enemy attack. 
or if that resupply is further diminished the further from a safe railhead the Russian offensive moves. In our hypothetical scenario, NATO understands this all too well. And that's why, as their forces retreat to pull the Russians deeper into NATO territory, Special Operations Forces launch raids against Russian supply convoys before melting back into the countryside. NATO's strategy is to put up a mobile defense that keeps the Russians firing and burning gas, but places a tactical victory always just out of their grasp. Russian units are equipped to be independent of resupply for three to five days, but in intense urban combat, those figures shrink dramatically to just three days at best. By the dawn of the fourth day of fighting, Russian forces are forced to cease their advance toward Riga, starved of ammunition, food, water, and fuel. In Lithuania, though, they have managed to capture Vilnius, though partisan fighters are making the Russians suffer in street-to-street -street fighting. With superior reconnaissance capabilities, NATO was able to pinpoint Russian air defenses and send wild weasel aircrafts on a mission to destroy them. Taking from the example of Russian performance in Ukraine today, these suppression of enemy air defense missions succeed with astounding success. For longer-range S-400 and older S-300 batteries, F-35s equipped with glide bombs are able to overwhelm their missile defenses and destroy them without the S-400 ever getting off a single shot. Loitering MiGs defending from air attack are likewise unable to pick off the F-35s until they get to within close range, which very few manage to do without getting blown out of the sky. However, the number of F-35s is limited, which is where their capability to network with non-stealthy fourth-generation planes comes into play. With their advanced data links, F-35s are able to guide target bombs and missiles fired by non-stealthy planes who can carry out attacks far outside the threat envelope of Russian defenses. The results are devastating, and though a dozen F-35s are lost in combat, Russian air defenses are savagely mauled. The greatest factor of NATO's success, however, is Russia's own incompetence. Our real-world invasion of Ukraine has proven that the modern Russian military is nowhere near the formidable beast that Europe has feared. In fact, they're barely capable of carrying out modern combat operations, and it's only their overwhelming numbers that are seeing them slowly defeat Ukraine's forces. On the tactical level, we've seen time and again as Russian tank commanders don't make use of dismounted infantry to protect the tanks from anti-tank kill teams, leading to numerous deadly ambushes by Ukrainian forces using NATO anti anti-tank missiles. We've also seen as Russian forces practice no discernible convoy security procedures, with their convoys often coming to a complete stop at crossroads and other danger crossings, and without deploying security elements on their flanks to delay an enemy attack and allow the convoy to push through. Even their ability to prevent friendly fire incidents through discipline and communications is under question, as more than once, Russian units have engaged in full-blown battles between each other, much to the observing Ukrainians' delight. Perhaps most baffling of all is the destruction of Russian air defenses inside a convoy by Ukrainian aircraft, even when at a complete stop for several hours. Their Russian crews never bothered to turn on their radar and scan for threats. The scenario has also repeated itself numerous times. Lastly, we've seen time and again how Russian forces fail to properly respond to Ukraine Ukrainian ambushes. When caught in an ambush, the proper procedure is to either fight out of the ambush or assault through it. Instead, Russian forces are often seen scattering in a panic, while their comrades who stayed behind actually to assault the ambush are obliterated one by one. Forces outside of the ambush zone are commonly observed to either drive away in a panic or come to a complete stop and begin to back up. Instead, forces outside of an ambush should be deploying for a flanking assault on the ambushing enemy force, neutralizing the threat to their comrades stuck in the kill zone. All we've seen so far in Ukraine is indicative of one thing. The Russian military is largely poorly trained. But they're also operating equipment in various stages of disrepair. Some units enjoy more modern, well-maintained equipment and are appropriately deadly, but many others seem to be suffering from serious maintenance and modernity problems. Russian tanks, for instance, are being savaged by Ukrainian infantry armed with anti-tank missiles not just because of poor tactics in their deployment, but also because they lack active protection systems such as Trophy, which an increasing number of US combat vehicles are equipped with. They seem to also lack environmental sensors to help them pinpoint the source of the attack, leading to confusion and panic after an attack only made worse by poor discipline, training, and ever-shrinking morale. Often vaunted for its electronic warfare capabilities, the Russian military has proven itself incapable of securing its own communications in its invasion of Ukraine. As it turns out, an astonishing number of Russian units operate on completely unsecured radios. This has allowed the Ukrainian military and even amateur radio operators to interfere with and jam Russian radios. Ukrainians have hopped onto Russian frequencies to insult their invaders, play the Ukrainian national anthem on repeat for days at a time, and even jammed the frequency with white noise, revealing messages or images when analyzed digitally. 
digitally. Against NATO, unsecured communications spell disaster for the Russian military, as NATO electronic warfare operatives don't just jam Russian communications, but actively use them for sabotage. False orders are relayed over unsecured radios, causing entire Russian units to move out of formation or even launch attacks against phantom targets. Fluent Russian speakers wreak havoc on Russian forces simply by hijacking their unsecured comms. But because they must be very close to the front line to do so, their effectiveness is limited. As NATO's response force finally prepares for a proper engagement against Russian forces, their air forces launch a devastating assault from the air. American B-2 stealth bombers penetrate into Russian air defenses to destroy important communication hubs and surveillance radars, throwing air defenses into disarray. Much like in the first Gulf War, when Iraq used air defense networks modeled after Russia's own, these precision strikes by stealthy aircraft proved to be crippling for the air defense capabilities of Russian units. Add in serious resupply problems after constant missile and air attacks against Russian railways and strategically important bridges, and the Russian army's capability to defend itself in the air falls largely to its aerospace forces. But here too, NATO has the advantage. Russian pilots struggle to keep a 120-hour flight time minimum per year, while NATO pilots regularly fly nearly twice as many hours to maintain their proficiency. Maintenance problems also affect the Russian aerospace forces. In our real world, we saw two Russian aircraft simply fall out of the sky on the first day of Ukrainian invasion due to maintenance issues, and across the broader Russian Air Force we can expect similar levels of unreadiness. But it's better avionics, sensors, and longer-range anti-air missiles coupled with a sprinkling of F-35s that prove decisive in the sky. In the largest air battle since World War II, NATO forces wrestle control of the skies over the front away from the Russians, resulting in dozens of casualties on both sides. This opens up the greater use of air support to attack Russian army formations, though. And here again, another of NATO's strengths over Russia comes into play. Very few Russian pilots have multi role experience, while NATO pilots regularly fly both air superiority and air strike missions. For a NATO plane, switching from shooting down MiGs to blowing up tanks is as simple as switching the plane's munitions. But Russian air forces must use dedicated aircraft and crews for each mission. The lack of flexibility hurts Russian forces badly in Ukraine, especially in the opening days of the war. And this is why historically Russia relies heavily on artillery for fire support, not aircraft. Logistic problems have starved Russian artillery of ammunition, though, and even when fully supplied, Russian artillery is not very flexible. Needing to always stay under an umbrella of ground-based fire support has also significantly slowed Russia's advance. While NATO forces can better exploit tactical opportunities, thanks to their reliance on air power for fire support. Now NATO is on the offensive on the ground, not just in the air, and the final critical weakness of the Russian military is revealed. NATO attacks Russian formations across multiple fronts with smaller but much more maneuverable forces. This exploits an inherent weakness of the Russian battalion tactical group, which is its inability to coordinate fire support against attacks coming from multiple directions. A lack of maneuver forces held in reserve also limits the Russian BTG's ability to respond to various new fronts at the same time. NATO's aggressive attacks across multiple fronts throws Russian commanders into disarray due to an inherent limitation in their command and control systems. Their electronic warfare and direct fire assets are formidable, but incapable of focusing across a wide front. By comparison, the decentralized command structure of NATO forces allows them to maneuver three times as many units simultaneously, with each formation acting semi-autonomously and pursuing objectives and opportunities as they arise. The result is like a giant trying to swat away hundreds of bees attacking simultaneously. Where Russian blows land, they're devastating, and numerous NATO units are annihilated in fierce close-quarter combat. But while one front is being reinforced, a completely different front is being attacked, causing confusion and chaos at the command level. NATO's own electronic warfare assets and fire support only add to the quickly gathering fog of war that the Russian chain of command is suddenly finding itself fighting in. As nighttime rolls around, though, things go from bad to worse for Russian forces. As observed in Ukraine, Russian night attack capabilities are uneven and sporadic. Many soldiers lack basic night vision, and NATO tanks and armored vehicles have on the whole more capable sensors and imagers. This allows NATO vehicles to open up first and from further away. American Abrams Silver Bullets prove particularly deadly versus Russian armor, just like they did against Russian tanks in the first Gulf War. T-72s make up the bulk of Russian armor, and while domestic models are better protected than export models provided to Iraq, the results are largely the same. T-90s fare better against NATO's more modern tanks, but there's simply too few of them and the front is too wide. The vaunted T-14, which was supposed to revolutionize tank warfare, never made it to full-scale production thanks to sanctions against Russia and its sputtering economy. The fight is not bloodless for NATO forces, though, and casualties quickly climb into the thousands after days of fierce fighting, with hundreds of armored vehicles lost on both sides. However, NATO operational superiority, high morale, better training, and largely more capable equipment proves to be decisive. Perhaps more than anything else, though, it's Russia's logistics that doom its military offensive into the Baltics. NATO forces have been savagely attacking Russian supply contracts 
convoys, even at the cost of foregoing attacks against tank and artillery positions. NATO knows it's far more important to disrupt Russia's ability to resupply its forces than to actually destroy said forces. And now with Russian troops deep in the Baltics and far from their rail network, their supply difficulties increase exponentially with each truck lost. The Russian military has been pressing civilian trucks into service, but ongoing attacks against supply convoys and even the destruction of public roads makes resupply increasingly impossible. By a week of proper ground fighting between the two sides, Russian troops are surrendering in mass and abandoning their vehicles. We saw this in our real world in Ukraine, and continue to see it as Russia struggles to fix its logistics problems. Ukrainian forces have discovered entire convoys of Russian tanks and APCs abandoned due to a lack of fuel or food, their crews trying to hike back to friendly lines. Against a far more capable force such as NATO, these logistical problems become critical vulnerabilities that spell disaster for the Russian military. It's the same story across every facet of the Russian military that has proven to be, in the words of the retired American Major General Paul Eaton, unexpectedly incompetent and incapable of combined arms warfare. Stalin had a famous adage when asked about the West's technological superiority, quantity is a quality all its own. That might have been true back in his day, but today no amount of quantity can make up for the Russian military's complete lack of basic fundamentals. While a NATO-Russian war would be devastating for both sides, in a non-nuclear scenario Russia has proven in its bungled invasion of Ukraine that it has no hope of victory against the obviously superior North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Snipers, bodyguards armed with handguns that can punch through body armor, helicopter gunships, and trained attack bears. We only made one of those up. But the protection of the President of Russia is absolutely insane. The American President has the Secret Service, and his counterpart in Russia has their own elite bodyguard unit, the Presidential Security Service. Part of the Federal Protective Service, this arm of the Russian government is responsible for protecting high-ranking Russian government figures and has a whopping 50,000 employees. The PSS, though, is only responsible for protecting the Russian president and prime minister, and they are very good at their job. Much of the way the PSS operates is similar to the way the American Secret Service operates, but this isn't copycatting, it's simply because the fundamentals of security don't change no matter what country you're in. However, the PSS has at least one additional requirement that the American Secret Service doesn't when dealing with the president as image-conscious as Vladimir Putin. Long before the Russian president steps foot on a plane to a new meeting or a vacation spot, his security team is already hard at work. Every single destination needs to be thoroughly checked for a wide variety of potential threats, and this includes every single road to be traveled and potential stop or visit. The first threat analyzed is the criminal one. A large number of organized crime syndicates would profit greatly from the abduction or even assassination of a government leader. Just imagine what Mexican cartels would do to get their hands on the American president. Thus, the Russian president's security detail meticulously analyzes the criminal threat to the president directly, or to any asset the president might be using during his travels. The last thing Putin's security detail wants is to accidentally travel down a road well known for frequent gun battles between rival criminal gangs, even if they probably seriously outgun any street gang on planet Earth. Next on the agenda is analyzing any potential for social unrest. The president's security detail will work to make sure that any potential travel route or visit avoids locations that are potentially hotspots for citizen unrest. Imagine what might happen if Xi Jinping had traveled through Hong Kong during the massive riots that rocked the city, or if the American president's travel plans had included a road trip through the city of Ferguson during its own social unrest. However, this part of the screening process includes analyzing the potential for social unrest actually inspired by the president himself. Putin has proven to be a particularly divisive figure in Russia, and frequently the target of ire by pro-democracy groups, LGBTQ rights activists, and women's rights activists. Once, Putin was accosted by feminist protesters during a visit to Hanover. While it's doubtful the protesters would have caused any actual harm, his bodyguards were immediately on hand to ensure Putin wasn't harmed or potentially embarrassed. Safeguarding the president from social unrest, he may inspire himself, includes carefully vetting any visitors or attendees to events Putin goes to, and even blacklisting individuals or groups from participating. Next is analyzing the possibility of natural disasters in the area the president might be visiting. This is done by looking at historical data and gaining access to good long-range weather forecasting. Some natural disasters can be easily predicted, or at least given a good probability of occurring or not. This includes seasonal events such as flooding and typhoons. Others, however, are completely unpredictable such as earthquakes or Kylie Jenner dropping her own album. In either case, the president's protection detail needs to have a well-established contingency plan that includes the capability to escape a natural disaster entirely before or after it's struck. 
If escape is impossible, the protection detail must have the necessary tools to shelter in place while the Russian military enacts a plan to extract the president. Lastly is a concern unique to Russia's current and very image-conscious Vladimir Putin. The last thing the president detail can let happen is to let the Russian president be assassinated. The second to last thing is to let him look foolish. For Vladimir Putin, this is especially important as the current Russian president has worked to carefully cultivate a strong, manly image through various photo shoots which include him sun tanning in the Russian wilderness, riding a horse shirtless, joining an underwater research excursion, swimming in a wild Russian lake, and hunting shirtless for some reason. While these photo shoots have been very successful at growing his popularity with segments of the Russian population, other Russians have fought back by making Vladimir Putin the most memeable world leader. Thus, the Presidential Protective Service has to be ever conscious of how a visit could affect the Russian president's public image. A month out from a potential visit, security experts inspect the location and especially the accommodations where the president will be staying. The location is carefully checked for any potential security vulnerabilities and any employees are carefully vetted by the security team. Lastly, every single item inside the president's accommodations is inspected and repaired well before his arrival. That way, during the stay, there is no need for any technician or repairman to visit. With just a few weeks before the president's stay, technical experts install radio and cell signal jammers. These devices will help prevent any potential IEDs or planted explosives from being detonated via radio or cell phone. However, it also helps to ensure the president isn't potentially spied on by hidden electronics that a sweep might have missed. Unique to the Russian president's security detail is the ability to ping any and all smart devices in proximity to where the president is expected to stay or travel. Russian laws allow the president's security team to use tapping hardware and software on any electronic device they believe will be in proximity to the president. They're also given the authority to execute body searches without the same legal restrictions a police officer might have, gain access to absolutely any building or organization, and seize any vehicle they may deem necessary for the protection of the president or that might pose a threat. So, who gets to protect one of the most powerful men in the world? First, you must be over 21 but younger than 35 at the time of application. You also have to be able to complete a stringent physical exam, so only those in peak physical shape should even think of applying. Next, you must be between 175 and 190 centimeters so that you're physically large enough to shield the president with your own body, but not so tall as to experience difficulty in tight physical confines or draw attention to yourself. The requirements to join the Presidential Security Service are surprisingly similar to that of the American Secret Service. Combat experience is not required, and in fact, good candidates are more defensively minded than offensive. That's because, as explained by a former Presidential Security Service employee, a soldier is meant to attack, but a bodyguard is meant to defend and protect. Being a presidential bodyguard can be much more challenging than being a soldier, as most of the threats that a presidential security service member will face are going to be clandestine. A good candidate must have an excellent attention to detail and only the best of situational awareness. Any member in a crowd can be a potential attacker, and even the sweet old lady waiting in line to shake the president's hand could be carrying a hidden gun in her purse. A good bodyguard must keep an eye on a wide variety of potential threat vectors, and yet remain aware enough to react to a completely unexpected threat. Even more important though is the psychological component. A president's bodyguard's job is not to apprehend or eliminate an attacker, but to protect the president, even at the cost of their own life. Thus, while a normal police officer or soldier might have the instinct to neutralize an attacker first, a Russian president's bodyguard will instead put themselves between the president and the threat even before drawing their pistol. This is why defensive thinking is more important than offensive thinking. The Presidential Security Service must also be well-versed in different languages given the Russian president's frequent travel abroad. This is so agents can understand if any threat is present in the area by listening to and understanding the conversations of the locals. Next, they must have a good sense for proper etiquette in politics while remaining tactful at all times. In this video, a security team member tactfully asks UFC fighter Conor McGregor to remove his arm from around Putin's shoulder. A big no-no that could have caused an embarrassing public incident if the bodyguard had overreacted. This is also why only calm and level-headed individuals are allowed to guard the most powerful man in Russia. The last thing President Putin needed here was an over-anxious bodyguard making a scene with a major public figure like McGregor. We have to admit though, the entire staff of the infographic show would love to have seen a Russian presidential bodyguard go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a UFC champion, and our money is on the bodyguard. That's because of the incredible training they undergo. 
Details are very scarce given the secrecy of the Russian government, but it's known that much like their American counterparts, Russian presidential bodyguards are experts in hand-to-hand -hand combat and have incredible stamina and tolerance for extreme heat and cold. Even the coldest conditions, these men must be able to tolerate the weather in only light overcoats, since heavy overcoats would hinder their agility and ability to move quickly. Rumors even have it that the Russian presidential bodyguards take a variety of drugs that directly affect their physiology. This could include the use of amphetamines for alertness or perhaps even human growth hormones or steroids to increase strength and endurance. Again, given the secrecy of the Russian government, these remain only rumors. But would you really be surprised to learn that Vladimir Putin is protected by a team of bodyguards jacked up on experimental super soldier serums? While the president is out and about, the PSS operates almost exactly as the American Secret Service. First, the president is closely protected by a team of elite bodyguards who are ever-present and within feet of him at all times. These men are trained to put themselves directly in the path of an attacker and take a bullet for the Russian president if necessary. As such, they carry body armor under their suits or jackets, and even carry special bulletproof briefcases which can be used as shields. They also carry well-concealed handguns capable of punching through body armor at a range of up to 50 meters, and submachine guns. Sometimes they even carry Kevlar umbrellas, which can protect from bullets and shrapnel. Next is the president's second circle of protection, arguably the most important. These individuals are usually invisible and don't look like government agents at all. That's because they're trained to blend into crowds so as to ascertain threats from within. They'll dress like regular civilians and work the crowd, identifying troublemakers and radioing their teammates about potential threats or individuals to be concerned about. They're also meant to act before an attacker has even had a chance to threaten the president. An individual suddenly shoving others out of the way might just be an overeager fan or a deranged gunman, and it's the second circle's job to neutralize them before they get a chance to threaten the president. The third circle of protection works along the perimeter of the crowd and carefully checks for threats from the outside. These agents will be dressed like their comrades, both to identify them as security detail members, but also to make themselves a threat and discourage an attack. If the president's security detail is highly visible and in large numbers, it can act as a visual deterrent discouraging a would-be attacker by making them believe they'd just fail anyway. The fourth circle of protection is made up of elite spotters and snipers situated in tactically advantageous points around the president's location. Their job is not just to keep an eye on the crowd and act accordingly, but even more importantly to act as counter-snipers. As the greatest threat to the president is going to come from a sniper, the president's own snipers have to be able to identify the most likely threat vectors for a sniper attack and keep tabs on them, and act to accurately and immediately neutralize any threat. Lastly, the Russian president is typically escorted by a special unit of heavily armed security personnel. These heavies are responsible for extracting the president from any potential situation or for neutralizing a heavily militarized threat to the president. They're capable of protecting not just from a human threat, but of employing anti-tank and anti-aircraft weapons to protect against heavy vehicles and airborne threats. On February 24, 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin sought to make his mark on Russian history by restoring Ukraine to a puppet state and pushing NATO back and away from its borders. Instead, President Putin will go down in history as the man who made NATO great again and even added additional countries to its roster. But why is Russia so scared of Finland and Sweden joining NATO? The Russian invasion of Ukraine was provoked in large part by the nation's refusal to submit to the Kremlin authority. After a presidential coup in 2014, Ukraine looked like it was on a path to join the West and leave Russia behind. Enshrined in its constitution was an amendment that Ukraine would pursue NATO membership as a matter of highest priority, and work began on meeting the requirements for entry into the alliance. For Russia's President Vladimir Putin, this was beyond unacceptable. Historically, Russia has suffered greatly from European invaders, ranging from the French during the Napoleonic Wars to the Germans in both world wars. After the Second World War, though, Eastern Europe was severely weakened and an opportunity opened up for the Soviet Union to expand its sphere of influence all the way to Germany itself. This wasn't just a power grab, though. It was a matter of vital national security for the Russians. By creating a slew of client states across Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union had in essence created a buffer between itself and Western Europe. Now any invasion could be met outside of native territory, saving the lives of millions of Russian citizens and preserving the economy of the nation. A buffer between itself and a potential invader is especially important because Russia's strategic position in Europe is extremely weak. The nation sits at the eastern end of the Great European Plain, a vast stretch of flat territory that is impossible to defend. 
Historically, Russian forces have struggled to hold off invaders coming from its west as the landscape offers few natural defensive features, and with the advent of modern high-speed warfare, the strategic picture only grew grimmer for the Russians. During World War II, the only thing slowing the German advances was sheer grit and determination from the Russian defenders, who tried to choke the mighty German war machine by throwing hordes of men at it. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, freed former client states like Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia were all quick to pursue NATO membership. For them, it was a matter of national survival. The Soviet Union might have collapsed, but nobody was foolish enough to think that the new Russian Federation had simply given up on its desire to control Eastern Europe. For existing NATO members, though, the consideration was a difficult one. Technically, the three Baltic states offer very little to the alliance and are more of a liability than an asset, except in one very important regard their location on Russia's flank. Adopting the three Baltic countries into NATO now opened up a wide front on the Russian northwestern flank, which threw Russia's force disposition wildly off balance. For decades, NATO had contended with very real possibilities that, in case of a war, they would be unable to stop a concentrated attack across the infamous Fulda Gap in Germany, with Norway offering no opportunity for NATO to seriously threaten the Soviet Union from its tiny border with the Union. The Soviets were able to concentrate the bulk of their firepower in East Germany for a decisive and brutal attack straight into the heart of NATO. After the adoption of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania into NATO, however, the alliance now could threaten Russia right on its own doorstep, across a very wide front, and this forced the new Russian Federation to more widely disperse its forces. To add to Russia's problems, the terrain across the Baltic front is very poorly suited for defensive operations, requiring even more troops to secure its border in the region. Now Russia's strategic position was greatly weakened, as it was forced to disperse its forces across numerous probable engagement areas. It also put the military enclave of Kaliningrad in serious jeopardy, as NATO could threaten it from the south through Poland and from the north through Lithuania. Finally, it severely weakened Russia's position in the Baltic Sea, as NATO ships had friendly ports across the eastern side of the Baltic Sea and could easily bottleneck the Russian fleet, much like the British did the Germans in both world wars. The balance of power in Europe had been irrevocably thrown askew and now favored the NATO alliance in case of a war. The addition of Ukraine would have been an unmitigated disaster, as now Russia would be flanked by NATO both to the northwest and the south, with Moscow just a few hundred miles in either direction for hostile forces. Even more importantly, Ukraine's ascension to NATO would have given the alliance complete and unmitigated control over the Black Sea, shutting Russian Black Sea ports off from the world and giving the alliance incredible control over the sea routes that Russia relies on for both imports and exports. The military invasion of Ukraine has, for now at least, put a stop to Ukraine's joining of either the EU or NATO, but in response, Sweden and Finland, two nations that have remained staunchly neutral, are now in very serious discussions about joining the alliance. In fact, by the time you watch this video, they may have already expressed publicly their desire to do so. Finland has a troubled history with Russia. During World War II, the Soviet Union invading Finland under the auspices of increasing security for the important seaport of St. Petersburg. At first, Stalin gave the Finns an ultimatum, grant us several dozen miles of border territory so we can ensure the security of St. Petersburg, then named Leningrad. In exchange, the Soviets would grant Finland several miles of completely useless territory along the northern border. Finland naturally refused, and Stalin used this as an excuse for war. Historians debate whether Stalin ever meant to fully capture Finland or not, though the evidence is strong that he did, given that he enacted a puppet Finnish communist government in occupied territories. Plus, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact with Germany meant the Soviets didn't need to fear German intervention nor a possible German threat from the south, freeing them up for a full invasion of Finland. The capture of Finland would have granted them access to Finland's natural resources and allowed them to establish greater control over the Baltic Sea. However, Stalin's ambition would never come to pass, as Finland proved to be a lot tougher than the Soviets had thought. Finnish resistance fought a staunch defensive war in terrain that heavily favored it. However, it was largely the Soviet Union's own military that led to a ceasefire three months later with meager territorial gains. Stalin had, in his paranoia, carried out large purges of the Red Army, eliminating many senior leaders whom he viewed as a threat to his rule. While this might have secured his political office, it left the Soviet Army without experienced professional officers, replaced instead with politically indoctrinated and loyal stooges who cared more about ensuring political loyalty than actually discipline and training. The price to the Soviet Union was great in manpower and resources, though it did win approximately 9% of Finland's territory, more than originally asked for. However, its international standing was severely hurt, which in turn affected just how much aid it would later receive in its war against Germany. Perhaps more tragic of all for the Soviets, though, is the fact that the war proved to Hitler that the Soviet Union was a weak and effective power. 
a clumsy giant with a large military but not good at wielding it. This convinced Hitler that invading the Soviet Union was possible after all, even while at war with the Western Allies, and would cost the Soviets millions of lives. Given its history with the Soviets, Finland remained neutral throughout the Cold War and sought instead to appease Moscow by establishing bilateral relations. While it cooperated with NATO forces and international missions, it did not wish to join the alliance for fear of provoking its next-door neighbor. Sweden likewise had maintained a policy of cooperation but neutrality with the West, believing it to be safer to remain neutral than potentially provoke a Russian retaliation. For 75 years, public opinion polls in both nations showed that the majority of citizens wished to remain neutral, and it isn't hard to see why. In case of war, their countries were right next door to Russia, while most of NATO was still far from the Russian border. The heaviest fighting of any war would be taking place on their soil. However, after February 24th, the security situation in Europe has been completely rewritten, and public opinion polls mirror that, with, for the first time in their history, a majority of Finnish and Swedish citizens wishing to join NATO. The invasion of Ukraine has proven to the two longtime neutral countries that if Russia doesn't like what's going on inside your borders, it's very likely to invite itself in and change matters how it sees fit. Now Finland and Sweden have a reason to fear that their neutrality is no longer a security guarantee, and any prior agreement with Russia is essentially worthless. After all, Ukraine had an agreement with Russia to preserve its independence in exchange for Cold War-era Soviet nuclear weapons left behind on its territory after the fall of the Union. For Russia, Sweden and Finland's accession to NATO would mean that it's essentially blocked from the Baltic Sea in case of hostilities. Now, NATO members would threaten Russian ships on all sides and allow NATO navies to operate right off of Russia's own shores by providing nearby replenishment and resupply. American aircraft carriers could, for instance, operate safely inside the Baltic Sea for the first time in history after a thorough sweep of the Russian Baltic fleet by NATO ships. Having two or more American supercarriers parked right off its own shore is a nightmare scenario for Russia, as it would be for any country, and the accession of the two Nordic countries to NATO would make this possible. Finland and Sweden joining NATO also turns the entire Nordic Peninsula into a NATO enclave, effectively hemming in the Russians on two sides. NATO air defense installations in Finland could seriously threaten deep parts of Russian territory, limiting the use of Russia's air forces in case of a war. It also places dozens of strategically important targets within striking range of NATO aircraft at the immediate onset of war, forcing Russia to more widely disperse its defensive forces and weakening them, while hampering its ability to launch offensive operations. Even more important though, as Vladimir Putin sought to improve Russia's security situation against NATO, Finland's membership would mean that instead, Putin created an additional 800 miles of vulnerability thanks to Finland's shared border with Russia. This now places NATO forces less than 60 miles from St. Petersburg and with easy striking distance of additional Russian targets to the north. While Russia might have difficulty moving a few dozen miles into enemy territory to seize a major city, NATO's swift and agile military would have no similar difficulties, and Putin knows this, which is why he's so terrified of NATO gaining a significant presence so close to vulnerable Russian territory. It's unlikely Sweden and Finland will be deterred from joining NATO thanks to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. NATO itself has vowed to fast-track the two countries' memberships, largely thanks to the fact that both Sweden and Finland already fulfill most of the requirements for membership. NATO's five requirements for membership include new members must uphold democratic values and enshrine protections for minority populations, embracing and tolerating diversity. New members must be making progress toward a market economy. This is a Cold War era leftover, as potential new Eastern European members struggle to throw off the Soviet economic system forced on them. Military forces of new members must be under the firm control of civilian authorities. Military dictatorships need not apply. New members must respect the sovereignty of other nations and be good neighbors. Potential members must be working toward compatibility with NATO forces. This means that their military command structure, training, and equipment must meet strict standards to ensure that a new member is not a liability in time of war. Equipment used by a new member must also show some degree of interoperability with other NATO members to ease the burden of logistics. If 29 of the NATO members are using a specific caliber rifle, but a 30th is using a different caliber, it makes logistics for the 30th member much more difficult. NATO members must be able to share and use equipment in time of war. Sweden and Finland are both vibrant democracies with strong liberal values, unlike authoritarian Russia. Their militaries are both very well equipped and extremely proficient easily meeting NATO training and operational standards. Membership into the alliance can be fast-tracked for both countries, seeing as they so easily fit the NATO mold already. However, there is a fear that Vladimir Putin will retaliate before both countries can formally join NATO and enjoy Article 5 protection of the alliance. 
He's already stated that there would be severe military and economic consequences if either nation sought out NATO membership. For this reason, NATO has already approved temporary commitment to protect both nations during the application process, which could still take months. This way, Russia cannot bully or intimidate Sweden or Finland as they contemplate this momentous decision, and the two nations are free to choose for themselves what path to take to national security. Given Russia's performance in Ukraine, it's highly unlikely that it will risk war against Finland and Sweden's completely modern militaries in order to prevent them from joining NATO. Right now, Russia can only afford to lose one war at a time, and even without NATO, both Finland and Sweden working together could make a Russian attack against them an extremely costly one that would see little political or territorial gain. Given that the terrain itself is far more suitable for defensive operations, it seems unlikely that Russia will seek to stop both countries' accession via military means, but it does not eliminate the threat of nuclear attack, a recourse many fear Putin is more than capable of turning to in the face of his military's ineptitude. Without NATO membership, Sweden and Finland are not covered under the American nuclear umbrella the way other nations are, and remain vulnerable to this final and most dramatic of intimidation tactics. A recruit forced to live with a fractured neck. Another had his legs and genitals amputated. What do they have in common? They were violently hazed in the Russian military. The Russian armed forces have tried to move away from a conscription service ever since the early 2000s, when it became clear that if they were to compete against professional Western militaries, they would need their own fully volunteer military force. Historically, conscripts have vastly underperformed versus professional soldiers due to worse morale and esprit de corps, but conscription also severely weakens a military in one key area, expertise. When a military over relies on conscripts, it's reduced to a constantly rotating body of soldiers, which leaves that military without any professional veterans. This lack of veterancy severely negatively impacts the performance of any military and leads to a weak non-commissioned or junior officer corps, a problem Russia is intimately familiar with and largely explains its terrible performance in Ukraine. Russia has been unable to transition to an all-volunteer military despite efforts to boost pay and benefits. However, it has managed to reduce its dependency on conscripts greatly. Today, about a third of the Russian military is made up of conscripts. And these conscripts are typically assigned to rear area jobs such as logistics, maintenance, and artillery corps. Russia's frontline forces, at least in theory, are fully professional, and under Russian law, conscripts cannot be used for military action outside of Russia's borders. As we've seen in Ukraine, though, Russian law means little, even for Russians as conscripts make up a significant portion of the forces fighting there. Russia has two conscription drives a year. The first is in the fall and lasts from October to December 31st, and the second is in the spring, lasting from April 1st to July 15th. All men aged 18 to 27 are eligible for conscription, though teenagers as young as 16 have been pressed into service. Corruption is prevalent throughout the length and breadth of the Russian military, however, and conscripts can often pay as much as $5,000 US to avoid service which inevitably means that most conscripts come from working-class homes, single-parent families, or orphanages. Wealthier Russians need not fear compulsory service, despite the fact that the Russian constitution explicitly states every Russian's job should be to defend the motherland. Would-be conscripts even go so far as to swallow magnesium crystals to give themselves painful stomach ulcers and avoid the draft, or add drops of blood to their urine samples hoping it'll make them seem unfit for service. Conscripts serve for one-year terms. Though extensions such as that which many in Ukraine are facing today are not uncommon. Upon enlisting, conscripts go through a one to two month long basic training, which varies depending on location and is not standardized the way it is in the US. After basic training, conscripts undergo a further three to six months of advanced training depending on their assignment before being assigned to regular units. Russian conscripts must pass a physical examination similar to that required by many Western militaries. This includes a 3-kilometer run that must be finished in 12.4 minutes, a 10-kilometer march that must be completed in less than 56 minutes, a 100-meter dash in under 14.4 seconds, and 12 pull-ups for any soldier in service less than 6 months. For their service, they're paid up to $14 US a month, though this varies. Once more, corruption is to blame, as Russia uses a system where unit commanders are directly sent the wages for their soldiers and it's up to them to disseminate pay. Thus, most Russian commanders skim off the top of the incoming pay largely from the conscripts who will be gone in a few months anyway and who have little to no rights inside the Russian military. The curious practice also explains much of the underperformance of the Russian battalion tactical groups in the current war. Officers routinely report their units are fully staffed and fit for combat despite having suffered combat losses. This way, senior officers can pocket the pay meant for soldiers who have been killed or wounded 
and removed from the front. Then when the unit is tapped for combat operations because to senior planners it seems like a full strength unit, it must go to combat with a percentage of its manpower missing. Training during boot camp is split between physical training, weapons training, and unit training. Unlike American boot camp, there's a far less rigid training structure and it seems like a lot of training is focused on physical training to get conscripts and recruits into shape. By comparison, US basic training differs depending on the branch of service, but focuses on weapons training and physical training alongside classroom training on topics ranging from the law of armed conflict to first aid. Russian recruits also tend to have less oversight during basic training and enjoy relaxing evenings after official training hours are over, even being allowed to watch TV or listen to music until lights out at 10.30. But the real challenge for conscripts isn't training, it's surviving Dedovshina, the rule of the grandfathers. Russians believe that the rule of the grandfathers makes for tough soldiers. Their performance in Ukraine begs to differ. Hazing inside the Russian military is not limited to conscripts, but conscripts bear the absolute worst of it. The practice is perpetrated by everyone from senior to junior officers, who ignore it or participate in it directly, and even by soldiers just a few years more senior than their victims. No one is safe from hazing in the Russian military, but hazing isn't just about abuse, it's often about outright theft or exploitation. One recruit, Kirill Bobrov, at the Kamenka military base was dragged into a boiler room after his compatriots found out that his grandmother had sent him $14 US in rubles. The drunk soldiers wanted the money for themselves so they could spend it on cigarettes, alcohol, and sweets, and they began to interrogate him on where he'd hidden the money. Bobrov claimed he'd already spent it, but the soldiers didn't believe him so they began to beat him. As he took the beating and refused to give up the money, one soldier picked up a wooden chair and smashed it directly on Bobrov's head, striking his neck. This would lead to a spinal fracture, which would be completely untreated by the military doctors he reported it to after complaining of extreme pain. They chalked it up to nerves and sent him back to his unit. Bobrov describes being continuously beaten on by senior soldiers and junior officers. They would often get drunk and drag recruits out of their bunks for random beatings to entertain themselves. Few stools or chairs were unbroken inside the barracks, as they had all been used to beat the recruits with. On his very first night in the barracks, Bobrov was woken by his sergeant and dragged out of bed only to be punched in the stomach and head several times. When he collapsed on the ground, the sergeant then proceeded to kick him in the stomach. Other soldiers would round up the new recruits and order them to fetch them cigarettes with filters within 30 minutes, which was impossible as the base was remote and nowhere near a shopping center. Plus, conscripts are paid pithy sums each month which is what made the $14 US gift from his grandmother so valuable to Bobrov. It was several months' wages at once. Other times, the recruits would be ordered to bring soldiers money. If they failed, which was often, they were severely beaten. Bobrov would go on to develop a severe infection in his legs that made marching extremely painful. He attempted to escape from the base three times, finally successfully fleeing and heading to St. Petersburg, where he contacted an advocacy group called the Soldiers' Mothers' Organization. The group sent him to a hospital to get his injuries documented so he could be reported as unfit for service. It's there they found that Bobrov suffered from multiple traumas and concussions, as well as the spinal fracture in his neck. Another soldier, Private Andrei Sitchov, described being tied to a chair by his drunk superiors and beaten repeatedly over the course of a night. The only breaks he got was as his seniors returned to their drinking binge, before inevitably coming back to continue the beating. He wisely did not report the situation, but when he reported to the military doctor for treatment of his injuries, the doctor said he was fine. A few days later, gangrene had spread to most of his wounds, and he ended up having both his legs and genitalia amputated. New recruits are often given extremely poor quality uniforms which helps identify them as doohy, or ghosts. Soldiers who have served for at least two years are referred to as old timers, while anyone past that is known as Dede or Grandfather. Without a professional NCO corps, and with most Russian officers too busy working second jobs to pay the cost of their own uniforms and supplies, it's the Dedes who are in charge of the barracks, and it's them who are the worst offenders and perpetrators of this systemic abuse. Recruits aren't just abused and have their personal belongings and even wages stolen from them though, they're also exploited by their superiors. Recruits are often forced to work for locals doing manual labor for which the locals will pay their senior soldiers, who give nothing to the Duhi. This is far from the worst fate, as new recruits are often prostituted out, an appalling practice that's been described as endemic inside the Russian military and is ironic for a culture that is so violently anti-gay. New recruits can face some pretty horrifying and disgusting non-physical abuse though as well. They can be sleep deprived for days or weeks at a time, forced to wake up in the middle of the night and go for runs or do push-ups for hours on end. Sometimes they might be forced to run with little clothing in blistering winter conditions, which leads to frostbite at times severe enough to require amputations. Recruits are often starved, with their food taken by senior soldiers much like school lunch bullies. 
However, one of the foulest abuses is the practice of forcing recruits to scrub toilets with a toothbrush. But if you're picturing the pristine porcelain thrones of American basic training, think again. These toilets are often simple holes in the ground, which must be scrubbed clean. If the abuser is particularly sadistic, they'll then force the recruit to brush his teeth with the same toothbrush afterwards. Over time, though, the West has become aware of the most common hazing practices. The first is known as the elephant. This ritual gets its name from the older generation Russian gas mask, which has a trunk-like tube through which a soldier breathes. A recruit would be forced to put on the mask and then have the other end sealed off, cutting off the air supply. The recruit is then forced to recite army regulations, sing patriotic songs, or do PT until they physically pass out. When the mask is unsealed and the recruit takes their first breath, they are immediately punched in the solar plexus. The next practice is known as the Batman. This involves a recruit lying on the bottom bunk of a bunk bed style army cot. Then they hang on to the top bunk with both their arms and legs and must hold for as long as possible. Several recruits will do the Batman at once, and the last one to let go is spared physical abuse. The first to let go is given the most abuse. The ritual known as the Crazy Deer involves a recruit being ordered to cross their hands over their forehead and bang their head against a wall repeatedly. Inevitably, this leads to concussions which can be severe. The hazing ritual that led to the amputation of Andre Sitchelf's legs and genitalia is known as the television. Here the recruit sits on a stool while holding another stool with a cup of water balanced on it. The stool he's sitting on is then pulled out from under him, and if the recruit wobbles and lets the cup of water fall, he's severely beaten. The ritual is named the television due to the fact that the recruit intently stares at the cup of water balanced on the stool he's holding while waiting for the stool underneath him to be pulled away. The bicycle involves waiting for a recruit to fall asleep, after which he has pieces of paper rolled together and put between his toes. Then the papers are set on fire. The way the recruit reacts by kicking his legs violently once his feet begin to burn is how the ritual gets its name. The confiscation is simple. Anything that a duha is sent by his family or friends belongs to the older soldiers, who steal everything. The recruit could tell his family and friends to simply send him nothing, except the older soldiers often force them to ask for specific things, and then steal it once it arrives. Next is the dried crocodile, a variation on the Batman. This one involves the recruit suspending himself face down between two bunk beds, then an AK with a bayonet fixed to it is placed pointing up directly under the recruit. The recruit must cling on for dear life or fall onto the bayonet. Often, other soldiers will beat the recruit with pillows trying to get him to fall. The ritual gets its name for the way the suspended recruit looks like a crocodile skin that's been stretched out to dry in the sun. Russian equipment is still largely outdated, which makes the birdie possible. In this ritual, the wires of an old 1930s field telephone is wrapped around two big toes of a recruit. The telephones work by hand cranking, which generates an electrical charge, and inevitably shocks the recruit. The harder the phone is cranked, the worse the charge. Billiards is a particularly brutal form of torture. Here a recruit is ordered to put a billiards ball in his mouth while a soldier whacks it with a pool cue. This inevitably results in missing or chipped teeth. However, another variant of the torture involves forcing the recruit to bend over and drop their pants, and we'll leave the rest to your imagination. The pheasant, however, marks the final torture ritual one must undergo before graduating out of being a duha. In this ritual, the recruit drops his pants and crouches on the legs of an upside-down bench. The older soldiers will then line up and whip his bare butt with metal belt buckles. A recruit must endure 100 lashes to graduate, and if they fall off the bench, they must undergo the entire ritual all over again. Inevitably, all this torture comes with severe consequences. Recruits face lifelong injuries and even extreme amputations as we saw earlier, with mental disorders not being out of the norm. Suicide is endemic to the Russian armed forces, however, most of it resulting from the practice of Didovshina. But sometimes the recruits turn their weapons on their tormentors. There have been multiple incidents of recruits killing their fellow soldiers before attempting to flee to the countryside. Soviet Union veterans admit that severe hazing was always a practice in the Red Army, but it has increased exponentially in cruelty ever since the fall of the Soviet Union due to the underfunded state of the Russian military. Russia is not just too economically poor to feel the large military that it has, but it's also plagued by rampant corruption, which means funds don't always make it to their designated units. With senior officers too worried about making a living by working a second job, discipline has absolutely crumbled inside the Russian military. The result is not just that life is a living hell for Russian conscripts and even professional soldiers, but that the Russian military is an incompetent mess that is incapable of subduing its far less capable neighbor, Ukraine. Things in the southern region of Ukraine are about to go from bad to worse. Vladimir Putin has just declared martial law in Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia. 
This likely is a desperate attempt to maintain control in the regions, but also has a much darker and sinister purpose. What is happening in these Ukrainian states is reminiscent of Nazi Germany, as Putin is literally trying to change the ethnic makeup of the region. Let's examine what martial law is, why Putin has implemented it in illegally annexed parts of Ukraine, and what it could mean for the future. However, before we dive in, imagine this haunting scenario. Overnight, your freedom is completely revoked. You can't leave your house without permission, and you have to support an enemy in their war efforts. Every day is a worse nightmare than the last. You step outside of your house. The streets are desolate as the sun begins to set over the distant hills. With everything that's been going on, you forgot to buy bread this morning, and without it, your family will starve. You look down the street to make sure no one's there and run down an alleyway. On the other side of the street is your local bakery. You dart out onto the main road where you hear a voice scream, HALT! You freeze, knowing that if you take another step, you could be shot. Three Russian soldiers walk up to you, rifles slung across their shoulders. What are you doing out after curfew? One of the soldiers asks. You explain that you forgot to buy bread and your family is starving. The soldier just laughs. They have no sympathy. Well, if you're headed to the bakery, you must have money on you. And all money should be going to pay the soldiers who are fighting for your freedom, like us. You stare at the soldier with pleading eyes. You ask them to show mercy, as you have two little kids and a wife at home. They just continue to laugh. One of the soldiers grabs your arms and holds them behind your back. Another searches your pockets and finds your wallet. They take the money out of it, throw the wallet to the ground, and just for good measure, punch you in the stomach. Now go back home and don't let us find you out after curfew again, the Russian soldier says, before spitting on you. The soldiers walk away laughing. This is what your country has turned into since Russia invaded. And now that martial law is in place, the military can do anything they want. This is the current reality in parts of southern Ukraine. But what exactly is martial law, and what does it allow Putin to do? If we think back to several months ago when the war had just started, the goals of Vladimir Putin were vague at best, and the ravings of a lunatic at worst. Just to recap how we got to where we are today, Putin proclaimed he wanted to re-establish a former Russian empire. He spewed lies and propaganda, stating that southern Ukraine had been stolen from Russia and that the citizens living there wanted to be reincorporated back to the motherland. Some people living in Ukraine did want this, but the vast majority enjoyed the independence and freedom from the oppressive regime of Russia and the democratic nature of the government. This brings us to the real reasons why Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. Yes, he wanted to form a new Russian empire. However, it was the democratic nature of Ukraine and the country becoming more westernized that actually led Putin to invade. He knew that if Ukraine became part of the European Union, NATO, or allied itself with the West, it could threaten his rule in Russia. Paranoia is a common trait among ruthless dictators because if citizens realized that their lives could be better if they had a say in the government and then decided to start a revolution, dictators tend to lose their lives. Putin probably always has this thought in the back of his mind, and as Ukraine became more and more westernized, Putin felt that he had to attack to save himself. It's not entirely clear which former Russian empire Putin wants to re-establish, however. When the former Soviet Union collapsed, Russia lost a lot of territory in Eastern Europe, including Ukraine. However, if Putin is hoping to reform the Tsarist Empire of 1914, then there would be a lot more conflict in the future. It's important to remember that the Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia regions were illegally annexed by Russia. In September, a staged referendum was conducted where voters were met at the polls by armed Russian soldiers who held them at gunpoint until they voted for their states to be annexed by Russia. That's right, the Ukrainian people living in the annexed regions of Ukraine were given a choice to vote for their homeland to be incorporated into Russia or die. There's little doubt that many Ukrainians were killed during the referendum for refusing to vote for annexation. The United Nations and the majority of the world do not recognize Russia's authority in these regions, however, this doesn't matter to Putin. Russia has occupied southern Ukraine for several months now, so the question becomes why did Putin declare martial law now? Like many of Vlad's decisions, this one doesn't seem to be completely thought out. Martial law expands the power of the military and law enforcement agents in the region. Occupied Ukraine really didn't have much freedom to begin with. All Putin is doing by declaring martial law is giving a different name to what's already been happening. Under the umbrella of martial law, the military can impose curfews, restrict freedoms, take civilian property, enlist people into the army, and force residents to rebuild any destroyed infrastructure. Again, these things are already happening in the occupied territories. However, since Moscow hasn't declared martial law since the Soviet Union, this may be Putin's first official move to bring annexed parts of Ukraine into his Russian empire. But again, the question is why now? What does Putin get out of declaring martial law? Putin has not just initiated martial law in Ukraine, but in the rest of Russia as well. However, there are different tiers of martial law depending on where you live. In Russia, Putin has called for basic martial law, which means nothing is really going to change but citizens should be prepared to aid the military in its war effort by working in factories or enlisting in the army if asked. 
In southern Ukraine, the martial law is instated and labeled as maximum readiness, which means that the people in those regions will be asked to make sacrifices immediately to help Russia fight against the rest of Ukraine. Putin has continually said that the reason he needed to implement martial law is that Ukraine's government and its western allies refused to accept the result of the annexation referendum as legitimate, which of course they weren't. Putin declared in one speech, as is well known, the regime in Kyiv has refused to recognize the will of the people. We are trying to resolve difficult large-scale challenges on providing security to Russia and protecting the future of Russia defending our people. What it really comes down to is that Russia has suffered a number of significant defeats in the war against Ukraine. Most recently, this has happened in the battle to control Lyman, where Ukrainian forces humiliated the Russian military by holding their ground and forcing the Russian army into full retreat. It's also important to note that Ukraine still controls parts of Donbass, where Putin has declared martial law, which means that the citizens living under Russian military control will be asked to not only support Russia but fight alongside them as well. Putin needed to declare martial law so that the military had the authority to use citizens as resources of Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia however they deemed fit to defeat Ukrainian forces. Many Ukrainians have fled the Russian-occupied regions in the south, however not everyone was so lucky. Martial law will give the Russian military the authority to compel any civilian under their control to aid the Russian war effort, which is a breach of the Geneva Convention. But Vladimir Putin has no concern over the proper conduct of war or basic human rights, so he's more than happy to formally increase his military's authority in southern Ukraine to allow them to use Ukrainian citizens however they see fit. The crazy thing is that by instituting martial law, Putin may be trying to mobilize a Ukrainian-style territorial defense force made up of Russian officers and part-time reservists, which would be supplemented by civilians. The martial law also allows the military to have greater control over who comes in and out of each region. There's currently a seven-day ban on civilians entering any of the annexed regions. However, since Russia doesn't control all of the territory in the four regions, this ban on movement will be extremely hard to enforce. The martial law declared by Putin also has a propaganda component to it. By stating he has the authority to modify the way things are being run in southern Ukraine, he is reinforcing the false fact that there were elections in the region and that the people living in the region are now happily a part of Russia. The decisions that Putin is making are all part of the narrative that he's just trying to do what's best for the Russian people. However, the rest of the world isn't falling for it, and it seems that Russian citizens might be losing faith in old Vladi and his regime. The implementation of martial law will likely be used to secure more resources for Russia. One main aspect of martial law is that the military can now repurpose any business or manufacturing center that they need. For example, metalworking factories that once produced materials for infrastructure can be repurposed into building weapons and war vehicles. Companies that procure natural resources such as fossil fuels or minerals can be forced to give their supply directly to the military. Basically, martial law allows the Russian government to convert any and all parts of its economy into a war machine. However, the most atrocious part of the martial law implemented by Putin is it will allow for easier deportation of certain populations out of Ukraine and into Russia. This is where things get a little too close to how Nazi Germany acted in World War II. It's no secret that Putin wants to enact mass deportation of certain Ukrainian populations to parts of Russia. The reason he wants to do this is to change the ethnic majority in the region. In Putin's eyes, Ukraine and much of Eastern Europe should still be part of the Russian Empire. By deporting problematic people who claim to have a culture separate from Russia's, Putin can create a more homogenous state that's made up of people who are loyal to him. Putin's regime has claimed they're only using force to temporarily resettle people. However, the fact that certain people are being targeted for deportation strongly suggests there is a much more sinister agenda at work. Experts estimate that somewhere between 900,000 and 1.6 million Ukrainians have been deported from their homeland into Russia. It's not entirely clear where these people are being sent or what they're being forced to do, but there's a chance they're being put in camps where they're required to aid the Russian military by working in factories or dangerous mining operations. Obviously, this looks really bad for Putin and his regime, so they released a statement shortly before announcing that martial law would be coming, saying that the residents were free to evacuate from southern Ukraine and the government would not only help them relocate in any part of Russia, but would provide housing vouchers as well. This was a thinly veiled distraction from what was about to happen. Every free-thinking individual knew it was just more propaganda to make Putin look sympathetic as his military forced people onto transports and sent them deep into Russia. Martial law also allows Putin to send more troops to annexed regions of Ukraine without admitting he is losing the war. 
The Russian people are becoming more and more disheartened. Those who believe in the cause are starting to wane. Hundreds of thousands of Russians have fled the country to make sure they're not conscripted into the military. Putin is losing the support of his own people. However, by declaring martial law, he can ensure that the military keeps Russian citizens in line while also giving him a reason to send more troops to Ukraine. For propaganda purposes, Putin says that martial law will help ensure the ideals of Russia are being upheld in the annexed regions. But the more likely reason why Putin needs more troops in Ukraine is he's afraid he'll lose the war. This also answers the question of why now. Russian forces have been defeated and pushed back several times in recent months. A war that was only supposed to last a month or two is quickly approaching a year. Putin will never admit it, but in the back of his mind, he is likely scared. If Russia loses the war in Ukraine or if the war gets drawn out for much longer, the people of Russia will see Vladimir Putin as being weak. There's a good chance if this happens, he'll be overthrown and executed by his own citizens. Therefore, Putin must maintain as much control and influence as possible. He's doing this by using his military and giving them more power through martial law. This will force businesses and defense contractors to align with his goals and provide him with the soldiers and resources necessary to continue fighting in Ukraine. It'll also allow Putin to not only control the populations in the annexed regions more easily, but will also allow him to control his citizens at home, especially if they start to become unruly or try to start a revolution against him. Putin and the rest of his regime believe that enacting martial law across Russia and southern Ukraine is a show of strength. However, many think it indicates how desperate they've become. The fact that Vladimir Putin needs to position his military in a way that ensures his citizens will continue to support him in his war effort is a telling sign that things are going very badly for him. The desperate tactics are less strategic and more of an indication that Putin and his allies are losing control. The sad part is that martial law will likely cause more death and despair in occupied Ukraine. As Putin becomes more desperate, he'll continue to escalate his tactics to ensure he remains in power and the war can continue on. However, if Putin ever loses control or Russia is defeated, it will not only be the end of Putin's reign, but likely his life as well. No Instagram, TikTok, or Rocky films. These are some of the craziest consequences if Russia ruled the world. To understand a world where Russia is the dominant power, we first have to understand what it is that Russia wants today. The invasion of Ukraine might have come out of nowhere for many people, but the truth is that this invasion was all but inevitable. And you might be surprised to hear this, but the US and NATO are not blameless in this. Certainly, it was Putin's decision to attack Ukraine, but NATO has seen the possibility of a conflict like this ever since the early 2000s, when they were considering formally including the Baltic states of Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania into NATO. Time and again, Russia had warned after the fall of the Soviet Union against NATO expansion. And time and again, NATO ignored those warnings as it continued to expand east and into former Soviet republics. To be clear, we're not arguing that this was wrong. People should be free to dictate their own fate. And the Baltic nations feared Russia and felt they'd be safer in NATO's hands. Obviously, time has proven them right. The inclusion of the Baltic countries, though, put NATO forces on the doorstep of Russia. And for a brief moment, moment the world held its collective breath. Would Russia invade in retaliation and kick off a major global conflict? Thankfully, Russia didn't, but it's important to understand that this was a very real possibility, and NATO knew it. Expanding the alliance all the way to Russia's border was a red line all parties involved knew could trigger a military response. Instead, the conflict was delayed by a decade, when in 2014 Russia invaded and annexed Crimea. Eight years later, with Ukraine undeterred from joining NATO and the EU, Russia invaded the country with the intent of conducting a regime change. Vladimir Putin has promised that he does not intend to annex the former Soviet Republic or hold on to any of its territory after the war is over. But given that Russia has lied about preparing for an invasion, then carrying out said invasion, and not targeting civilians, frankly Putin can be trusted about as far as you can throw him at this point. But why was Ukraine ever worth invading in the first place? The Cold War might have ended in the West, but Russia has refused to admit defeat. And no one more so than Vladimir Putin, who still views his relationship with the West as a zero-sum game. There can only be one winner between Russia and NATO as far as he's concerned. This antagonism comes in large part from the shame of the Soviet collapse, but also from what has been perceived across much of Russia as the West infringing on the Russian identity itself. The spread of Western liberal values into the country, such as gender equality, support for LGBTQ communities, and racial harmony are seen by many conservative Russians as a direct attack on their identity as Russians. The West might have moved on from the Cold War social attitudes, but the Russians didn't, and the state of their defeat in the Cold War only adds to their indignation at what they perceive to be the penetration of their society by Western institutions. This is due in part to extreme conservatism amongst a society that was walled off to the world for nearly 
50 years, but also because Putin has used the intrusion of these Western values as a chance to create ultra-nationalist propaganda. Russians under Putin must stand strong against corrupting Western influence that still seeks to destroy Russia, again in the mind of Putin. And thus, by rejecting these values, Russians can strike a blow against the West. For the most part, it's not the Russians that want to reject these values, but they've been made to feel like they have to because of the file propaganda levied against them for decades. If Putin's going to defeat the West, after all, he needs domestic support to remain high, especially when the cost of antagonizing the West has historically been crippling sanctions. Another reason for the hostility between Russia and the West, though, is the matter of Russia's national security. Russia sits at the far end of the European plain, a vast swath of flat country that's notoriously difficult to defend against invasion. That's why Russia has suffered terribly over the centuries from European invasions. If Russia is to remain secure, it needs to keep potential adversaries at arm's length, and that means keeping them off their doorstep. With NATO already on its northwest flank, allowing Ukraine to draw closer to NATO and the EU was strategically unacceptable for Russia. Again, NATO knew this and yet continued to flirt with the idea of Ukraine joining NATO on purpose. While there's no way to prove it, the invasion of Ukraine is exactly the scenario that NATO was hoping for, as it now gives the West a way to break Russia without directly attacking it. Sadly, the Ukrainians must bear the cost of Russia's defeat. So, what if Russia could achieve all of its foreign policy objectives? What would a world dominated by Russia look like? First, we have to stress, this is going to be pure fiction. Russia is not powerful enough economically or militarily to achieve anything that we're about to lay out. Under Vladimir Putin, Russia has become an isolated hermit kingdom whose economy is shattered and military is incapable of winning a conflict against an exceptionally weaker opponent. So buckle up, because we're about to take a dive into Putin's mind and imagine a world where Santa Claus is real, fairies exist, and Russia is the world's dominant power. First, to become dominant, Russia has to neutralize the military, political, and economic influence of both the United States States and China. A successful war against China is remotely possible for Russia. China's military might be big, but it still lags behind in modernity, and more importantly, it has no experience in modern combat. As poorly as the Russian military has performed in Ukraine, we can expect the Chinese military to perform even worse. But again, this is pure fantasy because, simply put, neither nation has the military might to completely neutralize the other. Instead, a war between Russia and China would drag on to become a multi-year stalemate where neither side makes much progress and both sides declare peace simply because the war has become so costly for them. Economically speaking, Russia has an even worse chance of neutralizing China, as its own economy is a fraction of China's, and shrinking. With the world blacklisting Russia since its invasion, it's lost any leverage it might have possessed over China. Both of those problems are only magnified exponentially when facing off against the United States. But the US has a third advantage, it wields far more political might than either Russia or China. The world currently exists largely under the leadership of the United States, who enjoys the benefits of having allies and strategic partners ships all over the world. But let's just say, somehow, the US and China are both militarily, politically, or economically subjugated by Russia. What now? First, we can expect Russia to export its model of authoritarianism around the world. There is nothing an autocrat like Vladimir Putin fears more than being removed from power, and Russia has a long history of violently removing rulers from power. Thus, to keep the world under Russia's yoke, we would see the end of the age of free, open media. Instead, news outlets would be nationalized exactly the same way they were inside the Soviet bloc during the Cold War. Information would be tightly controlled, and dissenting opinions violently suppressed. Those who defy the state would face steep fines or jail time, though the more closely aligned with Russia a nation is, the more subversive an offender is seen as, worse consequences such as death are not out of the question. Russia currently ranks 10th on the Global Impunity Index for killing of journalists, but that's hardly surprising for a country that sent assassins all the way to Britain to murder a defector who slandered Putin's regime. Modern Russia tightly controls information, and it's learned to be quite good at it. While a few independent media outlets do exist, a rapidly decreasing number ever since the Ukrainian invasion, most of Russia's media is nationalized and gets its talking points directly from the Kremlin. Russia is adept at hiding suppression of free speech, as laws meant to protect the people, such as the current law that promises up to 15 years in prison for anyone speaking about the truth of the Ukrainian invasion. Russia's enacted this law to supposedly combat misinformation that hurt national morale. The right to assembly, one of the West's most cherished values, is also technically non-existent in Russia. So while on paper you are allowed to stage protests, you must receive a permit to do so. Perhaps unsurprisingly, you're never going to get that permit to protest something the state doesn't want you 
you protesting? Russia has the vague appearance of liberal values, but is in fact one of the world's most autocratic states. What's important, though, is maintaining the illusion to avoid full-blown dissent and revolution. And this is exactly what you could expect to see happening in your own country if Russia ruled the world. If you don't like what Russia is doing, you better keep it to yourself. Because in a world dominated by Russia, your own government will punish you for speaking out. It happened during the Cold War, and it would happen again. To achieve this, Russia would install pro-Kremlin leaders around the world. Much like during the Soviet bloc days, you would still likely be allowed to vote, but only from a pool of candidates approved by your government, which itself would be handpicked by the Kremlin itself. Opposition candidates might even be allowed, much in the same way that they're allowed inside Russia today, but more often than not, these opposition candidates would meet with unfortunate ends. Many would suddenly be accused of tax fraud or similar crimes and imprisoned or disqualified from running for office, while others would simply be murdered. This was Putin's answer to the challenge from Boris Nemtsov, a Russian politician who publicly called for the public to march against Putin's government for his invasion of Ukraine in 2014. Nemtsov was shot by an unknown assailant as he crossed a bridge at 11.30 p.m. on February 27, 2015. Life under Russian global occupation, however, wouldn't be all bad, except for being constantly spied on and having no civil liberties. Unlike the Soviet Union, Putin's Russia is not communist and has fully embraced a free market. After all, it made Putin personally extremely rich, though much of that wealth has simply been stolen from oligarchs that dared to oppose Putin. You could expect to have much of the same luxuries you enjoy today, and the global economy would remain largely undisturbed. However, you can forget about social media apps like Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Instead, you'd have the equivalent of their Chinese counterparts heavily monitored and censored platforms where the government can and will punish you for producing material they find unacceptable for public decency. In both Russia and China's case, this happens to involve anything that goes against the official government position. Though thankfully, unlike China, Russia really has no problem with silly dances and K-pop boy bands, so you could still enjoy both. What the world would lose under Russian leadership is not so much its material prosperity, but its freedom of self-determination. The liberal values that Western democracies are built on would be stripped away one by one because those same liberal values present a challenge to the authoritarian model of rule. Any opinion contrary to the official state position would not be tolerated, and your national government would be made up of Kremlin-approved leadership that works to support a Russian-first agenda. As Putin today gathers much of his support from ultra-conservative Russians, you can also expect to see a dramatic reversal in race and sex equality, as well as the rights of LGBTQ citizens. Nationalism would be on the rise around the world, though ultimately all would swear allegiance to one man and one man alone, your new Vladi Dadi. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. Thankfully, to even come close to achieving global hegemony, Putin would first have to neutralize both China and America. If Russia's invasion of Ukraine has proven anything, though, it's that Russia is completely incapable of such a task, and if anything, Putin must accept that he now lives in a world dominated by the West. Ultimately, it's up to the Russian people if they're willing to turn into a modern North Korea-style hermit kingdom, or if they'll remove Putin and his henchmen from power and end Russia's decades-long zero-sum game versus the world. Because while Putin is busy telling his own population population that the West hates them, us Westerners are too busy enjoying euphoria, stupid TikTok dances, and the latest Pokemon game to care about a rivalry with Russia. It's the most advanced stealth fighter ever developed, capable of defeating any radar ever invented, and it can kill 10 American F-22 Raptors with just one missile, at least if you listen to the Russian Ministry of Defense. But why is an aircraft the Russians claim is more advanced than the American F-22 and F-35 conspicuously absent over the skies of Ukraine? exactly where it's needed the most by Russian forces. The Su-57 is a Russian multi-role fighter that's Russia's first attempt at a fifth-generation aircraft. It was conceived in 1999 after its predecessor, the Mikoil Project 144, proved to be entirely too expensive to actually put into production. The Project 144 was meant to be an answer to America's own F-22, which was at the time nearing completion and initial operational capability. However, the collapse of the Soviet Union led to an economic crisis and the project struggled to find adequate funding. The MiG-144 would have its maiden flight in February 2000 and then be cancelled shortly after. The Su-57, NATO codenamed Felon, was meant to build upon the successes of the 144 and feel the true fifth-generation fighter. By now, the United States was starting to churn out the F-22 Raptor, and Russia had no answer to this critical threat. But almost inevitably, the Felon ran into its own financial difficulties, and a program that was meant to produce a fleet of fighters by the mid-2000s would only deliver its first operational aircraft in 2020. Russia couldn't afford to produce the Su-57 on its own, though, and troubles began early when Russia and India signed an agreement to co-develop the aircraft in September 2010. As the project evolved, however, Indian engineers voiced serious concerns about the aircraft's capabilities and survivability against American fifth-generation fighters. By 2014, India had lost faith in the Su-57 
and formally abandoned the program, leaving Russia to finance it on its own. This immediately put a massive financial strain on Russia, further compounded by sanctions of high-technology goods from the West after its annexation of Crimea. The Su-57 struggled through development, and a fleet once envisioned to consist of over a hundred aircraft ended up producing only a dozen or so test models. In 2018, Russia claimed that the Su-57 took part in combat operations in Syria. However, there's no real proof that the jet performed any combat duties in the country. It's very likely, then, that Russia merely deployed the plane there to fly a few non-combat sorties so as to attempt to rouse interest from foreign investors, a very common tactic by the Russian defense industry. With a poorly diversified economy under pressure from sanctions, Russia relies heavily on foreign buyers to fund its weapons development programs. Despite no verifiable proof of the plane's combat record, Russia claims that it partook in combat operations both in Syria and now in Ukraine where Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu claimed that Su-57s took part in operations to neutralize Ukrainian air defenses, eliminating multiple Ukrainian surface-to-air missile batteries. Since we've all learned that Russia literally never lies ever, this is an impressive feat for an airplane that's technically still in development. What's more impressive about this claim, however, is the fact that the Su-57 is not even believed by Western observers to be a true stealth aircraft merely one with stealth characteristics. Observers point to difficulties by the Russians in joining panels of the body together tightly enough to reduce radar return, as well as its glaringly non-stealthy engines. The body of the aircraft is also significantly less stealthy than American counterparts, giving off far larger radar returns from the sides and rear. This, however, is in line with the Russian philosophy of operating aircraft only within the safety of ground-based air defenses. The Russians simply couldn't afford to field an all-aspect stealth aircraft and thus focused only on frontal stealth. The aircraft also appears to lack another quality of a fifth-generation fighter, data link capabilities. While tests are underway to have the Su-57 speak with a drone companion, this is far from the capabilities of the US F-35, which can operate as a sort of mini air control platform in place of traditional AWACS, speaking with a variety of friendly aircraft and helping guide weapons and planes to their targets. However, the Su-57 does have some design advantages over real fifth-generation aircraft in America's arsenal. For one, it's far more maneuverable than any U.S. aircraft, and this is a big clue to the fact that the Russians know this is not a peer to an American fifth-generation fighter. That's because the super maneuverability is not a design feature of a traditional fifth-gen aircraft, which are designed to operate as assassins, not knife fighters. F-35s and F-22s are built to engage enemy targets from beyond visual range with advanced AIM-120D missiles that have ranges in excess of 90 miles. Not only is this missile range outside the range of most other enemy missiles, but the stealth characteristics of an F-22 or F-35 means that an enemy being fired on won't even be able to detect the stealth fighter until it's much, much closer, estimated at about three dozen or so miles. With limited internal payloads of six to eight missiles, stealth aircraft should never be involved in a dogfight. Thus, super maneuverability is only desired if you have reason to believe your aircraft will be forced into dogfights because it's not stealthy enough or has the targeting capabilities to engage in a long-range fight. So while the Su-57 is capable of some truly impressive acrobatic feats, this will be meaningless in over 90% of engagements against an adversary such as the U.S. Air Force. Further giving clues to the fact that the Su-57 is not a true stealth aircraft are its cheek-mounted radars, which allow it to guide missiles to target at far more extreme angles than its American counterparts. This allows the Su-57 to turn further away from its target than an American plane and still maintain a good radar lock. But you only build this capability if you expect your aircraft to have to fight at close ranges where extreme maneuvers are required, or if you expect your aircraft to have to notch or defend against enemy missiles while guiding its own to the target. It's likely the Russian knew from the start the felon would be detectable at far greater range than U.S. aircraft and would need the ability to maneuver away from incoming missiles while maintaining a lock for its own. Despite this, the Russian Ministry of Defense claims the Su-57 is not just a match, but superior to the F-22 and F-35. If that's the case, then where is Russia's premier aircraft when its army needs it the most in the skies over Ukraine? First, if all claims about the Su-57 are true, Russia simply wouldn't be able to field them in large enough numbers to make much of a difference. Currently, there are only about a dozen or so Su-57s in operation, and most of these are test aircraft not meant for combat duty. This likely only leaves just over half a dozen that could carry weapons to target successfully. But there's no evidence outside of Russian claims that this has actually happened. The best the world can manage is a video of an aircraft with a similar shape to the Su-57 captured on video early in the war carrying out an air-to-ground attack. 
Most experts agree that if the Su-57 is truly engaged in combat with Ukraine, then it's not seeing frontline duty. Rather, the plane is likely only firing standoff attack munitions at long ranges from the safety of Russian airspace. Armed with the right weapons, the Su-57 could potentially stay out of range of Ukrainian air defenses and destroy them as claimed by Russia, but there's practically no chance that Russia is willing to risk flying its flagship aircraft over the front lines where it could potentially be shot down, causing Russia heaps of international embarrassment, at least more than it's earned so far. This is doubly true when you consider that Russia also fears Western weapons employed by Ukraine and knows for a fact that Western nations are feeding a steady diet of intelligence to Ukraine's armed forces. So why is the Su-57 not in operation over Ukraine? First, there's simply not enough of them to be worth employing. Russia has goals of just under 100 of the fighter by 2027, something that is completely unrealistic given extreme Western sanctions against the nation. If your military is having to strip washers and microwaves from microchips, you're not going to be fielding 100 stealth fighters in five years. Secondly, the plane was almost certainly not nearly as capable as Russia claims it to be. And the last thing Russia wants is the embarrassment of having one shot down by Ukraine. Russia has lost an estimated 144 aircraft in the war, with two dozen of those being frontline manned fighters or ground attack aircraft. The threat environment is too high for Russia to risk the PR disaster that would ensure if a felon was shot down by the Ukrainians. The Soviet-Afghan war raged for 10 years and killed over 15,000 Russian soldiers. It was a devastatingly costly campaign for the Soviet Union that directly led to its downfall and collapse. On February 24, 2022, Putin said, hold my beer, and launched an even worse military disaster. But is Putin's Ukrainian invasion really a failure, or are we all guilty of falling for Western propaganda as Russia would claim? Getting good intelligence on the ongoing invasion of Ukraine is difficult which makes drawing conclusions equally difficult. Wars are very dynamic things, and what starts off blazingly well can end in disaster or quagmire. Just as the United States after 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan. In both cases, US forces utterly decimated the conventional forces of each nation and then spent 20 years fighting an insurgency, only to leave with a strategic defeat that left the situation worse for America than before the invasion. But Putin's invasion of Ukraine has had immediate and very large red flags straight from day one that signal this will be one of Russia's worst defeats since the start of World War II. For starters, it's become abundantly clear that Vladimir Putin was operating on very faulty intelligence when he launched the invasion. Shortly before Russian forces moved to staging areas, he tasked his intelligence apparatus with infiltrating Ukraine and bribing or intimidating Ukrainian military and political officials into cooperating with Russia. These intelligence agents were also supposed to take the general temperature of the population in order to gauge whether or not Ukraine could muster the will to fight an invasion. Perhaps unsurprisingly for the Russian dictator, the verdict was exactly what he wanted to hear. Ukraine was not just ready for an invasion, but its population would welcome Russian soldiers with open arms and warm borscht. Well, that's the problem with being a dictator surrounded by yes-men. Nobody is going to tell you the truth. The second problem with running such a regime is that your underlings are no doubt just as murderous and corrupt as you are. So it was of no surprise when rumors began to circulate that the Russian intelligence agents had not just um, borshed their job up, but had actually siphoned off large amounts of funds dedicated to their intelligence operations into private accounts. To be fair, Russia's operatives had succeeded in some ways. For instance, when the invasion reached Kherson, the bridges leading to the vitally important city were supposed to have been mined and prepped for demolition. Somebody, though, had ordered the mines and explosives removed, clearing the way for Russian invaders to cross the bridges. President Zelensky would respond by firing multiple senior political leaders from the region. Yet overwhelmingly, as Russian troops crossed the border into Ukraine, they were met with Molotovs and Kalishnikovs, not borscht and hugs as expected. But this wasn't the only strategic failure on Russia's behalf, even before the fighting started. As planning for the invasion began, Russia failed to account for the current state of Ukraine's armed forces. In 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea, it did so with little opposition from Ukraine's armed forces. Overwhelmingly, the Ukrainian military melted away and retreated from the fighting. Eight years later, Russia believed that Ukraine's armed forces would repeat their performance of 2014 but failed to take into account that for the last eight years, the United States had sent hundreds of trainers and senior military personnel to train Ukraine in order to restructure their armed forces. While the process was still ongoing and incomplete as the invasion started, the military that met the Russian invaders was a vastly different machine than what retreated in mass during the 2014 invasion. More mobile, more efficient, and trained in Western doctrine, Ukraine's military did not fall back as expected, but put up stiff resistance that soon slowed Russia's advances to a crawl.
The failure to account for both Ukraine's willingness to fight and its military's new capabilities led to immediate disaster at the start of the war. Russia opened its gambit for Ukraine with a deep penetration air assault straight into the political heart of the nation, Kyiv. Its plan was simple, and given its 2014 successes and perceived overwhelming overmatch in firepower, should have worked. Fly Russia's most elite air assault forces to the outskirts of the capital, set up an air bridge, fly in reinforcements, and walk into Kyiv to execute Zelensky and replace him with a pro-Kremlin figure. The stubborn and uncooperative former Soviet Republic soon once more would be back in the fold. Except that's not how things turned out. For starters, the air assault into Kyiv was terribly prepared and executed even worse. The linchpin of the entire operation was the Anatov Airport, which was the primary target of Russia's air assault on Kyiv. Located just 10 miles from the heart of the capital, this airport had large enough runways to accommodate Russia's heavy lift airplanes. A successful assault here would allow Russia to simply fly in heavy equipment and rapidly move into Kyiv itself. But Ukrainian resistance was not just stiffer than anticipated, but better equipped. As two to three dozen Russian helicopters approached the airport, they were met with manpad fire. Regular air defenses had been successfully neutralized, but Ukrainian defenders were armed with manpads provided by the West. Multiple helicopters were either destroyed or forced to land, disrupting the flow of the assault. Eventually, the defenders were overwhelmed, but Ukraine had been warned by the American CIA of an assault on the airport and was already mustering response forces. Without any heavy vehicles of their own, Russia's paratroopers were dependent on Russian aircraft for support. But these were met by Ukrainian fighters and were limited in their effectiveness. Ukrainian ground attack aircraft such as the Su-24s also pounded Russian positions. By the end of the first day of fighting, Russia's elite paratroopers had been defeated and forced to retreat into the forest outside the airport. There, they linked up with the Russian ground assault coming from Belarus and eventually wrestled control of the airport away from the Ukrainians. However, by then the airport had been so badly damaged, Russia couldn't use it anymore. Russia's failure to account for Ukrainian anti-tank weapons meant that the Belarus assault force was greatly delayed in linking up with the air assault. Left relying on spotty air cover, the lightly armed paratroopers were defeated and forced to retreat, while the heavy fighting and Ukrainian sabotage destroyed runways and made the airport impossible to use as an air bridge. This type of extremely shoddy strategic thinking quickly became a hallmark of the entire invasion. It very soon became apparent that Russia was either incompetent, was entirely too confident of its own abilities, or had severely underestimated Ukrainian will and capabilities. Truth is, all three of those things are true to a degree. Russian incompetence is evident in the entire invasion plan. As many Western observers noted, Russia made the completely unprecedented and confounding decision to launch a full-scale invasion without first conducting an air and missile campaign inside Ukraine. Modern military doctrine states that before using ground forces, one first uses strike aircraft and missile assaults to soften up a nation's defenses. This includes strikes against air defenses, command and control nodes, supply and logistics hubs, and radar installations. When the US and coalition forces launched Desert Storm, air power was used to dismantle Iraq's ability to effectively control its own forces before a single tank crossed into Kuwait. Attacks against Iraqi air bases and radar sites also allowed coalition aircraft to rule the skies and denied Iraqi forces air support. Russia did none of this and instead launched its air campaign at the same time as its troops were crossing the border into Ukraine. What's more, it's become clear that its intelligence and recon capabilities were not up to par, as a significant number of its strikes failed to neutralize intended targets. This left Ukraine with a fully operational air force and air defense network that took a heavy toll on the Russians, while allowing Ukrainian aircraft to provide fire support for ground forces. Given that Russia operates the second largest air fleet in the world, it's absolutely baffling that the Russian aerospace forces, whose budget is larger than all of Ukraine's military budget combined, could not and still haven't won the war for Ukraine's skies. As the war continued, Russian basic military competency came into serious question. Everywhere you looked, it seemed as if Russian's military planners simply weren't up to the task, though this analysis might be skewed by the staggering amount of corruption within the Russian military. Things like bad tires leading to dozens of perfectly operational vehicles being abandoned can be blamed on corruption, with the unit commander skimming the maintenance and acquisition budget and buying cheap Chinese tires for their vehicles instead of the military-grade tires they require. But the fact that abandoned vehicles showed clear signs of sun rot in their tires on only one side of the tire is evidence that Russian maintenance personnel are either poorly trained or its military is criminally inept. When kept in storage, vehicles must be rotated on a set schedule in order to avoid sun damage on only one side of the vehicle. It was clear that Russia had not done this, and the simple mistake cost them tens of millions in lost vehicles that Ukraine happily put to use. The US military has a saying, Amateurs talk strategy, professionals talk logistics. 
Russia, it seems, has maintained its Soviet-era doctrine of under-equipping its units with logistics personnel and vehicles. Compared to an American unit, Russia assigns on average half as many logistics personnel and vehicles, meaning that its ability to project power far from its own borders is very limited. This was no clearer than in the suburbs of Kyiv, where the infamous 40-mile-long convoy of military vehicles would have its day in military infamy. Starved of fuel, ammo, and even food, Russian personnel either abandoned the vehicles or were forced to come to a dead standstill. The rapid advance on Kyiv, which was the linchpin of Russia's entire war strategy, failed because of its own doctrinal incompetence, and Ukraine took full advantage ruthlessly attacking Russian supply lines. Rather than kill tanks, Ukrainian special forces went hunting for Russian trucks. To great effect, each truck lost meant another 2-3 to three tons less food, ammo, and fuel, which meant an even slower and more vulnerable advance. Russia inevitably was forced to retreat from Kyiv and instead focused on its more successful operations in the east of Ukraine. Here it was steadily gaining ground, but the arrival of Western smart weapons such as US HIMARS rapidly changed the strategic picture for Russia. Failing to take into account the use of smart weapons, Russia suffered staggering losses of command personnel and supplies. This wasn't the only way that Russia failed to take into account how 21st century war was waged. As horrible electronic and signals intelligence discipline directly led to the assassination of dozens of senior military officers and the destruction of dozens of strategically important targets, Russian military personnel and reporters were freely streaming from near or adjacent to sensitive military sites, and its leaders were often using unsecured communication methods. All of this intelligence was very quickly scooped up by the West and directly fed to the frontline Ukrainian units armed with smart munitions, with predictable results for the Russians. In six months of fighting, Russia has lost more senior officers than the US lost in all of its conflicts since World War II, and it all comes down to a basic failure to understand 21st century warfare, as well as gross incompetence. Despite all this, however, Russia was winning the war for Ukraine, even if it was at an incredibly unsustainable win rate. However, in early September, Ukraine launched a massive counteroffensive that changed this and exposed yet another strategic failure from Russia. For well over a month, Ukraine had very loudly broadcast its plans to launch an invasion in the south with the goal of retaking Kherson. Russia took the bait and moved many of its best fighting forces from the north to the south. When the attack was launched, Ukrainian shaping operations using long-range precision HIMARS strikes led to some modest gains around the city. However, Russian forces were completely blindsided by a massive Ukrainian counteroffensive in the north, where its forces were weakest. While Ukraine had exercised strict operational security to keep the offensive a secret, even Russian military bloggers had made note of the buildup of Ukrainian forces in the north. Russian intelligence, however, completely missed the clues, and its forces were utterly overwhelmed, leading to a massive defeat and panicked withdrawal from the region. Russian apologists were quick to point out that the units in the north were some of Russia's least effective, and thus Ukraine's win is only temporary, as the moment that Russia's regular forces return to the area, Ukraine will be on the back foot once more. Yet this does not ring true at all, as a growing body of evidence shows that units such as Russia's vaunted First Guards tank army was present at Kharkiv and had not only been defeated but forced to flee in a panic, leaving behind many of its tanks for the Ukrainians. This is a clear indication that even Russia's best forces are having great difficulty inside Ukraine. The First Guards tank army was the very vanguard of Russia's ground forces. This was the force that was meant to smash into the teeth of NATO's best defenses in case of war and win. But what's perhaps even more telling for Russia's difficulties is the fact that even with Ukraine launching an offensive only miles from its own border, Russia's air force appeared to be mostly MIA from the fight. When you can't project air power literally miles from your own border, your military is in seriously bad shape. So is Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine a failure? Well, after the Kharkiv offensive and the panicked retreat of its military, Russia has the dubious distinction of becoming Ukraine's number one supplier of military vehicles. Directly supplying your enemy with more heavy vehicles than they had before you started fighting is not the best way to win a war. But Russia remains a massive military power. Even if it seems incapable of using that power with any great amount of precision or aptitude, Reports from the Kharkiv offensive clearly show that the Russian military is suffering from serious morale problems, and there's even reports of one artillery unit not undertaking a single fire mission during one day of fighting because the entire crew was drunk. This would seem incredible in a Western military, but it's frighteningly commonplace inside of the Russian military where discipline is incredibly low even during peacetime. Such incidents were commonplace during both Chechen conflicts. 
Russia has not lost the battle for Ukraine, and the war is almost inevitably to drag on for another six months or longer. But strategically, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a definite failure, even if it were to magically win overnight for some reason. For its aggression, Russia has become a pariah state, and unprecedented Western sanctions, bordering on what it might face in case of a real war against the West, have left the Russian economy in a seriously perilous state. For the moment, the worst of the damage is being contained, thanks to a large war chest Putin had accumulated before the war. But that money will run out sooner rather than later, given that half of that money is in Western bank accounts that are now frozen. Sanctions will soon bite into the Russian economy even harder than they have been, and the ruble is seen as a Potemkin currency that's only being propped up by extreme measures that simply can't last. But the real problem for Russia is that many of its best and brightest professionals and artists have fled the nation in droves, weakening its ability to compete in a 21st century global economy. For its military, sanctions have been especially painful. Cut off from advanced Western technological components, Russia's military has nearly exhausted its supply of precision weapons. It's also having great difficulty manufacturing things such as air defense missiles, with one plant shut down and its workers told they could either go on unpaid leave or get paid to go and fight in Ukraine. When you're sending trained engineers to go fight and die in a trench, you're not doing your future self any favors. Even if Russia were to win in Ukraine, it would do so at a cost so steep that some in the West wonder if the nation isn't even now under the threat of breaking up. What would be left of Russia is a shadow of a power with a military that would take a decade or more to rebuild, and forced to rebuild with 20th century technology as it remains cut off from Western imports. Reduced to a shadow of itself, Russia's only real clout internationally would be its formidable nuclear arsenal. However, the clearest sign that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a massive strategic failure is that its very goal was to prevent the strengthening of the West against Russia. Yet the result is that Vladimir Putin is the only Russian leader who ever set out to weaken NATO and accidentally made it even stronger, thanks to Sweden and Finland's ascension into the alliance. At this point, Vladimir Putin has so thoroughly crippled his own nation that the American CIA should be naming buildings in his honor for his hard work in weakening the US's chief rival. Its influence is floundering overseas as part of the world it formerly held in its iron grip turns its back on the once mighty nation. As it's increasingly isolated on the world stage, the West only grows stronger. Its military expedition into a neighboring nation has gone catastrophically wrong, proving to the world that the military of the once-feared superpower is a largely hollow, poorly led, and poorly trained force. Now thousands of casualties and even more wounded veterans are adding to the growing voices of dissent from within. But this isn't Russia today, this is the Soviet Union in 1989, just two years before its official collapse. The question is, will modern Russia collapse as its predecessor did, and what would it take to collapse this once mighty nation? The question of collapse is a difficult and tricky one to discuss in relation to Russia. It is almost impossible that the Russian state will simply dissolve, as while there are regions who would make a bid for independence if given the chance, internal cohesion is strong amongst most of the republics that remained within Russia after the end of the Cold War. A collapse of Russia is thus more likely to mean significant economic crash, along with the end of the Putin regime and any possible successor that he might support. So how do we get there? For Russians, a possible collapse is a lot more terrifyingly close than the state media would ever let it be known. Firstly, the war in Ukraine is going to be the chief catalyst in any possible collapse of the current Russian regime. In the 1980s, the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan led to a decade-long quagmire that sucked up resources and men. Unlike the United States and its own follies in the Middle East, the Soviet Union didn't have the benefit of an incredibly deep pocket and partner nations to fund and support failed military adventurism for years on end. Today, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is increasingly looking like another Soviet Afghanistan, but only much worse. In the Soviet invasion, the United States helped provide training and light weapons to Mujahideen fighters fending off Soviet troops. This resulted in a stalemate, where the Soviets controlled the cities while the Mujahideen controlled the countryside. But there are several fundamental differences between the Afghani Mujahideen and modern Ukraine. The first is that Ukraine already had an organized Western-style national military when the war began in February 2022. By comparison, the Mujahideen were an asymmetric, decentralized force that was largely impossible to coordinate. While this had its strengths in combating the superior Soviet war machine, Ukraine's ability to field a professional military allows it to fight in a coordinated national campaign that has been incredibly successful so far in stopping and even reversing the Russian offensive. 
It's exactly because Ukraine fields a professional military that heavy weapon assistance can be provided to its armed forces, something that would have been impossible or impractical in Afghanistan. At the start of the war, it was feared that Russia's superior military would quickly overwhelm Ukraine's defenses. This would have made supplying the country with modern military weapons a futile act, as they'd simply be surrendered or destroyed, and not even reach the battlefield in time to matter. However, as Ukraine scores tactical defeat after tactical defeat on Russian forces and even launches counterattacks to reclaim territory, it's become clear to the West that Ukraine has the expertise and numbers to actually stand up to Russia long enough for heavy weapons to make an impact. At first, this meant supplying Ukraine with Cold War systems sourced from unaligned parties or stockpiles of some NATO members. But now, the floodgates are increasingly opening on the supply of modern Western firepower. U.S. HIMARS, Harpoon anti-ship missiles, and counter-battery radars, for instance, have all inflicted disasters upon the Russian military. As other nations join in providing modern equipment to Ukraine, Russia is going to face an increasing number of modern weapon systems. This is something it is woefully unprepared for. Both because its military training is woefully inadequate for modern war, and because as the war drags on, it's increasingly relying on Cold War era weapon systems that simply cannot compete versus Western weapons. But new Western arms isn't Russia's only strategic problem, because it's also facing a morale crisis amongst its troops. As casualties mount and progress on the battlefield is measured in meters, Russian troops, many of which are conscripts, are becoming increasingly difficult to manage, at times even to the point of outright sedition. This has forced senior officers to the front lines as their troops are no longer trusted to operate without direct and immediate supervision. And in turn, this has led to staggering numbers of casualties amongst its senior officer corps, with as many as 14 generals and 56 colonels killed since the war began. As senior military echelons are thinned out, Russia's military loses what little expertise it had to begin with, leading to increased breakdown in command and control and increasingly deficient performance. It's difficult to get unbiased polling from Russia, as the nation has banned nearly all independent media when the war began to turn for the worse. But while the majority of Russian people seem to support the war right now, as it continues to drag on and military disasters pile on, their support will only last so long. Vladimir Putin will also soon have to deal with thousands upon thousands of returning veterans, many of them wounded and maimed, who are deeply unhappy with the war. This should sound like a familiar scenario to Putin, as it is exactly how the Bolsheviks helped launch their own revolution, which saw the imperial government ousted from power. But if there is a silver lining to the scenario for Putin, it's that there is no major dissenting political power within Russia. A student of history, Putin has purged any would-be opponents and dismantled any political opposition to his rule for over two decades. What remains is a small movement for true democracy, but without an influential leader to help coordinate it and fan the flames of revolution. By murdering and imprisoning his opposition without mercy, Putin might have helped avert his own overthrow from power. Yet, Russia remains a pressure cooker, and the pressure is only piling up. Even as you watch this episode, Ukrainian troops are being trained in the West to use modern weapon systems being provided to them in increasing numbers. The US has even helped finance the training of new Ukrainian soldiers in Western nations, where they can receive expert Western training in complete safety from Russian attack. As the war drags on, Ukraine's proficiency only increases, while it's obvious that Russia's own is in continuous decline. Even its stockpiles of smart weapons are all but depleted, with only those held in reserve in case of war against NATO remaining. To punctuate the point, it's been reported that Russia has been using S-300 air defense missiles in ground attack mode, a move of sheer desperation. If mounting casualties isn't enough to collapse the public support for the war, then a military defeat is sure to. Ukraine is currently incapable of inflicting such a defeat on Russia, but if the war continues for years, as many predict it will, the probability of Ukrainian victory becomes ever greater. If Putin's war machine suffers a humiliating defeat and forced retreat in Ukraine, it'll mean the political end of Putin and his regime. And he knows this, which is why some fear that he might resort to weapons of mass destruction if such a defeat seems likely. But using a nuclear weapon or large numbers of chemical weapons in Ukraine may mean a collapse of the Putin regime anyway. If Russia were to launch such an attack, the nation will be completely isolated internationally, as it becomes a pariah state. As damaging as current sanctions are, they will pale in comparison with the economic and political price to be paid for using weapons of mass destruction. On the topic of sanctions, these too might pave the way for a political collapse of the Russian government. 
To date, Russia has seen some of the toughest sanctions placed on a nation in recent history. Yet, the Russian economy seems to be weathering these sanctions very well. In fact, in July, the Russian ruble hit its strongest level since May 2015, when it hit a high of 52.3 versus the dollar. This resurgence after the collapse prompted by sanctions actually led to the central Russian bank to try to weaken the ruble on purpose so as to keep their exports competitively priced. As Russian President Vladimir Putin said, the idea was clear – crush the Russian economy violently. They did not succeed. But is that true? Are sanctions failing and Russia is actually flourishing? Russia's largest source of revenue is its exports of energy, including oil, gas, and coal. With oil prices at historic highs, Russia's exports to the very people trying to sanction it are leaving the country flush with cash. In just the first 100 days of the war in Ukraine, Russia raked in $98 billion in revenue from energy exports, with $60 billion coming from the European Union. Russia is raking in the money hand over fist, giving it the ability to artificially prop up its economy. For the time being, because the EU is dedicated to curbing its imports of Russian energy, in 2020 the EU relied on Russia for 41% of gas imports and 36% of oil imports. But these figures are set to plummet dramatically, as the bloc passed a sanctions package in May aimed at massively cutting imports from Russia by the end of 2022. The United States is helping the European Union wean off Russian energy by finding alternative sources, and even began the process of lifting sanctions from oil superstate Venezuela to encourage diplomatic talks aimed at fully lifting sanctions. The US has also worked with OPEC members to increase oil production and help relieve pressure on the EU. As the world moves away from Russian energy and into alternate sources, including renewables, its ability to bring in foreign money is going to drop year over year. If this war lasts for years, as it seems set to, Russia could see a major source of foreign revenue dry up over time and this will be particularly harmful to the Russian economy, because the unprecedented sanctions levied against Russia leave it largely unable to conduct international trade. Further damning Russia is the fact that its economy has never been well diversified, relying on the energy sector for the majority of its GDP. The enactment of strict capital controls also help limit damage to the ruble from Western sanctions. By limiting the ability for Russian money or foreign reserves to leave the country, the ruble has remained artificially propped up. Yet this is a temporary measure at best, as it literally strangles an economy and cuts it off from global markets. There is also the matter of Russia's currency reserves, which number at over 600 billion when the war started, though approximately half of that was frozen in overseas accounts in retaliation for the invasion of Ukraine. This war chest has been built up over the years from profits made by the energy trade, and been held in strategic reserve for exactly the situation Russia finds itself in today. Now the money left in its reserves is helping prop up the economy artificially and continue to help pay for the war in Ukraine. Yet these reserves will eventually run out, and when they do, Russia will find itself in dire straits. All of these factors have led many to call the ruble a Potemkin currency. Named for the fake villages made to create the illusion of prosperity for Russian Empress Catherine the Great, a Potemkin currency is one whose real value is being artificially propped up and which will inevitably collapse when those supports are no longer available. But the ruble's value is not a good indicator of economic health anyway, as Russia faces unemployment rising to 7% this year. With thousands of international companies pulling out of the country, foreign investment in the nation has plummeted to the lowest level since the end of the Cold War. This has left many Russians without jobs and struggling to find one amidst a stagnant economy. This pullout of international companies, however, comes with even greater repercussions, as Russia now faces a massive shortage of many goods and services that modern life relies on. Boeing and other commercial jet aircraft manufacturers like Airbus have stopped supplies of spare parts to the nation's air fleets and canceled maintenance contracts. This is quickly leading to the collapse of Russia's airline industry, as it's forced to cannibalize planes for parts in order to keep an ever-shrinking fleet in the air. It's also creating a massive safety hazard that could soon see Russian air travel the most dangerous in the world, because it's not just cut off from critical replacement parts, it also lacks the ability to manufacture them itself. Russia's poorly diversified economy is its own worst enemy, and as the nation has been cut off from international markets for high technology products, it's struggling to maintain modern tools and equipment. We already have reports from Ukraine that Russian missiles are being equipped with scavenged microprocessors from civilian appliances due to an embargo by Taiwan, the world's largest manufacturer of electronic components. Just two months into the war, Russia was forced to close down the Ulyanovsk Mechanical Plant, a facility responsible for producing surface-to-air missiles. Because Russia imported nearly all of the electronic components required, production ground to a halt as supplies ran out. Its workers were given a choice – go home on unpaid indefinite leave or join the Russian war in Ukraine at a salary of $600 US a month. This is typically quickly followed by a permanent retirement.
It's a story playing out all over Russia in both the military and civilian sectors. We know that supplies of Western-sourced medicines are at critical levels and in some places completely out. Some Russian families have been forced to accept that there is no treatment available for life-threatening conditions due to sanctions. Consumer prices on the whole have risen nearly 20%, with inflation expected to hit as high as 23% as estimated by Russia's central bank. There will likely be some stabilization in certain segments of the Russian economy as the shock of sanctions is absorbed and markets readjust. But Russia's economy is doomed to shrink significantly. As it stands, the economy is expected to shrink by a whopping 15% this year, wiping out 15 years of growth, with a further 3% reduction in 2023. Eventually, it'll stabilize, but without a doubt, Russia will be a shadow of its former self as a result. Perhaps one of the most difficult effects to measure in the near term, however, is Russia's demographic problem. The first part of this problem is Russia's ongoing brain drain, intensified in the last few months by its invasion of Ukraine and the exodus from Russia of intellectuals, artists, professionals, and youth. By mid-March, an estimated 200,000 Russians had left the country due to fear of reprisals for not supporting the war or of how bad the domestic situation would get in the long term. Since then, an accurate number is difficult to source, but some estimate that as many as a million might have left the country, and that exodus continues. Russia's problem is that many of those fleeing the Putin regime are exactly the people that a modern economy relies on. In the first month of the war, an estimated 50,000 to 70,000 IT professionals left the nation, and up to 100,000 followed soon after according to Russian IT industry trade groups. Hospitality, legal, consulting, and real estate professionals are also leaving the nation in droves, causing an unexpected brain drain that will make it increasingly difficult for Russia's economy to remain competitive. And if that wasn't bad enough, it's expected that 15,000 millionaires will leave Russia by the end of the year, taking their investment capital with them. So will the Russian government collapse? It's quite possible given the way that die has been cast so far. Vladimir Putin has spent two decades preparing the Russian people for a confrontation with the West and so far spun all the consequences for his own actions as attacks by the West against Russia and Russophobia. In the end, as the situation deteriorates in Russia, it might end up only consolidating his power base and ensuring the survival of his regime. Putin may end up a dictator over a backwater second world nation that's broke, internationally irrelevant, and politically isolated, but at least he'll remain in power. Francis Brighton crashes through the doors and into the war room, where a group of generals sit. He is a NATO intelligence officer and has come across something truly horrifying. The military leaders turn in their seats to look at him. Sir, you need to see this, Francis says, holding out a manila folder containing images taken by a spy satellite. The general slowly reaches for the folder, opens it, and begins flipping through the pages. His brow furrows in concern. The general shakes his head and passes the folder to the person sitting next to him. God save us, he whispers, as the photographs circulate around the table. Francis waits patiently in a corner of the room while each member of the NATO alliance looks at the photos he brought with him. The last general examines the images, closes the folder, and hands it back to Francis. He turns to the rest of the men in the room. What should we do, he asks. There's discussion about launching a counterattack. Some NATO members want to keep the status quo the way it is. Putin is clearly insane. And like any wild animal that's backed into a corner and feels threatened, he is more than willing to lash out in the most deadly way possible. Others in the room believe now is the time to act. They advocate for the deployment of more troops along the Russian border. I'm going to say what everyone else is thinking, one of the general states as he stands up from the table. We need to arm the nukes currently stationed in France and Britain. An eerie silence envelops the room. Francis shifts back and forth on his heels. He's remained quiet until now. If I may, sir, he says. The images clearly show that Russia is moving tactical nukes from this Object S site to their naval base on the Black Sea. However, we do not know if this is just a posturing gesture or if Putin means to use them. The generals around the room grumble. They all know this could be the first step toward nuclear war. Until this point, Vladimir Putin's only threatened to use tactical nukes in his war against Ukraine. Now he actually has taken steps to put those words into action. The deployment of several tactical nukes, each with an estimated payload of one kiloton or 1,000 sticks of dynamite, could change the world forever. The generals continue to deliberate. Commander Brighton, one of them says, we need you back at your post. Keep your eyes on the Russian nukes and update us of any further movements. Francis salutes the general and runs out of the room. He sprints down the hallways of the intelligence building back to the command center. Screens flash different images. TVs play live feeds from news outlets around the world. No one knows about the very real threat that he has uncovered except for the NATO generals. Francis types vigorously on the keys of his keyboard. He glances at the picture next to his screen. It's a photo of his wife holding their newborn daughter. She smiles as if nothing could ever get in the way of their happiness. Unfortunately, Putin seems hell-bent on doing just that, by throwing Europe into a nuclear war. Francis taps back into the satellite feed that he initially spotted the tactical nukes from. 
He zooms in on the road leading from the Russian nuclear base to the Black Sea coast. The trucks carrying the tactical nukes have made significant progress. They're only miles away from the naval base. Hours pass, Francis periodically sends updates to the NATO generals regarding the movement of the Russian tactical nukes. Putin had promised to use them for several weeks, but many thought this was an empty threat. Now it looks like he's about to make good on what he's been saying all along. There's been little movement on the Russian naval base where the nukes were dropped off. Francis has a hunch the warheads have been mounted onto SSN 30A caliber missiles and loaded onto Russian subs, but without proof there is very little he can do. It seems like the only way that Russia could secretly deploy the nukes and get them within range of targets in Ukraine is by submarine. Francis's eyes are exhausted from looking at computer monitors non-stop for days. Every time he blinks, it stings. The intelligence officer stands up and stretches. He walks to the break room where a fresh pot of coffee has just finished brewing. As he pours himself a cup, he watches live coverage of the battle raging on the outskirts of Kyiv. Suddenly, the camera tilts upward. For a moment, a missile can be seen screaming across the sky. It arcs down and slams into the ground near a group of Ukrainian forces. For a moment, nothing happens. Then, there's a bright flash and the feed cuts off. Francis stares wide-eyed at the static on the television. The coffee mug falls from his hands and shatters on the floor. For a moment, Francis is paralyzed with fear. It is very clear what he just witnessed. Russia launched a tactical nuke and wiped out everything in a quarter-mile radius. Francis sprints back to the control room and begins gathering as much intel as possible. He needs to figure out how much damage was done and in which direction the fallout is heading. By looking at satellite feeds, Francis can just make out the distinctive mushroom cloud rising up over the landscape. The wind seems to be blowing smoke further into Ukraine. Once again, Russia has caused a nuclear catastrophe on Ukrainian soil. Later that day, Francis gives a report to the NATO generals. It appears Russia used a one kiloton tactical nuke to destroy an entire Ukrainian tank battalion. Reports have been coming in across the world that countries are condemning Russia's actions. Everyone knows that if nuclear war breaks out, there will be no winners. Russia and the US alone have enough nukes to wipe humanity off the face of the planet, and that's not accounting for the nuclear warheads located in Britain and France. After the blast was confirmed to be from a tactical nuke, NATO armed several missiles at sites across Europe. They have not fired yet, but it seems that'll only be a matter of time before someone has to stand up to Vladimir Putin. Trying to reason with the homicidal maniac doesn't seem to be working. Even China, Russia's most powerful ally, has turned on them. China has a strict no-first-use nuclear doctrine, which Russia has just broken. In the eyes of China, nukes should only be used to defend one's own country, not as a weapon for offensive purposes. This is how much of the world feels, and it's the reason why almost every country on the planet has turned against Vladimir Putin. But as far as Francis can tell, this doesn't seem to be deterring the leader of the Russian Federation. Russia used the tactical nuke to show just how serious they were taking NATO's constant resupplying of Ukraine with weapons and supplies. Putin also wanted to make it clear he had no problem taking things to the next level and engaging in nuclear warfare. Europe is now in an even more tenuous position. In briefings that Francis has been a part of, all options were put on the table. Many leaders believed that NATO needs to launch a nuke at Russia to show they will not just back down. The flip side of this is that Putin could escalate things further and start firing larger strategic nukes at targets across Europe. If this happens, the entire continent could be decimated by fireballs and nuclear fallout. The tactical nuke that Putin fired obliterated everything within a quarter mile, and although the radiation from the blast will travel further, it's nothing compared to the much larger nukes that both Russia and NATO have at their disposal. These bombs can be a thousand times more powerful than the tactical nuke that Russia used, and each one could wipe out entire cities and cause millions of casualties. This is obviously what Europe is trying to avoid, but they also can't let Putin get away with unleashing a nuke on the people of Ukraine. Francis listens to the other options being suggested by the military leaders in the room. Some of the generals think that NATO should send forces into Russia and use conventional weapons to bring Putin to his knees. The counter-argument is obvious. If forces from Europe invade Russia, Putin will almost certainly launch more nukes to defend his homeland, resulting in the annihilation of much of Europe. Another option is to tighten the economic sanctions already placed on Russia. Unfortunately, these didn't seem to stop Putin the first time around, and it's unlikely they'll cause him to back down now. Economic sanctions also won't help deter Putin from using more nuclear bombs. It's determined that this could actually cause him to escalate things further as more countries turn against him. Even though China and most other countries are upset with Putin's actions, Russia still supplies a massive amount of oil and gas to the rest of the world. This includes Europe. And if Russia completely cuts off fossil fuel supplies to the EU, everyone within its borders will suffer. Utility prices across Europe have already skyrocketed to unprecedented levels as Russia continues to cut off its supply of oil and many European families can no longer afford to heat their homes during the cold winter months. 
Then, one of the generals comes up with an idea so crazy, it might just work. Francis sits at his computer station staring blankly at his screen. He can't believe the decision the generals came to. He closes his eyes and rubs the bridge of his nose. Forgive us, he whispers, and then focuses on the task at hand. Francis moves several satellites into optimal viewing positions, which will allow them to collect analytics for what is about to happen. The satellites align and begin transmitting data. They're pointed at a military base in Belarus. A digital clock has begun countdown. The generals are now in the control room with Francis so they can witness the aftermath of their choices. Belarus is not at war with Europe. The country is controlled by Alexander Lukashenko, a power-hungry dictator who allied himself closely with Putin. There's no doubt that Belarus supports Russia in its endeavors, but the Belarusian military is not actively slaughtering people in Ukraine like Russia is, nor do they have any nuclear weapons. Francis and the generals watch as the countdown reaches zero. On one of the side monitors, a video feed of a missile launching from a British battleship in the Baltic Sea is being played. The satellites track the missile as it arcs through the sky and descends upon a Belarusian military base. Unknowing soldiers carry out their daily routines. The seconds tick by. Everyone in the room holds their breath. Then, confirmation comes through that the tactical nuke launched by NATO has detonated and destroyed its target. Francis feels sick to his stomach. The men on the base had no idea what was coming or that they were even in any danger. Now they've been vaporized by a nuclear blast. One of the generals claps his hands together. Someone get me the Kremlin on the phone. Maybe now Putin will talk, but he doesn't. The plan was to show that NATO was not afraid to use its own nuclear weapons. Military leaders knew they could not launch a nuke at Russia to demonstrate their resolve, but it was determined that by blowing up a target in Belarus, they could still send a clear message to Vladimir Putin that NATO would retaliate with nukes if necessary. There's no doubt that Alexander Lukashenko is a terrible man who's done terrible things to the people in his country, but many feel like NATO took things a step too far. Belarus was sided already with Russia and has given them support in their fight against Ukraine, but now the Eastern European countries declared war on the rest of Europe. They do not have the military forces to back up the threats they're making, but Russia's made it clear that it will stand with Belarus and aid them in their war against the other countries in Europe. NATO leaders knew this would be inevitable, but hoped their show of force would cause Putin to back down slightly. However, this plan hinged on the belief that Putin, like everyone else around the world, wouldn't want to risk all-out nuclear war. But Vladimir Putin is not a sane human being, and therefore his actions following the show of force by NATO are not rational. Both Russia's decision to use a tactical nuke in Ukraine and NATO's choice to fire their own nuclear missile at Belarus have put the continent in a very tumultuous position. Countries around the world are condemning both sides and begging for everyone to come to the table and discuss what's happening before things escalate to levels from which the world might never return. Francis never agreed with the decision to show that Europe would also use nukes if Putin didn't back down. However, his intel has proved invaluable to the generals of NATO. When Vladimir Putin sent a communication that he wanted to sit down for peace talks, everyone was ecstatic. A delegation was sent to the Ukrainian border, where NATO ambassadors would meet with top officials from Russia. Francis was asked to come along to provide the latest intel about where Russian troops were located. Hopefully, this information could be used as leverage to show Russia that they were always being closely watched. It would also serve as proof that NATO knew about key military installations. He was not afraid to target them if Russia failed to cooperate. Francis is reluctant to go, but he knows it's his duty, and hopefully the intel he provides can help the two sides come to an agreement. Before he leaves his station, Francis pulls the picture of his wife and baby off the side of his screen and puts it in his pocket. Francis and the delegation of NATO diplomats head to the Ukrainian border. They land on a military airfield in Poland and are escorted to the border by NATO forces. As they cross over to Ukraine and enter the small town where the talks are supposed to take place, something seems off. The convoy comes to a stop. The delegates step out to look around. It's quiet. There's no sign of the Russian representatives. Maybe they're just running late, someone suggests. The group heads to the town hall where Russia initially agreed to begin peace talks. They enter the building. It's cold and empty. Cobwebs hang from the ceiling. It's clear no one has been here for a very long time. Something is very wrong. I suggest we get back to the airbase, one of the soldiers says. Francis looks around. He closes his eyes and tightly grips the picture of his wife and daughter in his pocket. He should have seen this coming. He should have kept a closer eye on the movements of the Russian troops in the area. Initially, when Francis noticed that the Russian forces were pulling back, he thought it was a sign of good faith. He just presumed the Russians didn't want to seem threatening, especially during peace talks. Now he realizes how stupid that train of thought was. Just like everyone else, Francis wanted this conflict to end without nuclear war. The Russian forces were not pulling back as a sign of their willingness to engage in peace talks. They were retreating because of what was about to happen next. Suddenly, an intelligence officer stationed back at the airbase begins shouting over the comms. Missile incoming! Get out of there! The voice yells. A tear rolls down Francis's cheek. 
A moment later, there's a bright flash. A massive explosion erupts out of the nuclear warhead as it detonates, vaporizing the NATO delegation and ending the peace talks. At the same moment as the nuke on the Ukrainian border detonates, Russia launches several more tactical nukes into Kyiv. Although this will destroy most of the city and irradiate the surrounding area, the Russians need to eliminate the Ukrainian resistance once and for all to prove their dominance. They do not send troops or tanks across the border into Europe as they had a hard enough time fighting against Ukraine and would never succeed in capturing the rest of Europe using conventional warfare. EU's leaders watch in horror as Russia launches nuke after nuke. They have not targeted any of Europe's major cities yet. Instead, their targets all seem to be Ukrainian military installations. Russia is showing the world they have escalated their wartime tactics to use tactical nukes. Regular missiles are now all but obsolete. The benefit of using these smaller nuclear weapons is that there's less destruction and fallout, but they still decimate any enemy force in the vicinity. Putin makes it known that if Europe or any NATO nations try to invade his country or launch a counterattack, he's not afraid to unleash his whole nuclear arsenal on Europe. NATO leaders scramble to decide what to do next. Do they launch their own nukes and engage in an all-out nuclear war with no winner? Or do they increase sanctions and mobilize forces to keep Russia from expanding any further into Europe? France and Germany launch ground forces and set up heavy defensive positions along the Ukrainian border. Poland asks for reinforcements as Belarusian military forces cross their border and attack any soldiers or civilians in sight as retaliation for NATO launching a nuke at their country. A major fear is that Russia will sell or gift tactical nukes to Belarus, who will then launch them against NATO forces in Europe. At this point, they could make a strong case to justify such an action. Nuclear war seems all but inevitable. For several weeks, Russia does not seem interested in an invasion of Europe. European countries and their allies struggle to figure out the best way to de-escalate the situation with Putin and his loose trigger finger. Thus far, all of the nuclear warheads fired by Russia have been around a kiloton, meaning that no strategic or megaton nukes have been launched yet. It seems like Europe continues to let Putin get away with murder, but NATO is trying its best to avoid a catastrophic war that will lead to nuclear winter. European leaders have been thrown into an unwinnable situation. They either roll over and let Vladimir Putin get away with his egregious atrocities, or they launch their own offensive and deal with the inevitable nuclear consequences. Europe has completely stopped purchasing oil, gas, and goods from Russia. This has hurt the people and the economies of the nations in the EU, but it was a necessary step. Russia's economy has all but collapsed, yet they still have a large influence over oil exports. Not only do they control where their own fossil fuels go, but they also have influence over the other OPEC countries in the Middle East. And even though China condemned the actions of Russia, they rely too heavily on their natural resources to cut ties completely. The suffering in Europe is exacerbated by the fact that every country must ramp up military production and recruitment. Without its main supply of oil and gas, there are not enough resources to go around. Europe has been moving away from fossil fuels and toward using renewable energy, but at this point, it's too little too late. Things become desperate as Germany's economy goes into a depression and the British pound becomes worthless. European nations decide it's time to fight back against the evil dictator of Russia. France and Germany launch air raids across the border. The British Navy fires cannons at Russian naval bases and blockade major ports. Infantry and armor units amass along main strategic points, and when the signal's given, cross into Russian territory. There's carnage and chaos across the continent. As Russian forces are defeated and pushed back, Putin makes the decision that everyone was afraid of but knew was coming. He fires tactical nukes at NATO forces. Nuclear bombs detonate on land and in sea. The British Navy in the Baltic is decimated. In a day, millions of lives are lost, but eventually Putin knows he will either run out of tactical nukes or soldiers, so he does the unthinkable. Warning lights flash across every surveillance center in Europe. Russia has launched hundreds of nukes from its arsenals. These are not the low-yield tactical nukes. Each one is over a megaton. When the warheads explode, they will demolish entire cities and wipe out military forces across Europe. There's no other choice but to fight back. Britain and France launch their own nukes at Moscow and other Russian targets. The rest of the world watches in horror as Europe is consumed by fireballs and covered in radiation. Most of Russia's forces are destroyed when the nukes from Europe explode on Russian soil. For the next several decades, most of Europe will be uninhabitable as the fallout spreads across the continent on shifting winds. The end of Vladimir Putin's reign comes at a cost of an irradiated European continent. It all started with a single tactical nuke launched from a Russian sub at Ukrainian forces. It's a grim outlook for the future of Europe if Putin ever does decide to use nuclear weapons. If this happens, decisions about what to do will be difficult to make. There will likely be mistakes, and many people will die as a result of Vladimir Putin's cavalier use of tactical nukes. There are no good options when it comes to nuclear warfare. This is why no one has used a nuke in combat since 1945. 
When the United States dropped the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the situation in Ukraine might be the closest we've been to nuclear destruction since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Except in the current situation, it's not the Soviet Union and the United States who have to come to some sort of agreement, but the leaders of Europe and Vladimir Putin. Hopefully, just as the crisis in 1962 was averted, we can avoid a nuclear holocaust in the coming months. Russia, the world's second most powerful military, versus Ukraine, ranked at the number 22 spot. It's a military of 850,000 versus Ukraine's 200,000, a force overmatch that should spell easy victory for Russia. So, why is the Russian invasion of Ukraine going so poorly? First, what does Russia even want in Ukraine to begin with? It's important to understand that this is not Russia's war, it's Vladimir Putin's war. For Putin, restoring the old Soviet bloc has been a dream since he saw the Soviet Union crumble around him in the late 80s and early 90s. It's not just a matter of pride, though. Putin sees relation with the West as a zero-sum game. In other words, there can only be one winner, and in his mind, it must be him and Russia. Initially, Putin drew closer to the West as Russia signed cooperation agreements with NATO. For a while, it looked like the old hostilities between NATO and Russia were over and a new future together was possible. However, as he was cozying up to the West, he was busy undermining it by using his intelligence services to influence Western democracies, as we saw during the 2016 US presidential election, where US security services confirmed that Russia was attempting to influence American voters. Ukraine's wish to join NATO, though, would place yet another NATO country on his doorstep, something that amounts to a strategic disaster for Russia. Having been the victim of many invasions throughout history, Russia's worked hard to create a buffer between itself and the West for decades after World War II. Today, most of that work has been undone, and Russia's potential adversaries now sit on its northwestern flank. In case of war, if Ukraine joined the alliance, it would allow NATO access straight into the soft underbelly of Russia. Ukraine joining NATO is simply unacceptable to Putin, and in his mind, it's vital for Russia's national security that Ukraine be friendly to Russia or at least unfriendly to the West. Ukraine's growing desire for NATO membership thus represented a significant threat to Putin's goals of keeping NATO away, and its perceived weakness gave him a chance to put the former Soviet Republic back into Russia's sphere of influence. He just needed to topple the national government and install a new one friendly to his interests. The seeds of today's invasion began with protests launched in 2013, after the Ukraine national government rejected the signing of the European Union-Ukraine Association Agreement, which was meant to establish a pathway to EU membership in favor of closer ties with Russia and the Eurasian Economic Union. Many in Ukraine saw this as Moscow influencing Ukrainian policy and a revolution swept across the nation. However, not all of Ukraine wanted closer ties to the West, leading to the breakaway republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. In response for a call for help from the Ukrainian president shortly after he was removed from power, Russia annexed Crimea and sent aid to separatists fighting Ukrainian national forces. Rather than deter the new Ukrainian government from joining NATO and the EU, though, this only created a sense of urgency for Ukraine. Joining the EU and NATO was seen as a matter of national security, and given Russia's invasion, the fear was well grounded. After rebuffing his threats if they should draw closer to the West, Putin saw an invasion as his only option. So what's gone wrong with the Russian invasion? Any good military operation starts with clearly defined goals. And here's where Putin's invasion met with its first strategic disaster. In multiple speeches, Putin made it clear that this was a special military operation tasked with denazifying Ukraine and ending a genocide of Russian-speaking people. This is not just blatantly false, as the thought of a Jew whose family died in the Holocaust leading a Nazi government is ridiculous in the extreme, but also not valid strategic goals. Generals need clear objectives so they can make plans to achieve them. By all accounts, Russia's invasion lacked set objectives. While removing Volodymyr the Iron Joker Zelensky from power was always a goal for Russia's armed forces, how exactly to do that and when was not clearly delineated. Should Zelensky be simply toppled, his government neutralized and rendered ineffective via exile, or should Zelensky and any supporters be arrested or killed? While it's still difficult to get an accurate picture of what has been going on behind the scenes in the Kremlin, we know that the Russian army seemed unclear of these two questions. At the start of the invasion, forces from Belarus began a march toward Kiev, while a full assault in the east aimed to push Ukraine's defenders back. Yet significant air power was not given to these forces advancing on Kiev, slowing the advance down to a crawl. Meanwhile, Russian forces elsewhere seemed set on a strategy of conquering Ukraine piece by piece by defeating enemy forces in place and securing territory as they advance. This was not a war with the goal of removing Ukraine's government, but rather a war of conquest. The lack of clear well-defined objectives led to the Russian military getting bogged down early and quickly, as it seemed to fight anywhere it discovered Ukrainian troops, as opposed to quickly moving to secure strategic objectives. This type of war heavily favors the defender, 
as it leaves them in complete control of when and where battles take place. However, it cost Russia something even more important – time. The longer that Zelensky remained safely out of Russian hands, the longer he had to influence the world, something he did with stunning effectiveness. Each day that passed, Zelensky was able to rally more and more supporters from across the international community, leading to the fastest and most severe sanctions imposed on a nation in modern history. Zelensky's defiance of Putin also emboldened NATO and other countries to provide direct military aid to Ukraine, even leading to such unbelievable moves as the EU supplying the Ukrainian Air Force with fighter jets. Before the invasion, the US and its partners believed that shipping of such significant war material would only serve to provoke Russia into greater aggression and was unthinkable. However, as Zelensky managed to turn global opinion against Putin and the Russian military mired itself in pointless fighting, opinion amongst the US and partners quickly changed. Eventually, Putin realized his grave error and at last clear instructions seemed to be given to his commanders, neutralize Zelensky and seize major cities at all costs. Suddenly, Russian forces changed tactics and they were no longer bogging themselves down fighting Ukrainian defenders where they encountered them. Now they were bypassing entire Ukrainian positions to rush to secure major cities. Even more importantly, the push for Kiev began in earnest, with hundreds of vehicles and thousands of troops in reserve poured straight into the fight for Kiev in a bid to overwhelm the city's defenders. As of the writing of this script, the massive Russian advance on Kiev seems to be halted due to supply problems, though. Not relying on conventional forces, though, there's evidence that Putin has dispatched special forces kill squads to eliminate Zelensky, and Kiev has been locked down as the hunt for infiltrators continues. Russian electronic warfare assets sniff through signals coming in and out of the Ukrainian capital, with the goal of pinpointing Zelensky's exact location for an airstrike. Zelensky is finally a wanted man, but killing him now will not undo Putin's major strategic blunder. Russian troops called Zelensky a clown before the invasion, but now his own troops call him the Iron Joker. And the Iron Joker has already defeated Putin on the world stage by rallying it against him. Killing Zelensky now will only turn him into a martyr and a rallying point for Ukraine's defenders. Had Russia acted swiftly to take Kiev and neutralize Zelensky, something its conventional forces should have been capable of within days of the invasion, Putin may not have suffered as badly on the global stage as he had. The longer this invasion drags on, the worse it gets for Putin's Russia, as the world turns its back on every facet of Russian business and culture. As new intelligence has revealed, though, Putin didn't just fail at setting strategic goals for his military, he actually didn't even let most of his military leadership know about the invasion beforehand. While they were certainly aware of the buildup of troops along the border with Ukraine, even his most senior generals were blindsided by the order to invade. Putin had kept his plan to invade Ukraine so close to his chest that only a small group of individuals very close to him ever knew. Without foreknowledge of the coming invasion, Russia's generals had no way of drawing up battle plans and being prepared to prosecute Putin's orders. Instead, they were forced to improvise on the run, a recipe for disaster. The fact that most of the invasion troops were pulled from across the entire Russian nation also meant that once hostilities began, there was no time to coordinate and integrate chains of command. We've seen plenty of evidence that Russian military has been infighting amongst itself and even engaging in full-blown arguments over radio. With no overarching strategy or chain of command, Putin's army is disorganized and ineffective. Putin's second invasion disaster was a stunning intelligence failure that ranks amongst the worst in world history. Putin told his troops they'd be greeted as liberators by Ukraine's large number of Russian speakers. In fact, his entire battle plan relied on his troops being seen as the liberating country, not the invading one. Thus, Russia's invasion force was by design smaller than required, even with all of his reserves committed. Putin's forces in Ukraine are simply not enough to pacify a country that does not want Russians on their soil. As Russian troops poured into Ukraine, they weren't met with flowers as promised, they were met with javelins and Molotov cocktails. Even in the most pro-Russian parts of Ukraine's east, the people have continued to rise up against what they see as occupiers and invaders. This has not just severely slowed the advance, but bogged Russian troops down in pacification operations. Troop to task analysis, or the analysis of how many troops are required to achieve a certain task, is notoriously unreliable. But even by the most optimistic of estimates, Putin's invasion force was not up for the task of pacifying a nation that did not welcome them as liberators. American analysts estimate that a successful counterinsurgency requires at minimum a 20 to 1,000 ratio of troops, 20 troops for every 1,000 civilians. This is merely an estimate, but even by this number, the Russians would need 340,000 troops to successfully neutralize a Ukraine insurgency. Russia, though, has poured 150,000 troops in its attempt to seize Ukraine. 
roughly a third of the total Russian ground combatants. While it will almost certainly prove to be sufficient for neutralizing Ukraine's military and installing a puppet regime, it's completely insufficient for actually controlling the country. Without immediately pouring more troops into the conflict, all Russia has succeeded in doing is ensuring that Ukraine becomes its own version of America's and the Soviet Union's Afghanistan, only much deadlier for its interest in troops both. There are signs that Russia is looking to fix this mistake, and by the time you see this video those plans might have been put into effect. As of the writing of this script, rumors amongst the global intelligence community is that Russia is planning on instituting a draft to draw up the necessary troop numbers to neutralize Ukraine. Whether this is true or not, what is true is that as Russia's forces currently stand, achieving any sort of strategic success in Ukraine is currently impossible. Russia's next biggest pre-invasion failure was a logistical one. Before the invasion actually took place, Putin famously said that it was drawing down some of his forces to de-escalate tensions. The world breathed a collective sigh of relief. Maybe there wouldn't be an invasion after all. But just days later, Putin ordered his forces into action. Was he simply trying to lower Ukraine's and the world's guard? Not quite. According to Western intelligence, Putin's claim of drawing down forces was actually so his forces could do something that should have warned him the Russian military wasn't ready for invasion. As Putin moved his timetable for invasion along, an estimated up to 20% of his combat vehicles were in disrepair. The claim of drawing down forces was instead a ruse to allow his military to tow broken down vehicles away from staging areas for repairs. This has been substantiated by media, who have visited both the Russian-Ukraine and Belarus-Ukraine border since the invasion and discovered dozens of broken down vehicles left behind in the process of being towed or repaired. With the Russian military suffering from sanctions for years and a stagnant economy back home, it's no surprise that so much Russian firepower was inoperable, but the sheer scale of broken down equipment on the eve of full combat is shocking compared to a modern military such as the United States, which the Russian military theoretically is supposed to fight and win against. But this isn't where Russia's logistics problems end. As the invasion unfolded, Russian troops made slow but steady progress into Ukraine, and then suddenly stopped altogether for a few days. To the world's surprise, entire units had simply run out of fuel, ammunition, or food and vehicles were abandoned by the dozens across Ukraine. How could this happen? As has been famously noted before, the Russian military has always had a problem with logistics. Compared to the United States, Russian units operated with up to 75% fewer logistics personnel, perhaps reflecting Cold War-era mentality that units were not believed to be survivable in a nuclear battlefield and would thus be destroyed or rendered combat ineffective long before significant resupply was necessary. It may also be simply due to poor military planning and a completely unrealistic expectation that heavy fighting would be sporadic and rare. Whatever the reason, Russian units began to run into supply problems by the third day of the invasion, further setting back their ability to make quick strategic gains necessary to circumvent mounting international outrage. Even worse, they left them at the mercy of Ukrainian air attack and lightning raids, with hundreds of Russian vehicles destroyed. Bottlenecks caused by stuck vehicles also gave the Ukrainian armed forces an opportunity to launch devastating raids and resupply themselves by pillaging the remains. But even as supply problems began to sort themselves out, a lack of Russian logistics led to massive traffic jams and further delay of critical objectives such as the taking of Kiev. The famous column of vehicles attacking Kiev stretched for up to 60 kilometers at one point, snarled up in the world's largest traffic jam. Meanwhile, Kiev's defenders used the time to equip civilians and build defenses. Logistics might not be as glamorous as infantry, artillery, or tanks, but without good logistics a modern army can't win. Force structure, though, was yet another of Russia's biggest mistakes. Details on the composition of the Russian military units are hard to discern, given that such things are valuable military secrets. It's been widely reported, however, that a large number of Russian soldiers invading Ukraine are conscripts, and we know that approximately 200,000 of Russia's nearly 1 million strong military are conscripts. Conscription in Russia is a mandatory 12-month service period for males aged 18 to 27. While Russia has made great strides in creating a professional all-volunteer fighting force, such as the US, it still relies heavily on conscripts, and even one-fourth of its elite Spetsnaz units are made of conscripts. But the problem with conscripts, as Ukraine has highlighted, are numerous. First, conscripts are short service terms, meant that they'll lack the skills and training of a professional soldier with multiple years under his or her belt. Pitting Russia's conscript force against Ukraine's mostly professional force is a bad idea with predictable results. Secondly, though, conscripts have notoriously low morale and will to fight, as opposed to a professional soldier who has chosen to take up arms. This has never been clearer than in the way Russia's army has faced massive insubordination, surrender, and outright sabotage of their own equipment to avoid fighting. While the Russian army remains intact, 
Many units of soldiers have surrendered themselves, even to unarmed civilians, in order to avoid fighting, and US intelligence reports that Russian soldiers have taken to punching holes in their own gas tanks to avoid having to move to the front. Intercepted radio communications have shown Russian soldiers refusing orders from Central Command, and even outright arguments and insults between units have been logged. Russian forces are increasingly showing themselves to be unprofessional, poorly trained, and with cripplingly low morale. Such low morale has made Russian units highly susceptible to Ukrainian influence campaigns, which have had great results in inducing Russian soldiers to surrender outright or fight poorly. Morale may be the reason why it appears that Ukraine's military is punching way above its weight class in defense of their nation. As opposed to most Russian troops, Ukrainian forces are highly motivated to defend their country, something the Kremlin severely underestimated. Fueling Russia's morale problems is not just conscription, though, but two other key factors. The first is the fact that many soldiers have claimed they had no idea they were invading until hours before the invasion began. Kept in the dark by their commanders, young Russian soldiers are increasingly reporting after being captured that they believe they were out on maneuvers or at most being sent for peacekeeping operations with their separatist regions. Then, right as the invasion began, the truth was revealed, resulting in shock and fear. The second reason, though, is because many Russian troops invading Ukraine today simply don't see the Ukrainians as enemies. Sharing a common heritage, Ukrainians and Russians have traditionally been brothers and sisters, and waging war against Ukraine has been hugely unpopular, not just back home in Russia, but amongst its own military. Russian morale has been at critical levels for days now, but supply problems have only made it worse. The failure of high-profile operations such as the dual airborne assaults against Kiev in the first days of the war have only made morale problems worse. Russia's next mistakes begin with the invasion itself. Ukraine is waging an influence war directly against the Russian military and civilian population both. Russia, long feared as a master of hybrid warfare which combines military operations with information manipulation, has proven to be absolutely inept in managing this conflict. The Kremlin has ceded the entire narrative of the conflict to Ukraine, which has exploited social media in ways Russia never could have dreamt of. For years, Russian disinformation lowered Ukrainian morale in regions bordering the separatist enclaves. And now Ukraine has turned this tactic back around on Russia and taken it 10 steps further. Quickly connecting to the world via multiple social media apps, Ukraine has flooded the world with images of the invasion, often taken from the front lines themselves. The images have revealed the brutality of Russia's assault and quickly turned global anchor against it. Russia, meanwhile, has proven completely inept at managing the narrative of the conflict and today has zero influence over how the conflict is perceived by the world, granting Ukraine an incalculable strategic victory that has resulted in the outpouring of support in the form of combat arms, humanitarian aid, intelligence sharing, and all the resulting economic punitive measures taken against Russia, its companies, leadership, military, and oligarchs. Unable to shape a global narrative, Russia has instead attempted to control the narrative at home. Russia state media has banned independent reporting on Ukraine, claiming that outlets such as Echo of Moscow are disseminating dangerous disinformation to attack public morale. On Russian state TV, the conflict is still being portrayed as a special military operation and not an invasion. Casualty figures have also been carefully released slowly over time so as not to make the Russian people aware of the scale of this military disaster. To raise support at home, Russian media instead paints the crippling economic sanctions against it as aggression from the West, led naturally by the great Satan itself, the United States. But many Russian people still get their news independently, leading to massive protests that as of one week into the war, number at thousands across every city in Russia. Older generations, though, who get their news primarily from their televisions and radios, still believe the Kremlin narrative about anti-Nazi operations and Western belligerence. Sadly, recent reports coming from Russia suggest that the Kremlin has begun massive efforts to block internet access to outside news sources. But the Kremlin can't stop Ukrainian forces from giving captured Russian soldiers a chance to call home, not just a humanitarian measure, but a carefully calculated ploy to destroy Russian morale back home. News of the invasion is now reaching directly into Russian homes through the calls of loved ones, and Ukrainian influence campaigns have been so devastating to Russia's war effort that now Russian combat troops are having their smartphones confiscated before going into battle. Russia's next opening day mistake was failing to properly utilize its massive advantage in striking power. Before the United States initiated a coalition invasion of Iraq into the first Gulf War, it undertook a shock and awe 100-hour air campaign with round-the-clock attacks on the Iraqi radar, air defenses, communication nodes, government buildings, and other militarily important targets. The US's air campaign was so incredibly effective that ground forces took only four days to defeat the Iraqi army. 
While the US enjoyed the benefit of having a large coalition of nations to assist it, it was still facing one of the world's most formidable militaries at the time, with one of the world's best air defense networks. By comparison, Russia is facing an opponent with an air force a fraction of the size of Russia's own and largely Cold War era air defenses. There's simply no excuse for the shockingly poor performance of Russian strike forces except a lack of commitment. Rather than commit overwhelming air power, Russia instead chose to limit its use of air and missile strikes, likely to reduce public outrage. This is because, unlike the United States, Russia has a relatively small inventory of smart weapons and sanctions have severely hurt its ability to procure more. As one Russian general famously said, we have great firepower, we just don't always know what we're shooting at. With a lack of precision weapons, Russia was unable to neutralize Ukraine's air defenses and command and control networks with the few number of planes and attack helicopters it allotted to the task at the opening of the conflict. This is puzzling, because many predicted this channel included that Russia would initially commit large amounts of its air force in the softening up of Ukraine's defenses before returning most of that air power to its regional security requirements. However, one explanation might be Putin's attempt to frame this both to his citizens and the world as a small-scale military action, not a full-scale invasion. Rather than destroy Ukraine's ability to defend itself from air attack and communicate with its forces, Russia instead undertook only limited strikes and sent its forces in to fight a ground war against an enemy still able to communicate and conduct long-range surveillance. Incredibly, Ukraine's air force wasn't just outright destroyed at the start of the fighting, but has continued to undertake limited sorties even a week after hostilities started. It seems, though, that as the ground war becomes a painful grind, Russia's rethinking its limited use of air power and missile strikes, and over the last 48 hours as of the writing of this script, has intensified attacks against both military and civilian targets. Putin's next invasion mistake was failing to utilize the various arms of his military properly. It could be tempting to look at the shockingly poor performance of Russia's military today and claim that Russia is an inept and weak military power. But while the invasion has shown that there does in fact exist a rotten core within the Russian military machine, it's also important to understand that to date, the Russian military has not been fighting the way it trains. Russia has made little use of its combined arms capabilities in fighting the war in Ukraine, likely because Putin still hopes to sell this invasion to his own people, now that the world isn't buying it as a small-scale military action and not a full-blown war, which is exactly what it's turned into. Moving large amounts of aircraft and other support platforms to the front will break any illusion about this invasion being nothing more than a fast, clean, small-scale operation rather than an actual war. However, Putin's military has still made critical strategic errors that ended in a disastrous opening day for the invasion. Russia's much-vaunted airborne infantry, allegedly the most elite of Russia's military forces, met with immediate disaster as they failed to take two different airfields outside of Kiev on the opening day of the conflict. After successfully dropping on their objectives, they repelled an initial assault to recapture the airfields but were completely unprepared to hold it out against Ukraine's mechanized forces. Details are still sketchy, but it appears that Russia made the same mistake the Allies made in Operation Market Garden back in World War II, as they deployed airborne assaults too deep behind enemy lines. As happened to the Allies in World War II, Russian ground forces today were unable to break through Ukraine's defenses to link up with the lightly armed airborne assaults and reinforce them with heavy combat vehicles. Incredibly, it seemed that Russia believed that it could simply fly reinforcements straight into the airfields after they were captured, using its logistics fleet to move heavy armor and artillery directly to the site of their air assaults. Whether this was pure hubris from Russia as it severely underestimated Ukraine's military capabilities or a critical lack of intelligence which led the Russians to believe that the Ukrainians didn't have the firepower around Kiev to retake the LZs remains unknown. What is known is that without proper support, not even Russia's famous paratroopers, the pride and joy of its armed forces, could hold against Ukrainian defenders and were eliminated in a massive opening day disaster for Russia. Perhaps Russia's greatest mistake in this entire campaign, though, was severely underestimating the world's resolve. In preparation for the conflict, Russia had built up over $600 billion in reserves to be used specifically to counteract the effects of sanctions against the economy. However, Russia never dreamt that the world would move so quickly and thoroughly to punish it over its invasion of Ukraine. The removal of most of Russia's banks from the SWIFT international payment system has already caused one bank to file for insolvency, and the banning of Russian aircraft from most European and North America's airspace is threatening the survival of its airlines. Punishing sanctions have also been targeting Putin, his oligarch supporters, and his cabinet members directly, with Russian billionaires losing an estimated $80 billion in wealth one week into the invasion. The blocking of Russian state-run propaganda outlets Russia Today and Sputnik across Europe and North America have led these two massive media outlets to shutter their doors in the affected regions, with thousands laid off here in the US and Canada alone. 
The infamous Nord Stream 2 pipeline has also been formally axed for good, killing one of Russia's most lucrative energy deals with Europe. But what's shocking about the extreme measures undertaken by the world is that they hurt not just Russia, but the very nations and companies exacting them. And yet the West has shown it's willing to hurt itself to shut down Russian aggression, something Vladimir Putin could have never predicted. German energy prices are set to dramatically increase as it cuts off its deals with Russia, and yet the German government has been willing to shoulder the costs in order to punish Putin. Whereas once the West was fragmented and beset by infighting over how to handle its relations with Russia, this invasion of Ukraine has unified the world to a point no one could have foreseen. Putin's invasion has even led to calls from within Finland and Sweden for membership in NATO, a stunning turn of events from two nations who have maintained traditional neutrality between NATO and Russia. The Finns themselves likely remember the infamous Winter War of 1939, when the Soviet Union invaded and the neutral nation found itself fighting alone against a superior power. With such an upset of the status quo, it's not surprising the two traditionally neutral powers have seriously discussed joining NATO, and Putin's threats warning them against the idea is likely only to further encourage them to join. Russia, it seems, is only capable of one failed invasion at a time and invading Finland or Sweden is indubitably going to trigger a military response from the West. About the only way that the invasion has been to Russia's advantage has been in its relationship with China, as China has opened trade with Russia to make up for the impact of sanctions. The two pariah states have been drawing closer ties, though at best they still remain frenemies. China's unwillingness to condemn the invasion of Ukraine, however, is costing even it, as it finds itself increasingly isolated on the international stage. The fact that China has not been shy about its ambitions to conduct its own invasion of Taiwan has placed extra scrutiny on the Chinese Communist Party. With deepened ties to Russia, its neighbors are now themselves eagerly eyeing closer ties to the United States, fearful of Chinese aggression despite its claims that it respects all nations' sovereignty. It's hard to imagine a worst planned military campaign and Putin's invasion of Ukraine will surely go down as one of the greatest military fiascos in history. As it stands, Russia has just launched a war that it'll take years to resolve if it chooses to continue prosecuting it, as the Ukrainian people prove themselves capable and willing of waging an ongoing war against their occupiers. As the Russian economy continues to be savaged by international sanctions and Putin finds himself increasingly isolated politically within his own country, his decision to invade Ukraine might spell the end of his political reign and the end of Russia as a major economic and military power. February 24, 2022, 5.30 a.m. local Russian President Vladimir Putin is going live to millions of people around the world announcing a special military operation to denazify Ukraine. Even as Putin announces the beginning of his invasion, two dozen Mi-8s are already penetrating Ukrainian airspace. The transport helicopters are carrying over a hundred of Russia's most elite air assault troops, the very cream of the crop of the Russian military. Accompanying them is a flight of Ka-52 attack helicopters to provide escort, security, and fire support once they arrive at their intended target. The trip is 250 kilometers from their starting bases in Belarus, and the helicopters have been in flight for half an hour by the time the news of the invasion is being broadcast around the world. The entire formation is hot on the heels of a massive missile assault on Ukraine in preparation for the invasion. Caliber cruise missiles rain down on strategic targets across the nation, prioritizing known air defense sites. Many air defense radars are destroyed. Many more, however, survive. Yet, under intense missile and electronic warfare attack, Russia achieves the only true victory of the war by completely disrupting Ukraine's extremely dense air defense network. It'll take days for the network to reform itself, but for now Russia has near uncontested dominance of the airspace above the nation. But such a long-reaching air assault comes with risk. It would only take one battery of Ukrainian air defenses to destroy the entire assault team. So the helicopters fly fast and low, skimming over the treetops. The Vozdushno Desantny Voiska Rossi, the Russian name for the airborne force. They rely on speed, surprise, and more than a fair bit of bravery to seize victory, and if they accomplish their objective today, the war for Ukraine will be over by the end of the week. Hostomel Airport, also known as Antonov Airport, will allow Russia to fly in thousands of troops right on Kyiv's doorstep for a decapitation strike on President Zelensky's regime. As the helicopters penetrate deep into Ukraine, though, the mission planners have made one fatal mistake. Russian troops are not as well equipped as their Western counterparts, and even these elite aviators and paratroopers lack enough night vision equipment to undertake such a risky operation in the dark. Thus, the assault begins right before sunup. But this also gives Ukrainian defenders a clear view of the approaching helicopters. As the choppers near the Dnipro River, they're no longer obscured by tree cover or buildings giving Ukrainian troops clear lines of fire at the approaching formation. Caught out in the open with no possible means of defending themselves, the helicopter assault immediately comes under fire from heavy machine guns, 
One of the Mi-8 helicopters is brought under withering cannon fire as bullets riddle the belly of the aircraft and cockpit. Seconds later, it drops out of the sky, smashing into the far riverbank. A Ka-52 attack helicopter tries to suppress the enemy defenders and unleashes a rocket barrage on a heavy machine gun position. However, as it banks away, a soldier using a shoulder-fired Stinger missile lets loose, the missile striking true and blowing the Ka-52 out of the sky. A few hundred meters away, another soldier inserts a battery coolant unit into the grip stock of his Stinger system. The unit immediately releases high-pressure argon gas, the pressure causing the gas to become super-chilled. The gas is routed straight to the seeker of the missile, chilling it to sub-zero temperatures. Now ultra-sensitive to heat, the seeker is easily capable of spotting the telltale thermal signature of Russian helicopter engines even from a thousand meters away. Squeezing a trigger, the rocket motor is ignited and the missile leaps into the air. The missile is smart enough to tell the difference between a helicopter's engine and the rapidly cooling exhaust, and course-corrects to strike an Mi-8 directly below the gearbox. The helicopter immediately begins to spin out of control, crashing into the water at over 150 kilometers an hour seconds later. A cheer erupts from the defenders. Not a single Russian is seen escaping the rapidly sinking wreck. The air assault, however, continues unabated and two dozen helicopters weather the sporadic defensive fire. The Ukrainians have been taken by surprise, despite the CIA's warning that an invasion was imminent. However, not all warnings went unheeded, and the airport has had multiple defenses installed over the last two weeks. But a traitor has already given away the location of these defenses to Russian intelligence, and the assault nears the airfield. The Ka-52s take the lead. Each attack chopper knows exactly what target to hit and quickly move to neutralize heavy machine guns and troop emplacements with cannon and rocket fire. The Ukrainian defenders manning these positions are taken completely by surprise by the speed of the attack and don't stand a chance. Not all defensive positions are surprised like this, though, and soon the sound of helicopters and explosions have put the garrison troops into action. These aren't Ukrainian regulars, though. These men are mostly reservists, who did not expect to be bearing the brunt of an attack by Russia's most elite troops. They're initially overwhelmed, but soon the attacking helicopters come under withering ground fire. The Ka-52s wheel over the airfield and launch a fresh volley of rockets and cannon fire, ripping into defenders. In the distance, the sound of the approaching Mi-8s can be heard, and the Ukrainian defenders realize they're about to be overwhelmed. Serhii Falatyuk, however, refuses to break and run, and brings his 9K-38 Igla to his shoulder, lining up a shot on an attacking Ka-52. The missile strikes true and the marauding helicopter is sent plummeting to the ground. The defenders cheer and are rallied. They won't give this airfield up so easily after all. The Russians were told ground fire would be light and sporadic, but as the main air assault begins to enter the airfield, they're met with fire that is anything but light and sporadic. Captain Ivan Bolodirov is in one of the lead helicopters when suddenly it's strafed by heavy machine gun fire. The helicopter sputters and stalls in the sky, forcing the pilots to bring it to a very hard and unpleasant stop on the grass below. The men inside are thrown about and jarred in their seat harnesses, but all survive the emergency landing. The attack helos have brought enough breathing room for the Mi-8s to set down, disgorging their complement of paratroopers. The men rush to create a defensive perimeter around their choppers, then squad leaders coordinate with unit commanders to expand the perimeter to nearby buildings. They're surrounded by Ukrainians, but the reservists and draftees that make up the defending garrison are no match for the attack helicopters and the elite paratroopers. To drive the point home, a series of explosions follows the roar of jet engines as a pair of Russian Su-25s lay waste to another Ukrainian position. The jets don't hang around for long, though. Already Ukrainian fighters are on their way. They've done their job, and the majority of the air assault has successfully landed. The defending troops have been pushed out of the airport in a bloody assault that leaves many of the poorly trained and equipped defenders dead. The Russians take only light casualties. All is going well. And back in Russia, infantry and heavy vehicles are being loaded onto massive Ilyushin IL-76 airlifters. Within hours, the airport will see the first of these big planes land and disgorge hundreds of troops. With 18 in total on their way to bring troops and equipment, by the end of the day, several thousand crack Russian troops will be sitting outside Kyiv. The perimeter is quiet for a short time. An American news crew from CNN is covering the air assault within meters of the Russians. The commander of the air assault even takes time to pass off a few comments. The airport is secure, he says. However, shots soon ring out along the edge of the airport and the news crew quickly flees. The troops along the perimeter are coming under fire from Ukrainian civilians hiding amongst the trees that ring the airport. Hearing of the air assault, local militias have taken upon themselves to quickly respond and lend their aid, only to discover that the defenders had already been overrun. Help is coming, though, as the 3rd Special Purpose Regiment, an elite unit of Ukrainian Special Operations Forces, is rapidly moving to counterattack. 
These special operators are equipped and trained to NATO standards, having learned directly from American, British, Polish, and French instructors the hard lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan. They're practically chomping at the bit to go after the Russian invaders, but more importantly, they know they have to act quickly. Once the first airlifter lands, their efforts would be too little too late. Ukrainian General Valery Zelushny realizes this fact as well and immediately tasks a nearby artillery unit to begin bombardment of the airport. He also swiftly dispatches the 72nd Mechanized Brigade in a counterattack on the airport. The Russian defenders are soon once more engaged, this time by a well-organized counterattack involving Ukrainian regulars and special forces. The Ukrainians operate under the cover of artillery, with two brave helicopter pilots conducting attack runs on the airfields. But the Russians manage to repel the attack with portable anti-tank weapons which tear into the armored vehicles. Automatic grenade launchers further wreak havoc amongst the attacking troops. The Russian defensive perimeter buckles at points, and they're forced to fall back in order to consolidate their position. But they're holding the airport. The time on the arrival of the first Ilyushin is ticking. All the Russians have to do is hold long enough for it to land safely. The Ukrainian forces running into extremely stiff resistance, and without a good fix on enemy positions, the artillery is proving ineffective. They're running out of time, and they know it. If they don't push the Russians out in the next few hours, it'll all be over. The 4th Rapid Reaction Brigade of the Ukrainian National Guard has been quickly assembled and dispatched in their armored vehicles, going full speed toward the airport. Police block off civilian roads and make a clear lane for the armored vehicles. An hour later, the first infantry fighting vehicles and tanks of the 4th are arriving at the airport, throwing their weight into the battle. The Russian paratroopers have little heavy equipment to counter this armored threat with, and rely on air cover to deal with the heavy tanks and IFVs of the 4th Rapid Reaction Brigade. Nearly out of anti-tank missiles, the Ka-52 attack helicopters and a pair of Russian bombers are all that stands between the defenders and annihilation under the treads of the Ukrainian tanks. More helicopters are destroyed, but under intense cannon and rocket fire, the 4th's tanks and IFVs take heavy losses. Russian air cover can't stick around forever though, as the aircraft are quickly running out of fuel and ordnance. To make matters worse, Ukraine's air force is scrambling to overcome the shock of the attack and the effects of missile strikes against its airfields and hangars. A MiG-29 is screaming toward the airport, and it spells doom for any Russian helicopter or bomber left in the area. Forced to retreat, the paratroopers are now on their own. By now, their defensive perimeter has shrunk even more. The commander of the airborne assault has to make a fateful decision. He cannot possibly guarantee the security of landing aircraft, knowing that it might spell the doom of him and his men. He radios the information via satellite comms back to headquarters. The Ilyushins are turned around and head back to Russia. Ukrainian defenders have no idea they've just won the battle for the airport, but the fighting is far from over. The Georgian National Legion has been fighting in Ukraine since 2014, and in 2016 officially made part of the Ukrainian armed forces. Legionnaires now rush to reinforce the attack on the airport. A fresh assault bears down on the Russians. They're now out of anti-tank missiles and are running dangerously low on ammunition. Cannon and machine gun fire strafes the buildings of the airport, and the Russians realize they're about to be overrun. There's only one way to avert an even bigger disaster, and that's to retreat to the safety of the woods to the north of the airfield. As the sun begins to set, the paratroopers are ordered to retreat, the men making a mad dash for the safety of the forest outside the airport. Out of ammunition, Georgian Legion commander Mamuka Mamulashvili hops into a civilian vehicle and runs over retreating paratroopers. As the night falls, the airport finally goes quiet but the battle for the heart of Ukraine is not over. North of the airport, a giant Russian armored thrust south out of Belarus has run into unexpectedly stiff resistance at Ivankiv, a key river crossing held by the Ukrainians. Outnumbered and outgunned, the Ukrainians are forced to destroy the bridge, but many tanks and IFVs have already crossed the river. Despite being under strength, they're ordered to immediately make for Antonov Airport. The column of armored vehicles comes under attack from Ukrainian special forces and partisans, who spring several ambushes along the road to the airport. Nonetheless, the vehicles push through the ambushes, knowing that victory lies in taking and holding the airfield. The Russian paratroopers have had a sleepless few hours to rest after their retreat from the airport. On alert for Ukrainian partisans and special forces who might be on the hunt for them, they had been told Ukraine wouldn't put up much of a fight, but they had never expected such fierce resistance. The sound of approaching friendly vehicles lifts their battered spirits though. Refitted and re-equipped, the Russians organize an assault on the airport. Preempting the attack, Russian bombers conduct several preparatory strikes, inflicting serious damage to the defenders. Ukrainian air defense networks are only now starting to come back online after being forced to disperse from pre-war positions or face destruction. Russia still enjoys the ability to use close air support. It takes full advantage of the fact 
bringing withering fire down on the airport's defenders. The assault breaks on the airport with renewed vigor, and a fresh wave of paratroopers skirts Ukrainian positions to land more troops. The tide is turning, and the Ukrainian defenders can't hold under the intense pressure of the assault. Forced to retreat, Ukraine once more calls on its artillery, but this time not to attack the Russians, but to pound the runways of the airport. The big guns belch out heavy shells that smash the concrete runways to pieces, and after an hour of bombardment the runways are a mess of craters and debris. The Ukrainians are forced to cede the airport to the overwhelming Russian assault, but they have won the battle for Antonov by default. With the runways out of commission, no troops can be ferried here, making the operation to create the air bridge and quickly win the war a failed one. A parallel assault on nearby Vasilkiv airfield also ends in frustration for the Russians and leaves them with no hope of flying troops and resupply in. The greater battle for Kyiv has now begun and will rage for the next month, but by the end of it Ukraine will emerge victorious. The war will be decided in the east in the coming months, maybe years, but not within days as Russia foolishly believed it could be. On February 24, 2022, Russia brought war back to Europe after almost eight decades of peace. Its invasion of Ukraine has shattered all expectations of modern European powers resolving their problems peacefully, and brought NATO itself to the brink of full-blown war against Russia. But this is only one of four possible ways this war ends, and the other three may surprise you. To date, Russia has lost an estimated 30,000 men either killed, captured, or wounded in action. That amounts to roughly 25% of the initial invasion force's ground combat troops in just over two months of fighting. By comparison, the United States lost 58,222 killed in action over the course of the entire Vietnam War. To put it simply, such incredible casualty rates are not only unprecedented, but completely unsustainable. Already Russian losses are severe enough that it's estimated it'll take roughly two years to replace its tank losses alone. And that's only if international sanctions are lifted from the nation so it once again has access to the high-tech electronic components it doesn't produce at home. If not, Russia will be back to building Cold War-era tanks, which as we've already seen can't even stand up to manned portable NATO firepower, let alone a fully equipped NATO armored brigade. While there's currently a lot of talk about mobilization, Russian military leaders admit that mobilization will do little to help Russia win this war. It would take 90 days to fully mobilize a replacement tank regiment, and even then, they'd only be equipped with Cold War leftover tanks from Russia's vast reserves of very obsolete equipment. These tanks and their completely green conscript crews would perform even worse in Ukraine than Russia's current tank forces. Replenishing Russia's dwindling air power assets is simply untenable until sanctions are lifted or Russia takes the years necessary to retool its economy to provide high-tech electronics at home and build new aircraft. That's why the first possible way that the war in Ukraine ends is with a whimper rather than a bang. At some point, the flow of equipment reaching Ukraine from the west will simply outweigh the flow of obsolete equipment flowing into the nation from Russia. NATO military tech overpowers Russia's obsolete Cold War-era equipment, and Russian losses continue to mount trying to break stiff Ukrainian defenses. To offset combat losses and personnel, Russia enacts mobilization and floods the conflict with additional conscripts. These conscripts are undertrained and poorly equipped as well as suffering from extremely poor morale. They've been thrown into a war against a brother nation that none of them wanted to fight, while the professional volunteer soldiers, whose morale is also starting to slip, force them into combat under threats of punishment, in some cases under threat of death, as it's been reported that Chechen Katerovites have shot Russian soldiers who refuse to fight. The influx of manpower has the reverse effect in the fighting that Russia's hoping for. The tens of thousands of conscripts set loose across the front requires intense resupply at a time when Russia is already struggling to resupply the forces it already had in country. The weak morale and poor training work against Russia by leading to massive casualties and surrenders and engagements across Ukraine. Eventually, the bad morale becomes extremely infectious, leading to very serious breakdowns in discipline. We've already seen how one Russian tank commander had his legs crushed by a subordinate in anger at the extreme losses the unit took. Inevitably, a further Russian advance into Ukraine simply becomes impossible, and the offensive stops. Putin declares victory by saying that he has taken the Donbas region and secured the vital seaport of Mariupol and the all-important waterways leading to Crimea that Ukraine had previously dammed off after Russia seized the peninsula illegally in 2014. This falls way short of Putin's original goals of toppling the Ukrainian government and installing a puppet government, but it still leaves Russia in control of very strategically and economically important areas of Ukraine, while choking off about half of Ukraine's ability to export goods. The situation is not great for Russia, but it's not awful either, and if one overlooks the staggering casualties it took to get there, one might even consider it a win. However, the Ukrainians would have to accept the situation 
and it's unlikely they're willing to simply give a quarter of their country over to Russians, especially if they're winning, and while certainly Ukraine isn't winning, it's definitely not losing either. There's every sign that despite Putin's earlier assurances that he wasn't interested in physically occupying Ukraine, that this is no longer the case. Though given Putin's laundry list of lies to date, it's likely this too was a pre-planned act of deception. In Russian-occupied areas, the Russian government is now guaranteeing pensions for Ukrainian citizens living there, as well as introducing the ruble as an official currency and even replacing street signs with those written in the Russian language. A massive effort to Russify the occupied territories is underway, with frightening speed, and perhaps most worryingly of all is the fact that one of the first things being brought into occupied territories is Russian television. This means that for citizens in occupied Ukraine, their only news source is now Russian state-run news and its non-stop blitzkrieg of propaganda. Putin is clearly not planning on ceding occupied territories back to Ukraine, but what if Ukraine fights back? Across the modern eastern front in Ukraine, Ukrainian forces are pushing back against Russian positions and liberating villages. However, they are also losing ground in the south. The entire front has become a back and forth reminiscent of 20th century wars, but the all important here is that Ukraine was not supposed to be able to push back against Russian forces at all. Ukrainian forces were supposed to be completely overwhelmed by superior Russian firepower, and yet we've discovered that Russia is almost as big a threat to itself due to incompetence, bad morale, and bad equipment, and worse training as it is to Ukraine. Ukraine could simply refuse to accept Russian occupation and continue fighting. The United States of America has already pledged to continue supporting Ukraine militarily until, as House Speaker Nancy Pelosi put it, the fighting is done. Europe may not be so eager to support an ongoing war in Ukraine, but they don't have to be. In terms of overall contributions to Ukraine, Europe's contributions are a little above symbolic, with the lion's share of support coming from the United States. In recent meetings with America's defense industry leaders, President Joe Biden worked to create a strategy for the ongoing resupply of Ukraine, even if the war lasts for years. As long as Ukraine is willing to fight, the US looks willing to continue supporting it, and the longer Ukraine wants to fight, the worse it might get for the Russians. Already the initial stance on not supporting Ukraine with heavy equipment has shifted. This was due to the stunning performance of Ukrainian troops and the equally stunning incompetence of Russian troops. Western analysts predicted Ukraine would fall within three days, and nobody believed that Ukraine's military could survive, let alone beat back the Russian assault to Kyiv and beyond. Now that the US believes Ukraine can fight for months, even years, it opens up the door for providing Ukraine with heavier equipment. Already, the US has provided Soviet-built helicopters it sourced from other nations, as well as other equipment that Ukrainians are already familiar with. However, if Ukraine is committed to fighting for years and the stalemate in the East holds, there's reason to believe the United States would begin arming Ukraine with modern American equipment. This would require months of training for its crews, but after which Ukraine would be fielding capabilities far superior to Russia's own. This is only possible if Ukraine continues this fight for years as it would take that long to train Ukrainian troops and create the logistical networks required for repairing and replenishing sophisticated equipment such as the M1 Abrams. Yet if Ukraine has to date held against the Russian onslaught, there's little reason to believe the nation couldn't hold a status quo for the necessary time to rearm itself with Western equipment. Under assault from a Western-armed Ukraine, Russia would lose badly in the East and be forced to retreat. At this point, there's only two ways this war ends. The first is with a humiliating admission of defeat by Russia and a general withdrawal. This is extremely unlikely. But as the war costs continue to add up for Russia, Ukraine may be able to force this defeat condition even with current equipment. However, this would be an admission of catastrophic failure to be remembered for all of Russian history and is an unlikely move to be made by any Russian public official. The second way this could end is with the use of weapons of mass destruction against Ukrainian forces. This includes nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons. Currently, Russia has nothing to fear from Ukrainian retaliation over the use of WMDs, as the nation has none in its arsenal. Most worryingly, Russia has already planted the seeds for the justification of WMD use by creating propaganda that claims Ukraine itself has been working on chemical and biological weapons under the supervision of Russia's favorite boogeyman, the US. This is, of course, a blatant lie as Ukraine has no WMDs, and if it did, surely it would have used them in the initial desperate hours of the war when it seemed as if Russian troops would take Kyiv. Even without Ukraine overpowering Russian troops after years of armament by the West, Putin might still turn to the use of chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons. President Joe Biden has declared this a line in the sand that would be met with an appropriate response. What this means is anyone's guess, but it's feared this would mean retaliation by the United States itself 
proportional to the attack carried out by Russia. If Russia uses chemical weapons, the US might launch a chemical attack against Russian troops inside Ukraine. The US would be unlikely to use such weapons inside Russia itself, for fear of escalating the situation, and the only type of attack it might respond tit-for-tat for, for might be a nuclear one. The only thing Ukraine needs less than one nuclear attack on its own soil is two nuclear attacks on its territory. This brings us to yet another way that war in Ukraine could end. If Russia were to turn to the use of WMDs and the United States responded in kind, it could lead to that of which the world has been most fearing, a full-blown confrontation between NATO and Russia. And yet this is a nightmare scenario for Russia given how extremely poor its troops have performed against Ukraine's military, which is largely armed with Cold War weapons. Taking on NATO's professionally trained and well-equipped militaries would be a catastrophe of the highest order for Russian forces. And while before the West feared Russia's growing military might, the war in Ukraine has proven that Russia was a paper tiger all along. This is why, despite Putin's tough rhetoric against the West, the very last thing he wants to see is NATO tanks gathering outside Kaliningrad. Putin might speak tough, but he really has to ask himself just how many wars he wants to be losing at once. Our final way that the war in Ukraine might end is one that seems unlikely at first glance, but is frighteningly possible if several key facts about the conflict change. Currently, Russia is bombing civilians in their homes, and even going to great lengths to specifically target civilian shelters. Russia is also destroying civilian infrastructure not just in the east where the heaviest fighting is taking place, but all the way as far west as Lviv, which had its power plant bombed by Russia. Despite having no military value, these random civilian targets are in fact far from random because they have great terror value. Putin's strategy is simple. It follows the same strategy that Russia used in Syria. By targeting civilians, he hopes to create mass panic and fear across the country, eventually prodding the people to sue for peace. In Syria, terrorized civilians refused to support rebel forces. In Ukraine, a terrorized population could demand that its military stop fighting. With no political will to fight, Ukraine could surrender to Russia without Russia ever needing to completely dominate it. It's likely this campaign of terror would backfire against Russia, seeing as how the nation doesn't enjoy the military superiority it enjoyed in Syria. However, should it work, Russia would end up installing a pro-Kremlin leader into power in Ukraine, given the fact that today Russia seems to have no intention on returning occupied territories and is even going so far as to russify them, a puppet leader could call for a referendum on Ukraine, rejoining Russia in the style of a former Soviet republic. It's even possible that Russia would actually rebrand itself as the Soviet Union again, something that is likely extremely appealing to a Cold War diehard like Vladimir Putin. A new Iron Curtain could fall across Europe and the Cold War 2.0 would begin anew. With Ukraine pacified, Putin would inevitably invade Moldova. Recently, a Russian general accidentally let slip what seemed to be Putin's real goals in Ukraine. His efforts focused on creating a land corridor across southern Ukraine that would not only cut off Ukraine from the sea and choke its economy, but also allow access to the Moldovan breakaway region of Transnistria. From there, Russian forces could pour into Moldova as well, all under the guise of protecting Russian native speakers. Putin would be two steps closer to restoring the former Soviet Union in its full glory, with eyes indubitably turning west toward Latvia, Lithuania, and Slovakia. These three nations are currently NATO members, which makes it doubtful Putin would seriously try to invade them, especially after President Biden's declaration that the United States would fight for every inch of NATO territory. The wording of this proclamation wasn't an accident either, as the United States has been aware of internal Russian brainstorming that involved launching a tiny incursion into a Baltic state, just enough to take a single village or a few miles of border territory, and then digging in defensively. This would force NATO to go to war against the entrenched Russian defense force over an insignificant border incursion. Seeing as some current NATO members didn't even want the Baltic states to join the alliance in the first place due to their vulnerability to Russia, it's possible NATO would splinter internally over the invocation of Article 5. This would destroy confidence in the alliance, especially from its most vulnerable members in the East, and could lead to a collapse of NATO on the whole. This would leave the United States and perhaps a few other European countries fighting an extremely unpopular war that a significant portion of Europe doesn't even want. In such a scenario, it's possible Russia wins this confrontation with the West and is allowed to take as much of the Baltics as it really wants. Vladimir Putin would have finally succeeded in restoring the Soviet Union in whole and greatly escalating the potential for a devastating nuclear conflict. Crimea, the flashpoint for the ongoing invasion of Ukraine. But how did a gesture that was meant to show the quote, boundless trust and love the Russian people feel toward the Ukrainian people end up as the catalyst for the slaughter of Ukrainians at Russian hands? The stage for today's war between Ukraine and Russia was set in the late 1700s. The Crimean Peninsula had been under the rule of the Crimean Khanate, 
for 300 years and was the longest surviving splinter of Genghis Khan's once powerful Golden Horde. The peninsula was bordered by both Russia and the Ottoman Empires, but the presence of a significant number of Turkic Crimean Tatars brought the peninsula under the influence of the Ottomans. In 1768, Western Europe was experiencing a period of weakness after the Seven Years' War, and an increasingly powerful Russia took advantage of the situation to impose its influence on Poland. Guerrilla war soon broke out, though Russian troops managed to suppress most of the uprisings. One group managed to slip away from the Russian troops by crossing over the border into the Ottoman Empire. The Cossacks pursuing them paid no heed to the borders and followed to the town of Balta, where they massacred everyone. Shortly after, war broke out between Russia and the Ottomans. The Ottoman Empire was beset by infighting, though, and while technically the superior force with a superior tactical position thanks to their control of the Black Sea, Russia would end up the victor six years later. This marked the rise of Russia as a major European power, and in the peace negotiations that followed, Western Europe states worked to limit the terms of the peace treaty so as to prevent Russia from gaining too much influence in the East. Crimea, however, was annexed by Russia and soon heavily colonized by both Russians and Ukrainians, though with a population that was ultimately mostly Russian. In 1853, Russia once more went to war with the declining Ottoman Empire. Britain and France joined in on the side of the Ottomans to prevent Russia from gaining too much influence over breakaway states of the ever-declining Ottoman Empire. Much of the fighting would take place in Crimea, hence the war earning the name the Crimean War, and it would leave the peninsula devastated economically. Russian persecution of Crimean Tatars led to many being killed or forced to flee the Ottoman Empire, with the Russians ending the practice only because too much farmland was being left unattended. Despite being the focus of much of the fighting, the peninsula remained in Russian hands though. Having lost the war, the Russian Empire went into a decades-long period of decline during which it sought to reinvent itself so as to remain its former status as a major European power. For Crimea though, life would remain largely the same until the Russian Civil War of 1917. Prompted by increasing dissatisfaction over the domestic condition in Russia and a disastrous involvement in World War I, the Russian Revolution began with the Tsar stepping down from power, believing that his removal would calm the ever-increasing social unrest. In his place, the Russian Duma was formed, which was made up of prominent capitalists as well as the Russian nobility and aristocracy. This, however, did not sit well with many people. Though liberated from serfdoms decades before, their liberation had come with vast stipulations that heavily favored the nobility that once lorded over them. The common people thus distrusted the Duma and banded together into Soviets, grassroots community assemblies that sought to bring political power to the lower classes through unity. For a time, the Duma ruled alongside the Soviets, with the Duma in control of the military and international affairs and the Soviets wielding great influence over domestic affairs. With the allegiance of much of the working class and middle classes, the Soviets were too powerful for the Duma to simply disband by force or ignore. Amongst the Soviets was the quickly growing Bolshevik faction, headed by Vladimir Lenin, who campaigned on the slogan of peace, land, and bread. He wished to end the disastrous war against Germany, give land belonging to the nobles to the peasantry, and end the famine caused by Russia's losing war. With thousands of demoralized soldiers coming home from the Eastern Front, the Bolsheviks quickly grew in popularity, and support for the war dwindled. Finally, tensions exploded with the October Revolution, during which the Bolshevik forces stormed Petrograd and overthrew the provisional government, leaving them in power over all of Russia. However, not everyone in Russia accepted Bolshevik rule, prompting the Russian Civil War. Russia split into whites and reds, with the white factions consisting of capitalists, imperialists wishing to see the Tsar restored to power, and various other political factions all supported by the West, who hoped that a white victory would return Russia to the war and continue to put pressure on Germany. Crimea became a stronghold for the White Army thanks to its access to the Black Sea, which allowed for easy resupply from Western allies. The peninsula would swap hands multiple times, though, as the bloody war progressed, making it one of the bloodiest places in all of Russia at the time. However, as the war turned against the Whites, Crimea would be where they'd make their last stand in 1920. After being defeated, any surviving Whites fled to Istanbul and beyond. 50,000 White prisoners of war and civilians would end up massacred after the defeat of the White Army. In 1921, the Crimean Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic was created and officially joined with the Soviet Union. Despite claimed autonomy, though, Crimea remained very much in control of the Soviet Union, and autonomy did not protect its population from Joseph Stalin's repressions. With tensions rising in the peninsula, Stalin took advantage of the natural famine and worsened it on purpose so as to starve millions of rebellious Ukrainians, including many in Crimea. Crimea would once more become the site of atrocities during the German invasion of the Soviet Union in the Second World War. Crimea was highly sought after by the Germans due to its beauty and fertility, and 
and was seen as a crown jewel to be seized and handed over to the German colonists after the war. Thus, it became the site of many of the war's bloodiest battles, until finally falling to the Germans. Despite brutal reprisals though, the Germans were never able to secure the mountainous areas from a partisan movement that lasted until they themselves were finally expelled by Russian forces. Stalin, however, had his own plans for the ethnic cleansing of Crimea and followed German persecutions of locals and especially Jews with its forced deportation of Crimean Tatars. The Tatars had their land seized from them and forcibly deported to Central Asia in a bid to destroy them culturally. The Armenians, Bulgarians, and Greeks would follow suit, leaving mostly Russians and Ukrainians behind. The Crimean Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic was also abolished in 1945, with the peninsula being made officially a part of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. In 1954, though, the Crimean Peninsula was officially returned to the Ukrainian Republic via a decree from the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. In a front-page announcement on the official newspaper of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Pravda, the decree read, On April 26, 1954, the decree of the Presidium of the USSR Supreme Soviet transferring the Crimean Oblast from the Russian SFSR to the Ukrainian SSR. Taking into account the integral character of the economy, the territorial proximity, and the close economic and cultural ties between the Crimean province and the Ukrainian SSR, the Presidium of the USSR Supreme Soviet decrees to approve the joint presentation of the Presidium of the Russian SFSR Supreme Soviet and the Presidium of the Ukrainian SSR Supreme Soviet on the transfer of the Crimean province from the Russian SFSR to the Ukrainian SSR. The reason for the transfer of the strategically important peninsula to Ukraine was described as a symbolic gesture, marking the 300th anniversary of the 1654 Treaty of Pereyaslav. However, this doesn't hold up to scrutiny as Pereyaslav is in central Ukraine and nowhere near Crimea, and neither did the treaty affect the peninsula itself. Symbolically, the Communist Party was trying to portray the treaty as the unification between Ukrainians and Russians. But while the treaty was a major step in that direction, plenty of violence remained before Ukrainians and Russians would consider themselves brothers. The real reasons are numerous. Nina Khrushcheva, political scientist and great-granddaughter of Nikita Khrushchev, believed that the transfer of the peninsula to the Ukrainian people was partially symbolic, partially an effort to reshuffle the centralized political system, and also because Khrushchev had always been fond of Ukraine. She believed that it was a gesture from her great-grandfather to what was his favorite republic. However, Sergei Khrushchev, son of Nikita Khrushchev, claimed that the decision was due to the building of a hydroelectric dam on the Dnieper River and a desire for the administration of the Ukrainian territory to be under a single body. Thus, ceding the peninsula back to the Ukrainian Republic was a measure of convenience. Other reasons, though, include the integration of the Ukrainian and Crimean economies and the belief that Crimea was a natural extension of the Ukrainian steppes. There was even some desire to repopulate Crimea with Slavs after the expulsions of the Crimean Tatars by Stalin in 1944. One effect of the transfer, however, was the unifying of the Ukrainian and Russian people. Savatopol in Crimea was the home of the Soviet Black Sea Fleet and an all-important naval base for the Soviets, through which they could influence the Black Sea and the Mediterranean and beyond. By transferring the peninsula, it bound Ukraine closer to Russia, and even the 1954 posters announcing the event ran with the slogan, Eternally Together. Whatever the reasons, the transferring of the peninsula did indeed bring the Russian and Ukrainian people closer together, resulting in great benefit to both. However, as the Soviet Union began to disintegrate in 1989, Ukraine declared its independence shortly after, taking Crimea along with it. This suddenly put the Russian Navy in a very disadvantageous position in the Black Sea, further impacting its ability to influence the Mediterranean. Vladimir Putin vowed to resolve that situation and took advantage of a political strife in Ukraine in 2014 to forcibly annex the peninsula. Putin claimed that he was merely responding to the request of a majority Russian population to be part of the Russian Federation. Crimea would end up emboldening Putin, however, and fueling his support for breakaway republics in eastern Ukraine. Claims were made that these republics too contained a majority of citizens who wanted to rejoin Russia, and public referendums were held that showed support in favor of leaving Ukraine, though these results were immediately disputed since no independent sources were allowed to verify the voting and the results weren't recognized by either the Ukrainian government or any UN member countries. This only added to the tension of the ongoing Russo-Ukrainian war, which has now lasted until at least 2022, and following Putin's decision to invade all of Ukraine, it doesn't appear to be ending anytime soon. What happens next in Ukraine is anyone's guess, though the current invasion is going disastrously for Russia. And in just the first two weeks of fighting, Russia lost more men and equipment than the United States did in 20 years of fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
Even if Russia succeeds in defeating the Ukrainian military, it's impossible for its army to secure the entire country against a raging insurgency hell-bent on expelling Russian troops from their native soil. With so much political goodwill destroyed between Russia and Ukraine, and with the blacklisting of Russia internationally, along with the staggering losses in lives and equipment, even if Russia wins in Ukraine, it will still have lost the war. In 1991, Ukraine declared itself independent as the Soviet Union collapsed around it. For years after, the new Russian Federation struggled to find its footing, and for a small time there were hopes that the Cold War could be left in the past and Russia would find its way to embracing better relationships with the West. However, those hopes were dashed with the election of President Vladimir Putin, a Cold War-era Soviet spy who was still stuck with a Cold War mentality. For Putin, the Soviet Union might have collapsed, but the dream of Soviet greatness wasn't dead and the one thing standing between his dream and the new Russian Federation was the West. In Putin's eyes, Russia was forever locked in a zero-sum game with the West, and there could only be one victor. As the Soviet Union disintegrated, newly freed Soviet republics and former client states immediately sought out membership in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. For those former republics and client states, it was the only way to guarantee their newfound independence after decades of brutal rule and oppression by the Kremlin. The Soviet Union might be gone, but nobody had any illusions about the Russian Federation suddenly wanting to be BFFs with the world, and the election of Vladimir Putin only reinforced a growing need for NATO membership. In 1990, NATO had promised that the alliance would not expand an inch to the east, yet this was before the collapse of the Soviet Union and clearly meant that the alliance wouldn't seek to expand into East Germany while the nation was divided. There had never been any discussions about NATO not expanding eastward toward Russia's borders after the collapse, as confirmed by Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev. That doesn't mean that Russia didn't warn NATO about expanding, it's just that there was no formal agreement against expansion. For Russia, NATO expanding eastward triggered fears of past historical invasions of Russia by foreign powers. The nation has suffered greatly from foreign invaders, and thus after World War II, Stalin worked hard to ensure that Eastern Europe remained under his influence. Europe was thus divided along Germany, with the Soviet Union controlling everything in Europe east of Germany and using it as a security buffer between itself and the West. The buffer served two purposes. First, it was a physical barrier to invasion. After both German invasions and the invasion of the French during the Napoleonic War, Russia suffered great loss of life and damage to its economy. Eastern Europe was now a shield that protected the motherland with any would-be invader having to pass through the entire Soviet bloc to reach Russian lands. Even better, millions of Eastern Europeans would themselves be thrown into war to protect the Soviet Union, placing the nation in the strongest position it's enjoyed since the heights of the Russian Empire. But this barrier was also an ideological one, meant to keep Western capitalist influence away from the Soviet homeland. The power of the Communist Party depended on keeping Stalinist ideology alive inside the Soviet Union. Liberal Western values and democracies threatened this. This has never been more true than it was post-2000s, after Vladimir Putin's rise to power. Liberal Western values are now seen as an infection in Russia, because they threaten President Putin's absolute power on the Russian government. For Putin, Russia today is under assault by Western culture, and he spent great efforts in waging a propaganda war both within and outside its borders. The last thing Putin or his elites want is a free, democratic Russia, and the only way they can prevent the ever-brewing political unrest amongst the population is by creating boogeymen out of the West to unite the Russians against. Starting in the early 2010s, Ukraine now wished to draw itself closer economically and politically with the West, much to Putin's dissatisfaction. At first, there was a wish to be more economically tied to the West to ensure Ukraine's prosperity. But as Russia exerted more pressure on Ukraine, a growing movement to formally join NATO grew inside Ukraine. Putin attempted to suppress this desire through intimidation and by using propaganda inside of Ukraine, even by infiltrating its government. In 2014, the situation came to a crisis point when President Viktor Yanukovych of Putin's stooge refused to sign a free trade agreement with the European Union which would have drawn Ukraine deeper into the West's fold both economically and politically. Instead, President Yanukovych ignored the Ukrainian parliament's overwhelming desire to sign this agreement and chose to draw closer to Russia and the Eurasian Economic Union, headed by the Russian Federation and made up of former Soviet states. The result was immediate, as protesters took to the streets and a full-blown civil insurrection threw Kyiv into chaos. The Ukrainian people had freed themselves from Russian rule and had no wish to go back to being a mere client state, and brutal clashes took place between protesters and police. The revolution of dignity, as it came to be known, resulted in the occupation of the government buildings across Ukraine, 
and the expulsion of President Viktor Yanukovych from power. Soon after, Yanukovych went into exile in Russia, and Russia responded to the coup by taking Crimea and supporting the breakaway provinces of Luhansk and Donetsk. Russia orchestrated pro-Russian demonstrations in Sevastopol, and four days later, Russian troops without insignia stormed into the parliament of Crimea and seized it, while other Russian troops took key strategic sites along the peninsula. With the peninsula secure, the Russian Federation installed the pro-Russian Sergei Askinov into power. Shortly after, there was a referendum that resulted in 97% of voters choosing for Crimea to be absorbed by the Russian Federation. Perhaps unsurprisingly, those votes were never verified by any independent agency, and the United Nations voted overwhelmingly to consider the referendum illegal. Thus, to this day, internationally, Crimea is still considered as belonging to Ukraine. But with Vladimir Putin threatening to use nuclear weapons, nobody sought to use military force to liberate the occupied peninsula. At the same time that Russian forces were seizing Crimea, Russia's infamous Little Green Men, so-called for their green insignia-less uniforms, moved into the separatist regions of Luhansk and Donetsk, working alongside separatists and even engaging in fighting themselves. Russia denied allegations that its military was in the separatist regions, but the ruse was all but given up over time as even Russian armor joined the fighting against Ukrainian forces. The Donbass War, as it came to be known, would rage until 2022, culminating in Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. The real question is, though, what does President Vladimir Putin really want to do with Ukraine when the war is all over? The answer depends on how the war ends. The least likely way that this war ends is with a full occupation of Ukraine by Russian forces. Initially, Putin claimed that he had no intention of occupying any part of Ukrainian territory and that his advance on Kyiv was merely meant to remove what he called pro-Western Nazi government from power. In the early stages of war, this might have been true. Putin may truly have not wished to physically occupy Ukraine and instead settled for installing a puppet government. This would turn Ukraine into a client state, much like Belarus, without the hassle of having to pacify an inevitable insurrection by physically occupying it. It would also achieve his grand aim of weakening NATO by denying it yet another member especially one situated right on Russia's soft southern belly. However, as the Russian advance into Kyiv faltered and then failed entirely, Putin's strategy seemed to radically change as well. Accepting that he would be unable to take Kyiv and topple the government, Russian forces instead focused on breaking out of the separatist regions and seizing the all-important Ukrainian southern coast along the Sea of Azov. With this coastline firmly under Russia's control, Vladimir Putin now has a land corridor from Russia straight to Crimea and Crimea's water supply can no longer be threatened by Ukrainian dams as it happened after the annexation when Ukraine blocked Crimea's drinking water in retaliation to the invasion. This land corridor, however, also gives Russia complete control over the Sea of Azov, essentially turning it into a Russian lake. Putin's forces now try to push north and west out of the land corridor and seem to want to take as large a chunk of Ukraine as possible. What's more important, however, is extending a corridor to the west all the way to Odessa and the Moldovian border. This would give Russia complete control over Ukraine's shipping ports and thus allow it to choke off Ukraine economically, but also allow it to link up with its forces inside the Moldovan breakaway region of Transnistra. Russia currently has 1,500 personnel there, and it's greatly feared that linking a land corridor across southern Ukraine will allow it to move more forces into the region and eventually take all of Moldova. This will give Russia control over half of the Black Sea and extend a security buffer out from Russia's vulnerable southern regions in case of a war with NATO. It's now certain that Putin wishes to completely annex occupied territories inside of Ukraine, as starting May 1st, the ruble was introduced as the official currency in the occupied areas that remain relatively stable and in Russian hands. Street and building signs were also all taken down and replaced with their Russian equivalent, and Russia guaranteed the pension payments of Ukrainian pensioners living in the territories. Even more importantly, Russian state TV was brought to the occupied territories, allowing Russia to feed those living under occupation a steady stream of Russian propaganda. Putin's goal is now territorial expansion, and it seems as if his plans for Ukraine hinge on what happens next in the war. Russian forces seem incapable of truly taking the whole of Ukraine, and the commitment by the West, especially the United States, to arm the Ukrainians makes it a complete impossibility that Russia will be able to take over the entire country. However, Russian forces may be able to seize that all-important land corridor to Moldova and take Odessa. Even though this is in question, seeing as three months into the war, Russia is yet to bring Mariupol under its full control. Further west, Kherson is a critically important city to capture, and as of the writing of this video, Ukrainian forces are launching successful counterstrikes against Russian forces around the city. This makes a breakout to Odessa extremely unlikely, but this isn't Russia's only problem. Corruption and incompetence across all levels of the Russian military have resulted in massive casualties 
and great loss of equipment in the invasion. The effects of these losses on Russia's ability to continue fighting are only compounded by the astounding amount of sanctions levied against Russia by the international community. Of greatest importance, though, are those targeting Russia's foreign reserves, which fund the war, and of which half have been frozen by Western governments. Of second most importance is the complete ban on selling electronic components to Russia, which are desperately needed by its military to rearm itself with 21st century weapons. Already Russian drones and other advanced weapons are being discovered with computer chips ripped out of coffee makers and dishwashers, and Russian jet fighters have been discovered with commercial GPS devices taped to the dash. With the West feeding Ukraine a steady diet of high-tech Western weapons, and with Russia's own stockpile of advanced equipment drying up, it's becoming increasingly impossible for Russia to truly win inside Ukraine. As Europe is committed to an incremental ban on Russian energy imports over the next year or so, Russia's economic situation will only grow more desperate, and its ability to continue this conflict will be in serious jeopardy. Russia is thus likely to attempt to settle the war by holding onto territories it's managed to secure, adding them to the Russian Federation, and weakening Ukraine. Ukraine itself has been willing to compromise by becoming a neutral nation, with neutrality enshrined in its constitution and thus seeking no closer ties to the West. However, Ukraine wishes to have guarantor states sign this neutrality agreement with nations legally bound to come to Ukraine's defense in case of another Russian invasion. Yet, as reports of Russian brutality against civilians continue to surface from occupied areas, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has stated that he is less and less interested in such a deal. Ultimately, unless Russia achieves some miraculous battlefield reversals, Putin's future plans for Ukraine may not matter at all. It's no secret the world is largely united against Russia and its invasion of Ukraine. But it might surprise you just how the Russian people feel about this invasion. To understand the Russian people and their support for Vladimir Putin, first you have to understand Russian culture and society. Unlike many countries who experienced great evil in the past, Russians never truly came to terms with the abuses of the Soviet Union. In fact, most Russians today still believe that Joseph Stalin was a great man, despite the fact that he imprisoned and killed millions of his own people. In 2016, the dead dictator's approval rating was 54% in a poll conducted by the Moscow Times. In 2019, though, 70% of Russians polled by the independent Levada Center said that Stalin played a favorable role for Russia. Over half of those surveyed even said that they personally viewed Stalin favorably. In May of 2021, a new poll showed that 56% of Russians viewed Stalin as a great leader. South Africa actively strode for racial reconciliation after apartheid. The United States has made civil rights for people of color and other minorities a front and center issue in domestic politics for decades. And Germany has completely denounced its Nazi past and actively works to educate its own children on the horrors of the regime, convinced that such a thing should never happen again. All of these countries and more have acknowledged their past and taken responsibility for it, while taking steps to rehabilitate their societies from the ill effects of said past. It may be an ongoing process in some cases, but the fact that it's happening at all is what's important. Russia has never experienced a collective reconciliation over the brutality of the Soviet regime. And this explains much about the current attitudes on Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Rather than acknowledge all the evils of leaders like Stalin and the great economic and physical harm caused by the Soviet Union, the Russian people have shifted the blame to various groups. A common sentiment in response to the evils of the Soviets is that it was the Bolsheviks. Bafflingly, sometimes Russia's favorite bogeyman, the United States, is to blame. Culpability is constantly deflected from one group to another, and the Russian people aren't completely to blame for this lack of self-accountability. Since 2021, it's been illegal in Russia to deny that the Soviet Union played a decisive role in overcoming fascism in World War II. And it's likewise illegal to equate the war crimes of the Soviet Union, of which there were many, with those committed by Nazi Germany. In Russian schools, history is taught selectively, with many of the Soviet regime's worst abuses either played down or simply not taught. Vladimir Putin even went to great lengths to spin the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany as a diplomatic victory. This pact outlined how Eastern Europe would be carved out by the two world powers, and was so shameful even to Soviet leaders that Mikhail Gorbachev publicly denied it and attempted to rewrite the history behind the pact. This time of historical rewriting by Vladimir Putin's administration helps us to understand why so many Russians support the war in Ukraine today. In 2005, just a few years after Putin's ascension to power, 40% of those polled agreed that Stalin had absolutely decimated the Red Army's leadership prior to World War II with his paranoid purges. This is, of course, a matter of historical fact, and the reason why the Soviets performed so astonishingly poorly during the Winter War against a much smaller Finland. 
Yet in 2021, only 17% of respondents agreed on the 2005 question. Putin has spent considerable resources to rewrite Russia's understanding of their own history, fully in preparation for his orchestration of a return to a repressive Soviet time, under his firm leadership, of course. Anyone who tries to bring up real history of the Soviet Union is painted as a foreign agent, probably American ones at that, as Putin has turned the US into a national boogeyman who's hiding under every bed and in every closet. His total information control doesn't just extend to the past, though, but also to the present, as media in Russia now is the least free it's been since the strictest days of censorship during the Soviet Union. Journalists who dug too deep into issues the Kremlin did not want exposed, or who wrote articles the Kremlin didn't like, were often discovered dead or missing. For a while, Russia was officially one of the most dangerous places to be a reporter in, and this included places like active war zones in Africa or in the Middle East. After the invasion of Ukraine, Putin's control over the media has only tightened to the point that the average Russian receives a steady diet of pure propaganda. It's now illegal in Russia to refer to the war in Ukraine as anything other than a special military operation, and this law is enforced with steep fines and as many as 15 years in prison. Putin has also passed a law that is in essence the widest sweeping form of censorship that Russia has seen in decades. It's not just illegal to call the war anything other than a special military operation, but it's also illegal to write, post, or say anything meant to hurt Russian morale or spread misinformation. What actually counts as hurting Russian morale or misinformation is, of course, left up to the Kremlin. This gives Putin and his administration incredible power to shape narratives on the war in Ukraine any way they wish. So, how do Russians feel about the war? Given Russia's lack of free speech and government interference in most media, getting accurate data is rather difficult. However, polls conducted by independent and not-so-independent agencies across Russia since the start of the invasion all clearly show overwhelming support for the Russian invasion of Ukraine. One survey showed 65% were in favor of the invasion, while a second showed 71. Independent polls routinely show figures above 50% approval. How can so many Russians support one of the most horrific conflicts in Europe since World War II? There's a reason why Putin has insisted the war be called a special military operation. It's careful phrasing that's meant to encourage the Russian people that there is no war, just a low-grade military operation. This is no different than a military operation the US might undertake to eliminate a new Al-Qaeda cell in a remote corner of Africa. Military operations are routine and even more importantly not very wide-sweeping. This is important because despite the two nations having taken wildly different paths since the fall of the Soviet Union, Ukraine is still seen as a brother nation to most Russians. The two share much of the same history and culture, and large amounts of the population speak the same language. The kinship was so close that before the war, Russian troops in the first few weeks of fighting were genuinely shocked that they'd been greeted not as liberators, but as invaders and occupiers. Putin admitting to the Russian people that he was launching a full-scale invasion of Ukraine would be like President Biden announcing that the United States was going to invade Britain. It's an unthinkable proposition for the American people to see themselves at war with a nation they consider to be a true brother nation. And likewise, the Russian people would be shocked to find out the truth about the brutality of Russian actions inside Ukraine. The careful language allows Putin to minimize this outrage, but also allows him to craft the narrative that he needs to continue gaining Russian support. By framing the invasion as a special military operation, Putin has convinced many of the Russian people that this war is actually about securing the safety of the Russian-speaking population of Donbas. But Putin still needed a boogeyman, someone that the Russian people would see as an enemy, and that's why he tapped into history. Putin's public justification for the invasion was that he was cleansing Ukraine of the threat of neo-Nazism. To the world, this is a ridiculous proposition, but to many Russians, it's an issue near and dear to their hearts. Their nation, after all, suffered more than any other at the hands of the Nazis during the Second World War. Thus, by painting this as a conflict against a resurgence of Nazism that threatened fellow Russian speakers, Putin was able to portray this as a heroic and moral war. The fact that these imaginary Nazis are right outside Russia's border only helps those spinning this war as a fight against fascism. Even the fact that Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is Jewish has been spun by Russian propagandists who point out that Hitler also had Jewish blood in him. When Russia immediately ran into trouble inside Ukraine, not even the tightest of information control could stop the slow realization that this was no small-scale military operation. Russia was at full-scale war, and its military needed to mobilize as such. The impact of the fighting is so intense that an estimated 20% of all Russian tanks have been destroyed, though this relies only on visual confirmation, and thus the real total is indubitably much higher 
3,342 armored vehicles have been confirmed destroyed, damaged, abandoned, or captured by Ukrainian forces. 115 combat aircraft have also been destroyed, damaged, or captured. Now Putin needed to justify the broadening of the special military operation into full-scale war, and to do this, he once more summoned the favorite Russian boogeyman, the United States of America. The new narrative is that NATO, at the behest of the US, is fighting a proxy war against Russia, while extremists inside of Ukraine pull the strings and force their army and population to fight a war they don't really want to. Casualties are estimated to have reached as high as 20,000 dead, with Ukraine claiming to have confirmed 18,900 as of April 8 via bodies they have personally collected or intercepted intelligence reports. Yet the Kremlin has cleverly spun this as the work of NATO and the US, thus rallying the Russian people against the much-hated West. But not all Russians support the invasion. In fact, 6,500 people were arrested across 53 cities in Russia during February 24 to March 2 in anti-war protests as tens of thousands took to the streets. However, the passage of new censorship laws have taken the wind out of the sails of any Russians who oppose the invasion, as they live in fear of arrest for their anti-war views. Russian police have even been documented searching vehicles and homes for evidence of anti-war sentiments, and Russia is slowly reverting back to a Soviet-era culture of neighbors snitching on neighbors. One thing is clear, though. While most Russians support the war in Ukraine, young Russians are the demographic most likely to not support the invasion. And since the start of the war, hundreds of thousands of them have left Russia. Turkey has become a hotbed of anti-war, anti-Putin sentiment among Russians who have fled their own country, as the EU will not allow passage for anyone with a Russian passport. While Russia has disconnected much of global social media from itself, young Russians are more likely to be able to know how to bypass national internet blocks via VPNs, and this exposes them to international news where they can see the truth about the consequences of the brutal war in Ukraine. Translating that to the older population, however, has not been as successful, and many young Russians report they no longer speak with parents or grandparents over their difference of views on the war. Putin may have the support of the majority of the population, but he has very little support amongst the two segments of the population that matter the most, young people and military conscripts. With conscripts making up a quarter of Russian forces, by the end of the war there will be tens of thousands of Russian conscripts returning home with their own version of the war to share. Here, it's important to note that the February Revolution of 1917, which overthrew the Tsar, was largely premeditated by the return of thousands of disillusioned troops from their time on the front. As casualties mount, the reality of the war will begin to sink home with average Russians who have lost husbands, brothers, and fathers in Ukraine. And Putin won't be able to deflect for long the anger of thousands of families grieving loved ones by blaming the West. The battle for Kyiv was supposed to take a few days, a week at the most. Spearheading the assault was Russia's vaunted paratroopers, forces so revered in Russia that they have their own holiday. Yet within 48 hours it was clear the air assault on Kyiv had failed, with terrible losses amongst Russia's elite troops. And for weeks after, the Russian column attempting to enter the Ukrainian capital suffered devastating counterattack after counterattack as it struggled to meet basic resupply needs. Eventually, Russia declared defeat and retreated, using troops aimed at the heart of the Ukrainian nation to instead reinforce the fight in the east. But what if the assault on Kyiv had succeeded? What if the war in the east fails for Ukraine? What will happen if Russia formally annexes the breakaway Soviet Republic and brings it once more back into the fold? The current Russian offensive seems to have dramatically redefined goals. At the start of the war, it was clear that Russia was attempting a decapitation strike on the Ukrainian capital, hoping to subdue the nation in days and install a puppet leader. When the assault on Kyiv failed, the Russian goals were redefined and a settlement of sorts appears to have been reached. Instead of taking the entire nation and turning into a Russian proxy like Belarus, Russia appears to be satisfied with first taking the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Then Russian efforts have been focused on seizing a land corridor to Crimea and securing the Dnipro River. This this will allow Russian-occupied Crimea to no longer be at the mercy of Ukraine, which in the past had cut off the peninsula from vital freshwater supplies by building a dam. The move caused Crimea's agricultural industry to shrink dramatically and greatly limited the economic opportunities available to Russian investors there. It's currently questionable if Russia can maintain its hold on these regions, though. As of the making of this video, Ukraine is launching a brutal counterattack across the southeastern part of the nation and is within striking distance of Kherson. Taking Kherson would give Ukrainian forces an easy crossing point across the Dnipro River and also allow them to base aircraft and long-range artillery, such as the American HIMARS, to attack against targets inside Crimea. Kherson would also allow the Ukrainian military to threaten Russian ships inside the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov with long-range anti-ship missiles, tech which is still being provided to Ukraine by the West. 
This counterattack would not have been possible without the aid of U.S. long-range attack platforms such as HIMARS and the TACOM, which allow Ukrainian forces to finally threaten Russian forces with deep strikes. For two months, Ukraine used its Western weapons to destroy supply and movement routes, such as blowing up the bridges outside of Kherson on the eastern side of the city, and to strike at ammunition depots and command posts. The effect was telling, with the Russian military being forced to move its supply centers further away from the front, greatly increasing the time required for resupply of combat troops and slowing any combat operations they might attempt to undertake. The loss of many senior command staff to deep strikes has also had a severe effect on both morale and the Russian military's ability to fight, limiting the scope of its combined arms operations. If Russia was to take the whole of Ukraine, it would first need to cut off the flow of Western weapons into the nation. Yet Russia has little to no political capital left to influence Western powers to cease supplying Ukraine, and its attempts to bully Europe into submission by cutting down on gas supplies has done little to stop the flow of advanced weapons into the Ukrainians. In fact, the supply of Western weapons has only increased in both numbers and scope, with the American Congress approving the training of Ukrainian pilots to fly the F-15 Eagle. In six months' time, it's extremely likely that the Ukrainian Air Force will be operating American F-15s armed with advanced medium-range anti-air and anti-radiation missiles, putting Russian control of the skies in serious jeopardy. Meanwhile, Russia's own stockpiles of modern weapons are running out, and with sanctions of high-tech materials such as semiconductors, the Russian defense industry is unable to replace advanced modern weapon systems. To take Ukraine, Russia would somehow have to completely reverse the political and strategic picture, a frankly impossible event. As there is no realistic scenario where Russia succeeds in taking the whole of Ukraine, we still have to suspend disbelief and imagine what would happen if this somehow happened. The very first thing that would happen if Russia took the whole of Ukraine is it would make Moldova incredibly nervous. Transnistria is a breakaway region along Moldova's border with Ukraine that has strong ties to Russia and the old Soviet Union. In fact, Russia maintains a very small contingent of troops there to act as peacekeeping forces after a brief conflict between Moldova and the breakaway region. During the early weeks of the war in Ukraine, it became apparent to many observers that Russia was attempting to push deep through the south of Ukraine to Odessa, even bombarding Odessa in preparation for an assault. But this push wasn't just to take the strategically important port city, but also to facilitate the creation of a Russian-controlled corridor extending all the way to Transnistria, giving the Russians access to Moldova. If Ukraine were to fall to Russia, Moldova would inevitably be next. Moldova is technically a neutral state, fearing Russian reprisal if it were to make a bid to join NATO. As such, it's not protected by the organization's defense commitment and would be easy pickings for the Russian military. Taking Moldova would allow Russian forces to create an even larger buffer in the south between itself and NATO in case of war. And from military bases in the country, it could threaten most of the Black Sea with long-range attack munitions, a very important capability for Russia as in any conflict with NATO, the weak Russian Black Sea Fleet would be destroyed rather quickly. With so much territory to buffer NATO with in the south, it would allow Russia to concentrate more forces along its border with the Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, putting more pressure on those breakaway republics and seriously threatening them in case of war. Of course, now that Sweden and Finland are in the process of joining NATO, being able to reinforce its northern borders is of even greater importance for Russia. Just remember that if you've ever had a bad day, at least you're not the Russian leader who dedicated his life to destroying NATO and ended up making making it even stronger. Control over Ukraine would help Russia counter NATO's ability to project air and naval power into the Black Sea. It would in effect leave Russia with full control over the entire northern coastline, and most of its eastern coast as well thanks to the military occupation of regions of Georgia. From bases along the coast, Russia could use its land forces to make up for its relative naval weakness and shut the Black Sea off to NATO fleets under threat of great loss of both life and ships. However, of even greater importance would be Russia's rights to the vast oil and natural gas reserves hiding under the Black Sea, large amounts of which are currently under Ukraine's claimed economic exclusion zone. The taking of Crimea by Russia in 2014 gave it access to a good chunk of those reserves, but taking all of Ukraine's southern coast would place a significant amount of those reserves in Russian hands. Having access to these vast new reserves would make Russia an even greater energy superpower than it currently is, and with energy fueling the majority of the Russian economy, it can be argued that seizing these reserves is not only a goal, but perhaps a matter of national economic survival. What is certain, though, is that the acquisition of approximately half of the Black Sea's energy reserves would give Russia significantly more leverage over the West, while denying it the economic bounty lurking under the waves. The Black Sea isn't the only strategically important water feature that Russia is seeking to control from an invasion of Ukraine. The Sea of Azov has historically been of extreme importance to regional powers because of its economic interests. Control over the Sea of Azov has resulted in conflicts that have raged over a millennia, and the state 
state that has managed to control both sides of the Kirk Straits has reaped great economic rewards from doing so as the sea is a vital trade artery. As the world has discovered in recent months, Ukraine is vitally important for two other reasons. It's one of the largest suppliers of sunflower oil and grain in the world. In fact, it's the biggest supplier of sunflower oil on the planet, and the nation provides a whopping 40% of the World Food Program's wheat supply. Thanks to the war, both of these badly needed foodstuffs have been threatened, leaving populations in developing nations under threat of famine and starvation. The situation had become so serious that eventually Russia was forced to allow the shipping of Ukrainian grain via Turkish proxies bringing much-needed food relief to places such as Africa. If Russia were to control Ukraine, it would be in control of a significant amount of not just the world's energy supply, but also its food supply. This would put Russia in a position of considerable leverage over Western nations it currently sees as rivals by putting pressure on two different critical areas, food and energy. Already, Russia has attempted to deny exports of Ukrainian wheat so as to influence global opinion against the West, having some success in turning public opinion in developing nations against the Western powers, and attempting to leverage this pressure to ease sanctions on itself and halt supplies of weapons to Ukraine. To many suffering from food security issues, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a European matter that shouldn't affect them, and the West is seen as making a bad situation worse by leveraging heavy sanctions against Russia and providing weapons to Ukraine, both of which are extending the war and preventing food from being shipped through the Black Sea. Russia's control over the whole of Ukraine would inevitably see the West turn away from its reliance on Russia for not just energy but food as well. While this would be a very good strategic move, helping to erode Russia's own strategic advantages, it would inevitably result in higher food prices as demand for food from elsewhere skyrockets. It would also inevitably lead to the expansion of farmland across the West or in other nations, prompting great amounts of ecological destruction. Perhaps the greatest effect of a Russian annexation of Ukraine, however, would be dramatic reshaping of the strategic picture in Europe itself. Russia would have returned a significant amount of former Soviet territory into the fold, and would be able to deploy forces to threaten NATO across the southern European plain. This would give NATO a much broader front to fight Russia on in case of a war, and erode NATO's ability to launch deep penetration assaults that seek to end a war with Russia quickly. From bases in Ukraine, Russian forces could threaten a significant number of NATO airfields and military bases with long-range attack munitions as well. The greatest victory, however, would be psychological, as Russia throws off three decades of slow decay and proves to the world that it's once more a formidable global power. This would have immediate ramifications for neighboring states such as the Baltic countries, which Russia has made no secret it wishes were back under its fold. Faced with a dramatically evolved strategic picture, NATO might need to rethink guaranteeing the security of states it's already poorly capable of defending in case of war, granting Russia yet another major geopolitical victory. With tensions skyrocketing in Ukraine, a confrontation between the United States and Russia is more likely than ever. But what would that look like, and how do these two military heavyweights compare? If Russia and the US come to blows, anyone caught in their way better make sure not to get underfoot of these two military titans. The US remains the world's premier military superpower, but Russia holds fast to the number two spot, just barely edging out over China's rising star. In Russia, crippling sanctions over the annexation of Crimea have bled Russia dry for almost a decade and been an absolute economic disaster for the nation. Not only is the Russian economy critically weakened, but sanctions and stagnation have led to a slow but steady brain drain of Russian talent out of the country. Russian professionals, entrepreneurs, academics, and artists are all migrating out of the country and seeking better opportunities in Europe or the US. The lack of a diversified economy is a crippling vulnerability for Russia, and the global fall in oil prices has only made economic woes even worse for the nation. This has directly translated into a sharp decline in military capabilities, as budgets shrink and planned replacements for aging equipment fail to materialize. Slowly but surely, the gap in technological capabilities between Russia and the US is growing. The United States has its own financial woes, seeing the worst inflation it's seen in 40 years. With interest rate hikes coming in 2022, the American economy is sure to feel the pinch as investors tighten their purse strings. However, the American economy remains strong and well diversified, leaving it far less vulnerable to economic disruption than Russia, whether that disruption comes from social change, technology, or war. But what do the numbers say about a possible war between the two heavyweights? Population matters in a prolonged war. Without population, there are no reinforcements, and an economy is far more vulnerable to mass conscription and casualties. The United States has a population of 334,998,000 versus Russia's 142,321,000, giving the US over a 2 to 1 advantage in population. However, that's only part of the story, because Russia's aging population only makes its disadvantages even worse in comparison to the US. 
The U.S. has approximately 147,399,000 conscripts potentially available to fight a brutal multi-year conflict, while Russia only has 69,737,000. Of those potential conscripts, though, approximately 122,274,000 are fit for combat duty in the U.S., while in Russia only 46,681,000 potential recruits are fit for combat. Every year, 4.4 million American youth reach military age, but Russia's population crisis sees only 1.3 million youth reach military age. Both nations are experiencing a decline in birth rates, with the U.S. birth rate at 1.70 and Russia's at 1.50. This is below the 2.1 birth rate required to sustain a population, but the United States continues a positive population growth thanks to healthy amounts of immigration. Russia, on the other hand, is experiencing a population decline. In simple terms, if the two powers engage in a mass casualty conflict that spans multiple years, Russia will be bled dry long before the U.S. is. A modern war, however, will likely be too fast and brutal for population trends to determine a winner, even if it doesn't turn nuclear. That's why what might matter most is the number of personnel both countries can muster within months of hostilities starting. The United States enters a potential conflict with a military of 1.39 million strong, while Russia maintains an active duty force of 850,000. The difference is staggering, with the U.S. military almost twice as big as the Russian military, giving the U.S. an immediate numerical advantage. Another advantage the U.S. enjoys is a professional all-volunteer fighting force. While Russia has had to cancel plans to transition to an all-volunteer force due to economic woes and shrinking budgets, However, Russia has come a long way from when its military was staffed primarily by conscripts, and today only about 30% of the Russian military is conscripted, or about 225,000. The disadvantage is still significant, though. A professional all-volunteer military is more likely to retain highly trained individuals who over time transition into senior leadership positions. This fills the upper echelons of an all-volunteer force with seasoned veterans who make all the difference in combat operations. A conscripted military, however, struggles greatly to retain individuals over the long term, leading to veterancy issues and a lack of well-tested command corps. There's no direct way to measure the advantage of an all-volunteer military versus a partially conscripted one, but throughout history, volunteer soldiers routinely outperform conscripted soldiers, which is what made mercenaries so attractive to world powers throughout most of human history. The United States thus enjoys another advantage over Russia, though that advantage has shrunk due to Russia's growing professional military. A critical component of any army, though, is the strength of its reserve force, especially in modern high-intensity warfare that can see regular forces quickly rendered combat ineffective. The United States maintains a significant reservist force of 442,000 personnel versus Russia's 250,000. In terms of reservists, the U.S. enjoys both an advantage in numbers and training. American reservists receive regular training and even partake in combat deployments, making their competency comparable to many nations' regular forces. This is not an accident but rather by design. The United States keenly understands that in a modern high-intensity conflict, it will face significant initial losses and is prepared to mitigate this loss in capabilities via a strong reserve force. By comparison, Russian reservist training has been historically spotty at best. Efforts to retain veteran soldiers with reservist contracts hopes to counteract a critical lack of training, but at the moment, the Russian reserves simply pale in comparison to American reserves and capabilities. A lack of training also extends to the Russian regular forces as well. Though great leaps have been made to increase the readiness of combat troops, large exercises, however, are not cheap and can produce a great deal of wear and tear on equipment, something that is a critical concern for a Russian army fielding aging equipment and with a limited budget. Thus, while the Russian forces have undergone an increase in military drills in the last decade, they still fail to match the training tempo of their American counterparts. The Russian air forces have also seen a dramatic reduction in training, with most pilots flying only between 100 and 120 hours per year. The United States was matching this rate until 2019, when it pushed for an increase to an average of 200 hours per year. Aging military aircraft in both militaries is directly leading to skyrocketing maintenance expenses, and flight hours are threatened with further reduction for both militaries. Big buys of F-35 and 4.5 generation F-15 and F-18s by the U.S., though, seeks to replace its aging fleet, which has an average age of 28 years. Russia, on the other hand, is procuring jets at a much slower rate. The U.S. spends $770 billion on its military, while Russia spends $154 billion. While adjusted for purchasing power parity, though, the Russian defense budget is closer to $170 billion, Given that Russia buys much of its equipment from its native defense contractors, the U.S. still retains a massive advantage, but not as large as one might think, given that salaries and benefits are much more expensive for the U.S. than for Russia. 
Still, in sheer value, the United States purse is exponentially deeper than the Russian war purse, leading to a much greater proliferation of hardware. In the air, the United States fields a fleet of 13,247 aircraft, over three times as large as Russia's air fleet of 4,173. America's fighter fleet is over twice as large as Russia's, with 1,957 fighter aircraft versus Russia's 772. Both US and Russia have nearly the same number of attack aircraft, with 783 versus 739, though this is only because the United States prefers multi-role aircraft over dedicated attack platforms. A significant technological advantage in munitions allows even non-attack aircraft in the US fleet to effectively carry out air-to-sea or air-to-ground strike missions, while Russia struggles with a lack of smart weapons and support platforms for said weapons. This disparity in numbers and capabilities means that the United States Air Force and Navy aren't just better positioned to secure air supremacy, but to exploit it with devastating fire support missions against Russian ground targets, though American air supremacy will still have to contend with one of the world's best air defense forces. Knowing that it can't match America in the skies, Russia has historically put a lot of weight behind ground-based air defenses, creating some of the most advanced air defense systems in the world. It's assumed, then, that Russian ground forces will operate under the cover of their ground-based air defense assets, seriously threatening the survival of American attack platforms. However, due to a need to operate under this umbrella of safety, Russian ground forces would be unable to rapidly maneuver, potentially leaving the decisive advantage of momentum in the US hands. In a defensive mode, however, Russian ground forces would be incredibly difficult for the US to break if it was denied its air power by robust air defenses. Mobility is incredibly important in modern warfare. And here the US shines with the largest air and sea mobility fleet in the world. The US operates 982 transport aircraft versus Russia's 445, giving it a decisive advantage in quickly maneuvering troops and equipment in theater. The US's focus on a large mobility fleet, though, is a matter of necessity. Just like the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans both make the United States invulnerable to invasion by any power on Earth, it is just as a big barrier for American troops needing to get to the front. As Russia lacks any capability whatsoever to threaten the US with land invasion, a conflict between the two would be indubitably playing out in Eastern Europe, necessitating the rapid movement of troops and supplies from America to Europe. Once in theater, though, the American Air Mobility Fleet will make it an agile force capable of quickly exploiting opportunities, which can just as quickly replenish losses. One area of air power where the US absolutely dominates Russia or any other world power, though, is in the number of special mission aircraft. These highly specialized platforms are critical for the success of a modern combined arms military and run the gamut from airborne early warning to maritime patrol aircraft to electronic warfare platforms. These aircraft can be everything from eyes in the sky to specialized platforms that listen in on or jam enemy communications and are critical for modern high-tech warfare. Here, the United States fields a whopping 774 special mission platforms versus Russia's 132 putting the logistical, intelligence, and technological advantage firmly on the US side. Attack helicopters are absolutely critical for supporting any ground offensive, and the US operates 366 more of these platforms than Russia, with 910 versus 544. Russia operates three main attack helicopters, the Kamov Ka-50 Black Shark, the Mi-24 Hind, and the Mil Mi-28. The US operates the AH-64 Apache and the AH-6M Little Bird. With a focus on special operations, the AH-6M Littlebird provides an extremely agile air support asset for soldiers in dense urban areas, while the US Army's Apache is designed to destroy enemy armor and provide direct fire support for American infantry. The Russian attack helicopter fleet represents the shifting of priorities and ideologies between its years as the Soviet Union and its modern life as the Russian Federation. The Hind is a heavy fire support platform with the capacity to ferry up to eight fully equipped troops into combat while the Ka-50 and the Mi-28 represent a more traditional attack helicopter design. Tanks make up the backbone of any modern army, and here both nations shine. The United States has a tank force of 6,612 platforms versus Russia's 12,420. It appears that Russia enjoys a 2 to 1 advantage over the US in the tank arena, but the truth is that Russia inflates the size of its armored forces by counting units kept in storage as part of its active force. In reality, Russia operates closer to 3,000 tanks, with 9,000 mothballed and in reserve. Not only would these tanks require weeks for them and their crews to be prepared for combat, but most are Cold War relics with extremely questionable survivability on a modern battlefield. As Stalin once put it though, quantity is a quality all its own. 
though Stalin never lived to see the blistering speed and overwhelming firepower of modern anti-tank platforms. The bulk of Russian tank forces is the T-72, which has received modernity upgrades alongside its M1 Abrams American counterpart. However, pound for pound, the Abrams continues to outclass the T-72. While most comparisons of the Abrams capabilities rely on the shocking display of overwhelming superiority against Iraq's T-72s, this is a grossly unfair comparison. For starters, export models of Russian T-72s are not nearly as capable as those fielded by the Russian army. Secondly, Russian tank crews are overwhelmingly better trained than their Iraqi counterparts in Desert Storm. The Abrams, however, is still the better tank in 2022 with armor, sight, and electronics upgrades integrated into the active tank force on a consistent basis. Russia, on the other hand, has struggled to keep its own tank forces fully modernized. The one advantage that the T-72 enjoys over the Abrams is its ability to fire anti-tank missiles from its barrel, though doing so requires the T-72 to stand still while guiding its missile to target, during which an Abrams could simply scoot out of the way or kill the T-72. Both Russia and the US place a strong emphasis on mechanized infantry, with the US fielding 45,193 armored vehicles versus Russia's 30,122. While this leaves the US better able to replenish losses, Russia still fields enough armored vehicles to provide ample mobility and protection to its infantry. In a battle of attrition, though, the numbers favor the US. There is one area, however, where Russia dominates not just the United States, but the entire world, and that's artillery. It's said Russia can field enough artillery that if it all fired at once, you'd feel the explosions on the other side of the world. And the numbers are truly astonishing. Russia absolutely dwarfs the US in numbers of self-propelled artillery, with 6,574 platforms versus America's 1,498. The story remains the same for traditional artillery, with 7,571 howitzers versus the US's 1,339. Russia also enjoys a 3 to 1 advantage in rocket artillery with 3,391 units versus the US's 1,366. The difference is a product of both geography and priorities. Russia has traditionally had to be concerned with fighting a massive land battle in either Europe against NATO or Asia against China. The nation has also had to contend with the reality that in battle against its greatest competitor, the United States, it could not count on air platforms to provide fire support for frontline troops. Facing off against a technologically superior foe, Russia placed an emphasis on sheer firepower. Superior American Abrams tanks don't matter much if they can't advance due to withering barrages of Russian artillery. The US, however, has by necessity shifted most of its fire support capabilities to more mobile airborne platforms. As it faces no threat of invasion or major conflict on its own continent, mobility is more important for the United States military. With a greater focus on technology, mobility, and smart munitions, airborne fire support simply makes more sense to the US military than masses of artillery that need to be transported thousands of miles to any conflict zone. American air-based fire support is far superior even to Russia's masses of artillery on delivering effective fire on target, but only if Russian air defenses can be neutralized. Otherwise, American soldiers might find themselves completely overwhelmed by the world's largest artillery corps. At sea, Russia operates a larger fleet than the United States, with 605 ships versus America's 484. However, the capabilities of America's Navy far surpass those of the Russian Navy, which has historically been the least important of its military branches. Funding priorities reflect this, and today the Russian Navy is in a state of serious decline, operating largely Cold War-era equipment that rarely sees upgrades. The United States currently operates 11 aircraft carriers, with its carrier air forces by themselves larger than most nations' entire air fleets. Russia, by comparison, operates only one, and operates is a term we're using rather loosely here, as the Admiral Kuznetsov is infamous for breakdowns. A remnant of the Cold War, the Kuznetsov is in a perpetual state of disrepair and would be incapable of posing even a moderate threat to US forces before it was destroyed. However, America's mighty carrier fleet is its own vulnerability, with Russia having developed hypersonic anti-ship missiles that present a lethal risk to American naval power. Currently, the United States has no defense against these weapons, except to attack and degrade Russian kill chain assets such as radar tracking installations, communication nodes, and satellites. The United States also operates nine smaller carriers to support amphibious assault operations, while Russia completely lacks this capability. Amphibious operations would likely not play a big role in a US-Russian conflict, but with the ability to fly the F-35, these many carriers would only complicate matters for the Russian Air Force and Navy. Russia does outnumber the US in numbers of submarines, with the US operating 68 versus Russia's 70. However, modernity is an issue with Russia's submarine fleet, and it's unknown how many subs Russia can actually put to sea in case of a war, 
given the state of poor logistics in the Russian Navy. By comparison, the United States submarine fleet is being steadily upgraded with the acquisition of the Virginia-class attack submarine and are on the whole more capable than Russian boats. The United States outnumbers Russia in numbers of destroyers, with 92 guided missile destroyers versus Russia's 15. While outnumbered and outgunned by major combatants, Russia has a far greater fleet of smaller vessels, which could pose a serious threat if massed together or used to harness U.S. supply lines. Russia has also mounted its caliber cruise missiles on civilian vessels, meaning that any Russian ship could be a potential deadly threat to an unwary American vessel. On the whole, the American military is larger and more capable than the Russian military in 2022. However, Russia has achieved a breakthrough in hypersonic weapons that the U.S. has yet to match and has even begun to press those weapons into service. This gives Russia a decisive advantage at the opening of any major hostilities, though its weak economy means that the nation can't fully capitalize on this advantage by fielding hypersonic missiles in significant numbers. This is a trend that tracks all across the board and has repeated itself with the Su-57 fifth-generation fighter and the T-14 Armata tank. Both of these weapon platforms present deadly threats to their U.S. counterparts, but due to a lack of funding, Russia has been forced to postpone any significant purchases for years, if ever. Today, Russia faces a modernity crisis as its legacy forces are being rapidly outclassed technologically by potential rivals. The United States has its own technological problems, however, and over-reliance on technology might become a critical vulnerability for the U.S. military should its satellite or command and control networks be compromised. An addiction to technology by the United States has also led to a legacy of weapons acquisitions in the post-2000s that is, frankly, catastrophic. Funneling billions upon billions into moonshot after moonshot, the United States has failed to bring few of its new weapon systems in the last 20 years to full maturity. The F-35's capabilities are still so in question that both the U.S. Navy and Air Force purchased significant amounts of F-15s and F-18s to compensate for the potential crisis. The Zumwalt destroyer and littoral combat ships were both complete boondoggles that cost billions and left the U.S. Navy high and dry. The failure of the Future Force Warrior program left the U.S. Army with few working technologies and a massive waste of taxpayer money. A focus on technological moonshots has eroded the United States' technological advantage significantly, and today the American military is in desperate need of new weapons platforms that cannot just match but outcompete those being developed or already in service with the armies of China and Russia. The U.S. has sent nearly $30 billion worth of aid to Ukraine, with a significant chunk of that being military equipment. The equipment has directly supported the nation's stunning counterattack, with U.S. equipment taking center stage in shaping the battle before it was even launched. Russia is now finding out why the U.S. doesn't have free healthcare, but what equipment has the U.S. sent, and why does it seem like Russia is helpless against it? Javelin A week after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there was one name the Russian army and the rest of the world had become very familiar with. Javelin. This premier American anti-tank system first entered service in 1996 when it replaced the M47 Dragon and has proven absolutely lethal against Russian armor. This is the weapon U.S. infantry would have used themselves in a war with Russia, and its effectiveness is nothing short of terrifying. The weapon consists of two components, the launch tube assembly and the reusable command launch unit. The clue is the brains of the system and features four times magnification at both day and night with its thermal sight. This system allows U.S. infantry to no longer be reliant on supporting heavy vehicles for target identification, and the clue can be used by itself even when no more missiles are available to provide infantry with a portable and very capable thermal sight. A 12 times magnification narrow field of view option allows gunners to effectively zoom in on a target and properly identify it. When the gunner is ready to fire, he switches to a seeker FOV mode at 9 times magnification. This is effectively now being fed into the missile guidance unit. With target selected, the gunner squeezes a second button and the missile is on its way to deliver 19 pounds of supersonic tandem charge high explosive American Freedom to its target. In order to defeat modern reactive armor, the Javelin missile features two warheads that detonate in rapid succession. The first is a smaller charge, which is meant to blow away explosive reactive armor panels being fired up at the missile in an attempt to disrupt it. The second shaped charge creates a narrow stream of molten metal that penetrates through tank armor to deliver an extremely emotional event to the crew inside. When targeting armored vehicles, the Javelin switches to top attack mode, in which the missile fires straight up into the air and then comes down directly on the tank's thinner top armor. You've probably seen pictures of Russian tanks with what were termed cope cages. These metal cages were being welded onto Russian tanks at the start of the invasion to protect from anti-tank missiles, and in some cases could actually be effective. 
However, against modern anti-tank weapons, the cages were simply wasted labor, and as Saint Javelin took a horrible toll on Russian tanks, the Russian Ministry of Defense quickly sought out a new solution. Nowadays, you're probably not seeing many of these cages on Russian tanks because A, most Russian tanks are now Ukrainian tanks, and B, they didn't work. So why are Javelins so effective against Russian armor? The truth is that modern anti-tank missiles of the quality being supplied to Ukraine are frankly terrifyingly effective. Even Western tanks would be hard put to defend themselves against them, which is why the US is gradually adding the trophy protection system to its own tanks. This anti-anti-tank missile system fires explosive charges at incoming missiles that are more effective at disrupting the weapon than explosive reactive armor panels. However, the real reason why Javelins are pounding Russian armor into scrap metal is that Russia has very poor military doctrine and uses its tanks improperly. Tanks are not meant to operate on their own, but are rather meant to be directly supported by infantry. Supporting infantry forces are responsible for keeping enemy hunter-killer teams at bay. Yet, the Russian military has routinely shown that it does not operate armor and infantry together well at all. Often, Russian armor is simply left to fend for itself with predictable results. Kamikaze Drones Odds are you've now become familiar with the names Phoenix Ghost or Switchblade. Russian infantry is not only aware of the names but actively fears them. The Phoenix Ghost drone is a loitering munition developed under the US military's big safari weapons program. This acquisitions program is meant to rapidly deliver new weapons to meet unexpected or evolving threats, allowing the US military to quickly counter enemy capabilities using pre-existing technology rather than going through a whole development and testing cycle of new tech. To date, the US has sent around 700 of these weapons to Ukraine, with a significant impact on the battlefield. The loitering munitions can hover over an area for six hours and conduct surveillance at both night and day thanks to its infrared sensors. Once a target has been detected, the drone kamikazes down onto its head with an explosive finale. The drone is great for taking out entrenched infantry, or even lightly armored vehicles such as trucks. The Switchblade is the name most people are familiar with, and has sort of stolen the Phoenix Ghost's thunder. The weapon was conceived by the US Air Force Special Operations Command as a way of rapidly giving infantry a way to provide their own air support in Afghanistan. Traditional air support may not always be available or take time to respond, plus it can cause serious collateral damage. The Switchblade 300, however, can be carried by individual soldiers and used for both reconnaissance and attack, dropping down from above directly on an enemy's head. When the weapon was first sent to Afghanistan, it was on a test case basis and in limited numbers. In 2012, US soldiers received 75 switchblades to try them out in real-world conditions. The result of that test remains classified, but very shortly afterwards the US Army made a request that the weapon be immediately made available in far greater numbers. Insurgents soon feared it and US soldiers loved it. Soon after its debut in Afghanistan, the switchblade was tested from the open bay of an Osprey transport successfully tracking and impacting its target. This paved the way for a new development between switchblade manufacturer Aerovironment and Kratos Defense and Security Solutions for a high-speed, long-range, unmanned combat air vehicle that could act as a mothership to a host of switchblade drones. The UCV would be designed to rapidly deploy an overwhelming number of switchblades in order to overcome enemy defenses. The US has provided over a thousand of both the anti-personnel and anti-armor version of the switchblade drone which Ukraine has used to devastating effectiveness. In response to the overwhelming success of the Switchblade, Russia has announced development of its own loitering munition, the LAOP-500, which it boasts twice as powerful as the Switchblade. Given the fact that Russia is bringing T-62s out of museums to fight in Ukraine, take that boast with a grain of salt. So why can't Russia stop these American drones? The easiest answer is that Russia simply wasn't prepared for modern warfare. Despite its many pre-invasion boasts of being able to take on even the military forces of the US, Russia has proven it simply has no idea how to fight a modern war. It has failed to conduct large-scale combined arms operations and displayed time and again a complete disregard for electronic and signal security. The devastation delivered by Western-provided smart munitions proves that it fundamentally was unprepared for the consequences of a smart battlefield. The hard answer, however, is that nobody is really prepared for the loitering munition threat posed by modern drones. There is simply no way of providing adequate protection to infantry forces from loitering munitions, though the US has been working on the problem for a few years now. Electronic warfare capabilities meant to disrupt drone signals or even shoot them down with electromagnetic pulse weapons are now being seen as integral to the very structure of the traditional American infantry platoon. So, the next time big, tough US infantrymen go to war, expect to see Geek Squad fighting right alongside them. 
because without electronic warfare support, infantry is too vulnerable in future conflicts. Stinger At the start of the war, Russian air forces operated in large numbers across the country. By now, Russian rotary aviation is conspicuously absent from the front lines. The reason is the US-made FIM-92 Stinger and similar platforms provided by other Western countries. Russian aviation is having traumatic flashbacks to the Afghanistan war, when its helicopters were mauled by US-supplied Stingers. Today the weapon system has been updated, but remains relatively the same as it was when liberating communist aviators from their earthly troubles in 1985. The Stinger is a shoulder-fired manned portable air defense weapon or man pad that can engage targets up to 3,800 meters away, making it perfect for taking out low-flying aircraft such as helicopters. Its smart seeker head can differentiate between the exhaust plume of an enemy aircraft and its engines, helping it home in for a successful kill. To fire the weapon, a battery coolant unit or BCU is inserted into the grip stock. This delivers a supply of high-pressure argon gas, which cryogenically cools the seeker to operating temperature. This causes the seeker to be very sensitive to heat sources, thus allowing it to lock on to enemy vehicles with great precision. Once fired, a small ejection motor pops the missile clear of the operator and to a safe range, where the main rocket motor is activated, sending the missile on its way. The warhead is relatively small, only about 2.26 pounds of HTA-3 explosive, a mix of HMX, TNT, and aluminum powder. However, the weapon is designed to directly impact the vehicle's engines, which can be easily damaged or destroyed even with a small amount of explosives. So why is the Stinger once more violently reuniting Russian aircraft with the ground? Once more it comes down to doctrine. Russian forces are doing a poor job of integrating air power with ground forces, leaving low-flying Russian aircraft at great threat from man-portable weapons. However, the real culprit is Russia's basic lack of precision targeting. Most of its ground attack aircraft lack targeting pods meaning they have to come in low for any attack to have a large degree of precision. This puts them directly under the threat of the Stinger. Hi Mars We couldn't possibly do an episode on US weapons Russia's having a very bad day with and not mention the vaunted HIMARS system. This thing is not very impressive on paper. The high-mobility artillery rocket system is, at first glance, underpowered rocket artillery. Unlike its more capable cousin, the M270 MLRS, the HIMARS system has half the number of munitions available to it, six GMLRS rockets. It's basically just a truck with a single pot of missiles on its back, so why in the world has this weapon single-handedly changed the face of the Ukrainian war? In the early 1990s, the US Army was retooling itself from fighting World War III against the Soviet Union and its allies to the expected Bush Wars of the future, which would feature low-intensity conflict. This meant the Army needed to slim down and start providing weapons that were mobile and flexible, something traditional rocket artillery is not. HIMARS was developed to meet the need of a light footprint force such as US paratroopers or a small contingent of overseas troops fighting a conflict requiring precision rather than overwhelming firepower. Mounted on a truck, the system has far greater mobility and speed than any of its tracked cousins. And this was a huge draw for a future low-intensity conflict. However, it was exactly this capability that would make HIMARS so valuable to Ukrainian forces. Faced with overwhelming numbers, Ukraine needed a platform that could rapidly deliver a fire mission and then flee before enemy counter-battery fire or air support could respond. Traditional tube artillery would be based around areas in Ukraine, could enact some form of air defense which protected them, but made them very inflexible weapons. HIMARS, however, could quickly drive to a launch site, pop off its missiles, and drive away in minutes, allowing the weapon system to be anywhere it needed to be with short notice. But it's HIMARS' precision and range that makes it truly deadly. Each of the six GLMRS rockets have a range of 57 miles and are armed with precision warheads. This gives Ukraine the ability to punch behind enemy lines at targets out of range of traditional tube artillery, which has a range of around a dozen or so miles. But it's the precision that really matters, because each rocket can be programmed to hit a specific target or to double up and defeat enemy fortifications, striking exactly at their weakest point. The error radius of HIMARS is classified but believed to be no more than a few meters at most, and is likely far, far less than that given the history of US smart weapons. With just a dozen of these weapons at the start of summer, Ukraine began to batter Russian command posts and logistics nodes, leading to an immediate effect on the battlefield as Russian forces were slowed to a crawl, as they contended with the chaos being wreaked behind their lines. Russia quickly moved to neutralize the weapon, dedicating large amounts of air power and special operations forces to locating and destroying these mobile rocket launchers. Within weeks of the deployment of HIMARS to Ukraine, Russia claimed it had destroyed all of them, yet the US confirmed that not a single HIMARS had been lost in combat. Was Russia lying? 
Normally, the answer to that question would be yes, but in this case, they actually might have been telling the truth, at least from their own point of view. Because the weapon is mounted on a generic heavy-duty truck frame, Ukraine created multiple HIMARS decoys using trucks painted green. Other decoys were mere mock-ups made of wood, and it's confirmed that Russia has destroyed at least 10 of these decoys with caliber cruise missiles. Russia took the bait and expended significant effort and resources better used elsewhere to find and destroy these fake HIMARS, leaving the real HIMARS safe from attack. The US quickly agreed to supply Ukraine with more HIMARS, and the nation now has just under two dozen of these platforms with plans for more to be delivered. As of September 8th, Ukraine has struck 400 Russian targets with the weapons, making it the hardest working weapon in the Ukraine war, and one that has forced Russia to radically rethink how it deploys its forces. No longer safe behind the front lines, Russian command and control nodes and logistics hubs have been forced out of HIMARS range, which means the rate of the offensive has slowed to a crawl as units have to wait even longer for resupply. Russia has threatened to retaliate against the United States for further deliveries of the weapon system, but given that it can't handle 16 of these and the US Army is equipped with over 400, it seems Russia's mouth is cashing checks its military can't cash. Russia's bluff has been called, and now its military might must clash with NATO forces in Eastern Europe. As both sides prepare for battle, there are high stakes in the skies over Eastern Europe as a squadron of F-22s and Su-57s rush to meet each other in a battle the world has been dreading for decades. But who would win between these two state-of-the-art aircraft? The F-22 was developed by Lockheed Martin to be the air dominance fighter of the future and first took flight as a prototype on September 7, 1997. Its origins, however, lie in the Cold War, with the US looking ahead to a future conflict with the Soviet Union. That's why when the plane was officially procured in 1999, it faced a very uncertain future. It was the world's most cutting-edge fighter, and an extremely expensive one at that. The age of great power conflict was thought to be over with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the F-22 was a plane without a mission. Inevitably, Congress approved the termination of future production of F-22s and the specialized tools and equipment used to create the most advanced fighter in the world were put into storage in case of emergency. The Su-57 Felon is a twin-engine stealth multi-role fighter aircraft developed by Sukhoi for the Russian military. Its origins are much more recent, with development beginning in 1999 as Russia began its process of trying to impose itself as a global power once more. Over the years, though, the Su-57 ran into serious budgeting problems. Initially, Russia, like the US, planned to buy hundreds of the aircraft, but eventually only 16 were actually built. The death blow to the Su-57 program was the ever-worsening Russian economy, as well as the pullout of India's partnership in the program when it was determined that the Su-57's capabilities were not as advertised or worth the investment. Both aircraft depend on stealth for survivability and lethality, but which is better? The Su-57 features specialized design to reduce its radar cross-section or RCS. This is achieved via techniques such as carefully aligning the edges of the wing and control surfaces so as to minimize the number of directions that radar waves can bounce back. Weapons are carried internally and its engines are coated with radar-absorbent materials or RAM. Its canopy features a 70 to 90 nanometer thick metal oxide layer to both absorb radar waves and protect the pilot from UV and thermal radiation. From the front, the Su-57 is more stealthy than a fourth generation fighter. However, from the side, the aircraft is significantly less stealthy and very vulnerable to detection and targeting. This represents a lack of expertise in stealth by Russian engineers, but is also a design choice, as the Su-57 is meant to operate within the protection of Russian air defenses. Outmatched technologically by the US, Russia has long operated its military under a fortress doctrine that makes maximum use of large numbers of long-range air defenses and ground artillery to fend off advanced US threats. Simply put, a squadron of Su-57s would not be operating far from friendly forces. Unlike US F-22s, which are expected to be the very tip of the spear, driving deep into enemy territory. The F-22 was designed with stealth as a top priority, and so much attention was paid to the plane's stealth characteristics that even the design of the pilot's helmet was taken into consideration. Like the Su-57, stealth is built straight into the design of the plane with a delta wing configuration curved vanes that prevent line of sight to the engine faces and turbines, and special alignment of control surfaces. The plane features a signature assessment system that warns a maintenance crew when the plane's radar signature is degraded and requires repair. And while it is coated in RAM, it's less reliant on it than the B-2. The B-2 is so delicate that it requires a special air-conditioned hangar, like the true prom queen of the US Air Force that she is. But the F-22 was designed to be rugged and tough, and can undergo repairs directly on a flight line. 
But hiding from the radar is only part of its stealthy design. Its flat thrust vectoring nozzles don't just look super cool from behind, but are specifically engineered to reduce the thermal signature of the big engines and thus reduce the range at which the plane is targetable by heat-seeking missiles. The plane is also designed around tight control of electronic emissions to prevent targeting or detection via electronic noise generated by its powerful radar and radio. It's also specially designed to be quieter than other aircraft and to be difficult to detect with the naked eye at a distance. The result is an aircraft with an RCS which is classified. But Lockheed Martin has confirmed that from some angles the aircraft has an RCS of a steel marble .0001 squared meters. The Su-57 on the other hand is believed to have an RCS of 0.1 to 1 square meter. There's no question that when it comes to stealth, the F-22 is the top dog, but at a price. In order to maintain its stealth features at an optimal level, the plane has a mission-capable rate of 62 to 70 percent, meaning that if the Su-57 were ever fielded in large numbers, their relative lack of sophisticated stealth technology would make them available for operations more often. Though if Ukraine is anything to go by, maintenance is a very weak point to the Russian military, and both aircraft might struggle to stay in the air throughout a lengthy conflict. In a dogfight, power and maneuverability are what matters, and here the two aircraft show some striking differences. The F-22 features thrust vectoring engines that can pivot up and down, giving it the most maneuverability of any U.S. aircraft. However, the F-22 falls very short of the Su-57, which is one of the most maneuverable planes ever made. Its twin engines feature independent thrust vectoring in all directions, meaning each engine nozzle can point in any direction independent of the other nozzle. That's why the Su-57 impressed spectators at air shows all over the world. And in a dogfight scenario, the F-22 pilot would be reaching for the ejection handle far more frequently than the Russian counterpart. When it comes to power, both planes are also unmatched. The F-22 is equipped with two Pratt & Whitney F-119 afterburning turbofan engines, with each delivering 35,000 pounds of thrust. This gives the F-22 a total of 70,000 pounds of thrust and the ability to supercruise at a classified speed of at least Mach 1.82. Supercruise is an important capability for modern fighters, and one that very few can attain. It's defined as the ability for an aircraft to cruise at speeds of one and a half times or greater the speed of sound, without the use of afterburners for extended periods of time. Using afterburners burns through an aircraft's fuel tank very quickly, and thus most planes cannot maintain supersonic flight for very long. With great speed, though, comes great fuel consumption, and the F-22 is limited by its size and fuel use to a range of 1,864 miles with external fuel tanks. Its combat radius is believed to be just over 500 miles, with a surface ceiling of 6,500 feet. The Su-57 is equipped with two NPO Lyulka Saturn Izdalai 117 turbofan engines, a significant technological step forward for the Russians. Each engine can produce just shy of 20,000 pounds of dry thrust, giving the aircraft the ability to supercruise at just over Mach 1.6. However, the Su-57's larger body allows it to store more fuel, increasing its range to 2,200 miles with a combat radius of 930 miles and a ceiling of 66,000 feet. The Su-57 seems to have the advantage here, even though its inferior aerodynamics and larger size means it's slower than the nimbler F-22. But the Russian Air Force has been having serious problems with developing the Su-57's engines, making them unreliable. Current Su-57s in operation are equipped with older engines, and in 2014, before walking away from a deal to help fund development of the Su-57, the Indian government expressed concerns over the engine's reliability. Russia hopes to sweep away these issues with a new engine designated Izdelai 30 and projected to be equipped on the Su-57 in the mid-2020s. However, this was before Russia was sanctioned by the world and cut off from critical technology supplies. The current fate of the planned engine upgrade is unknown. When it comes to engines, the F-22 is simply more reliable, with over 180 of the aircraft in operation for over a decade, while the Su-57 struggles with older engines in a planned upgrade that might never materialize. If Russia were to solve the engine issue, though, the Su-57 may outclass the F-22 in power, if not speed, due to the size difference. But a fighter is nothing without its weapons, so what kind of heat is each plane packing and who's really bringing the smoke? The Su-57 has two tandem main internal weapon bays that run along the entire length of the body of the aircraft, and two side weapon bays for smaller missiles or bombs. Designed as a multi-role fighter, the Su-57 can strike surface targets with ease, packing the 550-pound KAB-250 or an 1,100-pound KAB-500 precision-guided bomb in its main bay. It can also carry the KH-38M air-to-ground missile, the KH-35U anti-ship missile, and the KH-58 UCHK anti-radiation missile for striking enemy radar arrays, and the KH-59 Mark II cruise missile, though all of these in very limited quantities. 
However, if stealth is not a concern, the plane has six external hardpoints that can fit most Russian fighter-capable bombs and missiles. The KH-47 M2 Kinzhal hypersonic air-to-ground missile is also being developed especially for the Su-57 and meant to fit within the dimensions of the plane's internal weapon base. However, if going up against the F-22, the Su-57 will bring four beyond visual range air-to-air -air missiles with a range of up to 120 miles and two shorter range air-to-air -air missiles in its side weapon base. The F-22 has three internal weapon bays laid out in a different configuration from the Su-57. Its main bay is housed at the bottom of the fuselage, with two small bays directly on the sides of the fuselage and aft of the engine intakes. Up against a Su-57, the F-22 can carry six beyond visual range AIM-120 AMRAMs and one AIM-9 Sidewinder in each bay. This gives the F-22 a significant three-missile advantage over the Su-57, but this is hardly a surprise. The F-22 was designed specifically to take out enemy aircraft, while the Su-57 was designed to be a general-purpose machine capable of hitting both air and ground targets. The F-22 can also strike ground targets with the replacement of its four main bay launchers with two bomb racks that can each carry one 1,000-pound or four 250-pound bombs. The plane can also carry GPS-capable weapons, such as the Joint Direct Attack Munition, but it lacks the targeting pod required to self-designate targets for laser-guided bombs. Like the Su-57, the F-22 is equipped with external hardpoints for when stealth is not a priority, and it has four hardpoints rated at 5,000 pounds each. For a good old-fashioned knife fight in the sky, the F-22 carries the M61A2 Vulcan 20mm cannon and is equipped with 480 rounds meant for half-second bursts. The pilot's heads-up display projects a radar projection of the cannon's fire path when the weapon is in use to dramatically increase accuracy. The Su-57, meanwhile, is equipped with a 9A1 4071K 30mm autocannon with 150 rounds. While it has less rounds to fire, the 30mm cannon will provide a significant advantage if a hit is scored. And given the Su-57's incredible maneuverability, the odds of a hit are good. In terms of firepower, the F-22 takes the cake for air-to-air -air combat, even if it would do well to stay out of the dogfight range of the Su-57. However, the Su-57 is easier to configure for ground strike missions, making it more flexible. But all that smoke means nothing if you can't even detect what you're supposed to be aiming at. So how do the two planes compare in radar and avionics? The F-22 is a champion of sensor fusion, where it gathers data from all onboard systems, filters it for relevancy, and presents it to the pilot for greatly enhanced situational awareness while lowering his workload. It can even receive data from other platforms to add to its tactical picture. It's equipped with the Sanders General Electric ANALR-94 Electronic Warfare System, Martin Marinetta ANAAR-56 Infrared and Ultraviolet Missile Launch Detector, Westinghouse Texas Instruments ANAPG-77 Active Electronically Scanned Array Radar, and TRW Communication Navigation Identification Suite. It has over 30 antennas blended into the wings and fuselage to give the airplane complete all-around radar warning receiver coverage. This system can reduce its radar emissions to a confined narrow beam, down to 2 degrees in azimuth and elevation, exceeding over 250 miles in range and greatly increasing the plane's stealth by limiting excess electronic noise. In other words, if you take a shot at the Raptor, it's going to immediately know trouble is on the way. The system can even be used for a passive detection system that can search for targets and even provide lock-on for weapons at a classified range. The APG-77 radar equipped on the Raptor has a low observable active aperture, electronically scanned antenna that can track multiple targets while conducting scans in any weather condition. The Raptor can also focus its radar to overload enemy sensors in electronic attack configuration, degrading the effectiveness of enemy radar and increasing the survivability of fellow Raptors in formation. To reduce the chance of interception or degradation, the APG-77 changes frequency over a thousand times a second and has an estimated range of 125 to 150 miles for a target with the profile radar cross-section of a Su-57. Not good news for the Russian fighter. Head-on, the Raptor is likely capable of targeting a Su-57 at just over 30 miles. By narrowing its beam, however, the APG-77 can increase this range by approximately 100 miles. Its two Hughes Common Integrated Processors are each capable of processing up to 10.5 billion instructions per second, making the F-22 one of the smartest planes in the sky. In fact, its avionics are so robust that the F-22 has threat detection and identification capabilities similar to the RC-135 rivet joint. 
However, its radar is less powerful than dedicated signals intelligence and threat detection platforms. This capability, however, allows the F-22 to designate targets for Allied aircraft, making the F-22 not just lethal on its own, but lending its lethality to fourth-generation aircraft who can fire weapons from outside the threat envelope an F-22 is currently operating inside of. In effect, the F-22 can grant friendly aircraft pseudo-stealth capabilities through its big brains, giving the enemy one hell of a headache to worry about. The Su-57 is Russia's first attempt at achieving sensor fusion. To manage its various electronic systems, the Su-57 is equipped with an information management system developed by GRPZ. The plane is equipped with an N-036 AESA radar system and an L-402 Himalayas electronic countermeasure system. Its radar is configured across three platforms with a traditional nose-mounted radar and two cheek-mounted radars that greatly increase angular coverage. It also allows a pilot to guide a missile to target without having to point its nose at it, a significant advantage in close-quarters combat. Two N-036L-1-01L band transceivers are mounted on each wing's leading edge flaps and used for friend or foe identification, but can also be configured for electronic warfare and used to degrade enemy radar, albeit at significantly less efficiency than the F-22. It's also equipped with a redundant radio telephone system and encrypted data exchange capabilities between itself and other aircraft. However, the largest difference between the two aircraft is the inclusion of the 101 KSV infrared search and track system on the Su-57. While the F-22 lacks any such capability, often touted as a stealth killer, ISRT systems allow an aircraft to search for and target enemy aircraft by their heat signatures. This heat comes not just from the engines but from the body of the plane thanks to friction it experiences during supersonic flight. While the F-22 lacks ISRT capabilities, it's also designated to fly cooler at faster speeds than the Su-57, and with engine outlets that dramatically lower its infrared signature. Thus, the Su-57's ISRT will still have some difficulties targeting an F-22, and its effective range will be lowered considerably. Even so, this feature still gives the Su-57 an advantage in close-quarters combat. So, which is the superior aircraft? The F-22 takes the cake by a long shot. It's without question the world's premier fighter aircraft, with the most advanced avionics of any non-classified fighter in operation today. Its radar lacks the angular coverage of the Su-57 but can detect even stealthy targets at longer ranges compared to the Su-57 and, more importantly, provide good lock for weapons at increased ranges as well. With an increased number of air-to-air -air missiles, the F-22 has more chances to shoot a Su-57 out of the sky as well, another significant advantage. Yet, the Su-57 has the advantage in close quarters, and an F-22 pilot would do well to ensure he keeps a healthy distance between himself and the Su-57. But ultimately, this is a minor advantage, as the F-22 is simply built to not just be lethal on its own, but operate within a larger network of weapons and friendly platforms. This is a capability the Russians lack, and the US military remains the most networked armed force in the world. This means that it's not just the F-22 that's lethal to a Su-57, but a whole host of support platforms all using the F-22's targeting and tracking data to guide their own weapons to target. Not only can the F-22 win a fight on its own, but it can invite all its other buddies to that fight as well, leaving the Su-57 pilot frightfully alone. However, ultimately, the F-22 is superior for one single reason. It's an operational aircraft, and the Su-57 is not. If war were to break out between the two nations, it's highly unlikely an F-22 would ever meet a Su-57 in battle, given that there are only six non-testing models in operation, while the Russian Air Force would have to contend with over 180 Raptors. Snow falls in the frigid Siberian Arctic, where an American force shelters in a small village along the Trans-Siberian Railway. Suddenly, an explosion decimates the side of a building. From across the tracks, a Bolshevik force comes flooding out of the forest. The Russians fire their rifles. With each bullet, a stream of smoke exits their muzzles as it drifts in the freezing air. The Americans return fire. They're about to be overrun by angry Russian soldiers. No one wants to die in this frozen wasteland, so a retreat is ordered. The platoon of Americans covers one another as they run down the railway toward another regiment stationed to the north. The craziest thing is that the US soldiers aren't entirely sure why they invaded Russia in the first place, and now they're paying dearly for it. About a year before the United States sent troops to Russia, Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky incited the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. The US had just deployed troops in Europe to help the Allies defeat the Germans in World War I. When the revolution happened, the new communist regime pulled Russia out of the conflict and agreed to a tentative truce with Germany. The Allies continued to fight on, and eventually the tide of the war turned. 
By the following year, the Bolsheviks controlled a large part of Western Russia, but forces identifying themselves as the White Russians fought to take back their country from the Communists. This group was made up of a motley crew of mostly loyalists and reactionaries, with some Democrats sprinkled in, all of which were against Russia becoming a Communist state. At this point, American troops had been engaged in battles across Europe, and the German army was slowly falling to the Allied forces. On November 11, 1918, World War I came to an end, but as American soldiers prepared to return home from the brutality of war, a select group was ordered to remain behind. These soldiers were sent on a mission in northern Russia to help the White Russians maintain control of an important railway that allowed supplies to be transported to areas where the White and Red armies were engaged in battle. The United States maintained that they were staying out of the internal affairs of Russia, but secretly President Woodrow Wilson and other Allied leaders knew that if the Bolsheviks were victorious and defeated the White Russian forces, the country would become a full-fledged communist state that would pose a threat to capitalism and democracy around the world. Two American forces were ordered to go over the Russian border and help maintain supply lines for the war against the Red Army. The wording used by Wilson for these missions was vague and had no clear goal. This was likely because if the United States took a side in the conflict playing out in Russia, they could be thrown into another war. The invasion needed to remain as covert as possible, and having no clear orders or objectives, the American soldiers within the borders of Russia were given plausible deniability. Unfortunately, having troops stationed within a country undergoing civil war can only lead to rising tensions and casualties. The US troops, who were now technically an invasion force in Russia, found themselves in a very dangerous situation. The Bolsheviks were becoming more and more powerful. It would only be a matter of time before the American forces and the Red Army met. When this happened, the United States would have to take a stand or at least make some very difficult decisions. The invasion of Russia technically began in July 1918. The war in Europe could still have gone either way, but the Allies seemed to be losing. Since Germany no longer needed to worry about protecting their eastern front due to their newly formed peace with the Bolshevik government, German forces were able to focus on pushing west. They advanced further and further into France, leaving a wake of destruction in their path. The only way the German advance could be stopped was if the Allies somehow reopened the Eastern Front. British and French expeditionary forces were already in northern Russia where they were working to open up this new front. At that same time, they hoped to supply the White Russian forces with resources that would allow them to defeat the Bolsheviks and rejoin the war. The other Allied leaders convinced Woodrow Wilson to send 13,000 troops across the Russian border to help with this effort. President Wilson agreed, and when American troops crossed into Russia, the invasion had officially began. Since the United States wanted to maintain some form of deniability that what they were doing was not actually an invasion, Woodrow Wilson wrote a vaguely worded memo. The American expeditionary forces being sent to Russia had three main objectives. The first, guarding large caches of Allied weapons and supplies that were housed in Archangel and Vladivostok. These supplies were sent to the Russian cities before the country left the war, and therefore Allied command wanted to make sure they did not fall into the hands of the Red Army. The second objective was to support the 70,000 soldiers in the Czechoslovak Legion who were still a part of Allied forces in World War I. The Czech Legion was fighting the Red Army in Siberia, and since they were part of the Allies, the United States soldiers were to support them in any way they could. The final objective that Woodrow Wilson put into his memo was that the US soldiers were to avoid interfering with internal Russian affairs. However, they were also supposed to aid the Russians in self-governing or self-defense. Basically, Wilson was saying that the American soldiers should be helping the white Russians defeat the Bolsheviks by any means necessary, but they were not to let the communists find out that that was what they were doing. The reason that Wilson couldn't just outright say the US forces entered Russia to try to defeat the Bolsheviks was that it would have looked like they were declaring a war against a previous ally, but the lack of clarity around what the troops were actually doing in Russia ended up causing all sorts of confusion. This resulted in a very different mission evolving and the loss of hundreds of American lives. The US soldiers who were deployed to Russia were a part of the 339th Regiment. This group of soldiers was mostly from Michigan, which military strategists decided would make them ideal for the extreme cold that they would face in northern Russia. Before the invasion force left for their mission, they were trained in England by Antarctic explorer Ernest Shackleton to give them additional skills to survive in the brutal environment they were about to enter. After their training, the 339th packed their bags, boarded a plane, and flew to the Archangel, which sat just below the Arctic Circle. The men nicknamed their regiment the Polar Bear Expedition, which wouldn't be too far from the truth. As they approached the Archangel, temperature plummeted and the wind picked up. The soldiers looked out of the plane windows at the frozen landscape below. This mission was going to be brutal, and they weren't even entirely sure why they were there. Once the planes landed, the US soldiers were debriefed by the British commander stationed at Archangel. 
Although their orders were only to defend the cache of Allied supplies in the city, this turned out to be a very small part of what they would actually end up doing. The British told the Americans to suit up as they were about to leave Archangel and head southeast toward Kalas. This was not what they had been instructed to do, but at that same time, the vagueness of their orders also meant they could pretty much do anything they wanted. The 339th deployed with the British soldiers to Kalas. Their goal was to secure a railroad crossing that they could then use to connect supply lines to the Czechoslovak Legion fighting the Red Army to the east. British officer Lt. Gen. Frederick Poole ordered the Polar Bear Expedition Force to sweep south along a critical railroad track and remove any Bolshevik forces that stood in their way. The Polar Bears moved down the railroad toward Kalas. They encountered small bands of Bolshevik soldiers who they easily dispatched. The weather conditions were brutal, but the men had all been well trained. They pushed the Bolsheviks away from the railway and secured long stretches of it to aid in the movement of troops and supplies to other forces fighting the Red Army in the Siberian region. Unfortunately, the polar bears would never make it all the way to Kotlas. On November 11, 1918, the same day that World War I ended in Europe, the American soldiers found themselves in a bloody battle against Bolshevik forces. The polar bear expedition, along with Canadian and Scottish troops, were making their way south when they encountered a large Red Army force. Bullets pelted the snow all around them as the polar bears dove for cover. The Red Army had captured a town along the railway and still had a large number of men stationed there. Grenades blew craters around the tracks. The Allied forces returned fire but were unable to break the Bolshevik line. They had to retreat back to the dense forest and regroup. When they reached safety, the soldiers heard the news that Armistice Day had been celebrated in France. They couldn't believe that while they were being shot at and killed by Russian soldiers, the boys in Europe were being sent home. This was demoralizing and made no sense to the soldiers still stationed in Siberia. If the war was over, why were they still fighting? The soldiers started to complain to their superiors and question what their actual orders in Russia were. Many Allied soldiers once believed that the Bolsheviks were secretly on the side of the Germans, which made fighting them a worthwhile cause. But now that Germany had been defeated, the American soldiers were freezing their butts off for no apparent reason. At this time, Major William Graves commanded another expeditionary force that invaded Russia from Vladivostok. This regiment had been deployed to protect the Allied supplies housed in the city. But like the polar bear expedition in Archangel, these soldiers also had vague orders and would end up pushing further into Siberia than originally planned. Graves wrote later that at the time of the deployment, he was given no information as to the military, political, social, economic, or financial situation in Russia. This shows just how little the American soldiers who found themselves in the middle of a civil war in Russia actually had to go on. As 1918 turned into 1919, the Czechoslovak Legion controlled much of Siberia, including the Trans-Siberian Railway. In order to fulfill the ambiguous orders he was given, Graves ordered troops to be deployed along the railway and at the coal mines, which powered the whole thing. This meant that American forces would be moving further and further into Russia. Although no one wanted to say it, America had now invaded Russia on two fronts. The Trans-Siberian Railway was a vital lifeline for both the Czechs and the White Russians that were fighting against the Bolsheviks. Without the railway, supplies could not reach the forces spread throughout the country. But as the Americans worked to secure and maintain control of the railway, the White Russians did something drastic. In November 1918, a White Russian admiral named Alexander Kolchak overthrew a Czech-supported government in Siberia. This caused panic amongst the Czechoslovak Legion. Rather than continuing their fighting against the Red Army in northern Russia, they focused their attention on returning home. This put Graves in a precarious position. It was now his sole responsibility to maintain control of the Trans-Siberian Railway and secretly move supplies to the Polar Bears and other forces who were trying to capture Kolchak. In January of 1919, the Bolsheviks launched attacks along the Trans-Siberian Railway and deeper into Siberia, where American forces were positioned. It all started one freezing day 500 miles north of Moscow. Lieutenant Harry Meade and his platoon of 47 Polar Bears were held up in a small Russian village. They lit fires within the snow-covered homes as the temperature dipped to 45 degrees below zero. They had received word that the Red Army might be advancing on their position, but wouldn't reach them for several more days, at which point they would be long gone, or so they believed. Lookouts had been posted and the soldiers took shifts digging trenches into the frozen permafrost that surrounded the small village just in case they needed to defend themselves. The sun rose on January 19, 1919, causing a pink hue across the freshly fallen snow that made it look like cotton candy. One of the lookouts rubbed his eyes and stretched. He'd been up all night keeping an eye out for the enemy. It had been quiet, and his shift was about to end when he saw something move in the trees out of the corner of his eye. The sun was still low, and the trees from the forest cast long shadows along the railway. The darkness from the densely packed pine trees kept anything hidden within it. The lookout grabbed his binoculars and stared at the forest. 
He could have sworn something moved just on the edge of the trees. Perhaps it was a deer or a lone wolf. He put the binoculars down and rubbed his eyes, chalking whatever he thought he saw up to exhaustion. Suddenly, dozens of rifles fired simultaneously from the tree line. Rockets flashed as they ejected from their launchers and slammed into the buildings of the villages. The men started screaming as wood and rocks flew everywhere. Meade awoke his troops and ordered them to return fire. A wall of screaming Bolshevik soldiers ran out from the cover of the forest. The sunlight glinted off their bayonets attached to the rifles. The Americans continued firing, but there were just too many of them. Meade ordered his men to fall back and seek shelter. The Red Army soldiers shot at the retreating polar bears, killing several men in the ambush before they could scramble behind cover. Meade and his men took shelter in the buildings on the far side of the village just as shells began to fall from the sky. The Bolsheviks had set up mortars on the outskirts of the town and were unleashing a barrage of explosives that decimated the structures the Americans had taken shelter in. When the iron rain stopped falling, Meade peered out of the window and saw a terrifying sight. Bolshevik soldiers had moved to the flanks and were now closing in on three sides. They wore white uniforms and jackets that allowed them to blend in with the snowy landscape. The enemy looked more like ghosts than men. Meade ordered the machine guns to be mounted in the windows to keep the Bolsheviks at bay. But every time the polar bears would slow the Bolshevik advance on one side, the other two would move closer. It was a hopeless situation. The waves of Bolshevik soldiers never seemed to end. It was only a matter of time before Meade and his men's position was overrun and the Red Army slaughtered them all. Meade ordered a full retreat. The American soldiers exited the houses they were taking shelter in and headed for the edge of town. Every time they stepped out from behind cover, someone else was gunned down. The Bolsheviks were unrelenting and ruthless. If a polar bear fell, their body had to be left behind. 25 Americans died in the battle. Their bodies lie where they fell so the rest of the expeditionary force could make it out of the village alive and retreat further up the railway. When Meade and his men met up with another American platoon, they had lost over half of their force and had 15 injured soldiers who desperately needed medical attention. This was the beginning of the Bolsheviks' offensive into northern Russia in January of 1919. The Red Army had the polar bear expedition outnumbered 8 to 1. They pushed the Americans further and further north. It seemed that if something wasn't done to immediately bring the men home, they would either be driven all the way to the Arctic or killed by the Bolsheviks. Politicians and military leaders worked tirelessly to try and get the U.S. soldiers home, but there were still those in government who believed the polar bears needed to be kept in Russia to keep the country from falling to the Bolsheviks. The polar bear expedition was pushed all the way back to Archangel, where they'd held out until May when the ice began to thaw and the White Sea became passable. As the men loaded up everything of importance onto the ships leaving the city to head back to Europe, the Bolsheviks began to seize Archangel. Battles broke out on the outskirts of the city, but eventually the Red Army gained the upper hand and the Bolsheviks pushed into Archangel. Fights broke out in the streets as polar bears desperately tried to hold the Bolsheviks at bay for as long as possible. The ships were finally loaded and the Allied forces still in Russia managed to escape. On June 15, 1919, the last of the polar bear expedition left Archangel and headed back home. In all, around 235 Americans died on the Western Front of the invasion of Russia and not a single man could explain exactly why they were there in the first place. As the polar bears were headed home, the American soldiers who had been launched from Vladivostok continued to fight in Siberia. Even though the polar bear expedition had been a disaster, Woodrow Wilson still wanted American troops in Russia to maintain control of the Trans-Siberian Railway and to keep the white forces resupplied. However, there was a new threat looming on the horizon. Japan had been a former ally during World War I but had quickly become aggressive as the emperor dreamed of expanding his country's borders and influence. 72,000 Japanese soldiers were launched across the sea and landed in Siberia. They advanced toward Major William Graves and the American forces that held the railway. Even though they had once been allies, the Japanese soldiers no longer were considered friendlies. Their expansion into Asia and Siberia posed a serious threat to the white Russians and the American men who were still there. As all this was happening, Graves' worst nightmare came true. The very army they were trying to help turned on them. The white Russians wanted the Americans to either formally fight with them or get out. They were tired of American forces being in their country without choosing a side. The Japanese troops shared the same sentiment but wanted the Americans out of the region for their own reasons. Without the Americans there, the Japanese would be able to advance further into Siberia and claim the Trans-Siberian Railway for themselves. White Russian forces began to work with Japanese forces as they swept through Siberia, causing unprecedented amounts of carnage and chaos. Innocent people were executed and tortured. Cossack generals Grigory Semenov and Ivan Kalnikov roamed the frozen regions of the country, killing anyone they thought was sympathetic to the Bolshevik cause 
and taking whatever they wanted with the support of Japanese troops. Eventually, these forces turned their attention toward the Americans. It seemed that fighting would break out between the US soldiers still stationed along the Trans-Siberian Railway and the White Russians at any moment. If this happened, the United States would have no choice but to openly declare war and either send more troops to Russia or risk the lives of the Americans stuck in Siberia. As tensions rose, the Bolsheviks became stronger and stronger. They secured more cities and transportation routes while growing in numbers. The White Russians were losing badly on all fronts. Admiral Alexander Kolchak pleaded with the Czech Legion for help, but he'd already burnt that bridge when the White Russians invaded Czechoslovakian territory and committed countless crimes against the people in the region. Rather than helping Kolchak, the Czechoslovakians turned him over to the Red Army and returned for safe passage home. In January of 1920, Woodrow Wilson and his advisors decided the secret war in Russia had failed. They ordered all US troops out of the country as the Trans-Siberian Railway was all but lost to the Bolsheviks. By April 1, 1920, the last of the American invasion forces was withdrawn from Russian borders. 189 men were lost in Siberia. Each one had only a very vague idea of what they were doing there in the first place. Woodrow Wilson's decision to invade and keep troops in Russia in order to influence its internal affairs foreshadowed future endeavors by the United States to do similar things in other countries. The US had no business being in Russia after World War I, just as it had no business being in other countries later in the century. Somewhere in the east of Ukraine, a drab green military truck roars to life and pulls out of its temporary shelter inside some trees. On its back is a single pod of six 227mm rockets. Despite having less power than a traditional multiple rocket launch system, this single truck is the deadliest weapon in the Ukrainian war. The driver clears the trees and the crew gets to work. As the rocket pod lifts up off the bed of the truck on its own and swings to the left, Targeting data provided by the US satellites and secret intelligence sources is fed into the firing computer, which in turn programs each rocket with its own impact point. Once ready, a simple press of a button sends six of the big rockets screaming into the sky. As soon as the last rocket clears the launcher, the truck is already on the move. This single piece of rocket artillery provided by the United States is Ukraine's most important weapon and is the single most hunted piece of hardware of the entire war. Russian troops are on the hunt for each and every one of these 16 trucks currently in the nation, and their commanders have been ordered to expend any amount of life required to destroy them. Thus, the trucks are constantly on the move, never staying still in one place for long and always under heavy cover when idle. They pop out of their tree cover or camo netting to fire a salvo, and then immediately retreat to avoid counter-battery fire or an air attack. It's a dangerous game of cat and mouse, but to date, the Ukrainians have been winning to devastating effect. The truck is long gone by the time its rockets find their target, several dozen miles behind enemy lines well out of reach of any other artillery. Russian Colonel Andrei Vasilyev, commander of an elite paratrooper regiment, is taking a meeting with his senior officers. To date, Russia has lost a whopping 55 colonels in its half-a-year effort in Ukraine. A casualty figure so staggering, the only parallel is from the Second World War. Thus, Colonel Vasilyev has taken great pains to keep his exact location a secret. But US intelligence has found him and transmitted the GPS coordinates of his secret command post to the Ukrainians. One rocket impacts the command post with a precision of half a meter, instantly incinerating the good colonel and his officers. For him, the war is over. But for those Russians still living, the deadly reign of rockets continues. Supplies and ammunition for artillery pieces is destroyed, as dozens of other soldiers are killed or wounded in the precision strikes. Colonel Andrei Vasilyev is now the 56th Russian colonel to die in Ukraine. But he won't be the last, and a large part of Ukraine's stunning success in recent months is all down to one single gift from the United States, the High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, otherwise known as HIMARS. The impact of HIMARS in Ukraine cannot be understated. While the Javelin has become the patron saint and protector of Ukraine, this American weapon is far deadlier to the Russians than even the Javelin, and that's thanks to its range and precision. With just 12 of these weapon systems in the country, Ukraine has ground the Russian offensive to nearly a complete halt. But how in the world could so few weapons be given Russia so much trouble? And why can't Russia overcome such tiny numbers of US weapons? The HIMARS was developed in the late 1990s for use by the US Army. The system is not much different than any other rocket artillery, save for the fact that instead of the two rocket pods used by the Army's M270 MLRS, HIMARS has only one pod for greatly increased mobility. This allows the system to very quickly move into firing position and then escape before enemy counter-battery fire or a ground attack mission arrives on scene. And it's why Russia is having such a great difficulty neutralizing the dozen units provided to Ukraine. HIMARS can be loaded with a standard six-rocket pod or can carry a single tactical ballistic missile with a quick conversion. 
Its rockets have a range of between 1.2 and 190 miles, or up to 190 miles when using the Army's ATACM surface-to-surface missile. It can even be equipped with a SLAMRAM missile, surface-launched variants of the AMRAM anti-aircraft missile. But its versatility doesn't end there, because unlike any other rocket artillery in the world, HIMARS can even engage targets while loaded up on a transport ship. In October 2017, the U.S. Marine Corps fired a single rocket while at sea from the deck of an amphibious transport dock ship, successfully hitting a shore target with precision. This now makes HIMARS deadly not just on the land, but even when it's still loaded on a ship and waiting to be delivered. The weapon system saw wide use in the Iraq-Afghanistan conflicts, and in a prelude of what was to come if Russia had been paying attention, HIMARS's high precision allowed it to target Taliban commanders' hideouts in October of 2010 forcing them to flee the country temporarily. With its impressive range and precision, HIMARS has fired over 400 rockets at Islamic State militants since November of 2015, and the year after it fired rockets into Syria in support of Syrian rebels there. In January 2016, manufacturer Lockheed Martin announced that HIMARS had reached 1 million operational hours with U.S. forces, achieving an incredible 99% operational readiness rate. Compare that with strike fighter aircraft who have been loitering around 70% readiness rate for years, and you can see why HIMARS and its precision fire has become an incredibly important tool for the US Army. And now it's the most important tool in the Ukrainian Army. Russia must have been sleeping through the last decade, because upon making an appearance in Ukraine, HIMARS' impact was immediate, pun intended. The first four units arrived on the 23rd of June, and just two days later, they were in use against Russian forces killing over 40 Russian soldiers on a precision strike at a military base in Izium. For the first time since the war began, Russian rear areas were under threat from Ukrainian weapons, and the fear this realization struck was palpable, especially as successful fire mission after successful fire mission took place. Within days of its opening salvo, the Russian military said that the US's ML-270 MLRS and M142 HIMARS were the most dangerous weapons in Ukraine and that it was vital for Russian forces to destroy them at any cost. Yet, not all Russian officers were convinced, and it was believed that their air defense units such as the S-300 and S-400 systems would be able to knock the American rockets out of the sky. That, however, never happened, prompting the Russian government to launch an investigation into the manufacturer of the S-300 air defense system, just one of many ongoing investigations into failing or underperforming Russian weapons. For Russian air defense operators, HIMARS rockets fly too fast and too high for their systems to understand them as a threat. They have the flight trajectory of traditional artillery but with the speed of a fighter jet, and this can cause havoc when trying to identify a HIMARS attack. Russian software will need to be patched to begin targeting incoming rockets, a development which could take months to complete, if Russia can manage this feat given all their current difficulties. Any doubt amongst Russian officers as to the deadly efficacy of the HIMARS, however, was ended in the coming weeks as Ukrainian bombardments targeted Russian command posts and supply depots, inflicting crippling casualties in Russia's command and control networks and destroying over 50 supply depots. On the 4th of July, Ukraine even honored the American independence holiday with help from the Russians with the suspected HIMARS strike against a massive ammo depot. HIMARS has been so effective in countering Russian forces that Ukrainian commanders report that the Russian shelling is down tenfold after successful HIMARS strikes sparing the lives of hundreds of Ukrainian soldiers. But how in the world could 12 weapons be turning the tide of the war in Ukraine? It has everything to do with precision. Russia has the largest amount of artillery in the world and has come to be called an artillery army, yet the vast majority of that artillery is completely unguided. It is fundamentally the same artillery that was in use since the Second World War. HIMARS, however, is a complete game-changer because it's smart while Russia's artillery is dumb and it has greater range. With its extended range, HIMARS can hit targets well behind the front lines, putting areas normally considered safe from enemy attack at great risk. This means command posts, staging areas, supply depots, and even long-range air defense or ground attack systems, all juicy and very high-value targets that traditional artillery simply cannot reach. With command posts and supplies being forced to relocate further behind battle lines, Russian troops can't move or react as quickly as they once did slowing down an offensive and limiting the Russian military's ability to exploit battlefield opportunities. Overextension becomes a very real problem and could lead to outright disaster. But the system's real strength comes from precision, because HIMARS can accomplish with one salvo what it takes traditional artillery dozens if not hundreds of rounds to do. And Ukraine is using that precision to great effect by targeting Russian supplies and command posts. This is a strategy in effect since the start of the war, 
with Ukraine devastating Russian logistics even to the point of ignoring targets such as artillery, troops, or tanks. After all, without fuel and ammo, an army can't fight. And Russian forces are discovering that they are having acute supply issues thanks to HIMARS destroying their supply hubs, greatly slowing the pace of their advance and even halting it in places. The use of just 12 HIMARS systems has helped open up a window for a Ukrainian counterattack in the south, which is expected to commence at the end of July, and will probably have started by the time you watch this episode. But precision is worthless if you don't know where the enemy's juiciest targets are, and this is largely where the US comes in. The United States has been feeding vast amounts of intelligence to Ukrainian forces since the start of the conflict, and the US is very good at sniffing out enemy VIPs and other high-priority targets. That's partly thanks to one of the largest intelligence apparatuses in the world, but also thanks to the Russians themselves, who have almost no concept of operational or communication security. A fundamental lack of encrypted radios has allowed Ukraine and the US to snoop on Russian communications and take appropriate action. US intelligence has led to over a dozen Russian generals earning an early and permanent retirement, and with HIMARS on the front lines, that list is only bound to grow. The US is committed to keeping Ukraine resupplied with rockets it needs to keep blasting Russian targets, and is even shipping additional HIMARS units over the next couple months. Ukraine has said that with 100 of these systems it could push Russia out of its territory, and though we don't know how many the US will end up sending to Ukraine, we know that an additional four are already being planned for delivery. For its part, Russia has publicly downplayed the threat that HIMARS poses. Yet, the facts don't lie. Russian use of artillery is down significantly in areas where HIMARS is in play, as Russian artillerymen are forced to conserve ammunition and destruction of the American weapon has become a top priority. Russia claims it has destroyed four of the units to date, a claim that both Ukraine and the Pentagon deny. Now we have news that the US House of Representatives has approved a measure to provide $100 million in funding to train Ukrainian pilots in the use of American F-16s and F-15s. If the bill passes the Senate in September, then Ukrainian pilots could begin training as early as January of next year in US planes. By next summer, Russia could have yet another headache on its hands as it now faces modern American weapons both on the ground and in the sky. The real question is, though, with all its bluster about destroying NATO, how exactly does Russia plan to do that when it can't even handle a dozen US HIMARS? With nearly 400 HIMARS units in service, other NATO members are now requesting the weapon system from the US, which is bad news bears for Vladimir Putin's dreams of Russian expansionism. President Joe Biden has warned Russia that there would be clear and severe consequences if Russia were to use chemical weapons in Ukraine. But what if that thin red line was crossed? What if the US and Russia were to go to war over Ukraine? Two hours before war. Somewhere in western Ukraine, a Ukrainian base hosting several dozen American trainers comes under attack from Russian missiles. This is where America had been training Ukraine's conventional and special forces for the last eight years, and where US trainers now work hand-in-hand -hand with their Ukrainian counterparts to get 100,000 Ukrainian reservists ready to fight in the east. The attack is symbolic more than anything, Russia flexing its muscles and warning the US to back off from the war in Ukraine. However, a lucky missile strike happens to hit the American barracks. 15 American soldiers die from the Russian attack, one hour and 45 minutes before the war. The casualties are quickly confirmed and relayed back to Washington, D.C. via the US military's advanced extremely high-frequency satellite network. The constellation of six satellites sits in geostationary orbit and relay data via jam-resistant communication links for the US, Canadian, Australian, Netherlands, and British militaries. News of the casualties are on the president's desk just two minutes after the attack occurs. President Biden immediately calls for an emergency session of Congress, 15 minutes before war. The deaths of US service members is unacceptable to the American people. Russia has been warned that any attack against American supply convoys or personnel would be an attack on America itself. With a few dissenting votes, the American Congress approves a formal declaration of war against Russia, with the stated intent of neutralizing Russian forces inside Ukraine and preventing them from re-entering the country. Five minutes before war. Addressing the world and the nation via the White House Oval Office, President Joe Biden announces a declaration of war by the United States of America against the Russian Federation. He makes it clear that the military objectives of this war are to neutralize Russian forces in Ukraine and liberate the eastern-occupied regions. U.S. ground forces will not be entering into Russia itself. This is an attempt to limit the escalation of hostilities and prevent an immediate escalation to nuclear conflict. As the president is delivering his remarks, the United States military is already on the move. War, hour one. 
From the decks of U.S. ships across the world's oceans, SM-3 missiles modified to carry out anti-satellite attacks fire into the sky. Their targets are Russian military and civilian satellites that help provide communications and GPS navigation to Russian military units. American F-15s aid in the attack, launching their own anti-satellite missiles from high altitude. The attacks are limited and focused. Destroying a satellite in orbit causes a massive debris cloud that can damage or even destroy friendly satellites. Russia, which also has been preparing for the possibility of war with the U.S. ever since the start of the invasion in Ukraine, responds with its own attacks against American satellites. However, Russian weapons are greatly limited in number. Only two of the American advanced extremely high-frequency satellites are neutralized in this way. By comparison, Russian GPS is rendered completely ineffective due to kinetic strikes and electronic attacks against the Russian space network. American ships and cruise missile-laden submarines in both the Pacific Ocean and Baltic Sea launched several additional salvos, this time targeting Russian ground and naval infrastructure. Within minutes of President Biden's declaration of war, hundreds of American missiles are streaking toward targets in St. Petersburg, Kaliningrad, and the Pacific naval bases of Kamchatsky, Magadan, Petropavlovsk, and Sovetskaya Gavan. An American submarine, having secretly transited into the Black Sea weeks ago, launches its own attacks against Russian naval facilities in Sevastopol and occupied Crimea. Russian air defense units detect the incoming barrage of missiles and begin to go to work. S-400 and older S-300 units track the incoming missiles. American cruise missiles are subsonic and easy prey for advanced air defenses, and Russia boasts some of the best in the world. However, this first salvo is immense, and while dozens of American cruise missiles are destroyed, some manage to slip through the blistering barrage of air defenses to hit their targets. Air defense radars are primary targets for the U.S. Navy, but Russia has defended these well, knowing that the U.S. retains the advantage in the air. Only a few U.S. missiles find their mark, punching holes in the Russian air defense network of Kaliningrad, where most of the strikes have been focused. In the Pacific Theater, more U.S. missiles find their targets, given the thinner air defenses there. With the war in Ukraine going poorly for Russia, critical air defense units have been stripped from Russia's less important Pacific Theater to bolster its defenses in the east. Most of the Russian ports in the Pacific are rendered unusable. The Russian Navy has a fraction of the capabilities of the U.S. Navy, and its ships are being kept close to home, where they can enjoy the cover of air and ground-based defenses. However, some Russian submarines are on the prowl in the Atlantic and Pacific, and the hunt for these Russian infiltrators is on. By the end of the first hour of the war, U.S. troops in European bases are being recalled from leave for mobilization. NATO holds a hasty assembly, but most of the member nations do not wish to invoke Article 5. This was, after all, prompted by a strike on a Ukrainian facility that happened to hold American trainers. Only Poland agrees to join the American war effort, mostly out of necessity. Poland borders Kaliningrad and Belarus both, and will be pushed into the crosshairs of the Russian military anyway, as it's the only place the U.S. can stage a push into Ukraine. Hour 3 a barrage of Russian missiles is detected incoming at high speed by long-range airborne and ground-based air defense radars in Poland. The targets are Polish air bases where U.S. Air Force troops and aircraft are stationed. Missiles inbound from Kaliningrad are more difficult to defend against given the faster flight time half managed to evade U.S. and Polish air defenses in the region. The U.S. has positioned Patriot batteries in Poland since the start of the war in Ukraine. But these have been tasked with protecting the Polish Aegis Ashore facility that even now is nearing completion after years of delays and construction challenges. Poland is one of NATO's most important states given its proximity to Russia and the Russian enclave in Kaliningrad. This means that the powerful Aegis Ashore facility will one day be the cornerstone of one of the most robust missile and air defense networks in the world. But that day is not today and the facility is still not operational. Russia pummels the construction site with long-range missiles, but missile defenses manage to stem the bulk of the tide. A few slip through, causing some moderate damage that will ensure the facility will not be completed before the end of the war. Polish air bases also take a pummeling, but the ferocity of the strike is not as great as it was feared to be. That's because Russia has exhausted many of its precision weapons in the fight against Ukraine, and crippling sanctions have made resupply impossible. Russia produces almost none of the sophisticated electronics its advanced missiles need, and what started as a massive stockpile of thousands of missiles has been severely reduced. Any that remain will be needed to counter U.S. forces inside Ukraine itself. Hour 8. Aircraft from across U.S. air bases both at home and abroad take to the sky. They're moving to European airfields from where they'll be able to support the offensive against Russian forces on the ground. America's vast fleet of 650 tanker aircraft, the largest in the world, flies orbits around the Atlantic Ocean, allowing shorter-range F-15s and F-16s to make the transit to Europe from the homeland. Hour 36. 
U.S. mobilization is ramping up, and troops are preparing to move equipment and personnel into transport ships for the journey across the Atlantic. The largest airlift campaign in the world is already in full swing, with American cargo planes ferrying troops and heavy vehicles to Europe. However, even America's impressive logistics fleet is simply not enough to move large enough quantities of equipment for an offensive. For now, Ukraine is on its own, and Russia is pouring all available manpower into the conflict before the U.S. arrives. Hour 40 Russia does not wish to antagonize other NATO members, thus expected incursions into the Baltics never materialize. Neither do long-range strikes against America's most important bases in Germany. Instead, Russia scrambles to put together a massive offensive in the east of Ukraine. Its strategy is simple. If it can overwhelm Ukrainian defenses, then it can deny the US the very country it's trying to push Russia out of. But the Ukrainian defenders are resilient as ever, even as Russia mobilizes its reserve battalion tactical groups for battle. This will put tens of thousands of additional troops in the east of Ukraine in the next few days, overwhelming the defenders. Meanwhile, inside Russia, an emergency draft is instituted. Hour 42 Hastily prepped for their missions, American B-2 bombers have been flying from home bases in the continental U.S. for the last 17 hours. Now, the stealthy planes have penetrated deep inside Russian air defense zones and unleashed their cargo on Russian radar and communication hubs inside of Kaliningrad. The goal is to shut down the military enclave's ability to defend itself from air attack, and thus pin massive contingents of Russian forces down, preventing them from launching an offensive into Poland. Two B-2s are lost in the attack, but the damage to Russian communications and air defense infrastructure is significant and greatly expands gaps in air defense coverage. The U.S. Navy takes advantage of these gaps by launching additional missile strikes, supplemented by strike aircraft from carriers in the Mediterranean and ready forces stationed across Europe. The U.S. Suppression of Enemy Air Defenses, or SEED mission, is slowly but steadily stripping away Russian air defenses inside the military enclave. Russian fighters alone are no match for American planes with superior sensors, electronics, and weapons. But working in conjunction with very robust air defenses, they become a serious threat. Dozens of aircraft are destroyed on both sides of the conflict, as Russia tries to keep its air defenses online and deny the U.S. and Polish the skies. Hour 60 A Russian attack submarine scores a devastating blow on an American destroyer operating inside the Baltic Sea. This is one of Russia's most modern subs, and while not as capable as American counterparts, still a significant threat to the U.S. Navy in turbulent waters of the Baltic Sea. The submarine is pursued relentlessly by surface vessels working in conjunction with the airborne ASW aircraft, but manages to slink away, using a heavy storm as cover. Hundreds of American sailors die in the attack, and a multi-billion dollar ship sinks beneath the waves. The Russian surface navy has yet to show itself in battle, sticking close to shore where it's too dangerous for U.S. forces to target them. Day 4 A flood of cyber attacks rocks both Russia and the US, with both sides unleashing the full force of their cyber warfare capabilities against the other. The damage to civilian infrastructure on both sides is intense, but the US proves more robust and within 48 hours American markets are operating as normal again. Day 6 the war over Kaliningrad has reduced Russia's local air defenses to small bubbles of protection, but at the cost of many American aircraft. The Enclave, however, is now being mercilessly pummeled from the air as American B-52s launch punishing sorties from their home bases in the United States. Supply and logistic hubs are being set up inside Europe to allow the big planes to be closer to the action, and thus fly more sorties. But for now, the planes must make a day-and-a-half round trip to strike their targets and return home, slowing down the pace of the offensive. However, the vast amount of firepower each plane brings to the fight is devastating for Russian forces. With ground-based air defenses severely attrited by the air and missile strikes, American and Polish fighters can now fly air superiority missions over Kaliningrad, daring Russian MiGs to rise up and meet them. As shown in Ukraine, the Russian Air Force is not nearly as capable as once believed, though it is still very numerous. The US has many times more planes, but for now, they're not in Europe, bringing a numbers parity to both sides. US and Polish forces, however, have the advantage with superior sensors, while Russia has the advantage in maneuverability and thrust-to-weight ratio, making their planes deadly in dogfights. Unfortunately for Russia, the age of the dogfight is gone and most engagements are carried out from beyond visual range. Scores of aircraft are downed in the fiercest air battles since World War II, with the losses heavily on the Russian side. By the end of the first week of fighting, Kaliningrad is under serious threat from the air, but the United States has expended vast amounts of munitions in the attacks and must pause air operations to give time for rearming and refitting. For a few days, all is eerily quiet over the skies that were recently roaring with the sound of dueling jet fighters. Week 2 
At the start of the second week of fighting, US forces have begun to amass in Europe in significant numbers. It'll still take time for them to prepare for battle, and even America's vast logistics fleet will take months to ferry the US's firepower to Europe. However, smaller and more mobile forces have already begun the trip to Ukraine, and a large number of attack helicopters are being amassed to repel the Russian ground assault in the Donbass region. They are simply waiting for the refitting of the US Air Force so it can provide the needed air cover. New Russian battalion tactical groups have entered Ukraine after being hastily prepared for combat. However, the hasty preparations have wreaked havoc on Russian supply chains, which have already been struggling even before the broadening of the war. Now Russian vehicles and personnel find themselves stalled out in massive convoys reminiscent of Russia's failed push to Kyiv. US aircraft take the opportunity presented to them, but only the F-35 can penetrate dangerous skies still not secured by proper seat operations. Forced to carry weapons internally, the F-35s are very limited in firepower, and the attacks do little real damage to the massive formations of enemy troops. However, they are a massive morale boost to the beleaguered Ukrainian defenders who have been dreaming of the day US air power would come to their aid. As the second week of fighting comes to a close, the Russian offensive in the east once more bogs down. This time, though, because of Russia's crippling lack of logistics, Ukrainian defenders take the opportunity to pull back and create some breathing room, resupplying and redeploying to new defensive positions. Russia attempts to use air power to pummel the Ukrainian front lines, but very quickly discovers this to be a mistake. Lurking over the skies of Ukraine are a number of American F-22 Raptors. Deploying under the Rapid Raptor program, the premier air supremacy fighter in the world was some of the first American aircraft to arrive on scenes. While Russia can threaten Ukrainian airspace with air defenses based on its own soil, the Raptors are too far away from these defenses for detection. Russian aircraft experience significant losses before the air offensive is abruptly terminated. Week 4 The first American Armored Brigade combat team has crossed the border into Ukraine. A second quickly follows. An expected offensive by the US and Poland into Kaliningrad never materializes, as the US doesn't wish to provoke Russia into using nuclear weapons by physically invading its territory. Instead, Russian troops inside the military enclave are suppressed by ongoing air campaigns against them. America has achieved not air supremacy but air dominance in the region. For the first time in history, Russian and American armor clash in combat. Both sides have prepared for this conflict for decades, but after the end of the Cold War, corruption and a weak economy has hollowed out Russia's once formidable capabilities. The first assault comes in the dead of night. US forces down to the individual soldier are all equipped with night vision. Russian forces, on the other hand, only have night vision and thermals on their heavy vehicles, with a smattering of night vision devices across their infantry. America owns the night, and the ferocity of the offensive rocks the Russian forces to their core. Russian battalion tactical groups are massive beasts with a very heavy top-down command structure. US forces, however, enjoy a great degree of autonomy and are encouraged to seize the initiative. While the Russian BTG is superior in numbers, the US attacks using smaller, much more maneuverable forces. The confusion of fighting in the dark with few night vision capabilities only makes the situation worse for the Russian defenders. Russian T-90s, T-80s, and T-72s have struggled against Ukrainian tanks. Against modern M1A2C Abrams equipped with the latest upgrade packages fighting in the dead of night, they're decimated. Guided to their targets by superior sensors and fire control computers, Abrams' silver bullets bore through thick Russian armor, the edges burning away creating a self-sharpening penetrator that leads to an extremely emotional event for the Russian crew. Russian tanks fire back with cannon-fired anti-tank missiles, but America has sent the very tip of its spear into this first fight. While not every American Abrams has been equipped with a trophy countermeasure system, the tanks leading the charge into Russian lines have been, and the Israeli-developed countermeasures prove an able defense against the few Russian tanks to survive initial contact. The problem for Russian armor is that American tanks are engaging them from greater distances than they're capable of, thanks to the superior fire computers and sights the Abrams are equipped with. While in Ukraine, Russia has failed to use its infantry to screen its armored forces against anti-tank kill teams, the US makes no such mistake, and the offensive is partnered with mechanized infantry forces who quickly engage in neutralized pockets of resistance left behind in the wake of the overwhelming armored assault. Once more, US forces' abilities to see in the dark gives them an insurmountable advantage over the far less technologically sophisticated opponents. Close air support aircraft work in conjunction with the ground assault to pummel Russian positions. Vaunted A-10 Warthogs unleash hell from their massive GAU-8 Avenger 30mm cannons, while F-15s and F-35s provide air cover against a potential incursion by Russian MiGs. Standoff attack munitions have devastated many of Russia's long-range air defenses located in theater, and seed operations have greatly attrited many of the air defenses just over the Russian border that could threaten Allied aircraft inside Ukraine. The campaign has come at a steep cost for the US Air Force and Navy. 
but the benefits are worth the price, as American close air support aircraft mercilessly pummel Russian positions. Short-range air defenses are much more difficult to target and destroy, and a number of American Apaches fall prey to these and man-portable shoulder-fired air defense weapons. The tough A-10s prove far more difficult to bring down, however, constructed to survive exactly this type of large-scale combat during the Cold War. Overall, though, Russian air defenses manage to score only minor losses on the U.S. air fleet before they themselves are destroyed. While Russia has completely failed to conduct combined arms operations, the U.S. teaches Russia's underfunded and poorly trained forces a masterclass in modern combined arms warfare. Week 5 Additional American Armored Brigade combat teams make the transition to Ukraine. U.S. forces relieve Ukrainian forces along the front of Russia, giving the exhausted defenders a chance to rest and recuperate. The main thrust of the American advance is toward Kherson, with the U.S. forces currently engaged in urban fighting against Russian forces for the liberation of the city. American infantry is well versed in urban combat thanks to two decades of fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, but the terrain favors the defenders. U.S. casualties are significant, but with air superiority and superior training, U.S. forces are pushing the Russians out of Kherson. The local civilian populations that remain in the besieged city welcomes the Americans as liberators and aids them in the struggle against Russian forces, only complicating matters for the Russians. Outside of Kherson, the U.S. Special Operations Forces conduct daily nighttime raids against Russian logistics networks, crippling resupply operations into Kherson. The advantage U.S. troops enjoy during nighttime gives them the significant edge over the Russians, as does the fact that the local civilians throw their full support behind the Americans. Along the Polish-Kaliningrad border, skirmishes are common, but there's no full-scale fighting. Polish forces have created a massive defense front in order to keep Russians from encroaching into Poland. But by now, U.S. and Polish air forces have completely destroyed Russia's air defense networks in the military enclave. Any Russian forces that would threaten Poland come under immediate attack. Losses have been steep for both nations' air forces, but Russia losses have been steeper. Not only are Polish and American aircraft far more modern, but Russia's legacy of internal corruption and poor maintenance haunts it as it tries to fend off constant air attacks. Sortie rates for Russian aircraft plummet almost immediately and never recover enough to create a viable defense. To make matters worse, the shortage of critical electronic components has also crippled Russian air defenses. Already during hostilities with Ukraine, the Russian military was running out of air defense missiles, but now all of its stockpiles for use in case of war with NATO have been nearly exhausted, and there's no domestic replenishment available. Within another week or two, the Russians will be reduced to Cold War-era anti-aircraft cannons, which are completely ineffective against high altitude targets, though still pose a threat to low-flying aircraft. At the end of the first month of fighting, the Russian military is in dire straits. It's already exhausted by two months of fighting in Ukraine. The majority of U.S. ground combat power is not yet in theater, but well on its way, and what elements are already operating inside of Ukraine are putting incredible pressure on demoralized and exhausted Russian troops. U.S. losses are light, Russian casualties are steep, and many of its gains in Ukraine are being reversed. The U.S. has yet to initiate a large campaign against Russian forces, waiting until the bulk of its fighting units are inside the country before launching a massive blitz across the 800-mile front in the east of the nation. For now, the Americans are reinforcing Ukraine's exhausted defenders and relieving them for much-needed reconstitution and resupply. Only in Kherson have the Americans launched a true offensive with the goal of opening a corridor to Crimea. Week 6 Ukrainian forces and their American allies end the Russian occupation of Kherson. The city is the only place U.S. forces have sustained significant casualties. All along the wide-open plains of eastern Ukraine, American forces have remained in defensive postures, repelling initial attempts by the Russians to push them back. Now the front settles into a strategic stalemate as the U.S. waits for the arrival of the bulk of its firepower. In the air, however, the war continues. U.S. forces work day and night to attrit Russian air defenses. The use of drones, standoff attack munitions, and F-35s help curb what would otherwise be very high casualties, as does the fact that Russia is rapidly running out of air defense missiles. Turkey allows the passage of U.S. Navy ships into the Black Sea leading to a brief but intense confrontation between the Russian and American navies. The Russians managed to sink two American destroyers in exchange for nearly their entire Black Sea fleet, which is forced to remain in port or operate under the threat of being sunk. Those ships are soon destroyed at their moorings by the American stealth aircraft. U.S. Marines arrive in Odessa to bring preparations for an amphibious assault into Crimea. Week 9 in one of the fastest mobilization efforts in history, the United States has surged vast amounts of combat firepower to Ukraine over the course of two months. The battle for Ukraine is ready to begin in earnest. Week 10 Russian forces have had their supply lines continuously disrupted by U.S. air and special forces operations. 
Ammunition is low across the front, as is food, medicine, and morale. Russia has entered this war with an insufficiently large enough logistics fleet, and now after the destruction of hundreds of its trucks, its logistics networks are close to complete collapse. Russian forces have been forced to pull back dozens of miles across the front, but not due to military action, because supply lines are needed to be shortened in order to keep units resupplied with a diminished transport fleet. 20,000 additional Russian forces have surged into the nation, the vast majority of them conscripts. These soldiers are poorly equipped and suffer from extremely low morale. The front has been quiet for two weeks, but all of that is about to change. In a blistering nighttime attack, U.S. forces surge forward across the wide front in eastern Ukraine. The use of nighttime operations throws the Russians into disarray as they still lack night fighting capabilities in any significant number. Only in the cities is the offensive slowed, as the fighting becomes a block-by-block -block slog that favors the Russian occupiers. A thrust into Crimea splits Russian forces into two, as simultaneously U.S. and Ukrainian marines launch an amphibious assault outside of Sevastopol. The operation is a costly one. Russian resistance is stiffer here after eight years of occupying Crimea. However, the rapid advance of American armor into Crimea cuts off Sevastopol from the rest of Russia. Rather than attempting to take the city by force, U.S. and Ukrainian forces surround it and seal it off from resupply, allowing civilians to flee through humanitarian corridors while keeping Russian forces pinned down. Cut off from outside supply, they will eventually either starve to death or be forced to surrender. With U.S. forces in sight of Mariupol by the end of the week and 100,000 Ukrainian troops trained and equipped in the last two months, Russia faces a choice – admit defeat in Ukraine and retreat to its own borders, continue in a senseless defense of occupied territories that is doomed to failure at great cost to its own troops, or widen the conflict through the use of nuclear weapons. In what's become a modern desert storm, U.S. forces and their Polish allies working in conjunction with Ukraine's defenders have rolled back most of Russia's gains in a matter of weeks. The deciding factors are superior morale, training, equipment, and the fact that Russia has been unable to properly resupply its forces for weeks. But victory hasn't come without a cost to the U.S. and Poland. Thousands are dead and wounded, and the loss in aircraft is significant. Stockpiles of air defenses and ground attack missiles have also been greatly depleted. Replenishment will take years and leave the U.S. military vulnerable to any sudden aggression by China in the Pacific. One of America's greatest modern weaknesses is the lack of a robust industrial mobilization capability, leaving it to resupply losses in missiles and equipment through a slow, steady trickle that will take the better part of a decade. The date is March 4, 2022, and after years of deliberation, both Georgia and Bosnia and Herzegovina have officially been accepted as full NATO partners. Ukraine now reinvigorates its push for NATO membership, while Russia has for the last six months warned of military action. Alarmed by what it views as encroachment of NATO on its borders, Russia at last responds to the ascension of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Georgia by massing forces on its western border. Russia is gambling that the other NATO nations will reconsider admitting the two new members, or at least not be willing to go to war over the defense of brand new members to the alliance. Russia, however, has completely underestimated the solidarity of the alliance, realizing that NATO is in essence a worthless entity unless Article 5 of the treaty is immediately enforced. NATO warns Russia that an attack on one ally is considered an attack on all allies. To reinforce the point, NATO troops are sent into Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, the alliance's most vulnerable members given their direct proximity to Russia. Russia, however, sees this as an unacceptable show of force, and the move proves to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Without warning, Russian armor pours into Latvia and Lithuania, linking up with forces in Kaliningrad. World War III has officially begun. For the first month of fighting, Russian forces push as far west as Poland, but the offensive grinds to a halt as NATO members finish mobilizing and their resistance solidifies. With American troops and equipment making landfall in France and Germany, NATO is now launching vicious counterattacks against Russia's forces in Poland. In the Pacific, the American Navy steams towards Russia's eastern coast, bringing with it a Marine expeditionary force meant to open a second front in the war and split Russia's forces. Russia is faced with a losing proposition and decides to gamble. It authorizes a single nuclear strike against Berlin, betting that while European NATO members may retaliate with their limited nuclear arsenals, the Americans won't risk the destruction of their cities to support their European allies. The date is now April 12th, 0205 hours Zulu. American and Chinese infrared recon satellites both pick up the telltale fiery plume of an ICBM launch from a missile farm in the south of Russia. Two minutes later, the American president is awoken from his sleep and given the news. Russia has launched a single nuclear device, unknown payload, likely target in Western Europe. 
The US Air Force's Global Strike Command has for weeks been flying nuclear alert missions with its fleet of B-52 bombers, maintaining a nuclear armed force in the air 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, as its predecessor, the Strategic Air Command, once did for decades during the Cold War. With the detected launch of a Russian nuclear weapon, a priority flash is immediately dispatched to the airborne forces and alert forces on the ground. Flight crews stationed overseas in Japan, on the west coast of the United States, and in Europe all review their single integrated operational plan, which lays out the exact flight route, refueling track, and targets for each of the bomber crews. Most aircraft have two primary targets, with two alternate targets to be struck should they be unable to make it to their primary targets. Within minutes, the crews are in the air, and those already on alert patrols immediately set their course for the positive control turnaround point a pre-planned point near Russia where the air crews will automatically turn around unless they receive an order to strike. At missile sites across the American Midwest, the giant concrete shutters that protect the buried missiles inside their launch facilities are automatically rolled back, and the security forces personnel tasked with defending those sites go on full alert. Their orders are to defend the silos until every missile has been launched, after which they are to escort surviving missile crews out and back to a rendezvous point well away from the missile farm for these sites will be a priority target for incoming Russian missiles. Inside underground bunkers, missile operators rehearse launch procedures, each man responsible for a group of missiles. The entire system only requires two out of four of the operators to authenticate a launch order, just in case two of the men get cold feet about launching a nuclear Armageddon and refuse their orders. Deep in the Arctic, Pacific, and Atlantic Ocean, the US's extremely low-frequency communication system flashes a nuclear alert to America's ballistic missile submarine fleet. Each sub carries 24 Trident missiles, and each missile carries up to eight independently targetable warheads with a yield of 475 kilotons. America's fleet of hunter-killer attack submarines have for weeks been stalking and eliminating Russia's aging ballistic missile submarines, and the survivors are bottled up near the Russian shore where they can be protected with shore-based firepower and anti-submarine patrols. Now, America's attack submarines set course for Russia's coast, and their mission is to eliminate Russia's surviving nuke boats, though it will cost America's submarine fleet dearly, as Russia's Air Force and Surface Navy fiercely defend their surviving ballistic missile subs. At 0209 hours, the American president is told that the American recon assets have positive confirmation of a nuclear detonation in Berlin. The Russians have fired an older, single warhead ICBM, yet with a yield large enough to completely destroy the city of 3.6 million. On a hotline direct with the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, the President is told that Britain is already issuing a fire order to retaliate for the attack. The President knows that the attack on Berlin was a gamble by the Russians, who don't believe that the US will risk an escalation and attacks on its own cities to defend Europe. An emergency flash is dispatched by the US's ELF communication system to a lurking Ohio-class submarine currently on station deep beneath the ice of the North Pole. After authenticating the order, the sub breaches through the five-foot-thick ice and the door on a single dorsally mounted launch tube props open. The navigation system on the Trident II missile located inside the launch tube is activated and a mission trajectory is automatically loaded into the flight computer. Then a steam generator ignites a solid grain rocket motor which feeds superheated exhaust into a tank of chilled water. The water evaporates and expands, forcing the missile within the launch tube to be launched upwards and out after which the first stage motor ignites and the missile screams upward and towards space. An astro-inertial guidance system on board the missile uses star positioning to fine-tune the accuracy of its trajectory, as GPS has long been unreliable due to Russian attacks on NATO satellites. The Russians have bet wrong, and minutes later eight 475 kiloton warheads detonate over the Russian missile facility which launched the Berlin attack. Simultaneously, a British attack strikes the cities of Ekaterinburg and Novosibirsk, with a population of 1.5 million or 3 million together. NATO has responded in kind to the Berlin attack, and America has both punished Russia's nuclear forces for the attack and shown that it will stand with its allies. In the halls of the Kremlin, a desperate power struggle plays out. 3 million Russians lie dead, and the US has obliterated one of Russia's major nuclear missile facilities, destroying dozens of ICBMs in place. Russian ballistic submarines, considered to be the most survivable element of the nuclear triad, have also been decimated by American attack submarines, though the US has lost 12 subs of its own in its quest to eliminate the remaining Russian boats. Military leadership clashes with the civilian leadership and demands a retaliatory attack on American missile facilities. With US reinforcements in force on the Western Front, and Russia 
Russians starting to lose ground in Poland, battlefield commanders have for the last week been requesting a release on strategic nuclear weapons to use against American infantry and tanks. The fierce debate on the use of tactical weapons is reignited, and when further nuclear attacks are denied, Russian military leadership stages a stunning coup. The Russian president is removed from power, and Russian commanders receive authorization for the use of a dozen tactical weapons against NATO forces in Europe. Within a half hour, NATO troop concentrations in Poland are hammered by low-yield nuclear attacks, killing tens of thousands. American reinforcements fresh from the states and currently massing around the Rammstein military facilities in Germany are hit with three tactical devices. The Marine Expeditionary Force in the Pacific, staging out of Japan, is also struck by a single device, as are the two naval carrier battle groups supporting the invasion. By 9 a.m., American military forces have suffered more casualties than all wars since World War II combined, and the ability for NATO to push back Russian forces in Poland is eliminated. While Russia has maintained an inventory of low-yield tactical nuclear weapons to counter America's overwhelming conventional firepower advantage, the United States has not kept an active inventory of tactical devices for decades. This leaves the American president with few options for a comparable retaliatory attack. While the yields on America's airborne submarine and ground-launched nuclear devices can be dialed down, there's no way to broadcast that fact to the Russians, and little chance they'd believe it. An attack with traditional ICBMs, submarine-launched missiles, or airborne nuclear cruise missiles will seem to Russia like a full-blown attack and risk escalating the war into a total nuclear confrontation. Yet the president has little choice. Tens of thousands of American service members are dead, US forces in Europe have been badly damaged by the attacks, and both carrier battle groups supporting the Pacific invasion are reporting major losses of ships, aircraft, and personnel. The Marine Invasion Force in Okinawa is combat ineffective four divisions reporting over 55% casualties each. Resigning himself to a list of terrible options, the President orders a retaliatory attack using ground-based ICBMs. The Air Force's Global Strike Command nuclear bomber fleet is to approach and hold at their failsafe points, ready to proceed to their targets should Russia retaliate again. At Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota, a launch order is authorized by the two-man Minuteman launch crew, and a single Minuteman III missile roars into the night sky. Sixty seconds later, the second stage of the missile ignites, separating from the spent first booster stage. Adjustments using the second stage thrust vector control keeps the missile on its course, and another 60 seconds later the flight computer separates the second stage and fires the engine on the third and final stage. By now the missile has reached space, and as the third stage engine burns out, reverse thrust separates the three warheads and their penetration aids from the launch vehicle. Some of the penetration aids explode, showering space with millions of pieces of reflective aluminum which wreak havoc on radar used by missile interceptors, while other aids simulate the real warheads and serve as dummy targets for any Russian interceptors. With no real Russian anti-ballistic missile defense programs though, the warheads and the dummies all re-enter the Earth's atmosphere completely unharmed. 23 minutes after launch, three separate 475 kiloton nuclear explosions rock Eastern Europe. Russian forces in Poland are obliterated by two nuclear strikes many times greater in magnitude than those used against NATO forces, while yet another Russian nuclear missile facility is struck by the third warhead. With American weapons targeting their missile fields and systematically eliminating Russia's ability to respond to nuclear attacks, the final order is given for a full-blown nuclear response. American reconnaissance satellites and electronic eavesdropping assets all pick up the telltale signs of preparatory operations for a nuclear launch across Russia's remaining missile farms. The order to attack is mirrored in the US, and launch officers in North Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana receive the order to launch. Simultaneously, American airborne assets receive an emergency flash, which when authenticated authorizes the air crews to proceed to their targets with full nuclear release. American ballistic missile submarines breach through the thick polar ice, or rise to 25 feet below the waves of the Pacific in the North Sea. As Russian missiles clear their silos, it's America's nuclear ballistic missile subs which launch the first wave of retaliatory attacks, almost as fast as Russian ground forces. American submarine-launched missiles target Russia's remaining missile fields in a desperate hope to destroy them before they can finish launch operations, but for the most part the American strikes fail to stop the launches. Secondary military targets are then struck, with major Russian military bases, supply depots, troop staging areas, and airfields all being obliterated in nuclear fire within 10 minutes of the start of the Russian attack.
As Russia's ICBMs climb into the atmosphere, a wave of American ballistic missile defense systems immediately spring into action. Having spent billions on ballistic missile defense since the 1980s, all in a bid to make Reagan's Star Wars concept a reality, America now attacks the incoming missiles with a variety of tools. Airborne laser systems in Europe and flying in the Pacific manage to strike at a handful of ICBMs during their vulnerable ascent stage, superheating the missile body from hundreds of miles away with a powerful aircraft-mounted laser system. As the missile climb into space, ballistic missile defense sites across the west coast of the United States launch their ground-based interceptors. Using a powerful radar, the interceptors scream toward the incoming missiles in a bid to destroy them through kinetic impact before they can re-enter the atmosphere. The Russian missiles, however, immediately disperse their own penetration aids and a shower of billions of pieces of aluminum chaff wreaks hell on American interceptor radar. The interceptors switch to their visual interception systems, and advanced computer programs frantically scramble to identify the incoming warheads visually, ignoring the clouds of chaff. Half of the interceptors miss their targets, the other half manage to strike, yet of the successful intercepts, a full third are of dummy warheads. To make matters worse, the US only has an inventory of about 60 interceptors ready to fire and are completely overwhelmed by an incoming horde of hundreds of independently targeted warheads. 24 minutes after launch, the west coast is the first hit. One megaton strikes against Los Angeles, Seattle, Portland, and others obliterate the most populated cities on the American west coast. A follow-on 450 kiloton strike destroys the Los Angeles harbor area, along with tens of thousands of homes and the naval base at San Diego. Edwards Air Force Base in the California desert is struck by two 450 kiloton strikes, as is Vandenberg Air Force Base. Three minutes later, nuclear impacts strike the American Midwest. North American Aerospace Defense Command at Peterson Air Force Base is incinerated by a megaton blast, and the Cheyenne Mountain Complex is struck by two ground penetration munitions, though the blasts manage to do little damage to the deeply buried facility. Strikes continue to roll eastwards, and a saturation of 300 kiloton strikes decimates the American farm belt. These munitions are programmed to be ground bursts, resulting in the scattering of millions of tons of highly radioactive dirt across America's most fertile farmland. Another three minutes later and the east coast is struck by the Russian ICBMs. Washington is obliterated by two separate megaton blasts, as is New York City, the financial heart of America. The American president, however, is safe from the nuclear blasts. He has long ago boarded what is nicknamed the Doomsday Plane, an airborne command post from which he can still manage America's remaining military and civilian forces. With satellite and ground communications completely eradicated, a fleet of Air Force planes now makes up a global command and control system, linking up surviving military forces with the president. Soon, his plane will land at an intact airfield and he'll be helicoptered out to a surviving supercarrier, from which he will continue to command the survivors of America's military and oversee the reconstruction, if any possible, of what remains of America, all from the safety of the Atlantic Ocean. Day 1 the plan to invade Russia had been in motion for three months, with massive amounts of men and material moved into staging areas around Europe and Japan. The powder keg everyone feared would be lit was about to explode. It all began with Lithuania blocking rail shipments from Russia to the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad, in protest over the war in Ukraine, effectively cutting it off from resupply. For weeks Russia blustered and threatened and then did the unthinkable. Russian troops crossed the border into Lithuania to seize and secure the railways, linking the critically important Kaliningrad with the motherland. NATO immediately activated its rapid response force, pushing Russian troops out of Lithuania. Now the United States is preparing to do the unthinkable, and something that's very likely to trigger nuclear war. It will invade Russia. US troops have been staging in Poland, Norway, and Japan. The obvious choice may be one of the Baltic nations, but port facilities and airfields here are too close to Russia and under the threat of constant attack. At zero hour, the American attack begins on Russia. It starts with a series of explosions along the western air defense perimeter Russia has established on its home soil to defend against NATO air attack. It's an extremely robust system of SAM satellites, fighter bases, and radar installations, the densest air defense network in the world. But the United States has several tools for the job. The first is the B-2 stealth bomber. With its lack of vertical surfaces, it's the only stealth aircraft in the world that can also defeat long-range tracking radar, which even the best stealth fighter is vulnerable to. The only clue to the incoming attack are intermittent anomalous pings on Russian radars, but by the time Russian fighters arrive to investigate, the B-2s are long gone. Radar and communication nodes are the first to be targeted by American B-2 stealth fleet. This knocks out a significant amount of Russian long-range radar, and a few hours later B-51 bombers armed with standoff attack munitions fire volleys of missiles to crater Russian airfields and destroy fixed SAM sites. 
Unlike Russia's attempt to knock out Ukraine's air defense network at the start of the war, this is a concentrated and well-coordinated attack reminiscent of the shock and awe of the first desert storm, when the US and allies destroyed the second best and most importantly Soviet-built air defense network in the world in hours. F-35s move in to finish the job and knock out air bases along Russia's eastern border, as well as destroy rail infrastructure. Russia's mobility depends disproportionately heavily on railways, hence its problems inside Ukraine. And crippling railways means Russia can't move troops and equipment until the rails are repaired. F-35s are nowhere near as stealthy as the B-2s and have to get much closer than the B-52s to launch their own attacks. But as Russian interceptors rise to meet them, they're greeted by a swarm of US Air Force F-22s, which swat Russian fighters out of the sky from beyond visual range. The US loses several F-35s and fourth-generation aircraft in the attacks, but Russia's ability to defend its western border from air attack is crippled. There are still many mobile radars and SAM units to deal with, but these are under dire threat from constant wild weasel attacks by the US Air Force. Once feared as a near-peer competitor to the US, the war in Ukraine has proven that the Russian Air Force is not even capable of neutralizing a much weaker country such as Ukraine. Poor training, lack of communication, antiquated tactics, and bad maintenance all add up to devastating losses for Russia's air forces. Even as the US airstrikes begin, American ground forces are already rumbling to battle. Abrams' main battle tanks and Apache attack helicopters smash into Russian defensive lines in Kaliningrad. With overwhelming air support, the battles are brutal but short. Russian armor is no match for modern American weapons, and its tank forces are so depleted by the fighting in Ukraine that modern Russian tanks are few and far between. As Desert Storm proved, Cold War Soviet tanks are no match for even early model M1 Abrams, and especially not when working in conjunction with close air support aircraft like the Apache or the A-10 Warthog. By the end of the first day of the battle, Russian ground forces have suffered their worst defeat since the opening day of Operation Barbarossa. Day 3 US forces have moved deep inside Ukraine where they're en route to reinforce Ukrainian units in the east of the country. Under intense air assault, Russian forces have been retreating across the entire eastern front of the war. Ukrainian troops have used overwhelming American air power to inflict devastating losses on retreating Russians, and American ground forces are having to rush to catch up with them. There is fear of overextension, but the constant US air and missile assault leaves little room or time for the Russians to counterattack. The key to America's deadly efficiency is information. The US military is the most networked military in the world, and unlike Russia, employs overwhelming amounts of smart weapons. It's been tracking Russian forces since the start of the war in Ukraine, and sharing that information with Ukraine to devastating effect. However, the Ukrainian army always lacked the hardware to make full use of the information. The US doesn't. Adding to Russia's woes is a fundamental lack of operational security in its military. Most of Russia's radios are unsecured, allowing the US to scoop up vast amounts of signals intelligence. After spending 20 years hunting down terrorists in the Middle East by snooping through millions of radio and cell phone intercepts, the US has gotten extremely good at the job. This is why in the real world, Russian generals have been dying on a regular basis, their location pinpointed by the US and transmitted to Ukrainian forces. Now that the US hardware is in play, the slaughter is exponentially greater. Russian command chains are broken across the Eastern Front, and its forces in general retreat to more fortified positions inside the cities of Eastern Ukraine. Day 7 the battle for Kaliningrad is officially over. The fighting was brutal and intense, but under-equipped and demoralized Russian forces were ultimately overwhelmed by US firepower. Psychological operations against Russian troops have been particularly effective. First is an overwhelming display of US power in the form of precision air and long-range artillery strikes. Then radio broadcasts and even leaflets delivered by the US Air Force promise amnesty for any Russian soldier who surrenders. With a large number of conscripts who are accustomed to poor, even abusive treatment, the psychological operation to demoralize Russian forces has been a great success. It doesn't help that many Russian forces here have been recently rotated out of the brutal fighting in Ukraine. If the Russian army could barely win against Ukraine, what hope does it have against the full might of the US military? In the east of Ukraine, American ground forces have joined the fighting alongside their Ukrainian allies. The arrival of vast amounts of American firepower has reinvigorated Ukraine's frontline forces, who are eager to liberate captured territory. But Russia is an artillery army, meaning they field many times more artillery than any other military in the world. And despite intense counter-battery fire and use of ground-attack aircraft, the US is suffering its worst losses since the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Day 14 
the fighting in Kaliningrad is down to small guerrilla operations by Russian resistance forces. NATO forces from Spain, Germany, Poland, and Italy conduct anti-guerrilla operations, freeing up US forces to continue pushing into the Baltics. Rather than invade the Baltic nations as it once was feared Russia would do in case of a war, the Russian army has chosen to strengthen its defenses along the Baltic border instead. A wise move given the Russian Air Force's inability to deter US air operations. Without adequate air cover, any ground offensive against a military with the largest, most modern air force in the world is doomed to failure. Now US forces execute a push into Belarus from Lithuania and Poland. Belarusian resistance forces have been gathering inside Poland for weeks, undergoing training and being equipped by the US military in anticipation of an operation to liberate their nation from dictator Lukashenko. A popular uprising against Lukashenko severely hampers loyalist forces' ability to repulse the invasion, and Russian forces sent in support are under intense and constant air attack. In Ukraine, the fighting has reached major occupied cities in the east, with Russian forces slowly but surely being expelled. However, urban combat is notoriously difficult and time-consuming, and heavily favors the defender. The US is suffering its first major casualties in the fight to liberate East Ukraine. However, US forces have been engaged in urban combat for two decades in the Middle East and have superior training and equipment. Cutting off supply lines to occupied cities also cripples the Russian resistance, as does morale issues which have reached critical levels. When they were fighting just Ukrainian forces armed with US weapons, Russian frontline troops were already suffering from severe morale problems. Now faced with vengeful Ukrainians backed by American troops, morale is at a crisis point. Many units surrender without firing a shot. Day 21 a national mobilization effort across Russia has met with mixed success. With US involvement in the Ukrainian war, the anti-war movement has picked up considerable steam. Many young Russians are refusing to show up when mobilized, and attacks on conscription offices are on the rise. The US has fully mobilized its reserves as well, and behind closed doors at the highest levels of American power, discussions are being held on a new draft. While the US completely outcompetes the Russian military, actually invading Russia and toppling the Putin regime will require many more combat forces than currently available, and the only way to generate the necessary manpower is a draft. Casualties are also mounting, and while the losses are heavily on the Russian side, the US has suffered thousands injured and half that number dead. Of grave importance are losses in hardware. Modern US manufacturing is poorly suited for mass replenishment of combat losses. With current US defense production a fraction of what it was in the past, an invasion into Russia will cost huge amounts of hardware, and that is not going to be quickly replaced. US industry can surge to building 28 Abrams a month, but if the US is to maintain a credible deterrent against China, it'll need many times that number. Production of fighter aircraft is likewise limited, with perhaps 150 F-35s a year now being built a surge might bring that number to 200. To put it simply, US focus on advanced weapons and a reliance on overseas manufacturing means that American civilian manufacturing is poorly suited for a transition to wartime production of weapons. It's either going to have to win this war quickly or resort to less and less sophisticated weapons to do so. Day 30 At the end of the first month of fighting, Russian forces have been pushed back to within miles of Ukraine's eastern border with Russia. It's only stubborn resistance inside dense urban cities that's slowing US forces down. Russia has learned not to engage the Americans or their Ukrainian allies in open country anymore. It's just inviting destruction either from the air or from smart precision artillery. A plan for an amphibious assault on the Kamchatka Peninsula is cancelled as fears over mounting losses of equipment have led to a redeployment of forces from Japan to the European theater. Instead, the US Navy launches a number of raids against Russian military airfields and ports in the region, destroying the Russian Pacific Fleet completely. Russia's Far East, however, is relatively strategically unimportant to the nation, as it's too far from Russia's economic hubs to matter much, thus the losses do little to affect the war. The strategically important port of St. Petersburg has been blockaded since the start of the war, and the US Navy launches periodic strikes against Russian forces in the city. Russia fears an amphibious assault incoming and American Marines are spotted staging inside of Estonia for just such an operation. But it's a feint meant to draw Russian attention to the defense of the city and away from the fighting in Belarus. Inside Belarus, Lukashenko is a president in exile as US and liberation forces free the capital city and march on a retreating loyalist force, hastily making for the Russian border. Under intense air attack, few of the forces make it to the border with any semblance of cohesion. Once at the border itself, they're met with betrayal much like Russia did in our real world to its separatist allies retreating inside Ukraine, the country now refuses to allow non-Russian forces to cross the border. Rather than fight, many surrender. 
Day 45. U.S. armor chases retreating Russian units across the Ukrainian border and into Russia itself. For the first time since World War II, Russia is now under invasion by a hostile foreign power. Along the Belarusian border, U.S. air and long-range artillery has been devastating Russian defensive positions in anticipation of an assault across the border. Precision strikes have targeted lines of communication, supply depots, and concentrations of heavy equipment. Russia has far more artillery than the U.S. and responds with overwhelming volleys of fire. However, the U.S. is better at counter-battery fire, and artillery duels tend to end with the U.S. on the winning side. U.S. air power has taken significant losses dismantling Russia's vast air defense network, but is still extremely capable and available in large numbers. It's this air power that's most lethal to Russia's artillery forces, who are under regular air attack. U.S. stockpiles of smart weapons have begun to run low, though, after a month and a half of intense combat operations. Dumb bombs are being upgraded with smart kits to make them weapon or GPS-guided, and superior targeting capabilities by U.S. planes means that even dumb gravity bombs strike with great precision. By comparison, Russian smart weapon stockpiles are now completely depleted. Already running dangerously low by the fifth month of the war in Ukraine, Russia's stockpiles of modern weapons are all but exhausted. It's now putting Cold War relics into the fight with predictably poor results. But Russia has still a significant pool of manpower and conscripts to throw against the invading U.S. forces. As the invasion of Russia is set to formally begin, American commanders consider the dangerous logistics of going up against hundreds of thousands of Russian conscripts. Even if armed with vastly inferior equipment, the sheer number of defenders means U.S. forces could be overwhelmed if they overextend. The best strategy is to keep those troops from even fighting in the first place. U.S. PSYOPs have been working overtime to demoralize Russian troops and convince the Russian people to rise against the current regime. The U.S. promises that it has no intention of holding any seized Russian territory. In fact, it would be wildly impractical to do so, and instead states that its goal is the removal of the Putin regime. This message resonates with many disenfranchised Russians, especially amongst the younger generations. The crushing defeat suffered by Russian forces in the last 45 days helped steer many toward an unwillingness to fight. But many Russians see it as their duty to defend their homeland from any invader and have fierce loyalty to the Putin regime. A civil war is brewing inside Russia, and it might be the U.S.'s only hope of a successful invasion. Without support from the people, it's unlikely an attempt to remove Vladimir Putin from power will be successful, and that's if he doesn't resort to the use of nuclear weapons. Given the Russian military's incompetence, it's all but certain that the U.S. will also face the use of tactical nuclear weapons against its forces. This can only mean one thing and equal retaliation by the United States, the dangerous climb up the nuclear ladder that only leads to one place, complete annihilation. Despite its vastly superior capabilities, even the U.S., sole superpower on Earth, simply cannot successfully invade Russia and defeat it without, in effect, defeating itself. Missiles soar over the border of Finland. Russian tanks plow through a series of defenses. Soldiers slaughter one another as they battle for Helsinki. Vladimir Putin has lost any ounce of sanity and has invaded Finland. Lucky for the rest of the world, this will be the last thing he ever does. Finland is more than capable of defending itself, but they have a surprise up their sleeve. As Russia invades another neighbor, they're not just met by Finnish troops, but tanks, aircraft, and naval vessels that have an American flag emblazoned on them. Putin's gone too far this time, and the United States will make him pay. This is one of the many possible scenarios that could unfold if Russia attacks Finland. The extent to which the United States would get involved in a conflict between Finland and Russia depends on what actions Putin takes. A full-scale invasion would elicit a very different reaction from the United States than a series of skirmishes along the border of the two nations. That being said, if Putin resorted to using nukes against Finland, the U.S. response would be swift and catastrophic. Let's take a look at several different scenarios involving a war between Finland and Russia to see the extent to which the United States would go. Now before we get started, let's make one thing very, very clear. Attacking Finland is the last thing that Russia should be worried about right now. Russian forces are so consumed with the war in Ukraine that an invasion of another country would be unthinkable. Putin just doesn't have the manpower, weapons, or vehicles to wage another war without being crushed on multiple fronts. Therefore, he would literally have to be out of his mind to invade Finland. Although if anyone is crazy enough to invade a second country while losing a war they're already fighting, it would probably be Putin. Finland shares an 800-mile border with Russia, which is the longest of any nation in the European Union. This along with the fact that Russia and Finland have had a turbulent past has Finnish leaders a little on edge. 
Finland has a population of just over 5.5 million people, while Russia's population is around 143 million. However, it is important to remember that Russia is massive. In fact, Russia's landmass is around 51 times larger than Finland's. When all this is considered, it appears Finland would be on the losing side of any conflict between the two nations. But as we know from the war in Ukraine, size doesn't always matter. Finland's economy has been on an upward trend since 2015, and so is close to reaching $300 billion annually. The Russian economy, on the other hand, is starting to stall and eventually will go into crippling decline as the sanctions placed on Russia by the West take hold. These will cause long-lasting effects, and a lot of Russia's current and future economic problems can be traced back to the United States' policies. The exact opposite can be said about the economic relationship between Finland and the US. Economic agreements between these two countries have only helped Finland's economy. When we look at the future of Russia and Finland, it seems that the latter is in a much better position than its neighbor. However, Vladimir Putin probably doesn't look at statistics or data before making decisions. At the very least, he tends to ignore information that does not confirm what he wants. Therefore, a Russian invasion of Finland might be driven by pure greed and paranoia rather than any type of strategic planning. So let's look at Finland's military and then focus on exactly what the United States would do to aid the Finnish defense forces if Russia ever attacked. The Finnish defense forces have been preparing to protect the nation from Russia ever since its conception. Finland gained independence from the Russian Empire in 1917, but quickly found itself once again under threat of invasion by the Soviet Union during World War II. Finland managed to maintain its sovereignty at the end of the war, but has been incredibly wary of its neighbor to the east ever since. The Finnish Air Force consists of around 166 aircraft, of which only 55 are fighters. More specifically, these planes are U.S. McDonnell Douglas F.A. 18 Hornets. These are formidable aircraft, but it is the 64 Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning IIs that Finland has on order that will really strengthen their military capabilities in the air. Finland also has around 240 tanks, most of which are Leopard 2s, often considered one of the most capable tanks in the world. They've also been shown to make quick work of older Soviet-era tanks, like the ones Russia's been using more and more in Ukraine as its stockpile of tanks quickly diminishes. Finland also has around 800 artillery guns and 75 MLRS vehicles. The Finnish Navy is pretty much non-existent, with around 8 fast attack vessels and a handful of minesweepers. When compared to the Russian military, even in its weakened state, Finland is definitely outmanned and outgunned. But again, numbers aren't everything, and if a war ever broke out between the two nations, Finland would have some powerful allies, including the United States. The U.S. formally established diplomatic relations with Finland in 1919. Then in 1944, the U.S. severed its ties with Finland when the nation fought alongside Nazi Germany to protect itself from a Soviet invasion. However, once World War II ended, diplomatic relations between U.S. and Finland were once again re-established. During the Cold War, Finland's proximity to the USSR was of a particular interest to the United States. However, Finland was adamant about remaining neutral in the conflict and refused to openly aid the US or allow nuclear weapons to be deployed within their borders. However, the Finnish government was much more invested in the West winning the Cold War than the Soviet Union. This is because it seemed likely a powerful Russia would eventually want to extend its borders further and Finland was a logical choice for a future invasion. The fear of a Soviet Union that could dominate Asia and Eastern Europe led to certain agreements and under-the-table dealings between the US and Finland. This helped strengthen the ties between the two governments. However, in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the US ramped up its efforts to help support Finland in its non-alignment policies while also reinforcing their cultural and economic ties to the West. Basically, the US promoted any agreements that would bring Finland closer to NATO and Europe. And although it claimed to support the neutrality of Finland, the US government almost certainly had ulterior motives for Finland due to its strategic location. If Finland became more reliant on the US and Western powers, it was unlikely that communism or a similar form of authoritarian rule would take hold in the nation. And for the US and much of Europe, that was and is still the goal. Then in 2016, the United States and Finland signed a bilateral statement of intent. There were several objectives of this agreement. The first was to deepen bilateral and multilateral dialogue and defense policies. What this meant was the US wanted to start working more closely with Finland to ensure its military tactics and procedures were closely aligned with its own. In extension, this would set up Finland to join NATO more easily in the future since interoperability between militaries is a requirement for being accepted into the organization. The statement of intent would also increase the strategic information shared by both nations. Obviously, the one country that both Finland and the US were most concerned about was Russia, and therefore the information sharing likely had a lot to do with Finland's neighbor to the east and what they were up to. 
Another major aspect of the agreement was to increase the planning of joint training exercises, which would not only benefit Finland's military, but would also set the groundwork for US troops and vessels to be located in and around the area. The statement of intent included the United States' desire to increase armament cooperation in collaboration in research, development, test, and evaluation as well. With each aspect of this agreement, it became more and more clear that the US wanted to militarize Finland in a way that it could easily work with them in the future if their neighbor ever became aggressive. Everything that is discussed in the statement of intent between Finland and the United States seems to be set up to groom Finland to become part of NATO in the future. This itself could have been part of a plan of deterrence to keep Russia in check, but it also allowed the United States to be in a unique and strategic position to aid Finland if they ever went to war. The United States and Finland have also been in cooperation in peace support missions such as NATO-led operations in the Balkans, Afghanistan, and Iraq. It's hard to ignore just how much time, effort, and resources have gone into helping Finland grow its military and modernize its tactics. The United States has played a huge role in doing this, and therefore it would be very unlikely that they would sit by and do nothing if Russia ever invaded Finland. So in the current state of things, Finland and the United States have good relations, several trade agreements, and the US is heavily invested in maintaining the status quo of pro-Western ideologies and alliances in the country. This means that if Russia did invade Finland, the US would respond. The extent and severity of the response would be directly connected to the type of attack Russia initiates against Finland. Scenario 1. Russia invades Finland using similar tactics as in Ukraine. In this scenario, the United States would likely provide a huge amount of military, financial, and humanitarian aid to Finland. Again, the attacking force would likely be much weaker than the initial invasion of Ukraine because the war has taken a significant toll on the number of soldiers and weapons that Russia has at its disposal. That being said, the leadership of Russia has shown time and time again that they don't mind throwing huge numbers of inexperienced young men at another military force with the hopes of overwhelming them. In the past, this occasionally worked, but with devastating consequences in terms of casualties and resources lost. The United States, like the rest of the world, has learned a lot from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. If Russia began posturing and moving troops to the border of Finland, the US would not take such actions lightly. When Russia did this in Ukraine, the United States and the West threatened sanctions, which they later imposed. However, this obviously did not stop the invasion itself. Therefore, the US would likely take a much more aggressive approach if it seems that Russia was going to use tanks, armored vehicles, and troops to attack Finland. The United States would likely send similar types of weapons that they've proven to be effective in Ukraine. The great thing for both Finland and the US in this scenario is that they literally know what works well and what works really well against the Russian military. The US would send javelins to allow Finland's far inferior numbers to decimate Russian tanks and vehicles. The javelin is a fire and forget weapon because the missile locks onto its target before being launched. This means that when the Finnish troops fire at a Russian target, they can immediately fall back to cover even before the missile hits its mark. This would provide the Finns with excellent mobility and striking power that Russia would not be able to deal with. Like in Ukraine, the Finnish landscape would be littered with the husks of destroyed Russian tanks. Along with the Javelins, the US would also send M142 High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, or the HIMARS. The US Army identifies HIMARS as a full-spectrum, combat-proven, all-weather, 24-7, lethal and responsive wheeled precision strike weapon system. And at least in the war in Ukraine, this has been absolutely true. HIMARS can launch six long-range rockets either simultaneously or at different times, and then immediately move its position to get out of danger. The rocket's range is about 50 miles or between 70 to 80 kilometers. These vehicles would allow Finland to decimate any Russian forces within their borders and push them back out of their territory. The rockets are incredibly accurate and would allow the Finnish army to hit targets far behind the front lines, such as weapon caches or command outposts. And we've seen in recent months, the United States would almost certainly send tanks to Finland as well. A-1 Abrams could be used by Finland to launch their own offensives and quickly take back any territory that Russia has invaded. These tanks are state-of-the-art and could make quick work of entire battalions of Soviet-era tanks. Of course, the United States would also send guns, explosives, and artillery rounds just like they have in Ukraine. The United States may even take things a step further and provide Finland with more aircraft or at least expedite the delivery of the F-35 Lightning IIs that Finland's already purchased. What it comes down to is that the US would not hesitate to deliver military aid to Finland. As the war progressed in Ukraine, the US has ramped up its commitment to deliver weapons and vehicles that the Ukrainian military desperately needs. However, if Russia was to invade Finland, the response by the United States would likely be much more immediate. To put this into perspective, the United States has sent close 
close to $80 billion in aid to Ukraine since the war began. The US has the largest economy in the world, and although $80 billion is a lot of money, it's only a drop in the bucket when it comes to the US defense spending. In 2021, the United States spent about $801 billion on its military. There is little doubt that Congress would pass a Finnish relief bill that would authorize huge sums of money and weapons to be sent to Finland if they were ever invaded by Russia. There's also the possibility that the United States would take a much more aggressive stance if Russia started to amass troops on the Finnish border. Rather than waiting until Russia invaded, the US could deploy its own forces in a joint operation with Finland, which would act as a deterrent for Russia. If Russia invaded and American troops were caught in the crossfire, it may be seen as an act of war against the US. They could claim that Russia was not only the aggressor but attacked American troops intentionally, allowing the US to declare war on Russia. This tactic has been used by NATO in recent months as they send more and more troops to countries that share a border with Ukraine. This has been done to stop any further progress Russia could make if it won the war. The moment Russia attacks a NATO force, either on purpose or by accident, all nations including the United States would declare war on Russia, and that's not a war Putin could win. And this brings up another interesting point about a Russian invasion of Finland. Sweden and Finland applied to join NATO in May of 2022. Neither country has been accepted yet due to Hungary and Turkey holding out on their ratification. However, there might be a way for the United States and NATO to get around this technicality if Finland were attacked. Finland is a member of the European Union. Until recently, Finland has tried to maintain its neutrality, but an aggressive Russia has caused them to drop that stance and seek alliances. Since the countries in the EU engage in the common security and defense policy, Finland could invoke this article if Russia attacked, which would bring other European nations to their aid. If Russia continues to wage war while other EU forces are in Finland, it could be considered an act of war against those nations, many of which are NATO members. This would inevitably trigger Article 5 of the NATO treaty, and every member of NATO would declare war on Russia, including the US. Ukraine was an EU candidate when Russia invaded, so it did not have the benefit of the common security and defense policy. Finland, however, is a much different story. They are currently a member of the European Union, which means if Russia invaded, it is highly probable the US would find some way to join the other European NATO members in declaring war against Russia. Scenario 2 Russia uses grey zone tactics and launches conventional missiles into Finland but does not invade. If Russia attacked Finland by firing missiles or disrupting its trading capabilities in the Baltic Sea through blockades, the US's response would likely be slightly different than if there was a full-on invasion. These disruption tactics would definitely cause concern, and if missiles were fired, Finland and the rest of NATO would certainly call it an act of war, but they might not retaliate with force. There would undoubtedly be a misinformation campaign by Russia saying the West was setting them up or the missiles were an accident. But in reality, the rest of the world would know such an attack was meant to scare Finland and the rest of Europe into making concessions. This might have been more effective before the war in Ukraine, but if Russia tried to pull a stunt like this today, the US would have none of it. It's possible that, like with Taiwan, the US might openly state that if Russia continued to be aggressive or invaded Finland, the US would stand by them. This is not so much an alliance as a promise. In this case, the US would almost certainly deploy troops to Finland and NATO countries nearby in preparation for a retaliatory strike into Russia. This would be done to deter any further Russian aggression, and it would likely work as Putin knows that even at its strongest, the Russian military could never defeat the US. Perhaps one of the best indicators of what the US would do in this scenario is by looking at what they've already done. In November of 2022, President Joe Biden approved a $323 million arms sale to Finland. This sale included tactical missiles and joint standoff weapons, so it seems the US is already helping Finland prepare for a conflict with Russia. There's no other reason for Finland to procure tactical missiles from the US other than to mount a defense or act as a deterrent against a Russian attack. But things don't stop there. The US then approved an additional $380 million sale of missiles to Finland only days after the first arms deal went through. The second sale was possibly for Stinger anti-aircraft missile launchers and other similar equipment. As of right now, the US and Finland believe that a Russian attack by air is the most likely scenario if Putin dares to become aggressive against Finland. The United States released a statement explaining that the proposed sale will improve Finland's defense and deterrence capabilities. Finland intends to use these defense articles and services to increase its national stock. This critical platform will bolster the land and air defense capabilities in Europe's northern flank, supporting US-European Command's top priorities. 
This makes it very clear that even though Russia is in no position to attack Finland, the United States and NATO are still proactively working to deter even the thought of Putin setting his sights on his Nordic neighbor. However, if the mad dictator decided to launch an attack anyway, Finland would already have some defenses ready to go, and there is little doubt that if the missiles were launched or aircraft were used by Russia to attack Finland, the US would make it one of its top priorities to get Finland the anti-air defense capabilities they need. It's also probable that the US would deploy more forces to the region, similar to scenario number one, to send a message to Russia if the attacks continue, things will escalate. It's hard to imagine a scenario where Russia becomes an aggressor and the US doesn't find a way to insert itself into the conflict in Finland. Both nations have already been actively working together to prepare for such a scenario that the foundation is already in place. The US is willing and able to play an active role in the defense of Finland if it ever comes to it. Scenario 3. Russia attacks Finland with nuclear weapons. This is definitely the most unlikely scenario, but one worth examining. Finland does not have any nuclear weapons within its borders, at least that we know of. Therefore, a nuclear strike against Finland would be met by a unified global response against Russia. Pretty much every nation in the world, including China, would condemn Russia's actions. The United States would immediately go on high alert, and every branch of the U.S. nuclear triad would await striking orders. U.S. submarines would deploy to strategic locations alongside the Russian coast. B-2 bombers would take to the air and infiltrate Russian airspace. Land-based ballistic missile command centers would double-check trajectories over the Arctic to ensure optimal accuracy. A nuclear launch against Finland would absolutely bring the U.S. and Russia to the brink of war. Not to mention, the rest of NATO would also actively be arming their nukes just in case Putin decided to launch any more missiles. This would be an end of the world scenario. As we said, this is highly unlikely, but if the scenario ever did occur, the US would be at the forefront of bringing Putin and Russia to its knees. A Russian nuclear strike against Finland probably wouldn't result in World War III because China has made it clear it would not support Russia using nukes in Ukraine or in general. China itself has a strict defensive-only policy when it comes to using nuclear weapons, and no matter which way Putin spends it, launching a nuke at Finland would never be seen as a defensive action. North Korea might back Russia, but Finland, the US, and NATO have little to fear from North Korea. Japan and other East Asian countries that have closely allied themselves with the West would need to be slightly more wary. But North Korea's military capabilities are pretty limited as it mostly relies on old Soviet tech and nuclear missiles that may or may not achieve liftoff before detonating. It's also probable that China would keep North Korea in check if Russia launched a nuclear attack on Finland, as they do not want to see the world end in a nuclear holocaust either. So if Putin ever launched nukes at Finland, the US would not be the only country coming to their aid. It would likely be a worldwide effort to remove Putin from power and make sure no further nuclear weapons are deployed. However, if the US felt that Russia would launch more nukes at Finland, or any other part of the world for that matter, it might feel warranted to launch its own nuclear attack against Russia to send a clear message that they are done messing around. These strikes would target already known Russian launch sites to hopefully destroy them before more nukes can be used. This could result in a series of exchanges that would leave parts of the planet irradiated and result in the loss of countless lives. Scenario 4 – The Most Likely Scenario Russia is too weak to attack Finland. Even if the US hadn't already engaged in providing support, weapons, and joint military operations with Finland, Russia is in no position to invade another country. It is badly losing the war in Ukraine thanks to the resolve of the Ukrainian people and the weapons sent by the West. Men are being conscripted from across Russia to be used as cannon fodder as Putin desperately tries to hold on to the little territory Russia still controls in Ukraine. The scenarios discussed in this video would almost certainly lead to the Russian military being decimated as they could not hope to fight two different countries simultaneously. Putin just doesn't have the strategic capabilities or resources at his disposal. And with each scenario, it's almost inevitable that the US would get involved in some way. The most likely outlook for the future of Russia right now is that they'll continue to fight in Ukraine until more Western tanks and weapons arrive and the Ukrainian military eventually pushes them completely out of their country. At that point, Vladimir Putin will have to admit defeat, and the repercussions for his regime will be drastic. At the very least, he'll lose the faith of the Russian people and his power will be greatly diminished. There would be no hope for a Russian victory if it launched any type of attack against Finland. In fact, an attack against Finland would be the nail in the coffin for Russia as it would likely result in the US and members of the European Union taking a much more aggressive action or perhaps even declaring war on Russia. And since Russia can't defeat the much smaller Ukrainian military, it has no hope of winning a war against the US and its allies. So the probability of Russia attacking Finland is small. We'll never say never, as Vladimir Putin has clearly shown he's out of his mind. But if Russia ever did attack Finland, the United States' response would be swift and merciless. Vladimir Putin is sitting in his office, his top lip curled into a snarl. 
He's just been given his armed forces tanks inventory. The losses are staggering. The Russians were losing about five tanks a day earlier in the year, but it increased to 10 tanks a day after Ukraine's counteroffensives in the east and west. Legions of T-72s, T-80s, and T-90s have been destroyed. It's a nightmare for Putin. To suffer losses like that, the opposing side must have formidable weapons. As luck would have it, Ukraine has no shortage of them thanks to the West. The US providing aid to Ukraine is hardly anything new. The Ukraine-Russia-US story is a long and complicated one as to how these nations have interacted with each other, overtly and covertly, in recent years and long before the war. US help has been there for the right people for a while. Russia has also grown its influence in Ukraine and it's been that way, well, for a long time. In 2014, the US helped overthrow Ukraine's elected president, with Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland even being caught on the phone handpicking a new Ukrainian leader. So when we talk about US aid to Ukraine, it's a convoluted story going back way before the Russian invasion. The tale has many sides, which anyone paying taxes should arguably understand. The Russians have repeatedly said that the US has been dictating things behind the scenes, which has resulted in what they say is nothing more than a proxy war. The US has accused Russia of flagrant abuse of powers. Up until recently, Ukraine didn't take that much newspaper space, and when it was talked about, it was often in a positive light. Corruption and neo-Nazis often filled the stories. Now Putin is using neo-Nazi propaganda as justification for the invasion. There's the so-called realist account, as provided by the American political scientist John Mearsheimer, who believes the US has orchestrated the war for its own selfish reasons, pushing the world closer to a nuclear catastrophe. Mearsheimer doesn't get invited to many parties these days. He hasn't been on CNN for eons. Holding that view can make you a lot of enemies in the US and Ukraine. It'll get you called a Putin propagandist, especially when you say something like Mearsheimer told The New Yorker recently, we are going to blame the Russians, so we invented the story that Russia was bent on aggression in Eastern Europe. Mearsheimer is just one of the many vastly unpopular political experts who think the US has been pulling all the strings to cause havoc to Russia. They still think Putin is wrong, though. They still blame him for what he has done. You'd have many more friends if you espoused another view, the corporate media view for the most part, which is that Putin won't stop until he's satisfied that Russia is as great as it was in the past. That Putin is the epitome of evil. He's out of control. He won't stop until Russia has built a new Russian empire, which is why he needs to be stopped, which is why Ukraine needs billions in aid paid for by all you taxpaying citizens. So, in some sense, this is why the US can give so much aid. And for the most part, its citizens are okay with it. It's the same in other countries such as the UK, even if it is struggling right now. Today, we're going to talk more about how the US is aiding Ukraine in a practical sense, and we'll leave out all the small print of the why part. Neither will we try to understand what Vladimir Putin is thinking. We will just say this, though. We don't want to celebrate weapons and war. We don't want to make this show sound like weapon worship. The biggest losers in this conflict are the soldiers dying on both sides and the civilians suffering in large numbers. We only hope they'll find some amount of peace soon. As you'll see at the end, this could be wishful thinking. When you get to that end, if you pick a winner, you'll probably say the arms industry, the BAE systems of this world, the Lockheed Martins, the Northrop Grumman's, the Raytheon's, their shareholders are also winning, which happen to include some members of Congress and some members of the UK Parliament. You can't ignore that either when it comes to aid. Over $100 billion in aid to Ukraine has been spent so far by all countries, but expect that to shoot up as the weeks and months pass. Most of it has been and will be military aid. It's not all about weapons, though. It's about food, clothing, infrastructure, and more. This is humanitarian aid, after all. If you add up all the aid provided by the US, the New York Times says the package is $54 billion, but that was back in May. Things have changed since then, as you'll soon see. Still, that number is more or less correct. Just to put matters into perspective, last year the US government spent $43 billion on highway grants, $63 billion on public housing, $260 billion on education, and $56 billion on health insurance premium tax credits. You might now think the US's $54 billion is an immense amount, but in terms of their GDPs, Estonia, Latvia, and Poland have spent more than the US on Ukraine aid. In order, Lithuania, the UK, and Canada came after the US. In terms of US aid, $12.5 billion has gone to providing weapons or other supplies, $9.4 billion has gone to economic aid, and $6 billion on military and security assistance, $7 billion to food assistance and healthcare, $4.7 billion on grants and loans for military supplies, and $8.1 billion on military deployments and intelligence. It's surprising how many countries are helping out Ukraine. The number is around 50. 
We bet you didn't know that Argentina has just sent 1,700 tons of foodstuffs, medicine, and clothing to Ukraine. Bulgaria has also just sent over 2,000 helmets and 2,000 bulletproof vests. But tens of millions in aid is coming from many other nations, and for the wealthier ones, the aid is in the billions. France has sent Ukraine some top-notch military equipment, and we're talking about enough weapons and machinery to start a small war. It's the same with the UK. It sent a whole host of weapons to Ukraine, including thousands of anti-armor weapons and Javelin anti-tank missiles. It spent $54 million alone on Ukraine-bound Black Hornet nano drones. God only knows how they'll be used. We told you business was booming for the arms industry. Revenues have shot up, records are being broken as heads, legs, and chests are blown asunder. The profits of the people that make it possible have literally never been so good. In terms of raw numbers, the US is not only the biggest aid provider to Ukraine right now, followed by the UK, Poland, and Germany, but it's the biggest provider of military aid to nations worldwide. While humanitarian aid pales in comparison, the US is also the world leader in that regard. 8.2 billion for 2021, followed by Germany at 1.8 billion, the EU at 1.5 billion, and the UK at 840 million. The US's military aid comes from the budget of the Department of Defense, which as you know, is a huge budget. It's 722 billion for 2022, and the DoD has requested that to be raised to 813 billion for 2023. The U.S. defense budget started to increase drastically in 2001 when it was $331 billion. In 2005, it reached $533 billion. It wasn't even $100 billion in the late 60s and early 70s when the U.S. was fighting in Vietnam and secretly bombing the hell out of Laos and Cambodia. Still, in terms of inflation, the 1969 defense budget would be $679 billion in today's money. We'll talk about some new numbers soon, but first, we need to ask how the U.S. actually sends so many weapons to Ukraine. We mean in logistical terms, the answer is twofold. One way is by air. For instance, the US's giant air transport planes can transport an insane amount, with the Super Galaxy being able to carry 130 tons of equipment. That means you could pack it with two M1A2 Abrams main battle tanks, or as many as 10 armored vehicles, or perhaps 16 high-mobility multi-purpose wheeled vehicles, aka Humvees. Having a few military transport planes flying every week will help, but in August 2022, the Washington Post said the Pentagon was expanding its use of maritime shipping. The Pentagon obviously won't say what routes those ships will be using, but did say that many of the weapons will go straight to Ukraine, while others will add to stocks already in other European countries. We guess you can now see why Russia has been losing so many tanks. It seems the entire world has Ukraine's back. Even China, which some say is taking the side of Russia, has remained neutral and isn't sending Russia any military aid. The bad news, or the very worst news, would be if things got nuclear, because Russia could hold its own. That's scary, and some analysts don't count out nuclear war. Now let's look at some of the weapons the US has already sent to Ukraine. At the top of the list, we'll put the 1400 or so Stinger anti-aircraft systems. Anti-aircraft weapons have been very useful and have already taken out a number of aircraft on both sides. On October 1st, an anti-air missile shot a Russian Ka-52 attack helicopter to pieces in Zaporizhia Oblast, but we can't say exactly what weapon was used. The US has also sent about 8,500 Javelin anti-armor systems. News reports tell us that these things have been partly responsible for all the damage to Russian tanks that we talked about in the intro. Raytheon and Lockheed Martin have been busy making these things while the US sent around 32,000 units of different types of anti-armor systems. The list of weapons goes on and on, but let's just mention a few more things that have been sent already. One package included 20 Mi-17 helicopters. On top of this, there were 200 Max Pro mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles, eight national advanced surface-to-air missile systems, hundreds of armored high-mobility multi-purpose wheeled vehicles, and 200 M113 armored personnel carriers. Then you have things such as counter-unmanned aerial systems, air surveillance radars, patrol boats, night vision devices, thermal imagery systems, satellite imagery systems, cold weather gear, electronic jamming equipment, explosive ordnance disposal protective gear, and much more. It's still not enough, according to the US media. Some more recent items talked about in the media that we think are part of the $54 billion budget include artillery and coastal defense weapons, ammunition for the artillery, and a bunch more advanced rocket systems. Now, we imagine you can really understand Russia's tank problem. Analysts are saying that the recent losses for Russia have been nothing short of astounding. On October 19th, the country lost 1,392 tanks, 801 were destroyed, and the rest were just abandoned or were taken without being hit. Ukraine has also lost tanks, but not anywhere near as many. We should also add that Russia hasn't reported its losses, though the news comes from the Western media. Never mind how cynical you think it sounds, you should always question what's reported in terms of wins and losses in wars. 
Throughout modern history, the numbers have been cooked up with propaganda to placate and buck up the public. We're not saying that's the case here, but just bear that in mind. Russia will be doing the same, of course. It doesn't help that Russia has been using tanks from the 60s and 70s. The T-62 is so old that one of the abandoned tanks was found and inside it someone has written, I hate Nixon. Just kidding, but you get the idea. Modern tanks are far less exposed than older ones. According to Forbes, Ukraine now has quite the collection of captured T-62s. As for what Ukraine wants more of, not long ago it put in a request for high-mobility artillery rocket systems. These things, which will set you back about $3.8 million apiece, come from Lockheed Martin, are incredibly useful despite some reports of civilian casualties. Some members of the Taliban might also have been hurt, of course, although according to the International Security Assistance Force, the rockets were 300 meters off their targets. Despite the misses, military experts called HIMARS indispensable, or as one website said, combat-proven all-weather 24-7 lethal and responsive weapons. And that's why Ukraine has them on its Christmas list. As part of that same package, the US said it would also send some M777 howitzers, 18 of them, each weighing in at $3.7 million created by the British company BAE Systems. Recently, Ukraine said it needed longer-range weapons since Russia already had them. Obviously, it doesn't help if the enemy can hit you from further away. A Ukrainian presidential advisor explained it's hard to fight when you're attacked from 70 kilometers away and have nothing to fight back with. Ukraine can return Russia behind the Iron Curtain, but we need effective weapons for that. The BBC reported in September that the US had agreed to send new aid, this time amounting to around $2.7 billion. The BBC said the package would include howitzers, munitions, Humvee vehicles, armored ambulances, and anti-tank systems. Again, we can't tell you if this is already part of the $54 billion aid package or a bit added to it. We say a bit. $2.7 billion is hardly just a drop in the ocean of blood. It was agreed anyway without much opposition at all. As usual, the added money was greenlit by both sides of the US's political divide. This war and the attendant aid is about the only thing Democrats and Republicans can agree on for the most part. This is another reason why the aid can keep flowing. No one's against it, although not everyone feels the same about the situation. As you might know, former presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard just left the Democrat Party. She's taken an anti-war stance and just called the Democrats an elitist cabal of warmongers. She's in a very small minority of US politicians, and if you look at her Twitter page, half the public likes to call her a traitor. The highly critical Noam Chomsky take on the US foreign policy is not exactly embraced these days by the leaders of the free world. At a sprightly 93, Chomsky's no fan of both sides of US politics in their present guises. He'd prefer real diplomacy to happen in Ukraine, which might not happen anytime soon. No one in their right mind would be a fan of Putin, so you have to wonder how this will all end. Endless war seems to be in the cards. If any entity is thrilled about this, it's the military-industrial complex, not the actual people fighting and dying. In an interview, Chomsky recently talked about the utter incompetence of the Russian military, but he issued a warning about the Western media narrative, saying, Whenever there is a virtual unanimity on complex and murky issues, something is afoot, something is missing. Another former war correspondent and journalist said, We are either looking at endless war or a potential nuclear holocaust. This will likely mean that next year there will be more billions in aid, which, short of everyone shaking hands and making some deals, is the best outcome. The other outcome is the end of the world as we know it. Millions upon millions dead. How do we ever get to this? Again, that's a long, difficult story that's more complicated than some narratives suggest. This is a show about aid, but what does aid mean? It means death and destruction, so fittingly, we'll leave you with a sobering reflection from Chomsky. Unless the great powers find ways to accommodate and confront the most important threats that have arisen in human history, environmental destruction and nuclear war, nothing else will matter, and time is short. Since the start of Cold War 2.0, after Russia invaded Ukraine, Western media has become fixated on the nuclear capabilities of the Russian Federation. After all, with Putin continually making thinly veiled threats about using so-called tactical nuclear weapons, it's no wonder that people are concerned. As it turns out, those concerns are pretty valid. Due to considerable differences in Russian strategic strategy, though the overall number of known warheads remains stable, Russia has committed to modernizing its nuclear forces over the past decade. They're getting so good at this point that many suggest Russia has become a bigger nuclear power than the United States. According to known public information, the US and Russia are almost equal for reported nuclear warheads. As of 2022, Russia owns 5,977 warheads, while the US has 5,428 in its arsenal. The US actually has a slight advantage due to its number of forward-deployed nuclear warheads. 
For a weapon to be forward deployed, it must be available on submarines, aircraft, and forward launching sites in other countries. The US has 1,644 of these types of warheads, while Russia is just behind with 1,588. However, Russia does have almost a thousand more warheads in storage than the US. Warheads in storage can still be mounted on delivery systems and deployed. Why Russia has more available for its use is because the US has a backlog of older warheads waiting to be destroyed. Even though the official numbers are pretty evenly matched, in real life Russian and American nuclear capabilities are vastly different. While both countries maintain a strategic land, air, and sea nuclear triad, Russia has pursued an aggressive campaign of weapon modernization over the past 15 years, while the US has lagged behind. This is primarily because of the strategic differences between the two countries. There is much debate over exactly what Russia's nuclear strategy is and what it is not. However, there are a few points that people on both sides of the argument have agreed on. Firstly, Russia recognizes even before its disastrous war in Ukraine that its military is rather weak. Throughout the entire history of the Soviet Union, the Red Army has to rely on a steady stream of less than eager conscripts each year to man its military. Even after the USSR fell in 1991, the Russian Federation has tried and failed numerous times to transition to an all-volunteer force. Poor pay, appalling living conditions, and inhuman treatment by superiors have continued to plague the Russian army to this day. Because of this, most of its personnel and the Russian armed forces are unmotivated and poorly trained conscripts. Even though Russia recognized that it had to improve the quality of life for its troops after the Russian invasion of Georgia in 2008, little has changed. The poor state of the military's combat effectiveness has not gone unnoticed, even at the highest levels of the Russian government. Because the Russian army would have been outgunned and outmotivated in a conventional war with the US and NATO forces, Russian politicians have decided they would use nuclear weapons to bolster their power in a conventional armed conflict. If regular Russian forces faced imminent defeat on the battlefield, the doctrine of using a low-yield or tactical nuclear weapon would take effect, but more on tactical nuclear weapons later. Scholars also agree that another unspoken but official reason Russia has pursued aggressive nuclear modernization is to protect itself from a war against China. Due to China's sheer number advantage over Russia, many agree that Russia would use nuclear weapons to offset this advantage. But in regards to the US, many believe Russian strategic doctrine calls for defeating American nuclear capabilities, so a retaliatory strike would be impossible. This hotly debated topic would involve this possible scenario. In the event of an imminent nuclear war, Russia would make the first strike, and Russian missile forces, submarines, and aircraft would all launch strikes against US missile silos and airbases. Though submarines would still survive, the strategic effect of a strike aimed at preventing the US from striking back would hope to make the US surrender without a fight. An even more controversial theory is the belief that Russia might escalate to de-escalate. What that entails is using a nuclear weapon, whether strategic or tactical, against a state not directly involved in fighting but that might be supporting the conflict. Known as a bolt from the blue attack, this attack would deter other nations from getting involved in the war Russia is fighting. It remains unclear if Russia would ever seriously consider this strategy, but the fact that it's ever been debated in Russian circles is a scary thought. What is definitely not up for debate, though, has been the weapon modernization program Russia has gone on since 2008. Throughout the Cold War, both the US and Russia continued to produce nuclear weapons at a fever pitch. It was not until the 90s that both nations agreed to reduce their nuclear arsenals drastically. Over the next two decades, the US and Russia greatly reduced their Cold War stockpiles. However, Russia has opted to entirely replace its nuclear stockpile with modern weapons, while the US has decided to maintain current inventories. Russia has continued to develop a variety of known and claimed weapon systems that some argue beat out US capabilities. One of the most potent is the avant-garde hypersonic glide vehicle. A hypersonic glide vehicle is the way of the future in missile technology because these missiles can travel at 10, 20, or even 30 times the speed of sound, and they aim to defeat any air defense system by simply being too fast to attack. Combined with advances in flight paths causing the missiles to weave and change course mid-flight, it means these are the wonder weapons of the future. Though much debate has been surrounding the avant-garde, it's not known if it's operational yet. However, though the US has been experimenting with hypersonic missiles, military officials have never proposed to make them nuclear armed. Russia has explicitly stated that the avant-garde will be a nuclear missile. Even though the avant-garde is still a few years away from operational deployment, Russia is developing several terrifying nuclear weapons. Among them include an RS-28 Sarmat. The Sarmat aims to replace the aging Soviet missiles that still make up the bulk of the Russian nuclear forces. The Sarmat is a deadly weapon system that can fly faster and farther than any previous silo-based nuclear missile. 
Traveling an impressive 18,000 kilometers, the Sarmat is designed to defeat current and projected air defense systems. Due to its shortened boost phase, satellites would have difficulty tracking the missile. Russian planners are also believed to have programmed the missiles to fly to the North or South Pole to bypass U.S. Navy destroyers poised to shoot them down. The Sarmat also carries an impressive 10 to 15 warheads, known as multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles. One Sarmat missile can carry enough nuclear ordnance to destroy at least 10 targets. While MIRVs are not a new concept and have been around for decades, U.S. use of that technology is now non-existent. Before President Obama took power, the U.S. did have the capability of having MIRVs on Minutemen 3 missiles. However, as part of his attempt at a good-faith relation with Russia, President Obama ordered that U.S. missiles be capable of carrying just one nuclear warhead each. By 2014, all U.S. missiles now carry just one warhead. However, the U.S. still retains the capability to add more warheads if the government wants to, since no binding treaty forces the U.S. to do this. But a weapon even scarier than these two is the Burevestnik nuclear-powered cruise missile. Being propelled by an onboard nuclear reactor, the Russians claim the missile will have unlimited range and reach speeds never seen before. Being able to constantly change direction and loiter indefinitely, the missile is a wonder weapon. The only problem is the U.S. already tried this back in the 1950s and then quickly shut down the program when it realized how ecologically destructive this weapon would be. A nuclear-powered missile would spew radiation across the countryside as it traveled, a feature briefly seen as a positive by some U.S. military planners who quickly realized if they made this weapon, then the Soviets would respond in kind. Though the Burevestnik will probably never see operational use, both the Sarmat and the Avangard constitute developments in Russian strategic nuclear weapons that pose a real threat to U.S. sovereignty. The U.S. has opted not to produce any new nuclear weapons during this time. Instead, the U.S. government has decided to perform midlife extensions programs on existing ordnance. U.S. defense contractors have been busy updating the Air Force's unguided bombs and silo-based missiles for the past several years. However, it was not until the past few years that Congress and the military took talks of funding new nuclear weapon projects seriously. Currently, Congress has agreed that there is a desire to produce a new ICBM. Still, no date has been set to begin funding for research, much less reaching operational capability. Another great tool Russia has that the U.S. is reluctant to add to its inventory is a tactical nuclear weapon. There's no official definition for tactical nuclear weapons. Still, the general consensus is these are nuclear weapons that are capable of being fired from land, sea, and air platforms, whose intended purpose is to create a tactical advantage on the battlefield rather than destroy cities. Though the U.S. and NATO have consistently warned that any nuclear weapon of any yield would be treated as a strategic strike, Russia fundamentally disagrees with this notion. Going back to its Cold War days, the Russian military knows that in an actual conflict, its planes, ships, and ground forces are just not as good as what the West can muster. To close this technological gap, Russia has equipped all its forces with nuclear capabilities for use against conventional targets. Among the most prolific tactical nuclear weapons are the Iskander and Kaliber missile systems. These two missile systems are now a mainstay in Russian military units. While the Army has fixed and mobile launch platforms for Iskander missiles, the Navy and Air Force both can launch caliber missiles. Both missiles can be fitted with conventional or nuclear warheads, and Russian Navy ships and submarines could decimate NATO ships with low-yield nuclear weapons in a conflict. The U.S. has made some advances in tactical nuclear weapons. Just two years ago, Congress approved funding to produce 5 to 7 kiloton nuclear warheads for use on Trident II missiles. Known as the W-76, these warheads are the only nuclear weapons in the U.S. inventory that could be considered tactical. Such a shift in policy shows the U.S. has taken concerns about using tactical nuclear weapons seriously. However, Russia still fields a massive tactical arsenal. Estimates range from a few hundred to almost 6,000 tactical weapons. Because treaties do not talk about or track these kind of weapons, Russia has been producing them and not reporting their existence. Because of that, there's a lot of mystery surrounding what the Russians actually have. One example of a known tactical weapon is a nuclear-tipped S-200 and S-300 missile. Why Russia would put nuclear warheads on anti-air systems is due to a lack of precision. If Russia really needs to shoot something down, they want to ensure a kill. Shooting a nuclear missile at the inbound missile or aircraft makes up for the lack of adequate radars or training. Russian forces also boast some unique capabilities. For example, the Russian Navy claims it's developing an autonomous nuclear vehicle that can be deployed from submarines and is capable of creating nuclear tsunamis. Russian naval units allegedly possess nuclear torpedoes, depth charges, and anti-submarine rockets. 
Many of these were leftover Soviet weapons that Russia has decided to keep in stock. As for the US, it remains unclear if the government will procure more tactical nuclear weapons. But what is clear is that if a real war broke out, the US would be at a serious disadvantage if Russian developments pan out as promised. A column of Ukrainian armored vehicles accompanied by tanks approaches their ready positions, prepared for a fresh assault into the Russian defenses outside Kherson. The Ukrainian counteroffensive has been wildly successful, beyond even the scope of the most optimistic military planners. Russia can't hold the line against Ukrainian grit and firepower, and its troops are on steady retreat across the entire Eastern Front. On Friday, September 30, 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin had annexed four regions of Ukraine, declaring them Russian territory. This now allows him to use all available means at his disposal to neutralize the Ukrainian counterattack. Now, with his back against the wall, Vladimir Putin becomes the second person in history to order the use of nuclear weapons in war. A brilliant fireball lights up the night sky, incinerating the column of Ukrainian vehicles. Even inside their armored shells, the Ukrainian soldiers are killed instantly. Those who were far enough away to survive the heat and blast are killed by the radiation bombarding their bodies. Several hundred Ukrainian soldiers and a few dozen vehicles are destroyed. The attack has been largely insignificant in terms of military value. Ukrainian forces have mastered the tactic of dispersing and reuniting again for sudden offensives, but it sends a clear message to Ukraine and the rest of the world. Thousands of miles above the planet, a United States satellite, part of the American Space Surveillance Network, detects the distinct double flash of a nuclear explosion. The alarm is instantly relayed via communication satellites using the Secure Link 16 encrypted radio frequency system. Within 30 seconds of detection, the alarm has already reached a U.S. Space Force monitoring station in North America and similar offices around the NATO alliance. Minutes later, the alert reaches the desk of U.S. President Joe Biden. Picking up a secure phone, he dials a direct connection to General Mark A. Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the most powerful military officer on the planet. President Biden speaks only three words into the receiver, Execute Plan 36. The coded order is relayed via U.S. communication satellite to Stuttgart, Germany, and the office of the commander of U.S. European Command, General Christopher G. Cavoli. Within minutes, the authenticated order is transmitted to U.S. forces in RAF Bentwaters and RAF Lakenheath inside England. A separate communique is dispatched to the USS supercarrier George H.W. Bush, currently stationed in the Mediterranean. The Bush is loitering in waters off the southern coast of Turkey, and the ship immediately turns into the wind as its flight deck erupts in a flurry of activity. Ever since Putin's threats of using nuclear weapons, the American military has been prepared to respond. Beneath the deck of the Bush, F-18 Super Hornets are having AIM-160 MALDs attached to wing hardpoints. Each Hornet can carry two of the large weapons, a capability kept secret from the world until now. Two squadrons of the high-performance aircraft are quickly made ready and begin the journey, the flight deck above where they stand ready. In England, crews rush to man a fleet of eight B-52 Stratofortress bombers. The big planes are the backbone of the U.S. bomber fleet and can bring a frighteningly large amount of firepower to bear thousands of miles away. Joining them are four B-2 bombers also kept on alert status, their crews ready to go at a moment's notice with bellies full of weapons. Within 15 minutes, the first planes are taking to the sky and turning southeast toward mainland Europe. Two hours later, the bomber fleet links up with two squadrons of U.S. Air Force F-22 Raptors, taking off from bases in Germany. The Raptors are flying in stealth configuration, which means their wing pylons are clean of weapons. The internal weapons bay, however, is loaded with six AIM-120 air-to-air missiles and two AIM-9 short-range missiles in the side bays. The formation continues toward the Black Sea, the F-22s leading the way. An hour later, the F-22s link up with a loitering U.S. Air Force tanker aircraft in order to top off their fuel stores. The B-52s loiter as the F-22s refuel. With enough capacity to fly strike missions in Europe from their home bases in America, the B-52s have no need to refuel. As the F-22s refuel, NATO AWACS aircraft flying along the Ukrainian and Turkish coasts sweep the skies with their powerful radar, looking for any potential hostile targets that could pose a problem for the mission. The aircraft's powerful radar only has a range just above 250 miles, so they can only see across approximately half of the Black Sea. Soon, they'll move for a closer look, but in order to maintain the element of surprise, the AWACS stick to their normal flight pattern instituted at start of the Ukraine war. The F-22's refueling, however, is the signal for the USS Bush to begin launching her Super Hornets. One by one, the high-performance strike fighters take to the sky, their compatriots wheeling in the skies above the carrier strike group and waiting until both squadrons have taken to the air. Then the planes split into two groups, taking similar but distinct routes north and into Turkish airspace. One route will take the group west of Ankara, while another will take the other group over Sivas. An hour later, both squadrons pivot northeast, heading straight for the Black Sea. 
The B-52s, B-2s, and F-22s have now reached the Black Sea. The United States operation to punish Russia for its use of nuclear weapons is a go. The B-2s take the lead now. The entire formation has turned south and then east again, which will allow it to skirt Crimea by 70 or so miles, well out of the effective range of Russian air defenses in the region. The target is Novorossiysk and the Russian naval base located there. After the sinking of the Moskva, the Russian Black Sea Fleet has moved its largest surface combat vessels here in order to keep them out of range of Western anti-ship weapons provided to Ukraine. The AWACS aircraft have shadowed the formation, sweeping the skies with their powerful long-range radar. The job is to look for enemy fighters, thus allowing the accompanying F-22s to operate without their own search radars on, ensuring their stealth. However, the powerful radar is being picked up by Russian sensors in Crimea. The Russians now know that an attack is coming. NATO hasn't deviated in any significant way from its pre-announced patrol routes for months, and the only reason an AWACS aircraft could be approaching Russian shores is if it's backing up a major air attack. It's not long before the AWACS planes pick up the signature of multiple Russian fighters taking to the skies. The data is relayed via data link to the Raptors, who stand ready to greet the Russian challengers. It's now time for the Super Hornets to do their part. Skirting along the very edge of Russian long-range radar, the Hornets fire off their MALDs one by one. In minutes, 40 of the big missiles are screaming straight at mainland Russia. But the weapons aren't bombs. The miniature air-launched decoy is an advanced drone that can perfectly replicate the radar return of nearly any aircraft in NATO's arsenal. Currently, the decoys are spoofing Russian radar returns to convince them a flight of B-52 bombers is incoming from the direction of Turkey, escorted by F-18s. This is a credible threat. The U.S. maintains multiple air bases in one of NATO's most geographically strategic allies. Payloads away, the Hornets turn around and head for the bush. Russian long-range air defense radar in Crimea has spotted the real B-52s, but the appearance of a flight of B-52s escorted by F-18s incoming from Turkey is a more pressing threat. Russian ground crews have been scrambling to put three squadrons of interceptors into the air. Now a squadron consisting of a combination of MiG-29s and MiG-31s are wheeling south from air bases in Crimea and the Russian mainland. The jets are in full afterburner mode which consumes fuel at a frightening rate but pushes them to supersonic speeds. They must get to within 70 nautical miles of the incoming B-52s so they can intercept them with their long-range air-to-air missiles. The R-77-1s, NATO codename Adder, are inferior in range to their American AIM-120 counterparts, with only a range of 68 miles. This is roughly the range of the expected harpoons carried by the American B-52s, who have a range of around 75 nautical miles. Russia always doubted the U.S. would respond with its own nukes, and this only left one possible target for American vengeance, the Russian Black Sea Fleet. An alert reaches the Russian vessels and waters just off of Novorossiysk. The fleet currently consists of the guided missile frigates Ladny, Admiral Essen, and Admiral Makarov, which has taken the role of fleet flagship after the loss of the Moskva. Landing ships Nikolai Filchenkov, Orsk, Azov, Novocherkask, Cesar Kunikov, and Yamal are all at dock. The smaller guided missile corvettes Vyshny Volaychok, Samum, Ingushetia, and Gravoron take up stations around the frigates. This is the bulk of the Russian Black Sea Fleet currently in operation, with a few vessels on duty in the Mediterranean. U.S. Navy submarines and F-15 Strike Eagles from Europe are already en route to destroy them. The entire fleet turns with their noses parallel to the incoming threat. This will allow each ship's SeaWiz systems maximum opportunity to engage any missiles that penetrate long-range air defenses. S-300 and S-400 batteries along Russia's eastern Black Sea coast open fire on the incoming decoys. The decoys are easily within the 242-mile range of both systems for targets with a radar return as large as a B-52. The number of incomings is overwhelming. This is a major American air assault, and the air defense batteries expend most of their missiles. The vessels of the Black Sea Fleet opt to let the shore units do their work and focus on defending against any aircraft or missiles which slip past. American B-2 stealth bombers open up with AGM-158 CLRASM anti-ship missiles, the planned replacement for the Harpoon. The U.S. military still operates only a small number of the weapons and only recently adapted them for use with a B-2. Each of the four B-2s unleash a volley of 16 of these low-observable anti-ship missiles, and Russian radar screens light up as they detect the 64 incoming missiles. The attack is a complete surprise, and the missiles are moving so fast that shore-based air defense batteries have no chance of catching the missiles before they reach their targets. The fleet is on its own to defend against the attack. 
but the LRASM's low observable features is making the missiles difficult to target. To make matters worse, their missiles now dive toward the ocean, flying just above the water as they scream toward their targets. The missiles are within several dozen nautical miles before Russian radars can not just detect them, but target them. The Russian ships immediately fire off decoys. These immediately begin to fire off electronic signals meant to be more powerful than those emitted by real vessels, thus luring in anti-ship missiles to strike them instead. However, the American missiles are built with optical target recognition systems, ensuring that the weapons can tell the difference between decoys and the real thing. At just over three dozen miles, the Russian radars finally can target the LRASMs, and the frigates are the first to open up with long-range surface-to-air missiles. It's like trying to hit a speeding bullet with another bullet, and the LRASMs can be difficult to target. Of the 64 incoming missiles, 16 are struck and destroyed. With just miles left to go, the corvettes open up with short-range Komar missiles. These missiles have a much smaller warhead, but several manage to strike true. Another eight LRASMs are knocked out of action. The American weapons now enter the terminal attack phase and suddenly pitch up, climbing high into the sky. More Russian anti-air missiles fly out to try to swat them out of the air. Another six LRASMs turn to fiery wrecks. Each missile identifies its own target, prioritizing the larger frigates. The sky fills with tungsten from the frigate Seawiz systems. Ten more LRASMs are destroyed before striking true, but 22 find their targets. The 1,000-pound warheads slam into the Russian frigates. The Admiral Essen takes 10 of the missiles. She's already destroyed by the time the last three slam into her, but the missiles aren't smart enough to identify lethal battle damage. The Ladny only takes two and remains afloat with moderate damage. Admiral Makarov takes six LRASMs to the deck. The rest of the weapons either strike the smaller corvettes or explode in the water, missing their targets. Only two of the Russian frigates remain alive, along with three of the corvettes. Two Russian ships are quickly sinking below the waves. The attacking P-2s turn around and head for home, visible on Russian radar only for a moment as each bomber opened its bay doors. To the south of the fleet, the Russian interceptors are now in range to engage the MALDs and open up with R-77 missiles, ripple firing at the incoming formation. Each missile will find its own target, and with such a dense concentration of forces, should have no problem striking true. The Russian fighters are rapidly turning and burning for home, fully aware that American AIM-160s have a longer range than them. The lead Hornet should have opened fire by now, yet strangely no incoming missile threats are detected on radar. Reporting this to ground control, Russian commanders are beginning to grow suspicious. A second wave of interceptors is redirected west toward the incoming flight of eight B-52s. This happens to put them directly on course to intercept the B-2s, who are slow and vulnerable. In full afterburner, the Russian fighters will soon be in range of not just detection, but targeting of the stealthy aircraft. Right now, their focus are the big American bombers, who are completely vulnerable and helpless. Radar detects no accompanying fighters, which makes the Russian pilots very nervous. There are only two possibilities here. The eight B-52s are actually decoys, and the main attack is the 40 aircraft formation to the south, or the attack from the south is the decoy and this is the real thing. If the latter is the case, there can only be one reason why radar isn't detecting any accompanying fighters. The US has put its F-35s or F-22s into the fight. The intercepting fighters get their answer shortly after entering the Black Sea. The F-22s have skirted out into the Black Sea and away from the shore, keeping out of range of shore-based radar which can detect them within 100 or so miles. The Russian interceptors have even weaker radar and can only begin to pick up traces of the stealth fighters within 50 or so miles, but can only get good targeting locks from a few dozen miles away. The F-22s turn on their own targeting radar long enough to get a solid lock on the incoming Russian MiGs. On their radars, the Russians detect only a brief blip, as each F-22 rapidly volley fires their AIM-120Ds. The AIM-120Ds have a classified range, easily in excess of 100 nautical miles, and the MiGs don't even get to within range of the B-52s before they're forced to take evasive actions from the incoming missiles. Each missile has flown high into the sky immediately after firing, and now plummets down on the Russian fighters. Each pilot tries to notch the incoming missile but most of them strike true. The surviving fighters are forced to turn around at full afterburner, but the Raptors already have loosed another volley of aims at them to encourage them to retreat. The only way to defeat the American stealth fighters is to overwhelm them with numbers and absorb their long-range missile attacks. Once at close range, the Raptors would have been at a disadvantage. But the Hornet-launched decoys fooled the Russians into splitting their forces. With the skies free of enemy fighters, the B-52s are safe to get within 75 nautical miles of the surviving Russian vessels and loose their harpoons. 96 anti-ship missiles are soon screaming toward the Russian ships. 
the frigates immediately respond with their long-range air defense missiles. The harpoons are far older technology and don't have the same low observability features of the LRASM. Long-range air defense managed to take out 20 of the incoming missiles as the harpoons get within a dozen miles of the ships. Then the corvettes open up with their shorter-range missiles. Each ship is rapidly volley-firing their entire missile stock, knowing their lives depend on it. 20 more of the harpoons are knocked out before they get into range of the fleet Sea Whiz. Tungsten once more fills the sky as a wall of lead rises up to greet the incoming missiles. 22 more harpoons are knocked out either by missiles or Sea Whiz. Decoys manage to lure away a dozen or so of the harpoons, but 22 of the surviving missiles strike true. The 500-pound warheads smash into the corvettes and frigates, most of which have already been damaged by the LRASMs. Despite having half the warheads of the previous rocket volley, the blitz of missiles is lethal. As the B-52s head for home, Russia sends up more interceptors to take on the flight of MALDs to the south. The decoys are easily blown out of the sky by air and ground-based defenses, but all that does is expend precious resources Russia can no longer easily replenish. Their job is done. They succeeded in diverting Russian attention south and splitting up its interceptors. The Russian Black Sea Fleet has been destroyed. All that remains is four submarines which Russia doesn't dare put to sea for fear of being targeted and a complement of landing and support craft. The surface combat vessels were the important targets, and Russia suffered an irreplaceable loss. In the span of an hour, it went from the dominant military power in the Black Sea to the weakest. Blockades of Ukrainian ports are no longer possible, and Russia has been punished for its use of nuclear weapons with the loss of hundreds of sailors and billions of dollars in hardware. What remains to be seen is if the deterrent has been effective or if President Vladimir Putin will resort to even greater use of nuclear weapons as retaliation. If so, the United States stands ready with its allies to respond with either conventional or nuclear power. Miss Adams stares out at the confused looks the high schoolers in her classroom have on their faces. She lets out a sigh of exasperation. Let me explain one more time, she says, turning to the map on the wall and pointing to Eastern Europe. Ukraine gained independence. Before she can finish her thought, a strange sound fills the classroom. It's the sound of a siren. The shrill noise is dull at first, but as the dust from decades of neglect works its way out of the system, the siren becomes louder. What is that? The students say, looking around the room. Miss Adams looks out the window. All is quiet. She walks over to the door and opens it. There's no one in the hallway. Slowly, the other doors start to open, and her colleagues peer their heads out. The teacher in the room next door shrugs. Miss Adams walks back into the classroom and shuts the door behind her. She looks at her class. They shift in their seats. Is it a fire alarm? Someone asks. But that doesn't seem right. There are no flashing lights, and a fire drill wasn't in the plan for today. Everything's fine, she tells the kids. But everything doesn't seem fine. Miss Adams walks over to the window once again. She squints her eyes, and in the distance, she can see the skyline of New York City. She turns around and walks toward the phone on the wall to call down to the office. As she walks away from the window, there's a bright flash. Screams erupt from the classroom full of children. They dive under their desks as the room begins to shake. Moments later, the windows explode inward. Shards of glass go flying across the room. Miss Adams falls to the floor. A piece of glass sharp as a knife whizzes over her head and slams into the wall, breaking into hundreds of little pieces. The students are protected from the mayhem as they hunker down under their desks. The siren continues to blare. Miss Adams shakes her head to clear her foggy vision. Her eyes are ringing. She slowly stands up and looks around. The students are scared, but they look to be unharmed. Miss Adams turns toward the window. Her jaw drops. The New York City skyline is gone. She slowly approaches the opening. Warm air blows into the classroom. Stay under your desks, she says to the students. Miss Adams stares out the window where New York City once stood. A giant mushroom cloud now rises from the earth. The surrounding area is aglow with radioactive fires. A tear falls down her cheek. A nuclear bomb has just hit the east coast of the United States. At the same time Miss Adams' history class was interrupted, an intelligence officer named Corporal Grayson was working out of an Air Force base near Trenton, New Jersey. Grayson had just gotten settled in at his station when he spotted something strange. Satellite feeds indicated there had been a missile launch from the Russian-Ukrainian border. This had become a relatively common occurrence over the last several months. So Grayson chalked it up to the Russians' brutal tactics in their war against Ukraine. However, as Corporal Grayson moved from satellite to satellite to try to identify the impact site, he became increasingly worried. The missile had not yet detonated, which meant it was either a misfire or Ukrainian forces weren't the intended target. Grayson zoomed out on his search radius. The missile hadn't exploded anywhere in Europe. What's going on? He said out loud. Then he picked something up. It was his worst fears come to life. Grayson pushed his chair away from his workstation and darted for the red phone on the wall. This is General Rod, the voice said on the other line. Sir, we have a problem. You need to get to the control room right away. Grayson whispered into the phone. 
Moments later, an entourage of highly decorated officers barged into the communications room. Grayson was furiously typing on his keyboard. I think the Russians launched a long-range missile, he yelled over his shoulders. The officers immediately dispersed to the different stations around the room. They looked at the data to determine if the president needed to be informed of the threat right away. Fighter jets were scrambled. They took off toward New York. I've got it, Grayson yelled. But the officers rushed over to his station and looked at the data coming in. A blurry image started to come into focus. Mother of God, one of the generals said. Is that the Russian hypersonic missile we were briefed on a while back? Yes, sir, Grayson confirmed. And it's headed straight toward New York City. The day the nuke detonated over the east coast of the United States was the day World War III started. The blast was immense, as the bomb had a one megaton payload. Times Square and most of Manhattan were vaporized in the initial blast. In an instant, over a million people died. As the shockwave and radiation spread outward, millions more would perish. The explosion heated up the surrounding area to thousands of degrees, incinerating buildings, cars, and roads. The superheating of the air also caused a massive change in pressure, which resulted in a shockwave with winds blowing hundreds of miles per hour, strong enough to blow people off their feet and cause trees to topple. This shockwave extended for three miles in all directions, but it was the radiation from the explosion that would end up killing the most people. As the mushroom cloud rose into the air, it carried radioactive particles with it. The wind pushed these particles northeast. The fallout covered parts of Brooklyn and Queens, but the Bronx was the borough that received the largest dose of radiation. The fallout continued to travel with the wind, which carried it up the east coast of the United States, reaching as far north as New Hampshire. Hours after the blast, Corporal Grayson has a moment to breathe. He's been relieved by another officer so he can contact his wife, who is a school teacher in New Jersey. She teaches history, and he knows that she has an excellent view of the New York City skyline from her classroom, or at least she did, until it was wiped off the face of the earth. Grayson dials his cell phone. The phone rings and rings and rings. Come on, pick up, please pick up, he prays. There's a pause in the ringing, then a familiar voice answers. Thank God you're okay, Grayson says in the receiver. Miss Adams is still in the school. It's become a shelter for families needing food and water. Many in the community commuted to the city for work, and even though the town was spared from the blast and the initial fallout, at least half of its residents were lost in the attack. Corporal Grayson explains what's happening to his wife. A nuke was fired using a long-range hypersonic missile. The United States believed Russia was still decades away from making the weapon operational, but as Putin became more and more frustrated with his shortcomings in the war with Ukraine, he took drastic measures. It was more luck than anything else that the hypersonic missile actually worked. But now the east coast of the United States is consumed in flames and radiation. Putin couldn't be happier. After the bomb detonated, the United States immediately went into lockdown. All flights were grounded, the borders were closed up, no one was allowed in or out. The armed forces were instantly mobilized, and since it was clear where the nuke came from, soldiers were ordered to report to their bases for immediate deployment. New York City is in ruins, and much of the northeast coast will be covered in fallout. The military sends doctors and medics to the surrounding areas to help the hospitals deal with millions of people with burns, radiation sickness, and wounds caused by blunt force trauma. The death toll will continue to rise, and over the next several years, anyone who received even a small dose of the initial radiation will need to be examined for cancer. The nuke will have long-lasting effects on the east coast of the United States, but none of that might matter, as NATO is about to go to war with Russia. After the nuke struck Manhattan, the US immediately reached out to its allies and informed them of what was going on. They needed to take care of things at home, but Russia had declared war on the free world, and now the nations of NATO needed to make them pay. The UK and France armed their own nukes and await the orders from high command. Even though the United States had been attacked, military leaders know the consequences of retaliating with nukes. If World War III becomes a nuclear war, the entire planet will be at risk. There is no winners in a war where NATO and Russia continuously fire nukes at one another. However, this does not mean they will not be going to war. After the nuke hit the East Coast, all negotiations were off the table. The US will be invading Russia, and Vladimir Putin will pay. A nuke hitting New York City is a worst-case scenario, and the enemy knew this. There's no doubt that wherever a nuclear bomb detonates, there will be mass destruction and countless lives lost. However, New York City is the most densely populated urban center in the US. By firing a nuke here, it ensures it'll cause the most amount of casualties. Another side effect of nuking New York City is much more widespread. If a nuke hits the east coast of the United States, economies all around the world will crash. This may not be the most immediate concern, but if New York City is wiped off the face of the planet, the world economy could collapse. All-out war will likely occur, so nations around the world will start gearing up. The private sector will pool its resources and start building more weapons and machinery to help in the war effort. The US dollar and economy will probably tank, 
as investors pull their money from the stock market. But what if another nuke detonated somewhere else on the east coast of the United States? Regardless of the exact target, the results would likely be the same. The US military would mobilize and immediately strike whoever was responsible for the atrocious act. All NATO countries would send aid to the United States and help in any way they could. The nuclear arsenals of NATO would be put on high alert, and at any given moment the world could be plunged into nuclear war. A nuke going off in New York City would most definitely cause the most casualties as far as targets on the east coast of the United States would go, but there's another key location that an enemy could strike. If someone wanted to hit the heart of America, they would detonate a nuke in Washington, D.C. Moments before the nuke strikes New York City, the President of the United States sits in the Oval Office sipping coffee. It's been a long night. Decisions needed to be made about further sanctions being placed on the countries aiding Russia in the war against Ukraine. Suddenly, a squad of Secret Service agents bursts through the door. The President startles, spilling his coffee across the desk. Sir, we need to get you out of here, the lead agent yells. The President grabs his jacket from the back of his chair and is escorted out of the room. What's going on? He asks. There's no time to talk. Agents rush him toward Marine One. The helicopter's propellers are already spinning. The agents desperately try to get the president on board. Where's my family? He asks. They'll be right behind you, sir. The agent yells over the chopper's blades, cutting through the air. The president stops dead in his tracks. I'm not leaving without them, he says, but it doesn't matter. Before anyone can protest, there's a bright flash. A nuke explodes in downtown DC. The dome of the Capitol building instantly melts. Washington Monument goes up in flames like a torch. The White House is obliterated. In a millisecond, the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the U.S. government are all wiped out. Luckily, the vice president was visiting family on the other side of the country. She's immediately informed of the incident at the Capitol and is rushed to a secure location where she starts making decisions about rescue efforts in D.C. and New York City and how to best help the people in those areas that need medical attention. She contacts one of her closest advisors, a general working out of an airbase in New Jersey, to become her new secretary of defense. The National Guard is deployed to the surrounding regions. These soldiers are provided with radiation suits and iodine tablets to give them an extra layer of protection. They have to wait several days for the fires to die out before they can search for survivors in downtown DC. During this time, anyone who is exposed to the fallout is brought to the closest hospital where they're treated for burns and radiation sickness. The initial blast killed half a million people in DC and wiped out most members of the US government. As the wind swept through the capital, it carried radioactive particles north covering Maryland, Philadelphia, and parts of New Jersey. The fallout reaches as far as Connecticut, where it isn't as deadly but can still cause complications, especially for anyone who ingests contaminated food or water. If Washington, D.C. was destroyed, there could be a slight delay in action as a new chain of command would need to be put in place. But as soon as the vice president or whoever was next in line to become president was sworn in, the full might of the U.S. military would be unleashed on whoever committed the atrocity. B-2 bombers carrying massive payloads or their own nuclear bombs would take off and unleash a firestorm upon enemy military bases and key strategic locations. Nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers would be repositioned to areas where they could launch counteroffensives and fire high-powered conventional missiles at the enemy. Next, there would be boots on the ground and tanks rolling toward the enemy capital to remove the current regime from power. NATO would mobilize to aid in the war effort, but one thing is absolutely sure to happen. If the east coast of the U.S. was attacked by nuclear weapons, there would be retaliation on a scale that the world has never seen before. Time would be of the essence, as the longer the enemy remained in control and had access to their weapons arsenal, the more likely it would be that another nuke would hit the U.S. Perhaps the next nuke would be fired at the southeastern coast of the U.S. Marcus sits on his fishing boat with a line in the water. He hasn't caught much today and decides maybe it's time to head in and cut his losses. He begins reeling in the line when suddenly it gets stuck. Marcus pulls and pulls, but whatever's on the hook is gigantic. He smiles. Perhaps this will make up for not catching anything else that day. He hopes it's a tuna or a swordfish. At this point, he thinks it could be a tiger shark, as whatever he's caught won't let him reel it in. Suddenly, the water all around him starts to bubble. The boat whips back and forth. Marcus lets go of the rod and grabs onto the side of the boat for dear life. Out of the depths of the ocean, a metal hull appears. On the side is a five-pointed red star. It's a Russian submarine rising to the surface. Marcus shouts in terror as his boat capsizes and he's thrown into the water. A few moments later, Marcus surfaces. The Russian sub sits on the water like a giant metal whale coming up for air. He watches in horror as a hatch opens up on the top of the sub. There's a rumbling sound and a missile launches from its tube. It rises up into the air, arcing toward downtown Miami. For a moment, Marcus can't breathe. He watches as the nuclear warhead falls from the sky. It disappears for a second before a bright flash of light fills the sky. Marcus goes blind for a moment. 
He thrashes in the water trying to catch his breath and reorient himself. He blinks hard just in time to see the Russian sub sink back down below the water and disappear. He looks around for his boat, hoping he can climb onto it and wait to be rescued. Surely the Coast Guard will come to the aid of the people of Miami. Marcus spots his capsized boat and starts swimming to it. Before he can reach the side, he feels a wind against the back of his head. Marcus slowly turns around and treads water. He closes his eyes and shakes his head. A tidal wave created by the nuclear blast is rushing toward him at hundreds of miles per hour. In that moment, he thinks about his family. He wonders if there's any way his wife, who works in the local fish shop, could have survived the blast. He then thinks of his twin brother, who is the president's detail in the Secret Service. He hopes he's okay, even though deep down he knows no one is safe. Marcus grabs onto the side of his boat and grips it tightly. The sea was his entire life, and now it will claim it. Approximately 200,000 people die instantly in Miami as the result of the nuclear blast. The fallout would likely drift out into the Atlantic, with some radiation reaching the Bahamas. It is the thought of this horrifying scenario that would lead the United States and NATO to take immediate action and destroy any enemy nuclear launch site or housing facilities as quickly as possible. That being said, if US and NATO forces invaded a country with nuclear capabilities like Russia, there's a good chance they would deploy everything they had in their arsenals. Cities across the world would be targeted by nuclear weapons, and millions of people would be vaporized or succumb to the horrors of radiation poisoning. Regardless of who fired the nuke or why, there's a very real possibility that if the east coast of the United States was bombed, the world would come to a terrible end. The last thing the United States or most countries want is nuclear war. However, if a nation like Russia was the one who detonated the nuke and the US tried to fight back, Russia would likely unleash their entire arsenal, which contains enough nukes to cover most of the European and North American continents in radioactive fallout. There are several cities that are likely to be major targets on the East Coast if a nuke was ever launched at the US. New York City and Washington DC are definitely the two most likely areas to get hit, for reasons mentioned earlier. However, cities like Boston, Atlanta, Annapolis also could be targets. The problem with being on either coast when it comes to war is that submarines equipped with nuclear warheads could theoretically find their way to an area where they could hit several key targets. Take DC, for instance. If an enemy sub loaded with several nukes found itself off the coast of Delaware and Maryland, or even worse, in the Chesapeake Bay, it could hit several major East Coast cities all at once. Baltimore, Richmond, Philadelphia, Annapolis, and DC would be within firing range. The terrifying part is that once the nukes were deployed, it would be impossible to stop them before they reached their targets. This would give residents in these cities little time to seek shelter and hide from the oncoming apocalypse, that is, if they received any warning at all. The last time serious nuclear drills were carried out in the United States was during the Cold War. The sirens and fallout shelters of that era have fallen into disuse, and it's highly unlikely the average US citizen knows where the closest fallout shelter is. Even if there was time to warn a population of an incoming nuclear strike, it's doubtful people would know what to do. There would be mass hysteria up until the nuke reached its target and detonated. Make no mistake, if a nuke hit the east coast of the US, it would almost certainly be the end of the world. The only way that World War III wouldn't start would be if whoever detonated the device had no political ties or worked for a terrorist group. In these circumstances, the world might rally around the attack and decide that nukes are much too dangerous to be used in conventional warfare. Perhaps if this happened, all countries that possess these doomsday devices would decommission them and lock them away so they could never be used again. This is wishful thinking, however. It's much more likely that if nukes ever did go off on the east coast of the US, the world would be put on a path to nuclear war, and missiles would start flying across the planet in a desperate attempt to wipe out the enemy before they themselves are wiped out. In this scenario, Miss Adams, Corporal Grayson, the Vice President, Marcus, and every other human on the planet, including you, likely wouldn't survive. Despite being mortal enemies for several decades throughout the Cold War, the New World Order following the fall of the Soviet Union has seen American and Russian special forces conducting many of the same missions, combating common foes that seek to spread radical agendas and promote terrorism, and acting as the elite vanguard of their nation's forces, just how similar or different are US and Russian special forces. That's what we'll explore today in this episode of The Infographic Show, US Special Forces versus Russian Special Forces forces. Special forces refers to elite military units tasked with unconventional or especially difficult missions that require great skill and generally engender great risk. 
From Sparta's famed 300, who helped thousands of other Greeks hold the line against an invading Persian horde in ancient Greece, to the infamous Otto Skorzeny and his brilliant raids against Allied targets during World War II, special forces have always existed in spirit, if not designation, throughout human history. At their core, special forces are nothing more than highly skilled operatives conducting missions too complicated or difficult for large conventional forces to accomplish. But it was only after World War II that military Militaries around the world formally created small elite units and designed them as special forces. No matter their country of origin, all special forces hold five basic mission types for which they are responsible. Counterinsurgency Though the counterinsurgency role of special operations forces has come to the limelight in recent years thanks to America's global war on terror, the first heavy use of special forces in counterinsurgency operations came during France's and then later America's war in Vietnam. Partisans and terrorists have always constituted a major threat to friendly military forces, and work by undermining any potential gains made by defeating enemy conventional forces. Partisans and terrorists can be difficult to combat, as they do not wear identifying uniforms and wage asymmetrical warfare, or irregular warfare, typically from inside friendly lines. The need to combat these shadowy threats gave rise to one of SF's most important missions, counterinsurgency. Counterinsurgency ops are a mix of law enforcement and military missions requiring detective skills to track and locate insurgents and then eliminating or apprehending them. With the risk of so much collateral damage in terms of civilian casualties, counterinsurgency is a job best left to special forces rather than conventional forces, and an over-reliance on conventional forces to do the job in Vietnam is at times attributed for the poor performance of the US in the war. Unconventional warfare. Without a doubt the cornerstone of special forces operations, unconventional warfare, or U W covers a very wide range of mission types. These can range from targeted assassination of high-value targets, or HVTs, disruption or overthrow of governments, or conducting guerrilla raids deep inside enemy territory. A special forces icon, Major Benjamin Talmadge, fought the British during the American Revolutionary War and was famed for leading raids deep into enemy territory and striking at British supply trains. And striking at British supply trains, burning them to the ground, or stealing the supplies to bring back to American forces forces greatly in need of arms and ammunition. Frowned upon at the time by his military contemporaries, especially other American forces who viewed his execution of war as improper, Major Talmadge has become a hero to the American SF community and a template for special forces doctrine for centuries to come. Direct action missions can be best described by a motto familiar to many American soldiers. Our job is to kill the enemy and break his shit. Ranging from seizing and capturing high-value personnel, materials, or locations, to outright destruction of enemy assets, direct action engagements are very high-intensity and very brief-duration engagements meant to surprise an enemy and hit them where and when they are least expecting it. This is another area where special forces shine over the use of conventional forces. With smaller unit sizes and more specialized skill sets, special forces are able to move much more quickly and thus strike in much more unexpected ways or times than larger, less maneuverable conventional forces. Foreign Internal Defense Foreign internal defense missions involve special operations forces training and equipping foreign allied military forces. Different than security force assistance missions, foreign internal defense ops are more geared at aiding allied foreign forces to combat insurgency, terrorism, and even disrupt enemy special force missions against them. Today in Korea, American special forces regularly train with their South Korean counterparts to respond to and eliminate the threat from North Korean special forces. And with an estimated special forces strength of over 200,000 soldiers, South Korea faces a huge security challenge in the event of war from North Korea's most elite soldiers. Special Reconnaissance Special Reconnaissance missions are a major part of where American SF forces earn the nickname the Quiet Professionals. Typically consisting of very small unit sizes, SR missions are meant to collect information deep in hostile or politically sensitive territory with the explicit goal that the unit's presence is never detected. Because valuable intelligence can be rendered worthless if an enemy realizes it's been discovered, SR missions require the utmost stealth and secrecy. Sometimes, SR missions can be carried 
carried out in extremely politically sensitive situations, necess necessitating the complete disavowal of any involvement by the nation conducting them. This means that any discovered or captured operatives may be completely on their own, making SR missions some of the riskiest a special forces operative can undertake. Security Force Assistance Security Force Assistance operations involve the use of special forces to coordinate with friendly allied militaries and aid them with training and developing military doctrine. Long a hallmark of US Army Rangers, SFA operations may range from making contact with guerrillas deep in enemy territory or simply a deployment to an allied, less developed nation that needs help establishing a proficient military force. So with similar missions, and in recent times with similar terrorist enemies, how do US and Russian special forces compare to each other? With the vast amount of their operations kept secret for decades, it's impossible to ascertain which force is more effective than the other as there simply exists few, if any, true comparison points. Also due to the difference in ideology and doctrine, US, Russian, and special forces may undertake many of the same types of missions, but can vary widely in how and why they conduct them. The old adage of apples and oranges may apply aptly here. However, we can look at some major similarities and differences between the two. Both nations operate a number of different units under the general designation of special forces, whose missions and training can vary dramatically. On the whole though, one of the major differences between US and Russian special forces is the composition of their units. American special forces tend to adhere to a doctrine of skill specialization in which each member of a team has a unique specialty and numerous and overlapping subspecialties. For instance, one team member will be the team medic, but will also have training in communications and demolitions, though his primary job is to serve as medic. Russian special forces tend to favor a more general approach without unique specializations, which is why, on the whole, Russian special forces are more focused on the direct action mission of special operations, a deficiency identified in modern times that has seen some expansion in training for Russian operators. While select American special forces, such as Army Rangers and Navy SEALs, share a similar and more narrow focus, the American special forces community as a whole is a far more flexible organism than Russian special forces forces, able to undertake a greater variety of missions and bringing more varied disciplines to the table. The narrower focus of Russian special forces is an unfortunate holdover of the Soviet era, when the Soviet military forced their special operations forces to focus almost myopically on the destruction of NATO missiles and high-value targets in the case of war. Another major difference between US and Russian special forces is a general disregard for collateral damage by Russian operators, who are more concerned with results than public perception. One famous example is the response to the kidnapping of four Soviet diplomats in 1985 by the Muslim Brotherhood, conducted in retaliation for Soviet support of Syrians. Dispatching the KGB's Alpha Group, the Russian operatives arrived in Beirut, Lebanon, just as one of the hostages was executed. Rather than moving to rescue the remaining hostages, Russian operators instead tracked down and took hostage several family members of the terrorists, torturing and dismembering them and sending body parts to the terrorists. The tactic worked, and the remaining hostages were released, and no Russian diplomats were molested again for two decades in the Middle East. Yet while Russia's adoption of brutal tactics may have been effective in this specific case, it comes at a major cost of public perception, and could in fact backfire by raising public anger against Russia. Russia's ongoing difficulties with Chechnya is believed to be compounded by brutal retaliatory measures by Russian security forces. Preferring the hammer to the surgical knife, though, is a long hallmark of Russian military doctrine and further evidenced by the slow adoption of precision-guided munitions by a military that prefers to intimidate via overwhelming firepower without much regard to collateral damage. This doctrine would once more come into play during the Moscow theater hostage crisis of October 2002, when 850 hostages were taken by Chechen terrorists. After two and a half days of standoff and no concessions from either side, Russian special forces pumped an as-yet undisclosed gas into the building and initiated initiated an assault which would see all 40 terrorists killed, but as an adverse reaction to the mystery gas, 130 hostages also died. When Islamic militants took several hundred school children and teachers hostage in Beslan in September 2004, Russian special forces once more laid siege to the hostage takers. After a furious firefight, all of the terrorists were killed, but so were 186 children and 20 Russian operators, though witnesses reported that many of the Russians died or were wounded, trying to heroically shield children from the fighting. 
Striving for decades to build a safer and more structured world order in order to avoid the mistakes of pre-World War II Europe, the US has for a long time sought to preserve its identity as a global leader, recent presidential election notwithstanding. Knowing that such heavy-handed tactics as Russia's would endanger that perception, US Special Operation Forces are more focused on avoiding unnecessary deaths and obeying rules of engagement. While this may at times perhaps limit their effectiveness in a given situation, it does preserve a generally positive perception of American special forces which has made them welcome in nations around the world as they aid allies and regional partners such as the Philippines in combating their own terrorist threats or improving the capabilities of their military. American SF doctrine of maintaining a light footprint effect, however, does come with a cost, and in the last two decades they have suffered significant casualties in their efforts to combat terrorism around the world. It is impossible to truly determine which force is better than the other without directly pitting the two nations in open conflict, which thankfully has never happened. However, from the bold parachute raids behind German lines into occupied Soviet territory in World War II, to daring attacks against British supply lines during the American Revolutionary War, both Russian and American special forces share a common heritage of courage and professionalism. Though they may differ in doctrine and ideology, ultimately, both Russian and American special forces have one similar job kill the enemy and break his shit. One of the best indicators of how effective a military is, is good logistics. After all, it does not matter how far a weapon can shoot, how fast it can go, or how many soldiers you can put into the field if they cannot be supplied, rearmed, and taken care of properly. The US military has mastered the art of logistics, with a huge domestic industrial base combined with overseas basing, prepositioning, and forward deployed replenishment capabilities. The US can sustain combat operations anytime, anywhere. Such logistics prowess has been shown by the US fighting a two-front war half the world away for almost 20 years. Russia, on the other hand, has experienced logistics woes during its invasion of Ukraine. Media and military pundits have frequently bashed the Russian army's poor logistics, but they've yet to really explain why their logistics are so bad. Until now. Before we deep dive into how Russian logistics cannot compare to the US military, Russia has not done everything wrong. One forward-thinking innovation the Russian military has made is choosing smaller vehicles. For example, their primary main battle tanks like the T-72, T-80, and T-90 are about 10 feet shorter and 20 tons lighter than the M1 Abrams. Putting the effectiveness of each tank aside, purely from a logistics perspective this has an advantage. Shorter tanks take up less room inside ships. Lighter tanks also use less fuel when shipping them. And they they also make for speedier transport. The Russian Navy has also set itself up for sea access. At the end of World War II, what was formerly known as East Prussia got broken up and mostly absorbed into Poland. However, a tiny sliver of it went to Russia, known as the Kaliningrad Enclave. This tiny portion of Russian territory is crucial in giving Russia year-round access to a warm water port. This is because ports like St. Petersburg or Archangel freeze over during winter, preventing the deployment of ships and submarines. Because Russia desires more warm water ports, this was one of their primary motivations for involvement in Syria. Due to their assistance, Russia obtained perpetual basing rights to Latakia on Syria's Mediterranean coast. Capturing the port of Sevastopol was also a significant factor in the 2014 invasion of Crimea. Because of Russia's need for more desirable port on the Black Sea, Russia aimed to retake what used to be one of the Soviet Union's primary ports. Due to its steep decline from the port to the sea floor, Sevastopol has been favored as a submarine base for decades and serves as a major logistics hub. But of course, Russia has had to violate international law to get Sevastopol, putting the benefits of their generally lighter combat vehicles and aggressive stance at getting warm water ports aside. Russia's military as a whole has failed on the land, the sea, and in the air to provide adequate support for forward deployed units. The most obvious example of Russian failures has been its total lack of sea and airlift capacity. In 1992, just after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Russian Air Force had about 500 planes with a combined lift capacity of nearly 30,000 tons. Additionally, the Russian Navy operated about 80 amphibious and logistics ships with enough room to fit over 600 tanks. With fewer than 20 ships and around 100 airplanes left, Russia's forward-deployed combat capacity is just shy of 6,000 tons of gear and about 200 tanks. 
Such a dramatic decrease in lift capacity severely limits combat operations beyond its borders. Another crucial factor that limits lift capacity is the lack of support for ships and aircraft outside Russian borders. During the Russian campaign in Syria, it was a known deficiency that Russian warships could not resupply their troops in theater. Unlike the US Navy, the Russian Navy does not practice nor even have the capability of regular underway replenishment. Underway replenishment is a method of refueling and re-equipping ships at sea, spearheaded by the U.S. Navy during the First World War. In underway replenishment operations, U.S. Navy and NATO vessels come alongside at distances of about 180 feet from the oiler. One vessel will shoot shot lines over to the other and bring the spawn wire and in-haul outhaul lines over. These then connect the ship to pump fuel and slide pallets of food, parts, supplies, and ammunition between the ships. Though the Soviet Navy had limited capacity for refueling operations and no capacity for taking stores during missions, the Russian Navy has abandoned even trying anymore. Though every U.S. Navy ship regularly conducts underway replenishment, Russian ships do not. Instead, they have to waste time and money pulling into ports to refuel, rearm, and re-equip. The Russian Air Force does not fare much better. Because Russian alienates most of the world, few countries will afford them overflight rights. Overflight is the permission that military planes have to obtain from any country they fly through. If a country says no, that aircraft has to divert to a route that takes them through airspace they are allowed in. Thanks to the NATO alliance and friendly relations the US has with most of the world, there are few airspaces that American aircraft are denied overflight, but for Russian planes, their friends are few and far between. Because of this, Russian aircraft supporting combat operations have to take longer routes that waste time, fuel, and money. But even if more countries like Belarus permitted Russian planes to fly through their territory, Russia lacks overseas bases to support their aircraft. Unlike naval aviation which can launch and recover on aircraft carriers, ground-based planes have to have runways. The U.S. has spent the past few decades building relationships that have allowed American aircraft basing rights around the world. The Russian Air Force does not have this luxury. Because of this, with a few exceptions such as Syria and Belarus, Russian aircraft would have nowhere to land unless Russian troops secured overseas bases by force. Another crucial factor to consider is the over-reliance of the Russian Army on railways for transportation. Because Russia is so large, with huge territories of virtual wasteland, their military relies more heavily on rail systems than any other European country. The Russians adopted this strategy because during the Cold War they set up most of the USSR and Warsaw Pact countries with a standard wide-gauge track. They did this so in the event of a war they'd always have plenty of railheads to disembark supplies so they would not have to travel too far to forward units. But this logic has a few major flaws. Firstly, the Russians must assume that they'll always control a large majority of their vital rail hubs. Secondly, because of their over-reliance on rail, the logistics units meant to support forward-deployed units pale in comparison to US and NATO units. On average, Western militaries have three to four times the number of logistics personnel as Russia does for servicing equivalent-sized units. Because Russia has not been able to take many population centers, they're stranded in a sort of logistical desert in Ukraine. With no railheads to draw supplies from, the few logistics troops left have to service forward-deployed units in massive truck convoys that depart from the closest rail hubs Russia does control. Usually, these convoys have to leave from Russia or Belarusian territory. Once on the road, these convoys suffer constant attacks from Ukrainian drones and artillery strikes. Additionally, because of the Russian policy of treating its draftees, these often unmotivated, poorly trained, and even more poorly led soldiers are left to service the trucks and vehicles that keep the army supplied. Because of the backwardness, corruption, and hazing in the conscript system, little to no maintenance gets done on these vehicles, which cause a large number of them to be lost before Ukraine can even take a shot at them. Just how bad Russian logistics are at supporting faraway campaigns was studied extensively in a RAND Corporation study in 2020. The RAND Corporation is one of America's oldest and largest military think tanks, and both congressional and military officials frequently cite their reports. According to RAND's own war games, the Russian military would have extreme difficulty supporting formations of troops beyond a brigade level past the borders of Ukraine, Poland, and the Baltics. For any campaigns past Eastern Europe, it's been estimated that Russia could not support units larger than a battalion level. To put these numbers into perspective, a battalion, depending on the military, has around a thousand soldiers, and a brigade usually has several thousand soldiers.
This means that anything outside Russia's borders, their military can only ensure battalion-sized units are fully manned, equipped, and supplied. Such a finding has come true in Ukraine, where large Russian formations frequently ran out of fuel, food, water, and ammunition. Why Russia has had a hard time supporting forces outside its borders is not only due to nations not granting them basing rights or their inability to replenish at sea, their own system works against them. In the Russian military, conscripts have always made up most of the fighting force. However, the disastrous wars in Chechnya turned public opinion against the government for deploying conscript soldiers in frontline positions. During those wars, recently conscripted men were rushed to the front and thousands of Russian men died because their government did not care to train them properly. Because of public outrage over conscript casualties in Chechnya, the Duma also passed legislation that made sending conscripts into combat outside Russian borders illegal. Because of this constraint, Russian commanders have difficulty properly manning their battalion tactical groups. Legal constraints before the 2022 invasion saw commanders scrambling to properly man units in time for out-of-area deployments. Oftentimes, soldiers from units in the Far East would have to be brought in to man units in western or southern Russia, preparing to deploy to Donbass or Syria. Because of this dilemma, it's now obvious that part of the reason Putin rushed to annex parts of Ukraine he controlled was so he had the legal basis for sending hundreds of thousands of conscripts he planned to enlist to the front line. Conscription also hurts Russian logistics, because before the invasion, the policy was that conscripts had to primarily serve in support roles. Russian officials gave positions like mechanics, supply clerks, and all the other support roles to conscripts. Taking mechanics as an example, these troops serve a vital function not just in the serving military, but in maintaining stored equipment that, if not taken seriously, can have disastrous effects. In the U.S. military, planes, tanks, ships, and vehicles held in storage receive routine maintenance. Whether provided by contractors or reserve personnel, the U.S. military ensures that equipment held in long-term storage is available for immediate use, if the military ever needs it. The Russian military doesn't work the same way. In principle, Russia also maintains its vast Cold War stockpile of equipment. However, the war in Ukraine has shown that old habits die hard. During the Soviet era, it was common practice to make conscripts maintain and clean equipment. Volunteer soldiers saw these kinds of jobs as beneath them and forced the men who did not want to be there to do it. Of course, this led to work that was done poorly, if done at all. Another way that stored vehicles were improperly maintained was greedy army officers looking to line their pockets. Because Soviet equipment is among the most common gear in a lot of countries' militaries, spare parts are in high demand. Enterprising Soviet officers used to sell parts and pieces from vehicles to make extra money. After the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Russian military did its best to stamp out these practices. During the major Russian army overhaul in the early 2000s, it was reported to Putin that the military had stopped these practices. But it's clear now they had continued. After Russia started taking heavy losses in tanks and armored vehicles, tons of Cold War equipment was dusted off and brought into the fight. Only there was just one problem. A lot of it did not work. Broken equipment and tanks so gutted from the part theft as to be left inoperable have been so prevalent that some reserve tank units reported 90% of their inventories as write-offs. Russian part woes also extend to the crushing sanctions their country has faced since the invasion. Even though Russia boasts a robust arms industry, they relied on abundant imports from Western countries for advanced parts. Everything from microchip processors to advanced optics had to be outsourced to foreign countries. Even though Western countries often import parts too, unlike Russia, it's highly unlikely US supply chains will be interrupted. Even if Russian industry could support its arms needs, the government does not have the money. This is because Russian officials have poured what few defense dollars they have left over into developing wonder weapon type projects like super quiet submarines and hypersonic missiles. Ordinary equipment like gun sights, fire control computers, and communications equipment get left out. The budget constraints even affect the lives of ordinary soldiers to the degree that it hurts combat effectiveness. A hodgepodge of videos coming out of Russia shows that the military does not have the money for even basic things like uniforms, bulletproof vests, and first aid kits. Often enlistment officers tell men to purchase their own gear if they want to survive. Additionally, the soldiers' families are not taken care of. Conscripted men are taken off the street and put on the front lines within weeks or days of their induction. These men leave behind jobs and families that need support. Russian military leadership has said they do not have the money to care for soldiers and their families. Putin directed local government to work out whatever payments they could afford. In some Russian districts, men are given as sheep, and others get several kilograms of fish or some cabbage as payment for their service. Even when they're deployed, soldiers are told they're not being paid a salary and they should just do their job. 
It is this fundamental difference in how the Russian military pays its soldiers and cares for their families that truly makes the US better than Russia. No matter what, US service members get paid twice a month and get a housing allowance if married or above a certain rank. They get free health care for themselves and their families and a ton of other benefits like money for tuition. The Russian government simply does not have the money or desire to ensure their own troops are properly fed, clothed, and paid. To just show how little Putin cares for his troops, Russia has stopped listing soldiers as killed, but instead as missing in action. This distinction prevents families of Russian service members that the government knows are dead from receiving their life insurance benefits. November 2, 2021, the world is reeling from the economic devastation brought about by the coronavirus pandemic. And for world powers, as some might see it as an opportunity to make a move. Believing the United States is too distracted by China and the lingering effects of the coronavirus, Russia makes its move in Eastern Europe, seeking at last to reunify its military conclave of Kaliningrad with the motherland. It will also cut off the renegade Soviet provinces of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia from NATO and force them back into the loving arms of Mother Russia. NATO immediately responds, but quick reaction forces stationed along Eastern Europe are no match for the overwhelming might of the Russian army. It will take weeks for NATO to organize a proper military response, but the United States has already begun to strike back. Not in Eastern Europe, but in the Pacific. A U.S. Naval Task Force, part of the U.S. Pacific Command, is on its way to attack the headquarters of the Russian Pacific Fleet in Vladivostok. Russia's Far East has always been problematic for the Russian military to defend. The incredible size of Russia makes reinforcing the Far East extremely difficult and impossible to accomplish in a timely manner. Then again, the U.S. stands to gain little by attacking Russia's Far East except for knocking the Russians out of the Pacific for good. A push into Russia from the east is impossible. The distance to any military objectives worth seizing in the west entirely too far and transportation networks easily sabotaged by the Russians. Russia, however, is not ready to give up its presence in the Pacific. And luckily for it, the Russian Pacific Fleet is its second most powerful fleet. Suffering from years of neglect, though, that's not saying much. Steaming out of their home port to meet the first American carrier strike group en route to their shores is a fleet consisting of six destroyers and a half dozen corvettes, led by the cruiser Varyak, flagship of the Russian Pacific Fleet. The Russians know they're outmatched in open water, so instead they opt to use the same tried and true tactics of the 1904 Russo-Japanese War. They'll be fighting the same way they fought the superior Japanese Navy and the same way the Soviet Union expected to fight the American Navy, utilizing the doctrine of a fortress fleet. Supported by shore-based installations and aircraft, the Russian Pacific Fleet never strays more than a few dozen miles from shore. But the first strike against the Americans will come from below the waves. The Russian submarine fleet has suffered from similar levels of neglect as the surface fleet. However, with only one active carrier in the Russian Navy, great emphasis has been put into maintaining available Russian submarines. Gone are the glory days of the Soviet Navy, when hundreds of Soviet subs prowled the world's oceans, forcing the Americans into a game of underwater cat and mouse. Russian military command does not believe their Kilo-class submarines, dating back to the waning days of the Cold War, are survivable against the American fleet. Therefore, Kilos are ordered to remain silent, close to the shore, dashing in for attacks of opportunity once the enemy fleet is fully engaged. The three improved Kilo-class subs have a greater chance of approaching the American strike group, but only the Petropavlos Komchatsky is combat ready. The attack will fall on the small fleet of Oscar IIs capable of launching long-range attacks with anti-ship missiles. Had the attack come just 10 years earlier, the Russians would have likely found great success using their subs against the Americans. After developing the greatest anti-submarine warfare capabilities on the planet during the Cold War, the United States allowed its ASW capabilities to seriously atrophy resulting in a series of embarrassing mission kills on American carriers during training exercises with friendly nation subs in the early 2000s. However, the Americans were quick to correct their mistake, even contracting a Swedish submarine for two years to help them restore their ASW capabilities. The American 2021 fleet is not the 2001 fleet that couldn't see a submarine in the swimming pool. The four Russian subs must close to within 350 nautical miles to launch their granite anti-ship missiles. They don't dare close in for torpedo strikes against the American carrier, knowing they'll be easily spotted well before then. In order to reduce the chance of detection, the subs approach the carrier strike group on a 30-degree offset from each other, which has the benefit of greatly increasing the search radius of the strike group's ASW assets. The Americans know that their first strike will likely come from beneath the waves, and they've been prepared. ASW helicopters fan out dozens of miles around the strike group, 
equipped with torpedoes and sonar that they periodically dip into the ocean to listen for the telltale acoustic signature of a Russian sub. American attack subs always held an advantage over their Soviet and Russian counterparts. And during the Cold War, US subs tailed Soviet subs without being detected, allowing them to record a vast acoustic library of all known Soviet and now Russian submarines. Further aiding the efforts in the hunt for the Russian subs are the P-8 Poseidons based out of Guam, Japan and South Korea. With the world's largest air tanker fleet, the United States is able to drastically increase the range of its Poseidons, allowing the aircraft to sweep a corridor across the Pacific for the carrier strike group. The Poseidons lay down vast fields of airdrop sono buoys. On contact with salt water, the sono buoys' batteries activate. Some of the buoys are set to active search mode, pinging the ocean for miles around them with powerful sonar and listening for the report. Others are set to passive, listening for the telltale sound of a Russian sub. But further aiding the hunt for Russian submarines is a brand new development by the US Navy, a radar that can penetrate the waves and detect the underwater wake of a submarine. The subs can't evade the vast fields of sonar buoys deployed by the Poseidons, and eventually each sub begins to generate a good track. Poseidons now drop down to just a few hundred feet above the waves, allowing their magnetic anomaly detector to verify the presence of Russian submarines below. Upon confirmation, each Poseidon drops two torpedoes. The torpedoes don't even need to score a direct hit. Even a miss of 100 feet generates so much pressure that the submarine's hull will rupture. Round one goes to the Americans. Submarines aren't the only way to kill a carrier, though, and Russian Tu-22 bombers are already airborne. During the Cold War, Soviet military planners knew that attacking a carrier strike group would be an extremely dicey proposition. Official battle plans called for attacks with a minimum of 100 bombers, with an estimated loss rate of 50%. Even then, a mission kill was likely but not an outright sinking, merely taking a carrier out of action for a few months to a year as it underwent repairs. Today, the Russian Air Forces only have 67 222s, and most of them are stationed in the much more important Western beater. What they do have is the Granite anti-ship missile, capable of being launched from standoff ranges that should hopefully keep the bombers safely out of the strike group's air defenses. Two dozen Tu-22s leave the Russian coast behind. The American carrier is moving at full power, making it a surprisingly fast and evasive target. Russian satellites fix the carrier group's location for the bombers, but only for 15 minutes before they dip past the Earth's horizon and lose radar contact. The best way to fix the carrier long term would be to use airborne radar assets. But with American air bases in Japan hosting fleets of fighter aircraft, the AWACS planes would be splashed in a matter of hours. The greatest difficulty Russian forces are having in taking the American carrier out is simply finding the damn thing. Satellite surveillance gives the Tu-22s a box a few hundred square miles wide where the carrier could potentially be hiding. Now the bombers must approach that target box and remain within range of their granite missiles, 388 miles, until a new satellite fix can help the bombers get better targeting data. The bombers could turn on their own radars, but that would make them stand out like a spotlight in a dark room, making them easy prey for the carrier's combat air patrol. While the Russians are having difficulty fixing the carrier's location, the Americans are not having similar problems. Even under intense cyber attack, the American recon satellite network is vast, outnumbered only by the Chinese in physical assets but not in capabilities. AWACS planes launched from Japan each have a detection range of just over 250 miles, and once more supported by aerial refueling tankers, the US Air Forces are able to cover a wide swath of Russia's Pacific coast with radar coverage. Further supplementing the land-based AWACS planes are carrier-launched Hawkeye airborne radar planes and EA-18 Growlers. The Russian attack wave is easily vectored, and the carrier's combat air patrol is dispatched. While the Tu-22s must get within 388 miles to launch their attack, the carrier's F-18 Hornets and the new F-35Cs each have a combat radius of over 1,200 miles. Guided by airborne radar, the F-35s take point. The Tu-22s realize they've been targeted when the F-35's fire control radar illuminates them, but by then it's too late. Countermeasures spoof a quarter of the incoming missiles, but 10 of the bombers are still down. The limited missile capacity of the F-35s is its greatest weakness, able to carry only four missiles internally in order to preserve its stealth capabilities. Instead, the F-35s are forced to switch to guns, and for the first time in decades, US fighters strafe enemy aircraft with guns. Cannon capacity is also very limited on F-35s, however, and the Russian planes are built tough. Three more Tu-22s are splashed, leaving nine. 
They're still hundreds of miles from launch, though, and the follow-on F-18s may not be stealthy, but with Russia unable to provide effective air cover past its shores, they don't need to be. The bombers are sitting ducks, speeding straight into a head-on deathmatch with the approaching Hornets. Wisely, the surviving 9-222s turn around and head back for home. Round 2, once more, goes to the US. As the surviving 222s arrive home, however, the crews are sent for chow and a few hours sleep. As they rest, the bombers are being refitted with a brand new weapon, just delivered from the Western Theater. The Russian military still has very small numbers of them and must use them extremely judiciously. But with the strike group now within 1,500 miles of the shore, the time is now. Half a day later, the 222s are once more back in the air. They know they'll be immediately spotted by the American satellites and AWACS planes once they leave the Russian coast, but this time they don't need to get so close to deliver their deadly payload. The Americans can't believe it. The Russians must be crazy, they're trying the exact same attack that just failed so catastrophically. Vectored in by Hawkeyes and Air Force AWACS, the Combat Air Patrol once more moves to intercept the incoming threat, well outside of anti-ship range. This time, the 222s only need to get within 1,000 miles of the carrier. They have to once more rely on targeting data from the overhead satellites, meaning the American carrier can only be fixed for brief moments in time. The carrier isn't close enough to the shore for installations to aid in tracking. They must once more target a very large box of the Pacific Ocean, but this new Russian weapon is fully capable of finding its own targets. It's perfect for the task at hand, and long before the Americans' combat air patrol can intercept him, each 222 drops two 10-meter black and silver missiles from their wingtip pylons. The Zircon anti-ship missiles immediately fire their rocket engines, boosting them to over two times the speed of sound. The rocket engine now detaches from the missile and falls to the ocean below, as the missile scramjet fires into action. The missile scramjet engine has no moving parts, instead it compresses incoming supersonic air and simply adds fuel, which causes the superheated air to explode. The energy redirected behind the missile by the engine nozzle. It's a brilliant design, but only works when you're already at supersonic speed, which has limited its use by militaries for decades. The missiles rise to the edge of the stratosphere where the air-breathing engines can still supply needed oxygen, but high enough that the missile's onboard targeting suite can pinpoint the American carrier. A stealthy body helps the missiles evade the American Aegis radar sweeping the sky. As a satellite enters proper phase over Earth, it sends a new fix on the carrier to the missiles, redirecting their course and greatly increasing their accuracy. A few dozen miles from their targets, the strike group's Aegis radars begin to pinpoint the incoming missiles. Traveling at Mach 9, though, the strike group's missile defenses have less than 30 seconds to respond. The strike group's missile defense systems are fully automated. Humans are no longer fast enough to respond to deadly hypersonic threats. Only a machine is up to the task, and Americans have built themselves one hell of a missile defense machine. Beams of powerful electromagnetic energy reach up toward the missiles in an attempt to directly interfere with the sensitive electronics of the targeting suite or confuse them. Three missiles suddenly careen wildly off course, tearing themselves apart thanks to their hypersonic speed. Fifteen missiles remain, twenty seconds to impact. The destroyer escorts prepare to launch decoys. They first deploy chaff as a means to make the missiles think a better target is somewhere else through its superheated metal flakes. However, it soon becomes apparent that these missiles are much more advanced than the Americans thought when they don't even begin to alter course. Quickly altering course themselves, the destroyers deploy their more advanced Nolka rounds that are more powerful and try to walk the missiles away from the formation. 15 seconds to impact. The Russian missiles are finally within interceptor range of the strike group's destroyers, and within moments salvos of interceptors are fired. However, the Russian missiles are moving at such incredible speeds that a superheated layer of plasma around them is making radar lock difficult to maintain. It takes three seconds for each volley of interceptors to be fired, and by the time the second volley is fired, the Russian missiles are too close to be intercepted by American rams. Another four Russian missiles are splashed, eleven missiles remain. Five seconds to impact. Each missile is now moving at almost 7,000 miles per hour on their descent phase. The layer of superheated plasma around each missile grows in size as the missiles plunge down and the atmosphere thickens. The last line of defense for the strike group comes online and will have mere seconds to respond. On ships across the strike group, SeaWiz cannons have already been placed on standby. The plasma surrounding the descending missiles once more makes radar lock difficult to achieve. The missiles move so unbelievably fast that by the time they've entered SeaWiz range and the SeaWiz systems have swiveled the cannons in the right direction, there's only two seconds left to fire. 
Most of the cannons never fire. There simply isn't enough time for the onboard radar to work out a good lock through the layer of plasma around each missile. A few do, but their accuracy is abysmal. Only a single Russian missile is knocked out a mile above the carrier. Ten missiles have penetrated the carrier's defenses. Two of the missiles have suffered manufacturing defects and never detonate as they strike the carrier. The Zircon hypersonic anti-ship missile is, after all, bleeding-edge tech for the Russians. Bugs in the software and defects in the manufacturing are inevitable. The missiles are moving so fast, however, that sheer kinetic energy alone punches a hole through the decks of the carrier, each missile penetrating almost to the bottom hole. The electronic brain in one of the other missiles has slightly misjudged its geometry and explodes in the ocean a few hundred feet away from the carrier. The other seven, however, find their mark. The hypersonic missiles move so fast that they penetrate several decks before the onboard explosives are triggered, which only increases the destructing potential of each missile. Armed with 800 pounds of explosives, the Zircon carries only half the explosive power of a granite anti-ship missile. But with seven direct hits, it doesn't matter much. Explosions rip through the inner decks of the carrier, buckling the flight deck and destroying dozens of aircraft in the below deck hangar. Secondary fuel explosions rock the ship as black smoke belches out. Hundreds of sailors have died in seconds. Hundreds more will die soon. The carrier is dead in the water, but she doesn't sink. The incredible size and engineering of a supercarrier makes it almost impossible to sink with anything less than a massed missile attack. That's why the Soviets planned on using a hundred bombers to do the task. Russia's new Zircon hypersonic missiles are deadly to the US Navy, but they are still available in such low numbers that unless Russia dedicated the majority of its stockpile to a single attack, sinking a US carrier is still incredibly unlikely. Achieving a mission kill, however, is very likely, and though the carrier won't sink, it'll be out of combat for at least a year as it undergoes repairs. Modern Russia would be very hard-pressed to sink a US carrier. Finding and hitting a carrier out at sea is incredibly difficult, especially when it's on the move. Without a recon fleet of air assets the size and scope of the US's own fleet, and the ability to dominate the skies far from its own shores, Russia's first problem is just finding American carriers in the first place. Of course, in the real world, Russia is moving to develop land-based variants of the Zircon anti-ship missile because it recognizes that in a realistic scenario, its 222 bombers would be unlikely to survive long enough to actually get in range of a carrier out at sea thanks to the US fighter bases in South Korea and Japan. Russia and the United States have long been two of the largest international powers in the world. As a result, both countries have their own specialized and expansive security agencies, the Central Intelligence Agency or CIA and the Federal Security Service of the Russian Federation or FSB. Established shortly after the Second World War in 1947, the CIA has been responsible for the gathering and analysis of highly sensitive information all over the world on behalf of the United States federal government. The FSB was formed more recently, in 1995, as a modern replacement for the Soviet Union's KGB. It's tasked with various responsibilities such as counterintelligence and counterterrorism operations, surveillance, border security, and investigating any violation of Russia's federal law. We previously covered how the CIA and KGB fared against each other in CIA vs KGB, which was better during the Cold War. But how do their modern, present-day equivalents hold up? We're pitting the CIA and the FSB against each other to see if we can determine which of them is the superior spy agency. So what do each of these agencies actually do? The main role of the CIA is to serve as the United States Foreign Intelligence Service, meaning that they're designed to gather intel internationally. The CIA, in theory, holds less jurisdiction to operate on home soil. Any investigations and operations that take place within America itself are usually handled by other agencies, such as the Federal Bureau of Investigation, otherwise known as the FBI. This is actually the first key difference between the CIA and the FSB. While the CIA's focus is on external threats and intelligence gathering, the FSB's role is to safeguard the Russian state from within. While the nature of the FSB is perhaps more akin to the FBI, that doesn't mean they haven't been involved in some CIA-style secret and dangerous operations, or that they don't have some pretty gnarly skeletons in their closet. So with that in mind, how do the two spy agencies compare in terms of their dark and duplicitous deeds? Let's start with one of the many secrets that the CIA likes to keep under wraps. Did you know that the Central Intelligence Agency has a top secret assassination unit? Conspiracy theorists and even official sources have linked the CIA to a number of infamous, high profile, and historically significant assassination attempts, from Cuban revolutionary Fidel Castro to Osama bin Laden. 
However, it was revealed that in response to the September 11th attack on the World Trade Center, US President George Bush authorized the Central Intelligence Agency to use a covert assassination unit in order to track down and eliminate members of Al-Qaeda. Journalist Evan Wright highlighted that this marked the first time the US government outsourced a covert assassination service to a private enterprise as the CIA brought in private contractors to carry out their secretive assassinations. The entire operation was even hidden from Congress themselves, meaning that the CIA had the power to abduct or kill anyone they believed to be associated with Al-Qaeda, without their actions being tracked back to the US government. That's a scary level of power and freedom for an organization to be granted, made even more scary by the fact that it was kept top secret for so long. No information about these assassinations was known to the public until almost a decade after President Bush had authorized the CIA to conduct them. And there's even rumors that the CIA are still using private security contractors to carry out assassinations to this very day. The FSB has just as many dark secrets of their own, however. For example, did you know that the FSB runs their own covert kill squad? No? Well, that's probably because they don't want you knowing. Meet the Alpha Group. These guys are one of Russia's toughest military squads, an elite team run by the FSB themselves. Very little is known about the actual directive of the Alpha Group, although many believe it's their job to act under direct orders from Russia's political leaders, meaning these guys most likely answer to President Vladimir Putin himself, a leader infamous for killing off critics. So what exactly is the Alpha Group? Officially, they're a subgroup of Spetsnaz, Russia's special forces. First established by the KGB in 1974, control over the Alpha Group was assumed by the FSB when they were founded to replace the KGB in 95, and the Alpha Group has been in their back pocket ever since. Their main job is to act as a counterterrorism unit, responding directly to any violent attacks that may occur. Of course, that doesn't mean the FSB couldn't find other uses for their private elite squad. One of the Alpha Group's most famous operations, the Nordost Siege, took place under the newly instated FSB only seven years after the Federal Security Service was established. On October 23rd of 2002, a group of almost 40 Chechen terrorists stormed a concert hall in Moscow, taking 916 people hostage during an in-progress performance of a musical called Nordost. Several days of failed negotiations later, the FSB authorized a head-on assault, deploying Alpha Group to eliminate the threat and rescue the hostages. However, this wasn't to be any small feat. The Alpha Group soon found that the entire concert hall had been rigged with explosives that could be remotely triggered by the terrorists at the slightest sign of anyone trying to get inside, which would very likely have killed everybody inside. Given this tricky situation, the FSB instructed the Alpha Group to pump a nerve gas through the ventilation system as a way of incapacitating the terrorists while they gained access to the concert hall. With precise fire from silenced weapons, all terrorists in the hall were eliminated. We shot without fail. Hitting the body could lead to explosives detonation. That's why we aimed for their heads," said one anonymous former officer of the Alpha Group. Apparently, it took as little as five minutes for the team to eliminate every single one of the terrorists inside the main concert hall, and a further ten to track down and take out any stragglers in adjacent rooms. The Nordost siege was over in a quarter of an hour, and while challenging for the elite Alpha Group, the FSB's direction and coordination resulted in them saving hundreds of civilians. However, 67 were killed in the siege, and a further 63 died in the hospital shortly after supposedly as a result of the nerve gas that was pumped into the concert hall and ambulances being unprepared to treat any hostages that were exposed to it. Naturally, the CIA has plenty of operatives of its own at its disposal, enough to rival the FSB Alpha Group. What you probably didn't know is that some of them may even have psychic powers. It sounds like something taken straight from David Cronenberg's scanners or even the MK Ultra offshoot responsible for giving Eleven her powers and Netflix's Stranger Things, but the CIA are supposedly highly interested in the application of psychic abilities. According to declassified documents released in 2017, they tested the abilities of one Yuri Geller. Geller's a British-Israeli TV illusionist, best known for bending spoons supposedly with the raw power of his mind. While this is a trick that has long been met with skepticism from the British public, Yuri Geller's illusions allegedly managed to draw the attention of the CIA themselves. According to Geller himself, the Central Intelligence Agency wanted to ascertain if the entertainer was truly clairvoyant and telepathic. He even made the claim that they wanted me to stand outside the Russian embassy in Mexico and erase floppy disks being flown out by the Russian agents. This was all a part of a bizarre CIA program known as Stargate. Yes, exactly like the movie which was focused on recruiting psychic warriors to operate on behalf of the CIA. After all, gathering intelligence becomes a much easier job when you've got an operative that can literally read an enemy's mind. 
The strangeness of the CIA's activities doesn't end with private assassins and psychic powers, though. In fact, in a classic old-school spy fashion, the Central Intelligence Agency may have perfected the recipe for invisible ink. Often synonymous with spies, invisible ink is a great way to conceal top-secret instructions for undercover operatives or to keep highly sensitive information classified and away from prying eyes. Featured within those same declassified documents from 2017 is the CIA's own recipe for homemade invisible ink, just like Grandma used to make. The recipe goes as follows. Make a silver print, fixed and bleached in mercury chloride. To make visible dip in hypo. Ok, so maybe that's not the easiest concoction to recreate. The report featuring this recipe also includes instructions on how to open sealed letters without the recipient knowing, as well as what to do with messages that are printed with invisible ink on the human body. According to the report, in order to destroy any secret messages written on a body, that body needs to be thoroughly scrubbed down and washed with lime or lemon juice to hide any traces of the message. Russia's own intelligence agency has their own preferred modus operandi, of course. During March of 2018 in Wiltshire Cathedral City, UK, father and daughter Sergei and Yulia Skripal were found on a bench with foam spilling from their mouths after being exposed to a deadly poisonous nerve agent known as Novichok. Skripal was an intelligence officer who'd been moved to the UK in 2010 as part of a spy exchange. This assassination was eventually linked after an investigation conducted by the UK government to agents working for the GRU, another of Russia's intelligence services. Far from the James Bond-style spy thriller mystery of the CIA and their invisible ink, this incident was far more tragic. While the attack was carried out by the GRU, it's important to remember that the FSB could very easily conduct a similar attack. After all, they've already proved their fondness for nerve agents in the Nordos siege. It's fair to say that the nations of Russia and America haven't always had the best relationship, and trust between the two countries has never quite recovered since the Cold War. This is something that can be seen mirrored in the interactions between the CIA and FSB. The ever-present rivalry between the United States and the Russian Federation persists even today. It's widely believed that the FSB was directly involved in the email leaks that undermined Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. Additionally, they've also played a hand in supporting a number of extremist parties in Europe, murdered Chechen opposition leaders in both Turkey and Austria, and perhaps most infamously of all, influenced the 2016 US presidential election. On January 10, 2017, a dossier published by BuzzFeed, albeit unverified and uncorroborated, suggested that the FSB had been collecting compromising evidence on Donald Trump. Many suspected that the goal of this was to blackmail the would-be president into acting as Vladimir Putin's puppet at the head of the US government. Whether this was true or not, President Trump's actions toward Russia have been seen by many as soft, and many military members considered his defense of Russia even after learning of bounties put on US troops' heads by Russian agents as tantamount to treason. But the CIA aren't above interfering in Russia's affairs either. Decades prior to the 2016 election, they recruited a Russian official who gradually began to climb the ranks of the country's government. This informant within the Kremlin became one of the CIA's most valuable and protected resources, feeding them information that pointed to the potential involvement of Russia and the FSB in the 2016 election. However, this informant who served as the CIA's only eyes into their inner workings of the Russian government was eventually extracted from the country for his own safety, with the CIA still protecting his identity to this day, although some believe it might have been the ill-fated Sergei Skripal. So which is the better spy agency? In one corner, secret assassins, psychic powers, and invisible ink. In the other, highly skilled elite special ops teams and a lot of nerve agents. It's almost too close to call. We'd like to think the CIA assassins with powerful telepathic abilities could hold their own against the FSB. And who knows, maybe somewhere in the world, in the shadows where civilians aren't allowed to look, a fight like that is going on, and we'd never even know. But if we're keeping our feet firmly rooted in the realm of reality, meaning psychic warriors need to be discounted and secret mind control projects like MKUltra are just seen as expensive and unethical failures, we feel like we need to give this one to Russia. While the CIA's history as a spy agency is definitely illustrious and influential, just ask the many countries and organizations they infiltrated, they don't quite match up to the calculated ruthlessness of the modern Russian FSB. Not to assassin shame you or anything CIA, but at least the FSB doesn't need to subcontract its extrajudicial murders. Just saying. 100,000 troops stand ready on Ukraine's border with Russia. Thousands more reservists have been called up to active duty. Diplomatic talks with the US and NATO have broken down. Is Russia really about to invade Ukraine? And what will happen if it does? In 2014, despite publicly denying it, Russia invaded and seized Crimea formally recognized as Ukrainian territory by the international community. 
per Russia's narrative, the Crimean conflict was a domestically inspired revolutionary movement by ethnic Russians seeking to rejoin Russia. However, it very quickly became clear that this was a lie, as Russian special forces, who earned the moniker Little Green Men for their featureless uniforms, were confirmed to be working with Crimean rebels. Then, deep dives into Russian social media produced even more damning evidence of regular Russian soldiers operating inside of Ukrainian territory itself. Russia never formally admitted to utilizing both unconventional and conventional military forces in Crimea to fight off Ukrainian forces, and in the end, Crimea declared itself independent and was quickly absorbed by Russia. Since then, fighting against rebel forces has continued across disputed Ukrainian territory, and Russia has continued to support those rebel forces, albeit in a slightly less obvious way. Now the fear of a full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine seems more real than ever, as 100,000 Russian soldiers mass on the border with the breakaway former Soviet Republic. But why would Russia risk angering the world with an invasion of a bordering nation? Could it really do it, and what would the world's response be if it did? Since the end of the Cold War, Russia has largely been in retreat from its former Soviet glory. It saw massive losses of territory and subsequent economic outflow from the independence of numerous former Soviet republics. As the nation struggled through tumultuous post-Soviet Union years, many of these newly independent nations took the opportunity to ensure their own survival and independence by drawing closer ties with the West. Russia made it very clear that it did not want NATO to expand further east than Germany, and yet, one by one, new Eastern European states joined NATO's ranks, pushing NATO forces closer and closer to Russian territory. Eventually, NATO would stand on Russia's northern border, with NATO forces within 500 miles of Moscow itself. For a nation with as difficult a history as Russia, this was the sum of all fears, and a strategic disaster. Rarely ever the invader, Russia itself has been repeatedly invaded throughout its history, and each time the human and economic toll was profound. Many of these invasions threatened the very independence of the nation itself, such as Germany's near defeat of the Red Army in World War II and Napoleon's invasion during the Napoleonic Wars. These invasions are so threatening because Russia sits at the eastern edge of the European plain, a large swath of relatively flat land that's very difficult to defend. With modern, fast-moving military formations, this strategic deficiency only increased, and after World War II, the Soviet Union became obsessed with pushing any potential future aggressor as far west as possible. This led the Soviet Union to extend its sphere of influence as far west as Germany, creating the infamous Soviet bloc as a buffer zone to any future invasion. With the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, Russia's influence receded practically back to its own borders and all the strategic gains of the last 50 years evaporated overnight. Today, more Eastern European nations have chosen to draw closer to the US and its European allies than to Russia, mostly due to Russia's authoritarian system of government and fears of becoming puppet states once more. As the new millennium dawned, Ukraine began to seek a pathway for membership in NATO, and Russia warned that this would be tantamount to a declaration of war between itself and NATO. Not willing to antagonize Russia, NATO postponed the Ukrainian question indefinitely, despite building cooperative ties with the nation. In 2014, Ukraine's worst fears were realized, and now its continued independence is in question by the 100,000 strong Russian forces massing on the border. If Russia invaded, though, how would Ukraine fare without Western aid? Ukraine has a population roughly a third of the size of Russia, and its military is ranked at the number 22 spot according to GlobalFirepower.com, which ranks world military powers according to the strength of their militaries, their economies, and demographics. Russia, despite slowly slipping out of it, still retains the number 2 spot as the world's second strongest military power, and its overmatch with Ukraine is significant. Russia's military numbers at 850,000 active personnel versus Ukraine's 200,000 strong military, a mismatch of 650,000 in Russia's favor. Due to the ever-growing threat of all-out war with Russia, both Ukraine and Russia have the same number of available reservists, 250,000, as Ukraine has dramatically increased readiness and training of reservist units. Since 2014, it's created dozens of additional reserve units, which can be quickly activated to combat Russian troops. In the air, Russia absolutely dwarfs Ukraine with the second-best air force in the world, numbering 4,173 strong. Ukraine, on the other hand, only has 318 aircraft available, with only 69 of those being fighter aircraft versus a fleet of 772 Russian fighters. Russia also enjoys a massive advantage in attack aircraft, with 739 dedicated attack platforms versus Ukraine's 29. With the world's second-largest air mobility fleet, Russia can call upon 445 aircraft to rapidly move troops into combat areas or launch airborne invasions deep into Ukrainian territory. By comparison, Ukraine's tiny air mobility fleet of 32 would struggle to move significant personnel or supplies in theater. Russia's attack helicopter fleet also vastly outnumbers Ukraine's own, with 544 versus 34. 
On land, Russia claims tank corps of 12,000 strong, but it's widely accepted that only a few thousand of those vehicles, likely around 6,000, are capable of immediate combat operations. The rest are Cold War era leftovers, which are in a mothball storage and would require weeks to reactivate and deploy. Ukraine, on the other hand, has a tank force of 2,596, giving Russia a probable 2 to 1 advantage over Ukraine. Russia also maintains a sizable advantage in number of armored vehicles used to support combat operations, with 30,122 versus Ukraine's 12,303. So, what story do these numbers tell about a possible Russian invasion? Firstly, while the numbers advantage is decidedly on the Russian side, Ukraine wouldn't actually be facing the full force of the Russian military, even in a worst-case scenario. That's because a significant number of those troops are required for security operations elsewhere. Russia must still maintain a strong defensive posture along its northern border with NATO and along its far eastern flank on the Pacific in order to deter a possible American incursion. Realistically, only about 50% of its western and southern military districts would be freed up for combat operations in Ukraine, with some reinforcements from the rest of Russia's three other military districts. A probable invasion of Ukraine would involve between 150,000 to 200,000 troops, bringing the number parity much more in line as Ukraine would be free to use most of its forces to combat the Russian invasion. With Belarus still being a strong Russian ally, though, a significant number of Ukrainian forces must be left in reserve in case of an unexpected northern incursion, so even Ukraine can't commit its entire force to the fight. Russian reinforcements would also need to make a lengthy trip from training camps or other military districts to Ukraine, while Ukraine would be drawing up reservists just miles from the fighting. In a Russian invasion of Ukraine, Russia would not enjoy a vast number superiority that the raw data shows, even if, as Russia believes, portions of Ukrainian populations would join them in a bid to rejoin Russia. A dubious proposition, indeed. In the air, even only utilizing 30-40% to 40 of its air forces, Russia would still dominate the skies. Ukraine operates largely Cold War-era aircraft, which are being kept operational by a domestic arms industry, while Russia's inventory is largely modern, though not entirely so. Russia's overmatch in the skies would allow it to establish complete air superiority, and its extensive ground-based air defense batteries would allow it to threaten over half of Ukraine from the ground without even moving air defense units inside Ukraine's borders. Thus, Ukraine would likely opt to simply move its aircraft west and not even bother dedicating them to fight, opting instead for ground-based air defense. On the ground, Russia's tank forces vastly outnumber Ukraine's, but at least some of Ukraine's tanks are actually more capable than Russia's. In the second half of the 2010s, as war with Russia seemed ever more likely, Ukraine began a program of upgrading its Cold War-era T-64s, which are on the whole more sophisticated than Russia's vast fleet of T-72s. Domestic upgrades have made the Ukrainian T-64 BM Bulat deadlier than Russia's own T-72. But even with two factories dedicated to the task of upgrading Ukraine's tanks, it still only has about 300 upgraded T-64s in its inventory. Sadly, with complete domination of the skies, this is likely to matter little as Russian air power systematically seeks out and destroys Ukrainian armor. Russia's sizable numerical advantage is diminished significantly in an invasion of Ukraine due to its defense commitments elsewhere, but it still allows Russia to rotate combat troops out of theater with fresh forces and to replenish combat losses of aircraft and vehicles at a rate that Ukraine simply can't match. Further, while the Russian Air Force also has defense commitments elsewhere, the nation would be able to dedicate a large number of strike aircraft to the initial days of the war, launching a devastating blitzkrieg of overwhelming force against Ukrainian troops, supply depots, and command and control nodes. Russia also enjoys very robust electronic warfare capabilities, having made much greater investments into this area of warfighting than most other nations in a bid to defeat American smart weapons and erode its technological advantage. Russian electronic warfare could seriously degrade Ukrainian defensive radar interrupt or fully jam Ukrainian communications, and even aid in the spread of disinformation and propaganda. This has already been seen in combat along Ukraine's eastern front, as Russian EW units jammed Ukrainian communications and even spoofed text messages to soldiers on the front lines with demoralizing or confusing orders. For the most part, Ukraine has no such capability. However, while the numbers heavily favor Russia, a conquest of Ukraine would by no means be easy for them. For starters, Ukraine enjoys home field advantage, and after eight years of hostilities with Russia, pro-independent sentiments are strong amongst the Ukrainian population. Dreams of being welcomed as liberators by the locals and even having entire guerrilla movements spring up to aid invading Russian forces are almost certainly a Russian fantasy at this point. The Ukrainian people also have some faith that the West would not simply abandon them to Russian aggression, given that Ukraine's annexation back into the Russian fold would be a strategic disaster for NATO. This would help bolster morale in a brutal and very bloody invasion. Ukrainian military forces have also proven themselves to be far more capable than Russia believed in 2014. 
When the process of annexing Crimea began, the Kremlin believed that Ukrainian forces would quickly crumble and be incapable of long-term significant resistance to rebellion movements sweeping across the country's eastern border with Russia. It was believed that Ukraine would quickly fall piece by piece to pro-Russian independence movements, financed of course with weapons and supplies by Russia itself. Yet the Ukrainian armed forces did not collapse as expected, and while they were unable to weather the onslaught of battle against line Russian forces disguised as rebels in Crimea, they had largely been able to contain the separatists and Ukraine remains united. Ukrainian military units have proven surprisingly resilient and capable even under assault by modern and more capable Russian weapon systems, prompting the United States to send numerous observers to gather intelligence on Russian capabilities. The world has also not stood idly by as Ukraine was covertly invaded by Russian forces and in anticipation of a full-scale invasion has taken steps to ensure the nation is able to defend itself. The United States alone has provided a whopping $2.5 billion in military aid to Ukraine with an additional $200 million given in December of 2021. The aid has largely taken the form of anti-tank missiles, anti-air missiles, counter-artillery radar systems, patrol boats, small arms, and millions of rounds of ammunition. To date, the United States is responsible for 90% of all aid given to Ukraine. The specific type of aid given speaks to the US's thoughts on a Russian invasion. The vast amount of deadly Javelin anti-tank missiles provided to Ukraine are meant to maul Russian tanks and armored vehicles and represent an extremely significant threat to a Russian invasion. Manned portable air defense weapons will help Ukrainian soldiers eat into Russian air superiority, threatening Russian aircraft and providing a survivable air defense component that's not easily destroyed by Russian forces. Much like in Afghanistan, Russia could face serious threats from US air defense weapons, possibly having a significant impact on air operations in the country. Counter-artillery radar systems will help Ukraine take on Russia's sizable artillery forces, which provide much of the Russian military's killing power. In combat operations against rebel and Russian forces, Ukraine's tank corps had suffered 400 casualties, and almost all of these to Russian-made artillery. Counter-artillery radar will allow Ukrainian artillery to immediately launch counter-battery fire, destroying slow-moving Russian artillery. Its more important contribution, however, may be in limiting Russian artillery operations, as they'll now have to take into account the possibility of counterfire and thus practice shoot and scoot procedures which limit total rate of fire and place non-motorized artillery units in serious risk. However, US assistance has been more hands-on as well. The American military has provided direct intelligence support to Ukraine in the form of detailed satellite imagery and analysis, helping Ukrainian forces pinpoint rebel forces, track their movements, and target them for destruction. The assistance of America's eyes in the sky has had the effect of saving hundreds of Ukrainian soldiers' lives. The United States military has also assisted Ukraine by providing medical supplies and equipment, as well as hosting numerous training exercises in western Ukraine. U.S. active duty, reserve, and National Guard forces have all been deployed to western Ukraine to help train local forces, bringing their combat expertise in Iraq and Afghanistan, and teaching Ukrainian soldiers how to properly employ modern anti-tank and anti-aircraft weapons donated by the U.S. While no direct combat assistance has been provided by America to Ukraine, numerous and completely unacknowledged intelligence gathering and recon units have been deployed into the nation's conflict zones. This has allowed the U.S. forces to gather detailed intelligence on Russian weapon systems, as well as collect critical data on Russian electronic warfare operations and capabilities. This intelligence has helped Ukrainian forces directly in preparation for combat ops, but has also allowed the United States to better prepare for its own confrontation with Russia. The CIA has also joined the conflict. Its secretive Special Activities Division has been training Ukrainian forces in guerrilla warfare tactics for years and helping prepare the nation for a possible invasion. The CIA's SAD has been preparing Ukrainian active duty and reserve forces to wage an unconventional war against Russia's superior military, incorporating lessons learned from Vietnam and both the US's and Russia's invasion of Afghanistan. So, what would a Russian invasion of Ukraine look like? And what might happen? Russia's main thrust into Ukraine would come from its shared border, with an intense air campaign lasting two or more days, destroying any Ukrainian air opposition and targeting command and control nodes troop staging areas, supply hubs, and industrial sectors. In a mirror to the US's own strategy of shock and awe, the intent would be a swift and incomprehensibly violent campaign meant to blind the Ukrainian military, throw it into disarray by disrupting communications, and seriously demoralize it through extensive bombing. Ground-based missiles would supplement air operations, allowing Russian missile units deep inside its own territory to lay waste to Ukrainian targets. The next phase of the attack would come on the heels of the air campaign, with a massive armored thrust into eastern Ukraine. A double-pronged assault would see Russian forces pouring into Ukraine from the northeast border and from inside the separatist-controlled area. 
which could afford Russia with a staging area for an invasion, albeit such an act would give away its plans to invade long before they were put into effect. Another possibility, though a risky one for Russia, would be a naval assault against Odessa from Crimea itself. Russia's Black Sea naval forces have seen major reinforcements since 2014, and while still low in numbers, Russia's current fleet in the region is capable of amphibious operations. Historically, Russia has difficulty with amphibious ops due to logistical issues, and these same issues would be present today. However, Russia could still amass an amphibious assault force of 3,600 troops backed up by 70 main battle tanks and 153 amphibious armored personnel carriers in a first strike against Odessa. These would be quickly reinforced by further amphibious operations. The move would be risky, but if successful would leave Russia in control of 70% of Ukraine's trade, giving it incredible leverage over the country. Russia could also potentially launch an invasion from Belarus into Ukraine, however to do so it would have to move a significant amount of personnel and equipment into the nation. This would once more tip its hand early and allow Ukraine and the world more time to prepare a response. How would this really play out though? The main Russian assault across the border and from the separatist controlled areas would be difficult for Ukraine to defend against. However, the proliferation of American Javelin anti-tank missiles would take a heavy toll on Russian forces and severely slow their rate of advance. At this point, Ukraine's goal would be to slow the pace of the war as much as possible in hope of an international response and resolution, as it could never defeat the Russian military on its own. Ukrainian forces would be dedicated to stalling the Russian attack and trading blood for time. Even US military aid is focused to this end, hence why America has not provided larger weapon systems it knows would be unlikely to survive an initial Russian assault. Man portable anti-tank and anti-aircraft weapons gifted by the US to Ukraine are much more difficult to destroy and allow unconventional forces to take a heavy toll on a conventional force. Ukraine would inevitably be forced into a fighting retreat in the east, with the goal of buying enough time for the world to respond to the crisis. Taking a page from the CIA's playbook for a possible Soviet invasion of the West during a Cold War, some units might even allow themselves to be completely overrun, going to ground and remaining hidden as Russian forces push past them. This secret army doctrine was theorycrafted by the CIA in the 60s and 70s, and it was only until recent years that secret plans to leave entire sleeper armies behind enemy lines were revealed. The intent was simple. Given that certain military forces were unlikely to survive against a vastly superior Soviet force, they'd simply not fight and allow the enemy to push past them. Then, once they were in the enemy's rear area, they would rise up and cause mayhem and destruction behind enemy lines against much weaker rear area security forces. An invasion of Odessa from Crimea is possible as well, although unlikely. Russia is very aware of the limitations of its amphibious fleet in the Black Sea, and would likely choose against such a risky if high-yield operation. Such an operation would face no truly significant naval opposition, but it could face a sizable ground defense force. Given the likely slow advance of Russian forces in eastern Ukraine, reinforcements would have to come either by sea or air. If by sea, Russia's sea lift capabilities would doubtlessly dwindle over time as ships and landing craft are lost in combat operations or equipment breakdowns. A steady flow of reinforcements would inevitably slow to a trickle due to logistical losses. Russia would have to take and hold major port facilities to allow for large numbers of troops and equipment to be offloaded, likely with civilian vessels pressed into military service. It's highly unlikely that Ukraine would allow such facilities to remain uncontested or even operational. Another option would be to reinforce Odessa via airlift operations or airborne paradrops. However, the wide proliferation of American anti-aircraft weapons makes this an extremely risky proposition, and Russian airborne forces, which would already be facing steep losses to those weapons, could be devastated attempting to land so deep in Ukrainian territory. Despite being a possible war-winning strategic victory, the taking of Odessa would have to be done the hard way with a slow but steady advance from the east by Russian ground forces. Instead, Russian Black Sea naval forces would use their significant land attack capabilities to pound Ukrainian forces and military installations, while amphibious assaults near the front could flank Ukrainian frontline units, a much better use for them than a potentially suicidal attack against Odessa. The world's response to Russian aggression would undoubtedly be immediate and very punishing sanctions, but Russia has grown to be very resilient to further economic damage by global sanctions. The nation has already been severely punished by international sanctions, wreaking havoc on its economic and even military sectors, but there is a limit to what further sanctions could really do to the nation. Plus, thanks to its massive energy exports, which European nations rely on to a large degree, Russia has built up a sizable war chest to help it weather sanctions and the cost of combat operations. However, the United States has stated through its diplomats that it's ready to impose even more damaging sanctions on Russia should it invade Ukraine, as well as take unspecified actions that the US has never taken before. 
What exactly those unspecified actions could be remain a mystery, and could range from direct military intervention to massive cyber warfare operations against Russia. What is certain is that the United States and NATO would immediately supply Ukraine with much more offensive military aid. In a very real sense, the future of Ukraine is the future of Europe itself in the 21st century, and given the strategic importance of Ukraine to NATO, it seems increasingly unlikely that a Russian invasion won't eventually be met with a US-led military campaign against Russia. Russia's President Vladimir Putin also seems to know this as he recently threatened that Russia's nuclear arsenal stands ready for combat, no doubt because he understands that unless he can secure swift victory in Ukraine, the Russian military is no match for the US in a longer conflict. The United States leads the world by an incredibly wide margin in financial aid to Ukraine. As of the writing of the script, America has given approximately $50 billion in aid to Ukraine. This has bought much-needed military equipment, helped pay salaries, and provided vital relief for millions of Ukrainian refugees. As incredible as this staggering amount is, it pales in comparison with the financial aid that Europe gives Russia, equaling about 22 billion euros every single month. Shortly after the start of invasion, the world levied heavy sanctions on Russia in a bid to seriously economically damage it and hopefully force it to end its invasion of Ukraine. However, right off the bat, the European Union refused to take steps necessary to truly hurt the Russian economy, ban all Russian banks from the SWIFT international payment network. This highly secured payment network connects banks all over the world. The Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications, or SWIFT, allows for the sending and receipt of international payments. With over 11,000 banks in the network, over 33 million transactions happen every single day on the most massive and secure banking network in the world. But SWIFT itself isn't a bank, merely an in-between that allows different banks to connect with each other. Thus, the consumer can easily pay from his bank account to a member on the other side of the world using a different bank altogether. Without access to SWIFT, a nation would be extremely hard-pressed to interact financially with the world and have to take on additional time and expenses of directly transferring funds from one bank to another in order to receive or give out payments. Being removed from SWIFT would be catastrophic to the Russian Federation, and yet many European states lobbied hard for Russia to be spared this most damning of sanctions. In the end, most but not all Russian banks were removed from the network, and while this did have a significant impact on Russian businesses' ability to conduct international business, the banks that remained connected allowed Russia to mitigate any of the damage to its all-important energy sector. And with Russia, it's all about energy. The Russian economy is poorly diversified, with as much as 40% of the economy relying on the production of energy. This makes the Russian economy extremely vulnerable to disruption, and it's exactly why Ukraine pushed so hard for Russia's energy sector to be targeted directly with sanctions. With energy exports making up around 60% of the Russian budget, a ban on Russian oil would be a death knell to the Putin regime. So why in the world hasn't Europe acted yet? After sanctions against it, the ruble crashed and threatened to take the Russian economy with it. Yet, almost immediately, it bounced back to pre-invasion levels. This was foreseen by anyone who understood that energy is Russia's biggest lifeline. Sure, pulling McDonald's out of the country costs thousands of jobs, and Adidas's exit from Russia has put the country into a full-blown tracksuit emergency. But energy is what keeps the most important parts of the Russian economy moving. With the bounce back of the ruble, Putin was able to mock Western sanctions and point out to his own citizens that the ongoing sanctions have little effect on Russia. This allowed him to continue garnering domestic support for his invasion. Lithuania was the first European country to pull the plug on Russian natural gas, with its foreign minister Gabrielis Landsbergis tweeting out, Dear EU friends, pull the plug. Don't be an accomplice. But while the European Union is mulling over restrictions on coal imports from Russia, gas remains a hot-button topic for most European countries. Via just pipelines alone, Russia provided 42% of Europe's gas imports, a staggering amount of vital energy to fuel modern cities. In 2020 alone, the EU spent $60.1 billion in Russian energy, making energy two-thirds of all of Europe's imports from Russia. But petroleum absolutely dominates the import figures for Europe. With 8 billion euros in natural gas imported, Europe also imports just over 48 billion in petroleum and petroleum products from the energy superstate. And thanks to Russian law allowing only the government-owned Gazprom to operate pipelines into Europe, most of this money is going straight into the checkbook of the Kremlin, which in turn it uses to continue supporting its war in Ukraine. But who are the worst offenders? Despite warnings against it by President Barack Obama, Germany basically went all in on Russian energy imports. And in 2020, Germany dominated natural gas imports from Russia with 45.8 billion cubic meters pumped straight into the country from Gazprom. 
Next was Italy, with 20.8 billion cubic meters, Turkey with 16.4 billion cubic meters, Austria with 13.2, France with 12.4, Netherlands with 11.9, Poland with 9.7, Hungary with 8.6, Slovakia with 8.6 as well, and the UK with 6. After this, imports fall off steeply, with the Czech Republic importing 5 billion cubic meters and the rest of Europe coming in far under that figure. Europe is clearly a big customer for Russia, and exports to Europe of all minerals, including oil, make up half of all Russian exports. Couple this with currently sky-high oil prices and Russia's being enriched at a rate that far surpasses any amount of financial aid to Ukraine. According to Russian law, all revenue above $43 a barrel of oil goes straight into the government's pockets. Currently, as of the writing of the script, oil is at $110 per barrel, which means that over half of the price of each barrel of oil paid to Russia goes directly to the government coffers. Naturally, through taxes, Russia scoops up another few percentage points of anything below $43 a barrel, and just Europe's energy imports alone is more than enough to pay for Russia's entire military, which highlights the precarious situation that Russia would find itself in if Europe weaned itself off Russian energy. But Russia has worked hard for years to ensure this did not happen, cozying up to its biggest energy buyers and infiltrating political movements across the EU. Russian clandestine activities have targeted environmental movements that sought to wean their nations off non-renewable energy, and at the same time use those same movements to protest against the current operation of and building of new nuclear power plants. This was all done with one goal in mind, keep Europe sucking on the petroleum and natural gas teat of Russia. And as we've now seen, Europe's reliance on Russian energy has allowed the nation to do as it pleases in Ukraine. Yet now there's a growing movement to end all dependence on a nation utterly hostile to Western civilization. Poland's Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki was one of the leading figures of this movement, stating that Europe needed to end its dependence on Russian oil and natural gas so that the nation would not use those funds for further aggression. Some progress has been made, with Germany shutting down the Nord Stream 2 pipeline that ran from Germany to Russia, yet another project opposed by two American presidents. The pipeline was not yet operating though, so while it denied Russia some income, it was largely a symbolic move that Germany would not at least seek even further energy ties between between itself and Russia. Yet Europe as a whole, and especially Germany, has been extremely reluctant to directly target Russian energy. Putin, however, has been proactive. He has cut off natural gas exports to both Poland and Bulgaria, and is now threatening to do the same to other nations. Prior to this, Putin had demanded that all future payments for energy be made in rubles so that the value of the currency could be propped up and further economic collapse contained. Europe had denied this out of hand as current contracts stipulate that gas and other energy products are to be paid for in either dollars or euros. Yet, just a single day after Putin shut off the gas to Poland and Bulgaria, German and Italian energy companies practically tripped over themselves to open up accounts with Russian bank Gazprom Bank in order to comply with Putin's orders that purchases be paid for in rubles. With $850 million a day being paid by Europe to Russia, sanctions are not hitting Russia nearly as hard as they should be, and subsequently the war continues to rage. Yet, Putin's threats have galvanized Europe to become energy independent and have inadvertently led to a resurgence of a green movement on the continent. Facing the reality of being unable to effectively confront Russia as long as it provides for its energy needs, Europe has taken to looking at all sources of new energy, including renewable, with increased vigor. In the coming years, we should see an expansion of green energy across Europe, as many European nations are reluctant to turn to the Middle East for energy needs due to political concerns in the region. Now the European Union is working to phase out all Russian oil by the end of this year, and they're hoping to do the same with natural gas either by the end of this year or within a few years. This will be a serious hit to Russia's coffers, but the biggest benefit will be freeing Europe from the influence of a state that is overtly hostile to it. As long as Russia controls European energy, the European Union will never be able to effectively oppose Russian foreign policy. And as the shutdown of exports to Poland and Bulgaria have shown, some European countries are so dependent on Russian gas and oil that they threaten the very unity of the EU. On November 21, 2013, Ukraine erupted into civil unrest. The massive demonstrations were sparked by the decision of Ukraine's then-president, Viktor Yanukovych, to discard an agreement with the European Union, which would have seen Ukraine move toward eventually joining the EU. Instead, President Yanukovych announced that he would seek closer ties with Russia, to the surprise of no one as he was already considered a Russian puppet. What nobody expected was how the Ukrainian people would react to Yanukovych trying to tie their future to Russia instead of Europe. The protests soon turned violent, with the demand that the president and his entire cabinet step down. 
Named one of the most corrupt governments in the world by Transparency International, President Yanukovych had a long history of violence against his citizens and taking bribes, especially from Russian-backed sources. Eventually, President Yanukovych was forced to flee the country, and then the rebellion quickly installed a pro-European president in power. However, that's when Ukraine's troubles would really start. Finally believing themselves to be free of Russian influence, Ukraine instead found itself fighting off a secession movement in the regions of Donbass and Crimea, fueled by Russian separatists. When Ukrainian troops moved to quell the rebellion, they were surprised to find themselves in combat with Russian tanks, infantry, and even special forces. For its part, Russia denied any involvement despite the documenting of unmarked Russian military vehicles carrying dead Russian soldiers back to Russia from Ukraine. President Putin instead claimed that any Russians fighting in Ukraine were doing so on their own free will and that the government had no official role in the fighting there. Even more evidence, including social media posts from Russian soldiers themselves, dispelled any notion that Putin hadn't sent troops to Ukraine. Outmatched by Russian firepower, Ukraine's troops suffered a catastrophic defeat and were forced back, eventually all but ceding control of the disputed regions to pro-Russian forces. In response, the world slammed Russia with crippling economic sanctions, and US President Barack Obama ordered additional US forces to Europe in order to warn Putin from further aggression. Since Putin's original invasion of Crimea, however, things have changed dramatically in the world. Russia is still under punishing economic sanctions, yet it's Russia's common people who are suffering the effects, not Putin or his oligarch friends. Willing to have his people shoulder the economic pain he himself is unaffected by, Putin has thus far not been deterred by sanctions. Now the question on everyone's mind is, will Putin decide to finally invade Ukraine or not? Perhaps nobody is more afraid of this than the Ukrainians themselves, especially after Putin announced that he would grant expedited Russian citizenship to the inhabitants of Crimea. This is but one in several carefully planned moves by Putin to legitimize Russia's claim to the region. As once it's full of legal Russian residents, he'll have a better argument for supporting his currently illegal annexation of the Crimean Peninsula, which is unrecognized by both Ukraine and the rest of the world. Even more worrying, however, is a recent documentary released in Russia this summer where Putin himself makes the claim that several Eastern European nations illegally took territory with them that belonged to native Russia after the breakup of the Soviet Union. To anyone living east of Germany, Putin's statement is tantamount to threatening the invasion of not just Ukraine but any Russian neighbor. To a student of history, the current Russia-Ukraine situation sounds suspiciously a lot like the pre-World War II Germany's Sudetenland debacle that all but officially signaled the start of the Second World War. Would Russia really go for it and invade, however? Much like during Hitler's time, the West is showing some level of appeasement toward Putin's claims on Eastern Europe. Only this time, it's the United States who's doing the appeasement. Despite claims of being tough on Russia, US President Donald Trump has repeatedly ignored Russian actions in Ukraine and shown little to no interest in how the Ukrainian crisis plays out. With his gifting of Syria to Russia by ordering the pullout of US personnel, now the world's wondering if President Trump would dare oppose Putin on the world stage. If Russia wanted to use military force in Ukraine and annex the entire nation, there is little that Europe could do to stop it on their own. Without American military power, the EU simply couldn't field a large enough armed response to stop the Russian incursion, let alone reverse it. While Europe has known for decades that the transatlantic alliance with the US was strong and that America could be relied upon, the relationship has dramatically weakened over the last four years under President Trump, leaving many to wonder if the US would respond at all to a Russian invasion. To complicate matters even worse, a recent revelation led to the discovery that President Trump was aware of Russian bounties paid out by its government to insurgents who killed US troops, yet the information did not stop him from campaigning for Russia to rejoin the G8 after it was kicked out due to its invasion of Crimea. Despite the discovery by the CIA of bounties as high as $100,000 for each dead American soldier paid out by Russia's GRU, President Trump's pro-Russia campaigning signals that the US will almost certainly not interfere with the Ukrainian invasion. But would Russia really do it? With the EU unable to stop Russian military, the most they could do is impose even more sanctions, and yet Russia is already weathering pretty severe sanctions, so the economic impact at this point would probably not be enough to stop Putin if he really wanted to invade. Further adding to the risk of invasion is the fact that Putin himself is facing a variety of domestic troubles, ranging from a poor economy to civil unrest, as Putin sets himself up to remain in power indefinitely. 
a rally around the flag event such as a Ukrainian invasion might be seen to Putin as a solution, even if temporary, to his domestic troubles. Opposition in Ukraine would be stiff, however, thanks to the thousands of anti-tank weapons sold to Ukraine by the US. With little to no utility in fighting against rebels in Crimea who don't operate tanks, these weapons are very clearly meant to take on Russian tanks and armored vehicles. This would make a Ukrainian invasion a costly one for Russia, no doubt factoring into Putin's plans for the region. Ultimately, Russia could invade Ukraine successfully and re-establish some of the former Soviet Union glory that Putin so desperately wants to recreate, but it's events in America that will likely dictate if that happens or not, more than events in Europe. With President Trump showing no interest in countering any Russian moves around the world, if re-elected it's likely that Putin will see this as a green light to do as he wishes in Ukraine and elsewhere. As Ukraine is not a NATO member, its best it could hope for would be an armed response from European forces. But without US forces, Europe is simply not strong enough on its own to stand up to Russia. On October 8, 2022, the bridge built by Russia connecting it with Crimea underwent a mysterious and sudden deconstruction event. The world was quick to give credit for the explosion to Ukraine, but the nation hasn't actually come forward yet to claim responsibility. It's almost certain that the attack on the Kerch Bridge was the work of Ukraine, but the question is how? Using aircraft is out of the question given that the entire area is very well protected by S-400 and S-300 air defense units. American stealth aircraft could likely evade these defenses to get close enough to launch standoff munitions, but Ukraine simply lacks the capabilities. Missile attack is also extremely unlikely as to date the United States has refused to give Ukraine the long-range attack weapons it's been asking for for months. The distance from Ukrainian-held territory to the Kerch Bridge is also considerable, over 120 miles. This does put the bridge inside the range of the U.S. Army Tactical Combat Missile System, or ATACMS, but this is the exact weapon that the U.S. has so far withheld for fear of Ukraine using it to strike inside Russia and escalate the war. But it isn't impossible this is the weapon responsible, given that right before the attack on the bridge, Ukraine had offered to give the U.S. complete oversight of all targets it used long-range weapons on. There's a possibility that the bridge was mined by Ukrainian special forces who have shown incredible skill and creativity throughout the conflict. However, the currents under the bridge are treacherous and the waters near it patrolled by the Russian Navy. It would then require operators to make a significant climb up to the floor of the bridge itself to plant the explosives. Not impossible, just extremely improbable. What's likely is that the Kerch bridge attack was undertaken with the use of a truck bomb, though details are extremely scarce. Was the driver of the truck aware of his payload, or did Ukraine use a suicide bomber to carry out the attack? Suicide attacks have not been a feature of the Ukrainian playbook so this is unlikely, which means that the payload of the truck was unknown to the driver. The attack managed to kill three people, damage one of the rail lines, and destroy one segment used by cars. It has crippled motor vehicle traffic in and out of the area, and put a serious hamper on the use of the motorway to move supplies and troops into Crimea. But if the goal of the attack was to shut down Russia's capability to use it for resupply, then the attack failed. Within days, the all-important railways were once more operational. Russia famously uses rail to resupply its troops, a serious deficiency because it lacks the truck transport capability to then move those supplies from safe railheads to the front lines. The further away the front is, the slower Russia can move supplies as it requires its limited truck pool to drive further for longer. But the attack has left Russia shaken to its core, as evidenced by the fact that in retaliation to the attack, Putin ordered a barrage of missiles against mostly civilian targets in Ukraine. Kyiv was hit especially hard with multiple civilians killed, as missiles landed on a pedestrian bridge, or near it as Russian precision weapons have never really been precise, and a public park. The attack was almost a knee-jerk reaction to once more being humiliated by Ukraine in a place that Ukrainian forces were supposed to be incapable of reaching. Even more than that though, it's not just a war crime but also foolish as Russia expends what remaining precision weapons it has, attacking civilians instead of the military targets that are even now defeating it on the battlefield. While the attack on the Kerch Bridge might have been a tactical failure, it had a significant strategic value. For starters, it once more puts Russia on the back foot. The Kerch Bridge is a critical link between Russia and occupied Crimea, through which much of the weapons, personnel, and vehicles needed for the war in Ukraine flow. Severing this vital logistical artery would cripple the ability to resupply Russian forces in Crimea and in the south of Ukraine. But just the fact that Ukraine managed to attack what is supposed to be a very secure feature far from the front 
shows the vulnerability of Russia to asymmetrical attacks, and defending against these types of threats is extremely resource intensive. When the United States was waging its wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, it had to devote significant resources to countering asymmetrical threats from terrorists to guerrilla attacks on supply bases, consuming a lot of its manpower and limiting the scope of the operations it could undertake. The US is, however, far more capable than Russia and was able to successfully prosecute offensives while protecting from asymmetrical threats. A lack of capability isn't the only defense, though, as Russia must now dedicate manpower and resources to protecting areas once seen as safely out of reach of Ukraine, and manpower and resources are two things that Russia is critically in low supply of. The attack also had a significant effect on the morale of both the Russian people and its military. Every time Ukraine does the impossible, it makes Russians feel more vulnerable. This has had a very real psychological effect on both the population and conscripts, which are even now being thrown into combat. If Ukraine can strike such sensitive areas as the Kerch Bridge and supposedly safe air bases deep inside Crimea, then where else can it hit? And the frontline Russian conscript has to ask himself also, was this the work of saboteurs? Or is Ukraine fielding advanced NATO weapons that are now being aimed directly at you? It's a hugely demoralizing turn of events, for sure. The bridge, however, has significant value as a target for one other reason. It basically immortalizes Russia's annexation of Crimea. It's an impressive feat of Russian engineering, stretching over 10 miles in length and featuring a span for both rail and road traffic. Construction began in 2015, a year after Crimea was seized by Russia, and meant to legitimize Russia's claim to the territory. At a cost of $3.7 billion, the bridge was completed in record time in 2019, officially making it the longest bridge in Europe. Putin himself was present at the ceremony opening it for traffic, signaling a new height of Russian power and prestige. And that's why the bridge has significant value for Ukraine as a propaganda target. Destroying or even just damaging the bridge is like directly attacking Putin and the legitimacy of his special military operation. But for Ukrainians, the bridge is a symbol of Russia's aggression and the great crime they perpetuated in 2014 by seizing Crimea, traditionally known as the Jewel of the Black Sea for its vast beauty. Destroying the Kerch Bridge is not just a strategic goal of Ukraine, but an act of revenge. If in the future Ukraine can manage to fully down this impressive span, it will almost certainly signal not just the collapse of Russia's supply lines into Crimea, but the very collapse of Russia's war efforts in Ukraine. Now go check out why is Ukraine's counteroffensive so successful, or click this other video instead.